Welcome and to the third and final day of this live coverage from the John Birgis Sled Dog Marathon in Minnesota. The Mushers has been on the trails now for 45 minutes and now they're entering the final stage of the race. Later today we'll figure out who will come in first to the Grand Portage finish line and then claim the victory of this edition of John Birgis Sled Dog Marathon. Very happy to have with me here with some great mushers in the studio. And I'm very happy to introduce you once again to Norway's Nina Skramsta and Alaska biggest star, Dallas CV. How are you guys doing? Ready, ready to roll. Are you yeah. ready to rock yeah. and roll? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's going to be a fun uh, uh, finishing of this race to watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's getting exciting. Um, I'm having a blast doing this, analyzing this race, watching this race play out. We have some good dog mushers and great dog teams out there doing what they do best, um, getting into the exciting part of this race as we close in on the final hours. Exactly. We've been there on the trails for 45 hours. It's not ma many sports that you have to wait so many hours to figure out who's the winner. Tell me, what's the beauty of this sport? Well, the beauty is that for me, the experience with the dogs and the nature and the landscape, of course, and also I'm a bit of a, uh, well, a competition person as well, competitive person. So yeah, but the beauty is actually the experiences in the nature together with my dogs. Absolutely. I love the the long aspect of this race. The fact that it does take you know three days, or some of these races you know nine or ten days, or maybe thirteen or fourteen days for the last person to cross the finish line on a thousand mile race, because this is not just about one aspect. It's not just about running fast. It's about caring for a team day in and day out and addressing all of their needs. You know, everything from their physical abilities to their emotional, you know, stability and everything else. So I love that complete aspect of the sport that it's not just one thing. How long can you jump? How far can you run? Right? It's a it's a bigger, more encompassing sport between species, right? You have dogs and humans working together. You need to be patient also. Patience is an endurance racer's best friend. It's an absolute prerequisite to have any success in this race. You have to be patient and be aware of so many different things at one time, have this long view, but then also in these intense moments, focus in into a very narrow view. What do I do in the next 10 seconds? But in the back of your mind, you have to be aware, what do I do in the next 10 days? Well, I like the idea that you're totally on your own. Yeah, everything you do is depending on what you do yourself. Um, and you're kind of in a bubble. And well, it's not kind of, you are in, you are in the bubble. You yeah. are in your own little world during the race. And for me, it takes a pretty long time after finishing the race to land again or to feel down to earth again. You're in a bubble <laughs> after the finish as well, actually. Yeah. And, and like you say, it's patience is the best friend of a musher. And also, but you still have to be focused. And there are a lot of details to take care of all the time. How do you manage to keep focused and stay concentrated over such a long time, it's it's tough. That mentally. is a real challenge. Um, that is a huge challenge um, for you know the thousand mile racing. I call it the never ending day, right? Because we are constantly going, and you are constantly have to be your best performance for such a long period of time. It's, mm -hmm. it's very hard to manage your dog team and also yourself to make sure that you are 100% on point when you need to be, knowing when you can take a step back and relax your body, but your brain has to keep functioning. And so it's, it's the never ending day. You have to stay on your A game the entire way. And it's those collections of 30 second mistakes over the course of nine days that adds up to a two hour difference between first and second. And we're seeing the same thing here in the John Berger Sled Dog Marathon, where it's gonna be little seconds they picked up on the trail, you know, how they managed their team over these hills. Um, did they go let the team go fast enough down the hills, but not too fast? Were they helping the dogs up the hills? Those seconds add up to the minutes and hours we're going to see that separate these mushers coming into the next few checkpoints and then ultimately the finish line. Uh, one way to, to stay sharp for such a long time is to maintain, uh, as a human, a uh, uh, right uh, amount of drinks and food. Otherwise, if you don't eat and drink, you're going to be really tired. We have to be sharp for a long time as well, but the mushers, what happened? What, what, what kind of consequence can it have if you don't manage to stay focused and don't manage to stay concentrated on what you, what you should do? What can happen? 
Well, there, yeah. There's very much a snowball effect here, right? <laughs> you make one little mistake, you let that bother you, it leads to the next mistake because now you're focusing on what I did wrong yesterday. Yeah. So in some regards, you have to be very focused but have a short memory, right? <laughs> so whatever happened yesterday is done. It's behind me. I can't do anything about it. Focus on what we can affect, what we can improve. Um, and so, yeah, staying focused is absolutely crucial. Uh, staying focused on what's important is absolutely crucial. So it's easy to get wrapped up in, oh, where are the other mushers or what are the other people doing? That's not going to help me perform better. What's going to help me perform better is focusing on what does my dog team need right now. So that's, again, putting that, your limited energy where it needs to be is really important. As long as trying to keep a good uh, positive spirit. Yeah, <laughs> positive spirit. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, is it hard to do that as well when you have a lack of sleep? Because the guys, they don't sleep much. You know, Karan, when you <laughs> have a lack of sleep and you're getting more and more tired, I do, for some reason, get some strange uh, songs in my head. Songs I would never listen to. That just goes on repeating. So who's your favorite the artist oh, you're coming I, I to your head at that you, time? I don't <laughs> That'll be uh, really stupid songs going on repeat in my head when I get really tired. What, what, do you <laughs> have any songs? Like what happened to you when you get tired and you're kind of, you're kind of losing it? Um, I do. I, <laughs> many things happen. One, I'm trying to focus on what do I need to do to race? How do I create the best strategy for my dog team in the next miles in the trail? Um, a lot of these close races, it comes down to properly using 15 minutes of rest. Do I take it now? Do I take it later? Um, so I end up doing a lot of math and I find myself trying to do this, you know, very simple math in my head. And it, I keep going over and over and over. When and it you're takes on the sled. Me, yeah, it takes me two hours to figure out what should have taken me two minutes. Um, <laughs> just because you're sleep deprived. You're not functioning well. And then there are some hallucinations. Uh, I, then you, you can know. make some bad decisions as well, as well, no? Yeah, but that's why I do this for two hours on the trail, not in when I need to be taking care of the dogs in the checkpoint, right? Mm. So the things that like this I should be doing on the trail. Um, so that when I get to the checkpoint, I can be focused on what I need to do. I also plan what am I going to do when I reach the checkpoint? What needs to happen when I arrive yeah. so that when I get to the checkpoint, I'm not trying to think. I'm just moving. I've already done the thinking on the trail. This night, the mushers, they've been not been sleeping very much neither, I imagine. And um, they've been doing on the leg five. And Colin Valin, she's going to go take us through the leg number five. So have a look at what she's saying and about the challenges on the leg five. So heading out on the fifth leg of the race from Poplar Lake, we do a loop over to the west, and then we come back, and we have to go past the checkpoint where we have just rested, which is really tough for sled dogs. I'm picking up speed, my foot's off the drag pad a little bit, and I have a ski pole, and I'm pulling, and, and I'm pedaling like I'm on a scooter. Uh, the musher starts working and running up all the hills. We're stopping still every two hours to snack our dogs, and we're on our way to Devil's Track Lake, and it's always as windy as windy can be at that checkpoint, and it's cold, and we get the dogs all bedded down in their straw, we get them fed, and now it's time to really take a look at dogs. Who's doing well? Who's pulling? Who's eating? Is there any dogs that need a break, need more of a break? Um, when a dog is running, if they are having a little uh, wrist problem, their, their head will bob. Once again, the veterinarians are all over the dogs, whatever you need. Um, they'll check a dog out. They'll take care of the dogs. Um, but the key is get them fed and get them rested and get them in the straw because they, they know we're on the final push. I got all that. They are on the final push. We are on the final push, she says, uh, Colleen Valin. What is that? What does she mean by that? This is the uh, kind of closing in on the end of the race here. You know, they're within the 100 kilometer mark now. Um, you know, I guess leaving this checkpoint, they've got a little farther than that to go. But this is time to start focusing on actually getting to the finish line as quickly as possible, right? The first two thirds of this race, I think, is really about certainly the first third is about positioning your team, building the team, getting them into a good routine. The second third is a little bit about uh, moving up, getting into position. You don't have to be in front, but you do have to be within striking range. The final third is about closing the deal, getting to the finish line, um, 
if your goal is to win it, then you know, trying to get there first, um, or more realistically, as quick as your team is capable of. So this is the first time in the race that I would really start to look around, see where the competitors are, and see what I need to do. Is it realistic to catch up with that team, or should I be more concerned about staying ahead of the team behind me? Mm -hmm. And this this leg was just going in. It was going on this night, so it was night in the middle of the night, and, and we're going to have a look at a little bit of recap of uh, of the the fifth leg. If we can have some pictures, that would be great. So here we have they have them coming into the trail center yesterday. The four first coming in to that uh, trail center yeah, coming checkpoint into the trail yesterday. center. Um, this is where we started to get the teams kind of organized as they took a little more of their mandatory rest. Here we have Ryan Reddington pulling into the trail center checkpoint. He was actually second into the checkpoint, but had a commanding lead based on the amount of his mandatory rest that he had already taken. Um, nice looking dog team. Uh, to this point in the race, he's been consistently kind of the, the fastest team. I guess he hasn't posted the fastest time every single time, but he's been within a minute of the fastest time, or in fact, you know, much faster than everybody else. Nice um, Ryan seems to be in good spirits. I think he's pretty confident in his both his team and his position at this point in the race. See a lot of happy fans seeing that team coming in there. He's smiling, <laughs> waving to people. You know, it's good to see mushers that are chipper and aware. Um, but it's still daylight. It's much easier to be alert and aware when you have the sun out. Uh, mm -hmm. Once the sun goes down, it's maybe three in the morning. That's when that sleep deprivation is going to start kicking in. It's going to be a little harder to stay awake as a musher. Yeah. And this here, here's a, now the second one is coming in. Yeah, this was uh, Keith Eiley that came in. Um, operating from the same kennel as uh, Ryan Reddington. We can see the same you know, green booties and sled bag there. Um, had a nice run time over there as well. Uh, solid looking dog team. I think he's sustaining a little bit larger dog numbers as we go through the race here. Or, you know, more of the team is still in the team there. You know, he had had a little bit of issues he reported to us in the previous checkpoint with getting the dogs to rest next to another team that had some distractions to him there. Also, he's a little bit concerned about the number of lead dogs that he has in the team. And that can make a big difference in your ability to sustain a fast pace. Because what's really important about a lead dog later in the race is that you need somebody to go up there and set a fast pace. Mm. And that's easier to do if you can switch out that dog. Yeah. Give a dog a break and let somebody else go up there and set a fast pace. So, Again. So this is, we just remind that this is the pictures we had from the trail center checkpoint yesterday before they go out to the fifth leg. Yep. Um, coming into trail center, completing the fourth leg of the race there. Uh, next coming in there, we should have had, uh, I believe it was Ryan Anderson or Martin Massacott. I'm trying to see who we got here. Mas Masicott. That's Martin Massacott coming yeah. in, yep. Uh, so Martin had actually, he dropped down to a smaller team than some of the others early on, but he's actually been sustaining that team. And so I've always said this, you know, as long as they're the right dogs, it's not a big deal if you have a smaller team. Uh, this is a really solid looking gang coming in here now. Um, all, I mean, that's one of the nicer looking dog teams I've seen. And that could be just because they're traveling at the speed that that team should be going at. Um, I don't know if he's going to have the upper end speed to compete with these guys all the way to the end, but uh, this team is traveling comfortably at the speed that they're doing. That's really nice to see, and I think this is a very steady team that won't waver much to the end. But, Can you uh, say this early. is a really one of the better looking teams with an expert eye? How do you? What do you say when you say? What do you mean by saying that? <laughs> I think the expert here would reading the teams would be Dallas actually. But, uh, <laughs> Some would define a good-looking team just by the look of the, uh, the look of the dogs. I mean, the, the exterior the posture, of the dogs, the posture yeah. of the but, dogs. But a trained musher eye would look at the gait of the dogs, the the uh, the, the, the looks of the dog. Yes. You know, like, not the exterior looks, but I mean, no, more like the dog. How the dog <laughs> is uh, behaving in front of the sled, actually. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'm looking at. Um, Everybody's working in a similar gait. They all have tight tug lines. The dog looks comfortable. You know, their lines are tight and they're all firing on all cylinders, smiling. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm had, looking for the happy dogs. Yep, next, we have Ryan Anderson coming in here. He was the fourth, uh, kind of right now, he's the fourth in our pack, was in here in a little bit uh, different position. But another very nice dog team, sustaining a little bit slower speed um, than the guys ahead of him at the moment. I do think on one of the previous runs, the run directly before this one, he actually had the fastest run time, which could affect him on this run, slowing down just a little bit, coming on the heels of that other time. But, but another 
another solid looking dog team. All of them firing on all cylinders, tight lines. You know, they're, they're perky, they're aware. This is not a team that's depleted in any way. So we're looking really good in this team. Um, so coming in here again, they got their rest. There's quite a lot of variation in the amount of rest that mushers have taken to this point. But I think as we see them leave Trail Center, the checkpoint they're now pulling into, those resting times are really going to start to even out. And you're not going to see two hours difference in the amount of rest that mushers have taken. So, so I think by the time we leave here, we're going to have a much clearer view of who's actually in lead of this race. Um, and again, the, the differences we're going to see in the times are based on their traveling speeds, not the amount of rest that they've taken to this point. So that was Ryan Anderson coming in there. Uh, again, four really nice looking dog teams mm -hmm. coming in here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like those steady teams. My, my eye is drawn to those teams that uh, I see that they can do this for a thousand miles. And so I have to keep reminding myself that this is only a 300 mile race, which is still a long race, of course. But um, you know, the upper end speed can be beneficial in a race like this. But I still like looking at those teams that are at a steadier pace that can do it for days and days and days. And from Trail Center, they went out to the fifth leg. Yep. And we're going to have a look at the graphics and have a look at how it all turned out over the race uh, from that uh, fifth leg. So leaving out of Trail Center, we had Ryan Reddington out of there and lead. Um, he had stayed there about four hours. Eiley, Keith Eiley was right behind him and Martin Massacott and then Ryan Anderson. Um, all four of those top mushers uh, leaving Trail Center took very close to four hours of rest. Martin, I'm sorry, Ryan Anderson took 4.51. He had the longest rest. Keith Eiley at 3.56. Like I said, they're going to be making up any difference in uh, the total amount of rest that they've taken. So they come back by the same checkpoint there. We see mushers passing head on. Kind of a bit of a confusing mess there with yeah. GPS. Because going you see, like, they directions. actually go back up the trail and down again, the same direction. Yep. So it looks a bit confusing. But And now. So pulling into uh, Skyport there, um, we had the same four mushers that left the previous checkpoint in lead, still in lead. Uh, they In Skyport, those top four mushers took all, again, pretty close to four hours with the one outlier being Martin Massacott that took four hours and 50 minutes, which I think put him pretty well even with the rest of these guys. They should all have about, about 20 hours of rest accumulated now. Um, as we head to the, the final checkpoint here. But now you see, you, where we see them now, they're actually, it started out from this checkpoint and then they're on the leg six yep. actually. So they're so on their final leg here. Where we're closing up the live update now, where they are. Yep, so and as it stands right now, we have Ryan Reddington in lead, Keith Eiley in second, just a short distance behind him there. Um, I think there's only a few kilometers separating them, about four kilometers. Then there's a bit of a gap as we go back into third and fourth place with Ryan Anderson and Martin Massacott. And again, they're right close together. But there is a gap between our first two mushers, mm. then the second two mushers, and then there's a fairly good gap going back from there. So I'm pretty sure that uh, right now we have Reddington and Eiley out in front there, then that second group with Anderson and Massacott. Um, I would say 99% chance one of those four mushers is are going to be our winner. I think there's about a 70, let's call it an 85% chance that Eiley or Reddington are going to be one of the winners here. So they should be arriving in the next checkpoint fairly soon here. Mm -hmm. um, and at this checkpoint, it's a mandatory four-hour rest. So like I was saying, the resting is going to even out because they all have to stay for here uh, before they can continue onto the trail. And if they haven't taken, you know, they have to have a total of 24 hours and at least four here. Mm -hmm. So like um, Ryan Reddington has actually taken, I think, 20 hours and 15 minutes. So he's going to have more than his required amount of rest because he has to stay here four hours. On the fifth leg, there have been some action, though. There is... Yeah. Uh, yeah, John Fisher is having some problems, had some problems this night. Uh, should we have a look at uh, what what happened to him? If you have a look, if we we'll have the graphics have of of uh, graphics. John Fisher when he this on the fifth leg.
just a little bit, but there again, they have to use their full 24 hours of mandatory rest. So yeah, it is where they're gonna be more alert, more aware of where the other mushers are, though there's not a whole lot they can do about it. When it comes time to leave this checkpoint, there's one simple strategy, and that is get your team to the finish line over this next, I think we got about uh, 40 miles of trail, 64 kilometers, get over that trail as quickly as possible, right? So you're gonna see mushers, um, you know, I don't want to say being, they're just certainly not going to be reckless, but they're going to be, you know, taking their foot off the brake a little bit and covering this trail because when the dogs cross the finish line, it's over. They can sleep all night, right? There's no four-hour stop. There's no time rush after this. So, yeah, it, it is a very fun time in the race. You know, Karen, I think we should repeat that in this kind of race, in this uh, Bear Grease race, it's uh, legal for the handlers to help the teams on every checkpoint except uh, sawbill checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see people, uh, the handlers here, helping out uh, Ryan, Reddington, and uh, the checkpoint is also with the cars close by to the dog mm -hmm. teams, but the dogs are not allowed to sleep. In so the what you're saying that that's not normal? No, no, come on. No, in the editorial there are no handling uh, mm -hmm. whatsoever during the race. And what about the feminine race? In the feminine race, the handlers are allowed to help uh, the mushers with dry clothes and uh, food mm -hmm. uh, for the person, for the musher. Okay. The musher needs to do everything with the dogs himself or herself. So you, yeah. you can, they can be there to get, provide you with what yeah, you but need, but you allowed have to do the job. That's right. They're yeah. not allowed to, to get close to the dogs. They're not allowed to pet the dogs. They're not allowed to walk around the dogs. Mm -hmm. But they've got to be outside, call it like a fenced area. Yeah. yeah. So they can watch. <clears throat> yeah, in the in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series, we actually have a few different race structures yep. um, that allow different type of handler access and handler assistance. The Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon it allows the most handler assistance, like Nina was saying, where the dogs can help, yep. or you, the handlers can help take care of the dogs. Other races, the handlers can help take care of the musher, but not the dogs. Yet other races, like the Iditarod, there is no assistance. Mm -hmm. It is just the musher and the dogs. Nobody can help you. I wanted to take a look here with uh, Ryan Reddington. Um, he's got eight dogs into this checkpoint, I believe, yep. um, in his team. So that's plenty of dog power. I think we've heard you know, Bruce Lee in the field, Greg Heister in the field, and us here at the desk as well, talking about the different number of dogs. Okay, coming in here, Keith we have Keith Ailey. Ailey. Yeah. yeah, coming in. Now, he's got, I think, an 11-dog team coming in here. Um, Nice-looking gang. He was about two miles uh, uh, behind uh, Ryan. So that was 3.5 kilometers or a little bit more than two miles. Yeah. No, that's a nice looking dog team. Sorry, I was just focusing on dogs there for a second, trying to see what these guys look like. Nice looking dog team. Everybody's moving pretty smoothly. Um, and he's got a full 11 dog team, or a, a, I shouldn't say full. They started with 12 dogs, but an 11 dog team. That's pretty Reddington good. has an eight dog team. What I was noting from last year is Reddington came into the same checkpoint last year with nine dogs and left with six. Um, and then the, this next run proved to be very challenging. He had a run time of almost twice as long as some of his competitors. So while Ryan Reddington has a commanding lead, um, as last year is evidence of, everything can still change. So it's gonna be because really he was in lead at the same moment, at the same checkpoint last year. He had year. about a two-hour lead yeah. at this and point last year. And, yeah. and yeah. he ended up taking about four hours longer mm -hmm. on the next run. So it's easy to say, oh, we got us a winner and it's looking <laughs> clear. But no, everything no. can change. Um, I've had races that it has all changed in the last you know, 30 miles of the race, 40 miles of the race. Um, in fact, one of my Iditarod wins, I finished and I thought I was in third place because uh, when I had passed the other mushers, they were off the trail and it was a very bad storm. So and everything can change and the musher is not always aware of what's going on out there either. Mm -hmm. A little bit back to what we were talking about, the, the handlers out at the checkpoint and the difference between mm -hmm. the, the, the events in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. Um, the big race, uh, you can, you're allowed to use the handlers and they can help you out. Is it also um, a different level of mushers, uh, their, their performance level or their experience? Is it also adapted to the mushers to take place in these races? Like, like the more performance guys and those are experienced due to add a rod. Here there are mushers that are not that experienced, so you could, you could have more help? Or? I think you're going to see overlap in all of that. Uh, I know we got another team coming in here very soon, uh, oh. so I'm going to answer that question in a yeah. second. But this coming one in first. here, yeah. We got another nice looking team. This is Keith Eiley again. Um, 
coming into checkpoint. I'm seeing a lot of happy dogs, smiling faces, <laughs> and a not so happy looking musher. <laughs> <laughs> He's just from He's focused. Let's say that. He's yeah, focused yeah, here. Yeah. Um, you know, they're all looking good. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him leave at least one dog behind here. I'm right. seeing probably one, maybe more. But, but Dallas, do you remember the time difference between uh, Ryan Reddington and Keith Ailey? Because uh, Ryan's got to rest 15 minutes more, I suppose, because he, he needs four hours rest. They're all going to need to take four hours. I know, I know, but yep. he still has 15 minutes. Uh, he needs to take extra. If I'm No, I, I believe he's taken 15 minutes extra. Uh, we, we can take a look at that here yeah, in a second. Yeah, because but, they might um, get close. Yeah, no, it, it is going to be interesting to see how much time we have between these two mushers coming into this checkpoint. Now, it's, again, important to remember that these two mushers are actually running from the same kennel. Um, so I don't think that means there's any cooperation necessarily, but... Uh, from that kennel particularly, they're sitting in a pretty good position because even if Ryan were to have trouble, kind of like he did last year, and not be able to post another fast run time for this last leg, um, your second pick is Keith Ailey. So <laughs> I think it's kind of, uh, they've got, they're in a good position right now, a very nice looking dog team here. I like seeing perky dogs, wagon tails. You see the handlers are having to hold pretty hard here. The mushers got both feet on the brake. This is not a tired dog team. This is a team that's, that's ready to, you know, keep on trucking. Mm, they have and more under their belt. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The light, uh, nice looking gang there. Uh, Greg Heister told me last uh, night that uh, Ryan is probably racing the A team. So that will be uh, Kate Ailey and Ryan Reddington are racing uh, dogs from the same kennel. And uh, Ryan has probably the, the best team of those, the best dogs from that. I would, I That's would assume what, uh, Greg, so, yeah. Greg told me, actually, yeah. so that's what he believed. But as we know, that will be a mix of those two teams with Ryan going to the ID road. How, how different is, is there a huge difference? I mean, the way you, you train your dogs. There is some basics that everybody has to do, but do, do Reddington and Ailey do anything different from you guys, for example? Oh, I think uh, most all mushers train a little bit different. And that's something that I think most mushers keep a little bit close to their vest, right? Um, that's not something that I'm posting online. Oh, this is exactly what my team is training like right now. That's some of it is a bit trade secret. Um, there are There is information that I share very openly, particularly as it pertains to dog care and dog welfare, um, the different medicines we use, the, the supplementations that we use, the nutrition that we use, the sports medicine, like as far as massage and um, mm -hmm. therapy like that. We're very open about that because that benefits all the dogs. But when it comes to training, um, that's the part that I kind of, training and equipment, I'm a little bit more secretive on the research and development we do about that stuff. What about sports science? And dog mushing. I mean, in sports science and training, you know, you can use heart rate to 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 monitor how tired you are. Mm -hmm. Are you? Is this something you could do in dog mushing as well? Use like, <laughs> you know, really scientific there data is. to use to do your training. There is a lot of very scientific stuff you can do. Um, is it common to do it? Yes and no. And I just was talking about the stuff that we keep kind of close to our vest. <laughs> and, and I think this would fall into that category yeah. pretty squarely. So there are certainly things that I, I do when I'm developing my dogs, training my dogs, the research that we do that helps inform us as to what is the next best thing for them to do training. And that's really important. You know, knowing how to best develop these dogs, knowing when they're ready for a little bit more, knowing when you need to back off. Human athletes do that with heart rate monitors. Um, particularly when they're sleeping, their resting heart rate. Um, yes, there is a lot of that. Some mushers are more scientific than others. Um, and, you know, honestly, a lot of mushers that you would not say are very scientific are still very successful. So uh, the, the jury's still out on how effective it is. We do have people in Norway uh, working on that from the scientific point of view. And uh, I've actually been taking a course in these things just to learn a little bit more. Uh, you know, we have a lot of dogs and it's difficult to monitor all the dogs regularly when you have a full-time job on the, on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for sure, it shows that dogs with lower heart rate, low 
over. Call my dogs at the starting line. That's a that's a good thing on the contrary to those very hectic dogs when it comes. That's what science really shows. It's, uh, it's also because it, and um, um, you know an eye and an experience an empiric uh, mm -hmm. knowledge. It's obviously very important, but also at some point maybe. Not because you've been doing like this for the last 20 years or 30 years. Maybe there is some science to, you know, really to... There is. And, uh, and you know, there's other tests, um, you know, more related to the blood test. And with the Iditarod, we actually, it's mandated before you start the race, all the dogs will go through a blood test to confirm that they are healthy, not just to the, the naked eye, but on the inside, right? Exactly. Um, so we've done those same blood tests the, after the race measure the, to yeah. measure their recovery times, the how much time do they need so to on. bounce back. Yes, there's numerous things, everything from you know, lactate to hematocrit, um, white blood counts, if those are elevated, right? There could be indicative of an infection of some sort. So it's, it's done for a health reason to safety reason as with our ECGs or EKGs which is just making sure that there's no irregularity with the dog's heart right so the dogs go through all these tests as well as numerous physical exams before they're allowed to set foot on the Iditarod trail and each race has a different kind of collection of pre-race health checks that the dog must go through mm. and then I've replicated n many of those health checks after the race um, immediately after the finish six hours after the finish 12 hours after the finish 24 hours after the finish to kind of track how that dog's recovery time looks like. So we look at the screen here. Um, one other thing I want to point out is we see a lot of dogs eating. <laughs> and that's a good sign. This is a sign of a team that's not too tired, right? If they just had a really hard run, if the run was hard for them, they would um, want to curl up and take a little nap first. When you see dogs still eating like this as soon as they get into the checkpoint, that means that yeah, they're ready for a nap, but their battery's at 60%, and they're going to rest back up to 90% in the next four hours, and then they're going to take off again. Um, we, what we don't want to see is a dog team that their battery's down to that 40 30%. That's where you're going to see them curl up and take a nap and need to sleep an hour before they're ready to eat their meal. Do you, need, do you give them any different food when at, the, at the end of the race than you did at the beginning? Do you mm. give them more fat? Ca what kind of calories do you give them here? Well, this at is this where... Stage. Yeah, for, for me personally, this is where speed becomes a factor. Um, and the number one question is, what does this team need? And so when I pull into a checkpoint, maybe I've had a team that's been eating everything in sight. They've been snacking great on the trail. But you know what? They're getting a little bit tired. I want to focus on sleep. I may actually just give them a quick snack, make sure they have enough calories, and then just let them sleep. Other teams, maybe they're well rested, but they're starting to get a little thin. Their body score is not great. I might keep them awake longer during that resting time to get more food in them. I would say one thing that's important um, on maybe not so much here because they're not going to be feeding again before they leave the checkpoint, but not overfeeding your dog before the last run. I've seen mushers make that mistake mm. where their dogs are really eating well after like a mandatory eight hour stop at the last checkpoint in the Iditarod. So they feed a really big meal and then the dogs are rather sluggish on that last run. So there is a right amount of food. Um, it's not you know, you don't want them looking like uh, little manatees here with big, <laughs> big bellies on them and, uh, you know, not ready to go run. So the right amount of food, but as far as what that food is, um, I wouldn't adjust that based on where they are in the race as much as what the dog needs, right? Does and what it, need likes, and what it likes. And what it likes. Yeah. When you talk about amount, how much does, does each dog get to eat right now? Is it, like, are you talking kilos or are we talking grams or? Uh, yeah. What's the amount each dog eats? It's really. I, I would I say, it's, uh, uh, well, yeah. talking in the metric system or in the uh, European system, I would say we are. Uh, each snack given on trail or at checkpoints will be between 150 grams and 200 grams. That's mm -hmm. a snack, That's snack, right? Yeah. So that'll be beef, chicken, salmon, or some kind of special made sausages or for dogs. Or uh, that will be, for example, as I told you yesterday, I would use horse or uh, beaver as well, if I can get a hold of that. And each snack will be, depending a little bit how, mu how much calories it is, mm -hmm. that kind of meat. Mm -hmm. but Basically, 150 to 200 grams, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a snack. And a meal like this, in a big meal? Uh, they're having a real meal now. Yeah, I'm going to say they're going to eat probably at least, and, and what, the reason I was hesitating before is a lot of the food we feed has a very high moisture content. Like when you see these pieces of frozen beef that they're handing, and it, I like having them sliced. First of all, the beef comes in a tube that looks like a loaf of bread. I then slice it like a loaf of bread, about the same thickness, and then I cut it once lengthwise. So each snack is half 
of a piece of bread, essentially. Mm. Um, so it's easy for the dogs to chew, especially if it's cold out. You don't want a, a you know softball-sized chunk of meat that the dog's having to gnaw on and work at. It needs to be very easy for it to snap apart when they chew on it. Um, but that's mostly moisture. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about food, the, both the volume and the weight is skewed by the amount of moisture in that food, especially when we then make up a soup to try to get moisture into the dog. So as far as the actual weight of the food, I think it's possible that the dogs could eat up to a kilo of food in a checkpoint like this very easily, not counting the additional weight of the water that yeah. we have going in there. But on, on a cold race, which this race has not been thus far, I believe last year was much colder out there, you can see dogs easily burn 10,000 calories a day. And just to put that into you know, human terms that we can comprehend, that's nearly 40 Big Macs every <laughs> single day. So when we think about the volume of food, you know, they're breaking that into maybe three feedings plus a number of snacks over the course of the day, but you still got to put 40 Big Macs into a 55 pound dog every 24 hours. I get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of food. <laughs> look at, we, look, we can see on the screen now, okay, ladies Greg, Greg Bruce and Bruce are getting ready. Maybe we can have some chat with them soon. That'll be nice. Yeah. And behind them, you see the kind of, in Norway, they'd call it the camping car. In the U.S., we'd call it an RV or a, a camper truck. Um, that's going to be pretty common here that mushers have a place to go inside. Yeah, yeah. looks like they're getting lined we, up with Ryan Reddington, which hopefully and, can... Uh, any of the numbers here. Have you uh, taken care of all of your chosen rest at this point in time? You just have your mandatory four-hour here, or do you have to add I, on? I think I got like four hours and 12 minutes or 15 minutes, Some a little bit of change on there. Okay. But, yep. So you got eight? Eight dogs left. Will you leave here with eight? Um, I think so. We'll see. Um, yeah, I'll give them the rest here and see how they look when we wake up to get ready. Yeah. Are you happy with their performance into here? Yeah, this, there's only one dog in that team that ran Bear Grease um, last year. So it's a new team, so I'm just checking them out for what what ones for I did run. Yeah. And so you saw Mr. Eiley come in here shortly after you. You must yeah. be uh, yeah. glowing with pride right now. Yeah, yeah, um, very much so. Reddington dogs are are making me proud. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and his they, team and and uh, Keith's team, I'd say, man, they look really smooth, really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, um, it's gonna be a nice team when it, for I did ride when I put together the two teams, the best of the two teams, and um, there's one my main leaders at home so um so it'd be nice to have him in there too your main leaders at home why is that i i just wanted to give him the, the rest here and um he'll be in for the up 200 and everything yeah. okay his name's archer and so that is the plan to take the best out of your team the best out of keith's team and then take them north yep yeah, yeah. Well, you put two teams in the UP 200 as well? Yep, two teams in the UP 200. Okay, Ryan, so you, you got in here in the lead last year with a two-hour lead, yep. and you didn't win, yep. right? And I know it's probably one of the more frustrating runs of your entire life. And so uh, take us back there last year. What happened, and, and how do you ensure that it doesn't happen again this year? And is it in your mind at all? Well, not really on my mind too much because um, uh, – there's only one dog in the team from last year and um so but yeah i had a couple dogs that were um that wanted some more rest so we gave them more rest out on the trail and and um but i don't look for that this year to happen yeah yeah so on this next run if keith is able to close the gap <laughs> <laughs> how does this happen going to the finish line well, I, I told him from the beginning when I first called him in the fall that he can run his own race, and I'm not telling him one. Um, if he beats me, so be it, but he's got a really good dog team, and that I'd be honored for him to, to mush him in the race. And so, yeah, um, I, I've been saying it all year to my handlers and my family that um, – I'm worried about that team. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, he's been running his own race, um, so that's really nice as well as to not have that stress and have such a good dog musher as he is to take care of him. And, man, he's looking like he's doing a really good job with him, and I, I'm very proud of him. And who will be in the lead out of here? Out of um, Art, I mean, uh, Ghost and Ghost and Henry will be in lead out of here. Ghost and Henry. That yep. ghost seems really tuned into you. I noticed at the oh, other yeah. checkpoint, he stands there and looks back at you for like when you're going to pull the hook. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, and uh, um, Henry, he's um, finished the last two I did rods with Anna Barrington, and uh, I um, borrowed him from my dad and the, for the Kobuk 440, and then this fall we were able to buy him, and good addition to the kennel. Yeah. yeah. He's the brown lead dog. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so how will you spend the next four hours? I'm going to get a little bit of sleep and, and um, eat a little bit and and um, and relax and, and um, wake up here and and tell the dogs that we got one more run and, and love on them and and uh, and hopefully have a good run to the finish. We wish you luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, All right. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Ryan Reddington. He's in first place right now, but you did hear from him. He's got 12 or 14 minutes or so of added rest that he needs to put on his team before he can leave. So he'll be here for those four hours and, and some minutes. And we'll have to check with Keith, too, to see if he's got any uh, time to, that he has to kill. But this could be a really, like, if Keith has taken care of all of his rest, they could be leaving here almost side by side. Yeah, it's not. A, well, even if they don't, with that little time between them, going 40 miles it's going to be right down to the finish you're not really going to know who's going to win this thing to yeah. right at the end and i just saw that uh, before ryan came over and talked to us he went around and checked on which dogs had eaten and then he pulled out these big chunks of of chicken and uh, man those i know what those dogs like the best they <laughs> hammered that chicken and the chicken skins yeah. that have a lot of fat so uh they're gonna be tanked up and uh i'll check back with keith's team a little bit and see how they eat they were all drinking plain water of course they're all the reddington dogs so they've yeah. all been there there won't be any differences in how you know the feeding protocols and all because they're all from the same kennel I tell you, if I had my second team behind me that looked like Keese, I'd be running up every one of these hills because <laughs> that team looks like they can catch him yeah. to me. But that's the fun of this. Yeah, it's and all speculation. There's a little town in Alaska called Kinnick, Alaska, and right now uh, the the Reddington clan is swelling with pride with all these Reddington dogs up here in, in the front of the Bear Grease. I'm sure it's crazy for them back there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's got to be be a great feeling to have that both first and second place yeah. Yeah. yeah so ladies and gentlemen let's send it back to the studio in oslo right now we've got a gentleman walking up on us that we're going to come back here shortly with an interview and we'll tell you who he is when he comes when we come back let's go back to the studio thank you greg and bruce for that update um ryan reddick and how did he look <laughs> he looks like uh, he's got one more run to go. <laughs> it looks like he's made it about 200 <clears throat> miles into a race, so um, understandably a little bit tired and probably a little bit wind burned from being out there and just not getting a lot of sleep. But obviously he's excited about not just his team, but the team that's behind him also are his dogs. And like he was saying, he's going to be combining those dogs for the Iditarod later here um, as part of the, Arctic World, the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. And um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. That's a great position to be in, to have your you know, one and two in this race at this point still can change, but at this point, one and two and being thinking that I can choose from these dogs to pull together my best 14 dog team. He's actually been testing 24 dogs for, for the Adada Rod. That it's an important test for him. Yeah, they need 14 to start the Adida Rod, so he's got 10 dogs, uh, which doesn't, doesn't have to make the team. Yeah. Yep. So that's what we would call a lot of depth in a kennel, mm. right? Where you have choices. Mm. And so on a team like that, that's where it does get harder to pick who's going to be dog number 13 and 14. A lot of times you see that there's a core group of 10 or 12 that, you know, when you go down your list, who's definitely going to be on my team? Check, 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 check. You tallied up. Yep, mm. sure enough, there's 10 or 11 of them. It seems like that's always what it is. And then you sort through all the rest of them to try to fit who's going to be the best one in this in this team. You know, you might say that, through all the training, dog A has been really consistent, but dog B, who's a little bit younger, man, he really shone on the, the bear grease, so that's going to be a tough call for them. It seems like we might be seeing Greg, and uh, they, they're, they're walking around trying to... No, we'll let a little bit, wait a little bit. Um, I was thinking of the lead dogs. Yeah, for, yeah, for the selection, like you, choosing the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 dog. What makes a difference of making the team or not making the team? It can be something very, very small. Um, one classic place that you get up against, um, this, every musher has been in this situation where you're trying to pick that 
in the Iditarod, it's a 14 dog race now, trying to pick the 14th dog. Maybe you have a, a three year old dog that's a young up and comer and not yet proven, mm. but shows all the signs of being great. And an older dog that was great, but maybe on the other end. So it's always that decision. Do I take the proven one that might be older or the younger one that might be the next superstar? And we are supposed to have some contact with Greg and Bruce in at the Mineral Center. Do we can break Greg, can you hear me? No, you can't hear me. But it will be uh, we will soon we will hear from Greg and Bruce, so over to you guys. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Mineral Center. Greg Heister, Bruce Lee, and we are joined now by Mr. Mike Keyport. I got that right, right? You did get that yeah. right, yep. And this is the great grandson of the legendary John Bear Grease. Right on, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's phenomenal. And so I don't I'm not even sure where to begin with this, but let's talk about uh, like family legend. Who, who was John? What was he like? And and what what do you know about him? You know, there's many, there's been books written and there's uh, so many stories about John Bear Grease, it's incredible, but I, I consider him to be a part of the history of the North Shore on Lake Superior here. He was quite the, quite the guy. He, uh, he's been, he was been called the jack of all trades because he was not only a musher and if you can, as you drove up the highway today, if you can picture that highway not being there and John Bear Grease just on a very narrow trail, not nothing fancy like we got now, yeah. you know, with old mutts. They weren't Alaskan Huskies. These were just good old dogs that he trained. And and uh, I guess one of the most unique things is he trained them in Ojibwe. Okay, the language. So, the language. Yeah. So when he'd give the dog command, it would be in his native tongue. Oh, it wouldn't be in English. Cool. So yeah. that that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, was he, a, oh, we got a truck pulling right in front of our camera here. We'll continue to talk, but uh, was he a big man? Was he a physical man? Like, what, he, what was he He like? was a, he's about our size guy. He yeah. was 6'3". Yeah, let's just move over this way, Mike, a little bit. We'll get out of the way of the truck. And we're letting the camera guy know we're walking. If you pan right, you'll see us. Pan right a little bit. All right, tell your camera to pan to his right. Okay, Mike. Um, so, yeah, tell us about him. Yeah, yeah, he was a good-sized guy, and uh, and they, he, he actually had had brothers that would run the mail route with him, and they they went from uh, they started and he lived in Beaver Bay, if you can picture that on your way up. So he had actually backtracked to two harbors, which is about 25 miles, get the mail, load it on a sled, sometimes up to 600 pounds, we're wow. told. And this was a toboggan-type sled, not the sleds we see out here today. And then he would head up the shore and stop at the towns along the way and, and end up in Grand Marais. Yeah. And then uh, pick up the mail and, and make the return trip, and he'd do that about once a week. Yeah. And uh, he, not only, he not only brought the mail, but if you can picture back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, he not only brought... Uh, the mail, but he brought news. You know, people didn't know oh, if uh, if sure. Aunt, Aunt Betsy died down in Duluth yeah. or something, and he'd he'd have yeah. that information. He he had uh, bells he would put on his dogs, like okay. Christmas bell, jingle bells. Yeah. And people would hear him coming in the small communities, and they'd all gather around to see what he had to say. Yeah. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And we're talking with Mike Keyport. He is the uh, great grandson of of the legendary John Bear Grease. Your family must swell in pride. Uh, every January when this race comes around. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, I give the uh, board of directors a lot of credit for, for keeping that part of culture in this race. I'd be disappointed if they didn't. Yeah. Well, we Bruce and I uh, were affiliated with the Iditarod. This is our first time to this race, and it's been uh, a glorious four or five days for us. We've learned a lot. We've seen a lot. And... Uh, we get to meet. There's so many great people. There is. Like there really this, is in this race. There, there really is, and people people will tell you that there's different parts of the world that's God's country, but you're you're standing in it right now. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what do you do the rest of the, the year? Or what do you do for a living? I I actually, I'm the emergency management director for the for Cook County here. Okay. The, I I worked for the tribe for a number yeah. of years, and I just recently I uh, went to work for the county. So. Yeah. Well, Mr. So, Keyport, we appreciate your time. 
Yeah, thank you guys yeah. for uh, being out here with yeah. us. This is pretty exciting for our race. Yeah, and it's great to meet everybody that's been associated, the number of volunteers, and, yes. and Bruce and I have been talking about it, you know, so often in these mushing events, uh, there are people that are so committed, so passionate about something, and, and they don't even have dogs, right. but yet they put right. so many men and women hours into an event like this to put it on. They really do. It, it's, it, it, never, it never ceases to me, amaze me how, how many people it draws, and, and the people, like you say, they take vacation to come yeah. up here and stand out in the cold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Keyport, let's send it back to the studio in Oslo. We're efforting an interview right now with, with Keith Eiley. We hope to have that for you momentarily. So for now, let's go back to you. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you to my keyboard. Look at this. It's the grand grandson of John Birgris who delivered the mail, and the, here is a, it's a bag of, of the of where he put his mail, and he, tra yep. he traveled down the trails. It's an historic um, aspect of this, this race. Right, it's cool they had the grandson there. Yeah. Yep. No, and, and again, you know, it's just fun to see that it wasn't that long ago that sled dogs were the ones that were hauling the freight, hauling the mail, keeping communities in touch. Um, in the interior of Alaska, literally, there are parts of the state that were cut off from the rest of the world for months out of the year, except for dog teams. That's where the only food, means the of supplies, transportation. Yeah. You know, these mining towns that we had up here, and that's the history of the Iditarod. Of course, the history with the John Bear Grease mm -hmm. is the mail routes. Um, and that's something where we had sled dogs, dog teams that had the government contracts to deliver the mail. And, you know, later, and, you know, roads get developed, telegraph lines get put in, airplanes advance to where they can now fly in 40 below, and the dog teams start going extinct because there's not the need. And that's where sled dog race came about was to keep this culture and history alive and we see it alive and well in Duluth Minnesota now with the you know kind of celebration of the history of sled dogs and how you know humans and dogs have worked together to be able to inhabit these remote and arctic well, places. I also remember the race for the south pole we then we just used uh, sled dogs to race for the south pole and Scott while, the dogs. Uh, yeah and he, wh he was why? with the uh, ponies yeah, Robert Scott was mm -hmm. the, from England who was using uh, horses. Mm -hmm. That was not a success. But, so you know, at the time when they were delivering these mail, the mail, they didn't have the mem sleds as you guys do have, neither, huh? A little bit different dog sleds that they were using, <laughs> right? It was uh, more of a basket sled. I, interestingly, my, my, my grandpa is a big history buff and obviously a longtime musher. You know, years before there was an Iditarod, he was mushing in good friends with Ryan Reddington's grandfather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's where we kind of, you know, got involved and certainly uh, Joe Reddington Sr., Ryan Reddington, who's leading the race right now, his grandfather, um, was definitely you know, friends with my grandpa and kind of encouraged him to run the first Iditarod and all. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of kind of connectivity and <laughs> history in that. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's just, a, it's just neat. I love sled dogs and the history that goes behind it. But the sleds that I grew up mushing were much like that. They had steel banded runners at my grandpa's house. He had the old sleds, right? The brakes were entirely different. And it was an old basket sled. So I'm five and six years old, mushing a very similar sled, maybe a little bit smaller than what John Bear Grease <laughs> used out there. But otherwise, um, you know, hundreds of years or hundred years in between, and it's the same sled. It was still lashed with the rawhide bindings, right? So it's, I, I love that historical aspect. Someday when I run my last Iditarod, I'll have to do it with, uh, with the sleds they use in the first races. Let's go a little bit back to update to what's happening right now because Greg is having an interview with Keith Ailey. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Mineral Center here in the north woods of Minnesota on the Bear Crease uh, Trail. We're joined by Keith Ailey. We have not had you on live yet. We apologize for taking so long for us to get you over here. But, man, you're in position to win a dog race. Yeah, yeah, I could if I really tried, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a little bit too much distance maybe, but I'll still be trying. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. you're not that far behind, right? Yeah, but still, it's only like a 40-mile run, so. Yeah, you've got 11 dogs still in the team. Yeah. You've yeah. done a great job keeping them together. Yeah, yeah, it's been worked out good. But you gotta, in this race, I've run this race so many times in the last 30 years. If you don't know how to control the speed on these hills, you'll, you'll injure dogs. So it's a really balancing act of how fast you can go and when you can go fast. Yeah. So you've got a lot of experience in this next 40 mile run to the finish line. What's it like? Hilly. It is. Yeah. Is it hillier than what you've already seen on other runs, or similar? No, it's a bit similar, but it's still enough hills to make it work at the end. Yeah. 
And so Bruce has been talking about your lead dog, the little white one. Uh, tell us about it. Oh, that big white one. It's a big, big, big one. one. It's a big white one. Yeah, that's an unusual dog. And it's not only too big, it's ugly, too, on top of it. So <laughs> it's one of those dogs you wish wouldn't be a leader, but it's one heck of a leader. Yeah. yeah. And name and age? His name is Splint. I bred that dog, but uh, actually, I, <clears throat> he bought that dog for me, but it should be running. I did a ride with him this year. Okay. It's a good leader. Yeah. And that's the main one that you've been depending yeah, on Yeah, for that team, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how are your dogs eating and drinking? Good. Good. They're, <clears throat> sorry. They're holding weight compared to a lot of teams a lot better. They're eating good. Yeah, they look yeah. really sharp really and really smooth coming in. I know we're just seeing 100 yeah. yards here, but yeah. still, when you've seen a lot of them, they look yeah. really nice. They're out there like that, too. There, It's a really, really steady team. Maybe lacking a little bit on the top end because not not having another key leader with more speed, but still, it's a nice, powerful, steady team. Do you have more time, uh, rest time to take care of other than the mandatory four hours, or are you yeah. all set? Yeah, there's a little more, yeah. Yeah, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I don't know. You don't sure. know exactly what they'll tell you when they, yeah. they'll give you your out time, and right. then you'll know when you got to go. And so if it comes down to a, a foot race between you and Ryan, are you w willing to get off the sled and run to Grand Portage? Oh, yeah, he knows that, too. <laughs> we've, we've raced quite a few times together, and we're pretty equal on who's won and who's lost when we raced each other. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he knows if I'm close, we'll be racing. <laughs> well, we're, we're really hoping for some, some tremendous television yeah. there in Grand Portage, so try to, try to work that out for us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. Keith Eiley, ladies and gentlemen, currently in second place here at the Bear Grease. Let's go back to the studio in Oslo. Yeah, the Reddington Kennel, one and two. What do you think about what we heard just Keith Ailey talking about? Well, the first thing that stood out to me that he was talking about is lacking a little bit um, on the top end. What he means there is that he doesn't have that sixth gear maybe and and he directly related it to having only the one lead dog and this is what we talked about a little bit earlier in the program that having multiple lead dogs to kind of swap out gives your key leaders a break and even if they're just a little bit farther back in the team two or three positions back they can mentally zone out just kind of tuck in behind the dog in front of them and just move their legs and let their brain sleep um and that's that's very valuable, having the depth in leaders. And this is something you see that's a problem when you have two teams running out of the same kennel is, you know, I'm assuming Ryan wants to run his key group of dogs that he's going to be racing in the Iditarod. So it's hard to part with a really good leader in there. What you say you need, what kind of a leader dog does he need now for the last leg? What, what, what kind of a characteristic? Yeah, he needs the, it sounds like he has the leader he needs. The problem is that leader's had to do all the leading to this point, exactly. right? Exactly. You need a relief pitcher. Yeah. And that relief pitcher needed to be used in the last couple runs, even for portions of those runs, to give that lead dog a break. But it sounds like he's got a great leader. If he were to catch up with Ryan Reddington, he'd need a dog that's ready to set down a really fast pace. Not just make it down the trail, but attack that trail. And that takes a well-rested dog, an abnormally well-rested dog. So what we generally see for our key leaders is that that not only are they the dogs that we can communicate with well and have all these other attributes, but they're generally our best athletes because it is a more athletic position. So when I'm looking at which lead dogs am I going to, or which dogs am I going to invest a lot of time into to help make them become great leaders, I start with who's the great athletes because it is a tougher position and they've got to be there at the end of the race. That's where you really need them. He was talking about this dog is ugly. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What did he mean by that? There's a certain <laughs> level. I, I understand this conversation perfectly. There's a, there's a level of um, kind of, I don't know, fun relationship with your dogs. And uh, it's a jovial thing where, yeah, he's ugly as sin, but he's an awesome lead dog. And it's a rough and tumble type of thing. And I don't doubt that there's any less love between him and the dog just because well, the dog's a bit ugly. You to remember the main thing for the Alaska Huskies when you're a professional musher or a musher, the main thing is how does the dog work? How does it function in a team? Yeah, because me, the Alaskan... Alaska I mean, it doesn't really... Yeah, because he's not a pure breed, right? So if, to me, it doesn't really matter what color of eyes or air, uh, the, the way the, 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 uh, the fur, that's not the, it's how the dog works, that's the most important thing. Yeah, the Alaskan breeds, you can have song with long hair, shorter ears, well, like you be very different yeah. uh, physics from mm. these dogs. Yeah, and the color of the eye, yeah. just... It's hard. And there's not a perfect look or build for a lead dog. Um, you know, when I 
um, numerous times on my on the Iditarod, one of our winning races, I had my two lead dogs, who was literally the biggest dog in the team at about 74 pounds, a dog named Hero, and the smallest dog in the team, a dog named Reef, that weighed in at about 52 pounds. So it was complete polar opposites, and when running side by side, one was this tall and one was this tall, and they looked ridiculous together, but they had the right drive, the right mentality, they were both great for their own reasons. Um, so I don't care what the lead dog looks like, as long as they can get the job done. That's the most important thing. <laughs> and clearly, Keith Eiley's dog is getting the job done. <laughs> he seems to be happy about that. And uh, what you say, they, these guys will be racing now. Yep. Towards the end. I think they're going to be racing all the way to the end. They're, I mean, they're ve not, not very, they're quite defensive about what their, their plans are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're defensive about what they're going to say their plans are. And I shouldn't, defensive might not be the right word. They're reserved. They're not just saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go catch Ryan. I, I definitely got it. They're reserved. They don't want to, you know, say too much. But there's only one strategy from here, and that is get to the finish line as quickly as possible. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter it's what easy. they say. We all know what they've got to do. <laughs> <laughs> what is interesting right here is that the trail to the finish line, uh, I believe it's about 60 kilometers or 42 miles, I believe. Uh, it goes in loops, which means it's not like a straight line from A to B to the finish line now. The dog teams or the material will go in different loops coming back to mineral centers. You will probably will see them underneath on the, on the way to the finish line mm -hmm. because uh, they'll be closer to the, like Greg and, and Bruce and the camera team. Uh, you know, while we're sitting here and waiting for the next interview to come from, from, the, from the checkpoint, we have some sh questions from the social media. And uh, so you guys can send us, send us questions and we can answer some of them here at the studio. <coughs> so the first one is now, how long does the last musher have to finish the race after the first musher completes the race? Yeah, so according to the race rules, the, the last musher has to... Well, to stay, there's a cutoff time. And the mushers have to leave Mineral City, the checkpoint we just saw Ryan and Keith Eiley arrive in. They have to leave that checkpoint within 12 hours of the first musher. Now, this is a little bit flexible. There is the caveats and the rules that, you know, they're um, barring extenuating circumstances, right? So it gives the race judges the ability to be fair. Perhaps if the front mushers get out there and a big storm comes in and it stops the whole second half of the race, you don't want to have them all you know, not be able to complete it. Now, another rule in this race is about remaining, um, staying competitive with the rest of the field. So as long as there's a group of mushers competing with each other, even if they're hours behind the leaders because they were separated by bad weather or other extenuating circumstances, they're going to let them keep racing. We want to see the mushers reach the finish line. We know what these mushers and their teams of humans and particularly their teams of dogs have been through to be able to compete in the race. Everybody wants to see the team finish the race. So they're going to help accomplish that. But if they are more than 12 hours behind the first musher leaving Mineral City um, and they're not trying to be competitive, they could be removed from the race. I think that's unlikely that we're going to see that here. Well, but some, uh, most races do have like a certain maximum time. You have to cross the finish line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't have the volunteers out there that have been taking yeah. their weekends. No, they've yeah, got to get back to work. So it's hard to, to keep the road yeah. crossing yeah. safe if they're not there. Yeah. And talking about volunteers, there's a volunteer sending us a question. I volunteer at cr road crossings. Talk about one thing the mushers expect from a volunteer at the road crossing and one thing the volunteers should not do. Well, <laughs> as a musher, what I expect at a road crossing done by a volunteer is definitely one very, very important thing. And that's to make sure that uh, traffic is being s stopped. If there is like a more uh, pub, uh, a very well used road, it has to be marked clearly for the party uh, for the car, uh, the traffic, and to stop every car while you're crossing the road. Mm -hmm. That's the only one important thing. I mean, I don't expect anything else at all. I just expect them to make sure to do their my job. dog team is not hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> and what should, what, they should, what should they not do? Um, to me, personally, I want them, I don't want them to, to take the lead dogs and lead them over. I want my lead dogs to get moving across the road themselves. Okay. Yep. But of course, if the, my lead dogs decides to turn right or left, of course, they got to run after and help me over. But normally, I like to pass the road myself. Yeah, and I guess one other thing I'd add to that is I expect uh, them to smile. 
have yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy yourselves out here. I'm going to smile. Wait, how's it going? You know? Hey, there. Um, and then one uh, other yeah. thing that's fun is if they can say, hey, the last team went by here 10 minutes ago. You know, that's always kind of fun. It's not necessary, but it's kind of fun <laughs> as a musher to, to get that little bit of an update. Maybe you left 15 minutes behind and they say, hey, it was 10 minutes. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm catching up with them. <laughs> you did know Dallas. I always ask the volunteer, I forgot to say that, but I always ask the volunteer at the, uh, road crossing, how far is the, another team in front of me? And they answer, and I keep telling them, don't tell the next team where I am. I don't want them to know that, right? <laughs> they can't play favorites. That's one thing they shouldn't do. I really appreciate the work they do at the World Crossing. Yeah. Okay, we continue with some questions. You keep on asking us questions. We'll try to take it as long as it comes in. So here's a question. Is it rare for the leader at the last checkpoint to be running eight dogs? It seems like the more dogs, the more power, the more consistency. That's a good question. Very good question. Um, you know, I usually leave the last checkpoint on the Iditarod with eight dogs. And that is about, uh, I mean, it's nearly a 70-mile run to the finish versus this race with only a 40-mile run to the finish. What I'm looking at at this point in the race is who's my, which which of these dogs on my team are ready for a fast run to the finish line. So more dogs does not necessarily mean more power, and it certainly doesn't necessarily mean more speed, because if I want my team to go 10 miles an hour to the finish, I've got to take an honest look and say, these eight can do that and have fun doing that. These other two or three, maybe they could do it at nine and a half miles an hour, but if I want to go 10, they're not going to be having fun on this run, so I need to leave them behind. Eight is not too few. Um, six is getting to be pretty slim, but um, I've finished plenty of races with six dogs as long as as long as they are the right six. Again, what I'm looking at is not how many dogs, it's the health of those dogs. How well are they rested? How much body fat? How's their hydration? That's the important factors more than the total number of dogs. I would also uh, f uh, take away more uh, extra weight on the sled, which is not mandatory gear. If I have less dogs at the last leg, I would make sure the sled is as light as possible. And I will say that if you're gonna have an eight dog team versus maybe an 11 dog team on this run, the musher better be ready to run <laughs> because that's where it's going to make a difference is going up those hills. So when I say that, I'm thinking, okay, that's my experience, but I'm also planning to run up every single hill, be using that ski pole. I'm going to have to be a physical musher with a small dog team. But we do see heavy uh, mushers uh, s still winning. So. But you're never as fast as the slowest dog, is it? Yeah, you're, you're only as fast as your slowest mm -hmm. dog. And that's, I guess, the analogy I was talking about is if, if you have a few dogs that are only comfortable going in nine and a half miles an hour, and you have the rest of your team that's capable of going 10 miles an hour comfortably, you're better off leaving those bottom dogs behind. And again, they're not bottom dogs. They're just dogs that don't, aren't prepared to go that speed. So again, realistic expectations for each dog. Know your team. Know what they're going to do and set them up to succeed. You always set your team up for success. So if that means leaving with six or seven dogs that are ready to do this run fast, that's the right move. And here comes the million dollar question. Dallas and Nina, what do you enjoy most most with the sport? Well, it's a pretty yeah. It's a wide question. That's a great question, yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, but obviously I love dogs. Obviously obviously I have a passion for dogs, right? So um the, the idea of traveling and cooperating with my dogs uh, during a race, or actually for me, it doesn't really have to be a race. It could be a, just a long, nice, nice training run. Being together with my dogs, managing and uh, mastering my own dog team from point A to point B, the whole process of that, as well as... Uh, having my own puppies, bringing them up to be really good or nice dogs, uh, behaving uh, nicely, liking to be around me, the whole process of that. And then as well, my experiences in the landscape, in the nature, that's very, very important for me to, to uh, feel that romantic thing about it, you know, traveling in the nature. Yeah, as well as one more thing I'd like to say, I really, really enjoy the friendship with my fellow mushers, especially mm -hmm. during competitions. I think that we say in Norwegian that you have such some kind of dry humor, humor. when the humor is, I don't know whether it's going to be translated, when the humor is really interesting after many days without sleep <laughs> and that the friendship you have, that laughter you have, and then everybody just meet for the banquet and you have a great party and the whole social thing. That's yeah. something I really miss during the summer. To, I mean, I could talk for an hour about what I love <laughs> oh, about mushing. Go ahead. Do you to, have to a time? To answer the question <laughs> specific, what do you enjoy most 
with the sport. That's what I'm trying to cue in here. What is it that I enjoy most about the sport? I would have to say, while obviously the lifestyle is an all-encompassing thing, I spend my time working with animals in the wilderness. Um, that's what I love doing. It's a variety of tasks. One day I'm playing vet. The next day I'm you know, playing coach. The next day I'm trying to fix equipment or design the next evolution in sleds or dog gear. But what I enjoy most is watching a dog develop helping that dog develop. When you have a little tiny puppy that's born, which I did right before I came here, uh, had a litter of puppies, and you look at this dog and you think, what experiences are we going to have in the next 10 years, 15 years? And how, how great can you be? I know your parents. I know your grandparents. I know your great-grandparents. And I have all the knowledge of having worked with those dogs. And to anything I did wrong with your grandparents when they were a year old, maybe we didn't do enough training or we did too much training, I can correct that mm. with you. And watching that dog evolve and develop and become this super athlete. And then when you cross the finish line of one of these races, the sense of pride – the pride in these dogs and the accomplishment it, yeah. that we created something amazing and not just in each individual, but then watch them to come together as a team. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about this sport. That's what's amazing to me about this sport. When I hear you guys talking and to talk with people that are so passionate about their life, their sport, I kind of want to do this myself, but it sounds really, really nice. There, there are amazing, You're a great promoter for this sport. <laughs> when are you not, not going to ask us uh, what do you not like about this sport? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the money. <laughs> it's yeah. a very expensive career. It's extremely expensive in a way that you use everything you earn on dog food, on uh, equipment, on traveling, on starting fees. Uh, you, it's yeah. voluntarily, of course, but I mean, it's expensive. I could do something more cheap, actually. <laughs> it's a it's a rich rich life, but you don't get rich from it. That's right. That's you get very rich true. In your heart. And this and this ties into what you were asking about before, like the the science and the you know, yeah, it's it's there. The knowledge is there. We have to figure out how to translate that to canines and to animal sports, but. It's not like mini sports where if you win, there's such a big prize. That in, in football, of course, there's so much money in the sport um, that the athletes are you know, studied and there's science into it and there's the money there. So as a dog musher, we don't have the resources to do that, but we do have to look at these other sports that are spending that money and say, what can we pull from this? Mm. What the, have they developed and what knowledge have they gained that we can pull from there and easily translate and put into our sport in a cost-effective manner? Because the money's simply not there. Um, you know, I don't even know what first place gets in this race. I can't imagine it's a whole lot monetarily compared to what it costs to drive there and, and I do believe, the race. I believe actually it was between $5,000 and $10,000 for first prize. Yeah, somewhere in that range, I suspect. But uh, we're looking at so much more than that to feed you know, a, a, that dog team. The cost of feeding the dog team that Ryan Reddington is running for one year, just the food, will be more than first place in this race. Yeah. <laughs> just But the food. Do you, I mean, you're born in this way. I've done it since 81, 82. Uh, but I do feel sometimes I need to see more than the back of my dogs. I mean, I need to see more in life than just the back of my dogs. I love dogs. I love dog gamashing. But sometimes I need to feel I have a life a little bit on the side. Would do you feel like that? Could you? Do, would you feel like that? Yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty happy with mushing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty content there. Like you said, you can talk for an hour about oh, this. Yeah. But you know, Sorry. we're gonna look, yeah. uh, look, have a look at the GPS uh, map and see how things are going in Birgris. For that's that's. We're closing up at the finish stage now. Yeah, we're getting in uh, close here. Of course, we have um, Ryan Reddington into the Mineral City checkpoint. Shortly behind him, we had um, Keith Eiley with the runtime that was actually a few minutes faster than him. Kind of still on the trail, we have um, Ryan Anderson and Martin Massacott that are not too far from the checkpoint here. There's a few miles between those two, but uh, not much. They're fairly close to each other. Now we see a big gap here on the trail as we go back to uh, Colleen Wallen uh, in position number five back there. Um, she's fairly close with Blake Frecking. Um, so this is where we start to see our second group of mushers. We talked about this earlier in the race, that the teams would start to spread out, and there's the first group, and then the second group, and that's what we see here. So that was Ka Colleen Wallen, Blake Frecking, Nathan Schroeder in seventh. Um, these guys are kind of constituting that uh, second wave, if you will, if after we count the first four mushers up there. Then if we go a bit farther down the trail, we see uh, McClelland. Um, 
you know, Pete McClelland was uh, somebody we followed throughout this race, and they've been chugging along pretty steadily. Jennifer Frecking with her Siberian team is right next to him there on the trail. Um, going a little bit farther back down the trail, we have Jay Fouché on the trail. Now, she is quite a ways behind the rest of the crowd here. Um, and I think this is where we get into the group of mushers that want to accomplish the qualifying races, just get the, the course done, you know, have a successful race under their belt. So in this group, I think what we're mostly looking at is Hopefully we see him get it all the way to the finish line. Back still in the Skyport checkpoint, we have Laura Nice. Um, can I get down the rest of the list here? Kevin Mathis, Lisa Dietzen. And again, John Fisher has uh, scratched from the race, that is to say. Has and here we have uh, Ryan Anderson. Uh, he's on his way to the Mineral Center. A little bit freezed right there, but that's because of the satellite. It's it's. it's He's here, we're up live, and that's that's what's happening sometimes in this broadcast. It's a challenge for us, for the technical part, but we're doing a good job. I will well, welcome just, to... He'll be coming back. Working in remote areas, right? Exactly. This is what it's all about, is you're not on the beaten path. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're not in the there. middle of New York City. We are out in the nature, and this... Um, and I've been honestly quite impressed with how much uh, information we've been able to get in from the field, from Greg and Bruce, talking to these mushers. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun to see mushing a remote sport, a sport that takes place in the middle of nowhere, in these remote go. areas, happen well. Here we have Here's Ryan Anderson. Ryan Anderson coming into the checkpoint here, just a, a short distance out of the checkpoint. Again, nice looking dog team. Um, he's averaging a little bit slower speeds than those teams ahead of him. Uh, as far as I can tell, we'll have his accurate run time when he reaches the checkpoint, and we can actually compare his time between the Skyport checkpoint in Mineral City versus uh, Ryan Reddington and Keith Eilie's time. And then, of course, right behind him, we have Massacott. Um, which is, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see their run times. That's the most valuable information to me is looking at that, that time in between the checkpoints. And then, of course, any footage we can get of the dog teams on the trail is really nice to see what the team looks like moving down the trail. Well, it looks like uh, Ryan will be in about a little bit more than an hour after Ryan Redding. I think that we, we're actually the Quilt Pet Arctic World Series, we're broadcasting it live. That's, is it, how important is that for the sport of dog mushing, that we start this new broadcast and, and everything? Yeah, it's, I think it's huge for the sport as a whole um, to, get, to reach that broader audience. I think there's a lot of people that are aware of mushing, familiar with the concept of mushing. They know dogs pull sleds in the Arctic, but have they ever really gotten to see that firsthand and follow it? And I mean, I talk to many people throughout the, throughout the year that, have heard of mushing and the number one comment is I just didn't know that so much went into it right and I think that's what's exciting to bring to people is the depth of this sport the connection with the dogs there's so much more to it than just having some dogs and hitching them to a sled and going and doing a race here we have another team coming in that's Ryan is this uh, Anderson yeah that's Ryan Anderson yeah. it's just from another angle yeah so he'll be in uh, about one hour, five minutes, four or five minutes after Ryan Redding, I believe. Yeah, actually, nice yeah. looking team. You know, it's a smaller team. Nine dogs, and we maybe should maybe see if we can have the sound from Greg. Yes, uh, he's, right. uh, he's telling it. So we will hear soonly from them. Yeah, he's work. He's he's now. He was pretty quick there, going to his trailer for. I see eight dogs on that team. Good one uh, in the sled. He may have one dog in the sled. I don't oh, I think so. He's pretty nimble there <laughs> for having a dog in the sled as possible. Um, uh, so he, that's still a, a plenty big team at this point. I think the, the stats had him out of the previous checkpoint nine, with nine, nine dogs. dogs. So um, it's quite likely that he, you know, if one of them was having a hard time holding that pace. When I see a team like that, they're holding a brisk pace. You see wagging tails. Um, and if you've got one uh, that's having a hard time holding that pace, here we go. He's going to lift the dog out of the sled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. go. There we got a fluffy dog in the sled. Yep. So that's pretty common. When you've got a small team that's moving briskly like that and you want to set a good time, you're better off to pick that dog up, put him in the sled for a few reasons. One reason is the team can travel faster without that slower dog in the team. Second reason is you're always, I've said this many times, always set up the team for success and that means setting up each individual for success. So if this dog is gonna be in the team and feeling like they're having a hard time keeping up, that's not gonna build confidence. You're way better off to stop, do a quick snack break, do what I call a good dog stop, pat them all on the head, you guys are doing great. Then load them in the sled and say, hey, buddy, what I want you to do now is sit down and ride in the sled for a little bit. 
the dogs don't view it as a demotion or anything like that. And there's another one coming in. All right, this should be uh, Massacott, Ma Martin Massacott coming in here. Uh, let's take a look at this dog team as they charge down the trail here. He it's the dogs. same one. Ten dogs out of no, uh, it's, airport. It's, it's a replay of... Of, yep, that of is Anderson. That is Anderson right yeah. there. Yeah, replay of Anderson. 12 Anderson. I was like, damn, that's another really nice looking team. Yeah. No, it's the same one. <laughs> uh, looks a lot like Ryan yeah, Anderson. Looks, <laughs> man, looks very familiar. Uh, here, uh, Milan Dogs, nice gates, a little bit obscured by the trees here. Uh, we might see. Yeah, for the most part, I'm seeing 99% looking good there. There's a few hitches in there, but it's hard to say because the dogs do get off pace when they're trying to look at the cameraman <laughs> and, and 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 the dog that's placed in the sled mm -hmm. is he kind of sad about being there depressed not being able to run with his friends um or how does he react yes there again i hate saying yes and no but there's always <laughs> two sides to these questions um part of it is what do you tell the dog yeah. and i think this is comes down to a relationship thing and this is where it's really important for the entire life of the dog that we're building confidence we're building them up we're supporting them and so when i say what do we tell the dog i don't necessarily mean in words but like i was doing my explanation there what i when i'm conveying to the dog is you've done a great job now what i want you to do is sit in the sled and ride that's your job now not i'm so frustrated that i have to load this dog up and carry him because that will come across too and that you cannot do that i spend my entire life and certainly the dog's entire life teaching them that they are superman they can do anything there's nothing in the world they can't do and the trick is never show them something they can't do set them up for success so if i know the last 10 miles of this run are is, is going to make this dog question his ability i'm not going to put him in a situation where they're going to be there i'm going to stop the team and say what i want you to do now is curl up and take a break you know you've done a good job so you will see sometimes that if the dog's loaded up they're a little bit anxious and kind of howling out of the sled they want to get back with the team but um I think they understand that uh, they will always know that we have their best interest in mind if we always have their best interest in mind, mm -hmm. right? Well, so uh, uh, well as, as we see as well, the trail was pretty good, so the extra weight of the dog doesn't really matter that much on these kinds of trails. But if it's a uh, heavy snowfall and you're up in the mountains and you get to load the dog in the sled uh, for some reason, could be um, pretty heavy for you and uh, you'll lose time. It's very interesting what you just said to set up for success. Yeah, it's it's a very profound uh, saying. In in it can be used in many terms. Yeah, they. I mean, in, in, this goes back to the other thing we've been saying, which is realistic expectations. Don't expect the dogs to do something they're not prepared to do. Um, like Nina was just saying, if you're in the mountains, this could be devastating to your race to have to carry a dog. The dog can't know that. The dog doesn't know that this is a race. The dog doesn't care what position well, they come in. That's humanization, right? right? Humanization. Yeah, that's the humanization. Yeah, so yes, humanization. as a musher, you have to have a broad um, emotional range and then also be very, very compassionate. Compassion is one of the most valuable traits, patience and compassion here, because you have to put all this effort into running the race. And as a human, we care about the race. And we certainly know that our fans and supporters care about the race. But our number one responsibility is always that dog team. So if the right thing for the dog is to load up and get a ride, and we are in the mountains, and we are in heavy snow, and it's going to slow us down, so be it. My responsibility is to these dogs first dog. and foremost. Mm. Um, and I think people understand that and appreciate that and the fans that wanted you to win and maybe they even bet on you. I always hear people saying, oh, I bet a bottle of wine that you were gonna win the race and that's their, that's on them. My job is to take care of my dogs and if it costs us the race to carry the dog, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Mm. Sounds, it's, 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 we, I think there are hundred, you can talk, uh, hours about this and we still have some times and now we're going to go and see hear from greg and bruce on site greg how are you doing and how's how's things going and who are you with now okay all right we're back online here with our audio come on over here bruce come on over here and let's uh we're gonna go over and, and stand at uh at the lead of ryan's team and so let's um I'm not sure they heard anything. What, what did you see when the dog team came in? They looked really good. Uh, I did overhear Ryan saying he thought he was going to have his best run uh, of any of these stages or any of these, you know, between checkpoints. And then he had to load a dog into the basket. He came in here with one in the basket. We can talk to him about that in a little bit maybe. But uh, when you add a dog, you're adding weight, and that slows you down on the hills. So that's 
you know, that's always a disappointment to load a dog, but it also slows you down a little bit. So, And you can see us here on the camera, and just off screen left is where uh, Ryan and his team is parked right now, and, and he went to work, and you can tell, like, that when he came in here, like, he wanted to get to a spot, get the clock stopped, get his four-hour mandatory rest because every minute counts now. Yeah, I mean, whatever those times are, minutes are ticking. So the main thing is to get to get food and water into the dogs they they rest better after they've eaten and also there's this window of time the physiology of dogs is when their muscles are recovering there's this window of time where the to simplify it where the energy goes from the food into the dogs better if you can get it when their systems are still kind of really functioning from running when those cells are looking for energy feed me feed me right and so there is this effort to get it done quickly for both that and so the dogs can get a nice long sleep and be prepared for their next run and in a race like this especially with a mandatory rest now of four hours in the final checkpoint and and really no chance to to gain time uh, by cutting a rest between here and the finish line or anything like that. This is going to come down to speed you know, over these next 40 hours or 40 miles. 40 miles. The, the, the fastest team wins. Yeah, well, the fastest team wins, but that doesn't necessarily mean speed. It might mean it is fastest, but it also can be do you maintain that speed going uphill as well as downhill? There's still little micro adjustments that mushers are always putting into any given section of trail. So yeah, it is the fastest team, but it's also a perfect example. Ryan and Keith over there, he's got 11 dogs. That's more power going uphill. Yeah. So if he gets up each hill half a mile an hour faster, those little increments can start affecting your overall time. So it is speed, but it's where is the speed? Is it flat out speed on a flat trail? Or is it a big powerful team that has can maintain their trail pace and speed going uphill. In a general sense, on a flat trail, is 11 dogs faster than eight dogs? Not necessarily. Right. That depends on the individual dogs in the team and particularly the leaders that set the pace. There are often <clears throat> leaders, people have lead dogs for different reasons. You might have a dog that doesn't have a, a lead dog that doesn't have a real high, uh, speed pace and you would use that dog like a carburetor so to speak to you don't want your team going at their high speed and you put her around here we good put your put your your first speed you know your high speed dogs in when you can use that speed um, then there's also the aspect of um, well, who's a good G Hall leader so you don't miss a trail or you don't waste time. You could be faster, but then let's say you get there's a lot of snow machine trails right. out here. It's a huge recreation area. So they might go by thirty different trail crossings. And if you just say on by and that dog doesn't slow down at all, your team doesn't slow down, then you gain time. So there's that type of speed. Whereas if a dog takes a wrong turn and you've got to either run up and move them or Tell them no, G over, G over, G over. So there's a lot of things that come into it more than just the 100, dart, 100 meter dash, so to speak, of, of speed. Take a couple steps to your right here so we get out of the way of this beautiful Ford pickup truck. But we're looking at Ryan Anderson feeding his, his team right now, and they seem to be eating well. Yeah, they do seem to be eating well. Actually, they're eating as well, as well or better than any of the two previous teams I saw come in here. He might be able to see one of the leaders behind us that he's working with right now. Yeah. And, and we, we it, have watched Ryan's team uh, throughout this race, and, and it seems like from checkpoint to checkpoint, he, he his team has been as strong as any that we've seen. I would say they're, they're the most consistently steady is yeah. the way I would put it. And uh, and really a nice-looking team. They are drink I can hear them yeah, drinking let's, in let's, the background. So you can hear this sound at home.
if you're having a good dream, you've got that as yeah. a soundtrack in the background of here in Musher. That is the sweetest sound in the world. And as I, I know that everybody can't see him, but I can from here. I mean, three quarters of the team are standing up like this leader behind us, which shows they, you know, they're not so tired. They just want to get off their feet. And every one of them is eating like that. And, and yeah. again, it's that mixture of lean beef that I'm seeing and kibble, energy, flavor, and... Yeah, so I, I was told maybe those at home didn't just hear all that slurping going on because when, when I bent down, I think the audio cut out. But what we're hearing there is a dog that's really drinking, yeah. drinking and, and enjoying a meal right now. And what, what that means is that it is a dog that feels the need to get hydrated, feels the need to get some nourishment in because it's going to run well from here here to the finish line. Well, and, and not only that, it's not so tired that it doesn't want to eat. So you're always trying to maintain, you know, you're, there, it's an athletic performance. So like, like a human athlete, part of it is being tired. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't want to see somebody coming in from a great track and field event not breathing hard. But <laughs> the fact that they're not so... Uh, haven't expended so much energy that they don't feel like eating. And I think it's in, easy for any person to understand if you're a bike rider or, you know, a jogger, runner. Uh, you don't always feel like hammering down a big meal right after yeah. exercise. And by right after, I mean 30 seconds right, after. Right. And that's really what we're asking these dogs to do. So they have to keep a certain level of uh, energy and <clears throat> overall condition to just not be so tired even though they just ran 40 miles that might sound crazy to people but but uh that they still want to eat yeah. I, I will i i have a real love for these sled dogs working with them for most of my adult life in one level or another and used them recreationally and to live <clears throat> just transportation live with them before ever starting racing. The amazing thing about sled dogs are, particularly the Alaskan Huskies, there are animals in this world that are faster, like a cheetah. Yeah. And there are animals given time that travel f farther. But there is no animal that can travel farther faster uh. than an Alaskan Husky. I mean, think about it, a thousand miles in eight days in the Iditarod. Right. You know, there's birds that migrate long distance, but for land animals, they are the farthest traveling, traveling best adapted to cross-country travel of any animal in the world. That's pretty unique athletic ability and evolution in what they are. I mean, this is what they're born to do. Right. Yeah, there's been a great evolving sled dog, and I see Ryan down there. Hey, Ryan. Are you available for an interview? No, okay. When's a good time? Oh, he, he's he's messing with. It. He's on his way. So we're gonna we're gonna get a live interview with Ryan here, and we're gonna find out the the skinny, as they say, the the inside story. He's in, enjoying a cup of Joe. You you like it strong and black? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. Never. No cream. No sugar. No, no nothing. 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 Well, where are you at now? Where's your Where's your mind at? You're in here. What is it? About an hour behind or so? I think so. Yeah, I was hoping to maybe make up some time on this last run, and then about well, two hours from here, so I had to haul a dog. So yeah. Yeah, I kind of put the kibosh to that. But I think I still ended up fairly close to the run time. It was them with the dog in the bag. But and you don't run with a GPS, so you have no idea how much that slowed you down by carrying a dog. No, I, I really don't know how much it slowed me down, but. You know, I kind of knew there's a road crossing out here called Arrowhead Crossing, and I know being over these trails so many years that it's about 12 to 13 miles from there to here. So I just looked at my watch, and, you know, it was right at 10 miles an hour coming here. So, And so, uh, obviously, something's got to happen with the two teams in front of you for you to yeah, get there at this first. Point, or, yeah, at this but point. that doesn't mean, are you going to get off and still try to catch them? I had to run here because I had a dog in the bag. But <laughs> so you're tired. No, I didn't run too much. I mean, I paddled up a couple of hills, but yeah. that was about it. Yeah. How will you spend these four hours? What will you do? Uh, I will probably just rest, um, make sure the dogs, I mean, they all drank finally. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll just kind of go through feet and get them ready for the last 30, I think it's 36 miles. I haven't done this course, so, yeah. We heard it's about 40, but you know how yeah. that goes. They yeah, yeah, yeah. 42 or 38. Yeah, they it doesn't matter this, to them, but They it does call this them. one a 40, 48 yeah. or 49, and it's, it can't be. But because I don't think I averaged 10 for the whole run. But 
But the rest of the ones in harness that came in here looking really smooth, yeah, no, and I noticed they ate better than any dogs I've seen. For they finally, uh, it, it was funny, like the first three checkpoints, they were real picky. They wouldn't eat out of the bowl. They'd only take snacks, and then they'd eat maybe if you dump the bowl. And now, like, finally the last three checkpoints, they've been eating out of the bowl, like alligators. So I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a dog race. Um, it's a good dog team. It's probably one of the best dog teams I've ever had. Mm. But, uh, you know, it either comes together or it doesn't. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's just it's a dog race. So, so from what and we might not be have exact accuracy here because we don't have access to computers and all that out here on the trail. But we understand that Ryan Arrington left here last year two hours ahead. Well, he yeah. got here two, two hours, hours in front ahead. Of Blake. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yet didn't win. So I mean, thing is, it's not over to it. So it's not. It's a dog race. <laughs> it's, it's a do anything can happen. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of wrong turns out there. So anything. This possible. one here's I. If you look at it on a map, it's kind of funky. I don't even know where we go out of here. I think we head out that way. I don't know. Or is it this? No, that's the, that's that's, the that's after we do these other three loops, and then we do that. This is the section of yeah. this trail that if you're looking at it and you think, wow, their GPS went crazy, it, yeah. it goes out and it just looks like a kid with a pencil making, you know, a three-year-old. It just goes around in circles. I couldn't make sense of which direction they're going on it. So it's around and around and then blasting off yeah. to Grand Portage. Yep. So it's, I think it's eight miles from right there down the hill. So from there, it's pretty much downhill uh, all the way into Grand Portage. There's a few little Mowgli things, but ultimately we got to get from the top of the hill here down to the lake. Right. So it's ultimately all downhill. So um, if it's a 37 mile run or whatever, and I know that's eight miles, I'm guessing it's only a 29 mile run, and then it's all downhill free falling. <laughs> that's pretty good math okay. for a guy that hasn't slept much. <laughs> you, you, are you going to get some sleep in this four hour break? I won't sleep now. Not I slept, why now, right? Yeah, well, I slept two hours last night, and then I slept, uh, uh, I slept one other time. So. Yeah, we're, we're watching a, a team come in now. And blocked by the truck. Ryan, thanks for your time. You bet. Good luck the rest of the way. We'll see thanks. you at the finish line. Yeah. Ryan Anderson. And our new team coming in here. Who is this? Mr. Manicotta? Yeah. Yes. And look at that dog team, Bruce. Martin. It wants to keep going. Yeah, Martin's team looking, looking strong. Really animated for just doing a, this deep into a race. Leaders look nice and smooth. Wheel dogs pulling hard. He looks big smile. Yeah, a big face. smile. He looks happy. That's always a key of how a musher feels about their team. Yeah. Yeah, they look great. And two, four, six, eight, ten dogs. That's a lot of power. Yeah, and like you said, that team was uh, very, very animated. Mm -hmm. But look, with with just 40 miles to go, I mean, there's two teams right now that should be vying for a championship. And, and I realize it's a dog race. Anything can happen in 40 miles. But it is Ryan Reddington's race or uh, Mr. Eiley's race to win or lose. Yeah, between Ryan and Keith, I mean, right now, you could never begin to call that. For I mean, Ryan came in here first, but they've all got four hours and change and time to spend here, and neither of them knew how those extra yeah. minutes were. Se second, even with 40 miles, they're close enough that anything can happen. Like, like Ryan Anderson was just saying, he loaded a dog and it knocks off speed. If they misjudge which dogs they should take out of here and you load one, the whole game changes. And then we have the dynamic of eight dogs versus 11. So yeah. this is far from over at this point. And that, but that's where the fight's going to be to win this. And But Ryan Anderson's within striking distance. Give yeah. Him. Let's walk up here near our line. I, I think this... Uh, camera might be working better for us but uh so really it's two possibly three teams with a chance here more likely uh, just two teams and and bruce how haunting is it i know uh, the last few years we we watched what happened with nick petit on the ice between shaq tulik and koyak and then uh, he had an issue two years in a row there, and so with, and I know it's different dogs for Ryan, but for the musher, how much does does that haunt 
you when you're so close to a win and look at what happened with Ryan Reddington a few miles from the finish line a year ago. Does it haunt you as a musher? Do you think about that when you're back in the same position and a chance to win? They're aware of it. It's, you know, it's really a heartbreaking thing yeah. because the mushers at that point feel like they've let the team down because they may have misjudged or whatever in that in that situation but yeah it's on your mind and it can be a really haunting feeling but it's a new team and you just have the memory of it and and the positive part of that memory is this is always a learning experience yeah. and you really don't want to make that mistake of misjudging which dogs you should take again and that that's a real that's really the positive everything i always say every mistake isn't really a mistake it's a chance it's a learning opportunity if you can keep that positive spin on it that you make a mistake and you can learn on it and make uh, uh, and Maybe you can do it better. Maybe you can learn not to do it. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can learn to prepare more. I mean, there's a lot of different angles on on that. But it, we call them mistakes, but they're really just learning opportunities. I also would say one other aspect uh, that I was thinking about here when you're talking about uh, bringing up this that experience haunting for any musher that is at the end of a race as close as these three or four are. We always tend to ask people before they go out of the shoot, are you nervous? You're really not then, you're focused. This is the point in a race I think mushers get. You feel the jitteriness of mm -hmm. close competition. I always, in a tight race, would feel not more pressure, but more focus, more pinpoint vision when you're in a close race in the last 50 miles that's when you're looking over your shoulder that's yeah. when you're racing that's when you don't you know you want to really be encouraging those dogs you want to be driving with them but i always would feel more energized it's not really nervous but focused and energy in your body than at the start and we should point out that this is uh, the first morning we, you know, we, they they gave us these beautiful new parkas and it, we kind of need them this morning it we really woke up it's 10 10 degrees, 10 degrees out not 10 yeah. below but still 10 above and, mm -hmm. and a little breeze in the air so it so it feels good but it, ryan will spend a lot of time over the next 40 miles looking over his shoulder won't he because it you know you guys are always talking about you know 98 percent of the time our heads are forward and we're looking at gates and every foot and the way every dog is looking but now maybe it's just going to be 80 percent of the time the other part of the time you're going to be looking over the shoulder there'll be an awareness but the reason you're looking back is because of what's in front of you. Yeah. So, again, you don't want to make a mistake. It's that concentrated energy, and there you get into the aspect of you're looking over your shoulder too much, and a dog's got tangled, and you got to slow down and untangle it. Those are seconds lost. But there is an awareness. I, I just think unless you re know you're really, really in the lead by hours and hours, yeah. you don't really relax until you see that finish shoot. Yeah. You know, how many times in Iditarod after a thousand miles that we watch, if for any position, first and second or tenth and eleventh or whatever you pick, they're on the street together. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's not over till yeah. it's over. Yeah. And I, as you were saying that, the, the one race that Dallas won uh, came zooming to my mind the year that he didn't even know. I believe it was his second Iditarod championship. He didn't even know that he had, he had gotten there first. Because of the storm. Yeah. They didn't, you know, you're out there in the elements. You don't have, you can't see. And you're fighting your way through the weather. And you somebody stopped at some point and you went right by them and didn't even know they were there. So it's really it the point you can let down and celebrate is once you're underneath the sh you know you're into the chute but or as we say in gnome under the arch but yeah. but uh but this makes it this is what this is fun this is when we've got a real race and something to watch right to the last minute i ryan's in the lead he's a past champion he, he knows what he's doing and he's managing that team well that's his credibility. He got here. He did travel faster. Again, we don't know the rest times. To me, Keith's team, big, strong, the smoothest one I saw come Lively. in here. Yeah. Lively. He's got a lot of power. 
Ryan Anderson's team, the best eaters standing up, not overtired. Uh, he got a little ding there by having to load a, a dog for quite a few miles. But that's what I see. I see one team that's got more energy, but it's behind. It's eating well. I see the second place team is having the most power and looking really smooth. And rock, but facts are facts. Ryan got here faster, so he's probably got a little more speed. Right. And so as a competitor, how much time will they spend? Obviously, they're going to run some up the hills. Do you spend time running on the flats on this next section? If it and, were me, I'd be running up right? every one of these hills. Yeah. I mean, there are different mushers. We see it all the time. There's mushers that just stand back there and go on the runners, being a slug, going, good boys, good boys. <laughs> I look at it as a team. There's the musher and, you know, Dallas back there, I know I've watched him on the trail for years. He's a kicker He's a or runner, a worker, yeah. you know, and I've flown over the race in helicopters and planes. I would say I, it would be a minimal amount of time I would see someone like Dallas or Allie, and I was that way, that isn't working. You know, they, when you're doing something, kicking, or you know, you might, you might be down in your sled bag doing something or checking on something, but... Anytime there's a hill, there's a little bit to be gained. And and then there are other mushers who just stand there, you know. And fact is, we have mushers that stand on the back and stare at their dogs and smoke a cigarette, you know. And I go, wow, think what that team would do if you really got off yeah. and helped them. Yeah. It's an athletic event, and it's both dogs and mushers. And I know these mushers, and I include you in that group. I mean, you, you work really, really hard throughout a year uh, to put and to develop a team and to put them in position to hopefully get to some of these finish lines in first place. So will you? Will they be able to sleep? Will the tension grow? Will the pressure grow uh, in these coming hours and these coming miles with 40 miles to go and a chance to put your name on a trophy, uh, especially with this race that's been around for 36 years? And once you get your name on that trophy, Bruce, I mean, it's on that trophy forever. Uh, and I don't think, you know, we should underplay that at all. I mean, this is a chance to build legacy, uh, especially with a, with a race like this. And so is there pressure in this? Is there tension in this? Well, as far as sleep goes, it is now, you know, late morning. I mean, your biorhythms are such combined with the excitement of being near the end. I mean, somebody's going to lay in their truck stretch out their back and get off their feet but really sleep they're not going to do that here it it is history and what it says is it's not it's not so much pride and for the mushers it's not ego pride for yourself it's it's pride that you raised a dog team that won a race and that you managed them to reach their highest capability they beat the other dogs here that's the pride it's really pride in your team and that you worked with them well and like you said we we look through the past history there and and it is there forever i read myron angstom's name i read john Barron's name you know or susan butcher's name and that that is history and yeah. and that is the legacy of dog racing just like we know yeah John Bear Grease, you know, it's it's a whole culture. There's racing aspects, and you just you're just adding into the <clears throat> overall history of what these dogs, this breed, has done for us throughout time. Yeah, you bring up a few of those names, of course. Myron, uh, so important to the Cusco 300 there in Bethel. Dee Dee John Rowe won this race in 1989. Susan Butcher won it in 1990. That was the same year that she went on to win her fourth Iditarod. She wouldn't win it again. Of course, she lost that tremendous race in 1991 where those uh, that got caught in a storm it was Timmy Osmar, Joe Runyon. Uh, Rick Swenson went on to win his fifth in 1991, uh, denying Susan of being the first champion in that race to reach five um, but it, it is a chance uh, you know these are these are names and and races that oftentimes you just don't ever forget and I, I think winning the race all of these races is, is so very important and, and you've got Ryan Reddington up in the lead of this thing and the great Martin Boozer used to talk about it all the time Bruce back in his heyday where he says look 
being in the lead isn't the easiest thing. Yes, you're having a great run and your dog team is performing well, but everybody behind you knows what's going on in front of you. But the team that's out in the front has no idea what's going on behind. And so I think that there is an added pressure with Ryan leaving here first, knowing that you, you want to be in first, I get that. But there is added pressure because he won't know how f far back uh, Keith is until he's in sight. Yeah, and not only that, the dogs pick up that on that as far as there's two aspects that I think of. One, you're laying down the tracks when you're in first place. You literally are making the tracks in the trail. And on certain trails, that those two runners, if there's any kind of drifting, anything chewed up from snow machines, you're setting a faster trail for the teams following you. And then we're all aware of how dogs have such a heightened sense of smell. They're smelling those teams out in front of them, so they're chasing. So that can add a little excitement, too. So, yeah, the team in the front has the most pressure on them. And if the front team gets to a place where there's any confusion of which fork and a trail to take, they've got to figure it out. Second team comes up, maybe is a little confused, and then they see the dog prints and the trail the runner trail going that way and they go it's a right hand turn or left hand turn so there is more pressure on a lead team especially in the last 50 miles of a race yeah and the scent trail is laid down too right yeah that's the, what the, i'm the talking team, about yeah. yeah the heightened sense of smell for the dogs they have the scent of the teams in front of them and mushers you know they're so good you should get so good at just knowing trail and dogs that you you can look down in the snow and you can kind of judge a print and see if it's set up and then there's the 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 poop from the dogs is it frozen or is it fresh and, and all of We're that comes graphic, in place yeah, yeah well it's yeah. the reality they're yeah. animals you yeah. know and you you're used you're out on the trail and you can say oh that team must be about an hour ahead of us or five minutes yeah. or that was from four days ago you yeah. know it's so, like you're stalking a wild game yeah and you exactly. can tell how long the prince well been there and... you know good outdoorsman they, that's a good analogy greg you know out there is this uh is this an elk track from last week or did it just go through there and those people that were skilled enough to look down there and go it's right ahead of us survived and, yeah. and it's the same thing mushers are outdoorsmen and outdoor women and little things you notice that other people just kind of think oh there the snow's messed up over there you know yeah. and, but it you learn how to read the land yeah you know it's great when when you begin covering these races the energy is there and you can't wait and the anticipation and and you wonder what could happen as we get closer to the finish line and so so many times these dog races are anticlimactic right and in the last day someone might be way out in front and so their championship is almost claimed long before they get to the finish line but bruce we have an, a real opportunity at a photo finish later today in grand portage this could get really really exciting oh it could be right in the shoe yeah literally could be and mushers like that <laughs> yeah. you know they like that excitement because yeah. they're competitors but they're also friends and i think keith and ryan if they were neck and neck they would yeah they would really enjoy yeah. that yeah. we can only hope that we have images later today from grand portage of two mushers sweating profusely the steam coming out of the top of their heads as they sprint down that chute hoping to get to that finish line first we're, uh, Bruce and I are going to take a timeout right now. We're going to send it back to the desk there in Oslo, Norway, so we can go in and check uh, the sign. The ham operators, I'm sure, have been busy trying to accumulate information, facts and figures for us, uh, so we can get an idea of exactly who's leaving and, and at what time. And then we'll come back out here and get in front of this camera with hopefully another live interview and some more information for you. So for now, we send it back to the desk in Oslo. Thank you, Greg and Bruce. That was a long update from on-site, and it's always great to have some real inside information on site finally we have some something to talk about right <laughs> yeah it's uh, exciting to see uh, some live coverage in in the checkpoint there and just hearing those guys discuss what's going on on the ground right it's always a different feel when you're at the race experiencing that versus watching it from a distance but it's great to get that inside view and he was also talking about trying to figure out who's going out when and what time and how mm -hmm. long and you're exactly like <laughs> trying I'm sitting here to, you scratching know, on paper trying to do yeah, the, the short math, checking the stuff online um i think 
<laughs> this is what's been posted uh, just as a few seconds ago. Uh, what I have is Ryan Reddington is going to be able to be the first musher out of there after taking his mandatory four-hour rest, plus he had a few extra minutes to take care of, and he should be able to be out of there at 12.28 p.m., um, followed by Keith Eiley at 1.01 p.m. So there's going to be a bit of a gap there. Where is the race? Is the race between the first two, is, is that decided? Or even though you say a, dog, a, a race is never over bef before it's over. Yep. But where is the most exciting going to be between the fight it's, for the third place or is it a fight for the victory? It, it could go either way right now, right? Um, it, yes, it could be a fight for the victory. That's definitely possible. There's a 30-minute gap between first and second approximately. Uh, that's certainly a time that can be overcome. However, what we saw from the previous run is the speed difference between Ryan Reddington and Keith Eiley, the first and second mushers, was not that great. They had run times within two minutes of each other over the previous 40 miles. So to expect that over the next, I guess the previous run was 46. So over the next 40 miles, for there to be a 30-minute difference would take something significant. That's not unlikely. As we move a little bit farther back, Ryan Anderson um, had a runtime of 4.41. So he was a little bit faster than both Reddington and Keith Eiley, but again, only a few minutes. The only one that had a bit of an outlier on their runtime was Martin Massacott. We saw that team come in. Um, for me, that's the best-looking team so far. A lot of energy in that team, a lot of enthusiasm. He did that run in, I think, 4.36, so about 10 minutes faster than Ryan Reddington. However, he's out of the checkpoint about an hour and, twelfth, an hour and 30 minutes behind the leaders. That's too much of time to make up barring uh, an issue. We have a replay on, this, on, on the screen so yeah, so of the people coming in. So, so here we have R Martin Massacott coming in. I mean, that's, that's what you want to see at 300 or 250 miles into a 1,000-mile race, right? That's what you're expecting to see. And so this is a team that I'm looking at here that can go the distance. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Martin is uh, looking at running some, some races later in the year here, so there might be something to that. But that is a beautiful dog team. That's what you want to see. Now, he is an hour and a half off the pace, but, I mean, yeah, so they just covered a 46-mile run. They came into the last checkpoint of the race, and uh, they look as good as they did on the first day of the race. So when I'm racing a 1,000-mile race, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm shooting for right here is to come into the third way in the race. We start thinking about where we're going to take our mandatory 24-hour rest on that race, and that's what I want my team to look like. So he's got a smaller team with 10 dogs. I want to say he dropped down to 10 earlier on in the race than some, but he's, like, again, it's the right 10 that look really good. That's a solid unit. Will we see a higher speed now for the last leg? Will they, will the mushers take the chance to push their dogs a little bit on going a little bit higher speed? The last yeah, leg? I don't think we're going to see them. Um, well, how should I say this? Yeah, I think they're going to they're gonna let off the brake. They're going to let them roll a little bit. If they think there's a chance that they can catch up with the team ahead of them, or if they think there's a fear of being overtaken from behind. Um, they're all close enough that, yeah, you're going to be looking over your shoulder when there's 30 minutes between or 10 minutes between. So, yeah, now we got uh, this this replay here. We got Keith Eiley coming in, um, you know, another nice-looking dog team. And that's, I don't get me wrong, all of these teams look fantastic. Um, but this team looks like they're on the last, you know, nearing the end of a 300-mile race. And maybe he's been more appropriate on pacing this team, considering that it is only a 300-mile race. He doesn't need to go another 700 miles when this is done. So uh, another beautiful dog team. Dogs are perky, lively. Um, you know, Keith uh, looked a little more subdued himself. Uh, of course, he's having a good time as well. So I'm, I, I'm excited about all these teams. All of them, and we're watching good dogmen, Shepard, honestly. Um, we're watching mushers do well with their teams, managing their teams well, keeping the energy levels up, keeping the excitement up. Um, and if there's any criticism for Martin, it might just be that, you know, he hasn't really been going the speed that he needs to, but first priority is always to have that beautiful team. But remember, uh, Martin is actually uh, signed up for the ID Road as yeah, well, so I, he I, might do these as a training run. I was thinking that that was the thing, yeah. is that Martin was running the ID Road. I didn't want to say that because I wasn't confident, but thank you, Nina, for checking on that. So he is, I mean, that's what he wants his team to look like 300 miles into the race. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you, out of these four first teams, uh, that's Ryan Reddington and Martin, uh, who signed up for the ID Road. So Keith and Ryan Anderson is, uh, are not running the ID Road, uh, as far as... So here we have Ryan Anderson um, coming into the checkpoint. Now, he did have to carry a dog in his sled for the last couple miles there. Um, however, it didn't seem to really affect his speed. He's got a nice-looking team. He still did this run, I want to say, a few minutes faster. Um, i got to get my right sheets in front of me here. But I think he was about five minutes faster than Ryan Reddington, despite having to carry that dog there. Mm -hmm. About three minutes faster than Keith Eiley, which is a very small difference over the course of a 46-mile run. But clearly, it didn't. You know, it wasn't a major deficit for him. Now, we couldn't, can't say what he would have done that run in. Just simply stopping and loading the dog in the sled, doing it in a way that's not going to frighten the dog, that will take a few minutes. Just, just simply that time, not accounting for having to um, then carry the dog. But again, with a nice trail and a fresh team like we're seeing with him there, um, with Ryan Anderson there, carrying a dog is not really that, that big of a of a concern. He's clearly got plenty of power, so he might have been standing on the brake less than he was before that. Um, of course, where it makes a difference is when you're actually going up a steep hill. So. Oh, Dave. Uh, uh, so this, uh, I believe we're, we got uh, Martin Massacott here yep. again. Yep. Um, and that, that is, I think we're all agreeing, probably the liveliest looking team and as Nina checked for us he is running the Iditarod this year he signed up for that race so he's undoubtedly using this for a training exercise and that's something I'd like to point out here is could he have won this race that he may have you can never say what might have happened I think he could have raced harder if this was his a race as we would call it but I think his focus is probably on the Iditarod meaning that what's most important to him on this race is to get a good experience and to get to the finish line with a team that could turn around and do this trail again and then turn around and do it again, right? So I think he's having a very successful race. And we, a few times over the commentary here, we've touched on different mushers racing for different reasons, just to finish the race, to have their personal best, or to win the race, or in his case, and perhaps Laura Nice's case, in preparation for the Iditarod. Uh, and I also remember that Martin is also a rookie in the Iditarod, so he, he, he wanted to keep his dogs uh, ready for the Iditarod. I have a question, because now the trails are there, for those who really wanted to get a real Iditarod trail mm -hmm. training, when they come to the finish in Grand Portage today, they could rest for four hours and then go back again to Duluth if, if they wanted so to make a training ring. So earlier we talked about keeping our uh, training a little bit secretive. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, I have done exactly that. You I have, have run mid-distance okay. races. We generally take our mandatory 24-hour rest about 300 miles into the Iditarod. In the Iditarod, Takatna is a common checkpoint. It's 318 miles to that checkpoint. So I will do a 300-mile race. You go to the banquet, you spend the night, you take your 24-hour break, and then you go back out there. And I may not do the entire 300 miles yeah. again, but I will go, I want to have my dogs practice going through that 300, taking a 24-hour break, and then getting out and doing a few runs after that, either 100 to 300 miles after that. Because it's just teaching them. We're going to be we out have here for a seen people doing the same thing in Norway in shorter races, yeah. Uh, doing a 200-kilometer race, like a 120-mile race, mm -hmm. and then uh, return back to the uh, after and do it one more time, yeah. <laughs> when you're here now, you're watching now the end of the race, are you getting a bit frustrated to, to look at this, uh, the, the, the footage from, from Bear Gris being <laughs> here as measures? Well, I'm actually a bit jealous because they have great snow conditions. Yeah. I mean, this year has been crazy little snow here in southern Norway. So uh, right now, I just g give me some snow <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm fairly accustomed to not racing these races. I mean, yeah, it's exciting to see it, and it does get your, your heart pumping watching these races. But um, Nice trails. Yeah, yeah. beautiful trails. Yeah. I, you know, this one in particular, I was kind of planning on racing there. So it's a little bit like, man, I, I, I wish I was there, but it's more excited about going there next year. We're going to see when it comes I did a rod time, because traditionally I focus on one race. I have one race each season mm. that we're really focused on, and I might do a mid-distance race, but generally not. So we'll see when it comes to Iditarod. That's when it's going to be a little bit frustrating you know, on that, that race. I, not I would normally, it. Uh, normally So what he's saying yeah. is that he's not going to be in the studio with, 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 with me next year, huh? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's fun that you say that because 
um, we were looking forward to see you on the trail. You're obviously not going to end your career as a measure and be an uh, expert commentator. So yeah, am I that bad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's, it's great. You're it's saying don't quit your day job, keep mushing. It's probably better <laughs> no, at that. No, 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 no. It's, it's you great. But, uh, like we, the sofa mushing concept. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I understand that you guys are more mushers, you know, you, and when you watch it, you want to do it. It's yeah. like anything you, you're passionate about. When you see it, Absolutely. you think about it, you want to be there. What's a little bit uh, frightening for me in some ways is my dad's now 60-something years old, um, and he's still racing the Iditarod. So I'm thinking, good golly, do I got to do this for another 30 <laughs> years? You know? Um, you know, and that's where I think it is important to take a year off, you know, take a recovery year. If I'm going to be doing this for the next however many years, I want to stay excited about it. I want to be energized and, and keep that passion about it. I don't ever want it to become a job that I have to do, right? No, we'll take a year off, we'll raise some puppies. That was just what I was saying yeah. earlier in this uh, broadcast. Uh, it's nice to have another point of view in life somewhere, sometime, and then, as you want, go back to the races next year. For me, I don't know yet, but to have some other input, because I think I'll be a better musher if I have another life, or do something else in between, actually. And it's a very unique sport, because how, what other sports can you compete in at the top level? In 2012, I became the youngest person to ever win the Iditarod at 25 years old. In 2013, the next year, my dad became the oldest person to ever win the Iditarod. And I think he was 53 at that time. When he won again in 2017, he was 57. So we've got between 25 and 57. Not many athletes have to manage an athletic career for that span of time. Dallas, that's got to do with your family genes as well, I suppose. Oh, I mean, there's other mushers. Yeah. Doug Swingley won yeah. at a very old age. Yeah. Um, or I yeah. shouldn't say very old. I don't want to offend anybody. But um, oh, you know, he was the previous oldest musher. Him and Jeff King uh, both we got to remember. There. Well, Some of the favorites well. to uh, win the feminine race, they're more than six years old. Robert Surley, Ralph Johansson, uh, even more people, and they're still going really strong. Yep. So we'll see old guys, gray hair on the finish line. Now. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just a matter of managing, as an athlete, managing your career. And many other sports, it's all about you've got to hit it so hard for these five years because you're really only a viable athlete between 22 and 27. Or, you know, I'm just picking numbers. <laughs> if you're a sprinter or whatever the mm. sport may be, you have a much shorter career. And this mushing or this sport, um, you have a much longer career. So being able to manage yourself as well as your dog team. And this is very true on the race. And we're just going to see the beginning of it at the end of the, the Bear Grease here as they hit that 300-mile mark. But on the Iditarod and some of the longer races, like the Femin, which we'll be watching here in a, in next weekend, I think, um, we're going to start seeing mushers not only have to manage their dog team, but manage themselves. We have a lot of the decisions we make are almost intuitive. We're so in tune with the dog teams that I couldn't tell you why this is the right decision, but I know it's the right decision. I feel that. But now I have to look at myself and say, do I feel that because of something external? Am I very tired? So I think that taking a longer break here would be a good idea. <laughs> or do I actually feel that? So you need to zoom out and be able to look at yourself just like I do the dogs on my team and say, what is this? person feeling why do they feel this way what are they doing what's more important should i really be helping the dogs running or is it more helpful if i am resting on the sled so that i can take care of them the checkpoints so we have to start managing ourselves as well as the team i do think the biggest difference between being a younger musher and an older musher is that as, l as you get older speaking for myself you need more sleep so i believe the older mushers are more tired into the checkpoints into the race than the younger ones so have you spoken to your dad about that if he's more tired, feel the more he's your dad um, is. Oh man, there's so many. I, we have a great relationship, and I love giving him crap. So <laughs> <laughs> there's so many things I could say right now uh, about old mushers and <laughs> you know. Bring it Give us some good Bring stories, uh, Dallas. Yeah, I, you know, one thing I, I can speak to. My dad handles sleep deprivation very well, and a, a lot of the the mushers, it doesn't seem to be that big of an issue. I know my dad's back has been an issue, and this is something with older mushers that they just get beat up. And I know he can't be as physical on the sled running up the hills as I can. Um, but age is not a handicap in this sport. Again, 90% of what we do is coaching. On major sports teams, you don't see 25-year-old head coaches on the sideline. You see 40, <laughs> 50, 60, 70-year-old head coaches. Why? Because they're experienced. They know how to make the right call. So when I won the Iditarod at 25, 
that was, I mean, the 20-year average for the Iditarod champions was 17 years older than that, 47 years old. I th- or no, 42. Math, not good at the moment. But anyway, um, I was <laughs> much younger than the average age of an Iditarod champion. So what everybody was focusing on was athleticism. That's great. But what's valuable is experience. And so I think, you know, mushers get better and better and better as they get older, as long as they can stay physically fit enough. I will say that when I was 18, when I ran my first Iditarod, or 16, when I ran my first pro race, a 300-mile race, similar to the Bear Grease here, sleep deprivation was 10 times harder. It got much easier for me at about 21, 22. I started getting much better at the sleep deprivation. But when I was 18, it was terrible. But I could <laughs> ask you something. Do you, do you drink a lot of coffee while you race? Or do, you, do you drink something to make you awake? With things that, that that's a that's a good question. Coffee, um, for example? Everybody has their own preference. I drink coffee a lot all the time, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think it's unique for the race. Um, I do drink coffee on the race. I can also drink coffee on the race and get to a checkpoint and go to sleep 20 minutes later. So it's it's <coughs> not that big of a deal. I have on one of my early Iditarods, I drank uh, sports drinks, uh-huh. um, a very strong one, <laughs> mm. and I drank it in like the first six or seven days of the race. When I was getting tired at two, three in the morning and nodding off, I'd drink one of those and I'd be wide awake. On the eighth day of the race, I crashed because your body needs to go into that. We were talking a little bit a while ago about those micro sleeps and mm-hmm. being able to re- relax mm-hmm. on the sled and you don't want to go all the way to sleep, but you've got to let your body go into a little bit of a hibernation state. Um, so by drinking those energy drinks, that wasn't happening and it caused a huge problem. So now I don't drink anything other than coffee. I never which tried I energy drink. drink and I would never do it. I don't race. recommend it. No, I would never do the race <laughs> if I had never tried it before. And to me, I think it's all right to bring on natural things uh, like clean water or less artificial things like chocolate, for example, because I think uh, in the race you need uh, energy from Good, good, good food. Ingredients, yeah. yeah. Like we were talking a lot about nutrition and the dogs that they need to eat and snack. But what about the musher? I mean, you don't sleep much, but you need you need to eat. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess we heard a little bit there, but I'd like to hear what Nina says on that first, as far as like what what do you like to eat on the trail? I, is it- I'm really bad at eating on trail. I eat big, big meals at the checkpoints. I would eat big stew of reindeer meat. I would eat uh, whatever it's handed to me or made for me. Uh, but on the sled, I have big problems eating. That's one of my weak points, actually. Oh, in the longer runs, of course, I need to eat something, but I feel like everything is just growing in my mouth. If I have a piece of slice of bread, Ma doesn't taste me at all when it's uh, really cold. So what I've done is actually to uh, to peel an orange and I put the, the slices of orange, the boats, in a bl- plastic bag and I would just put the orange boats, <laughs> so to speak, in my mouth and just let them thaw in my mouth and get uh, the, 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 the liquid and also the taste. And then I also had, of course, a thermos with the hot drinks. But I, I'm really bad at eating. Yeah, you need to eat more than just an orange on a race. I, well, I <laughs> eat more than an orange, of course, but I mean, I eat really, really much at the checkpoints. Sure. So I think that's probably a slightly a difference between the Scandinavian races where you can have handler assistance and your handlers can provide you food. Or you might um, go into a cafe or at the in, checkpoints. in the checkpoints. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot more checkpoints that do have uh, food served there. A lot of the Alaskan races, it's very remote. And so the food that we have available to us flies out in the same bags mm. that we send out the dog food in. So it's <laughs> going to be frozen really solid. So you drop them um, in that food cooker. Yep. So when we're thawing the food for the dogs, I use my cooker. It's just a pot of boiling water and I'll have a slice of pizza seal mealed. So it's like a vacuum packed. So um, it's important here is that it's very thin because when it goes in that hot water, it needs to thaw quickly. So if you have a big burrito or something like that, it might take 15 minutes or something with a lot of air. Like if it has a bun on it, it just floats to the top and it doesn't thaw. So pizza in the checkpoints, but I do eat fairly well on the trail. I don't eat very much in the checkpoints. I survive on chocolate. I survive on chocolate um, because even when you're all bundled up, you can take a frozen Hershey's Kiss and throw it in down the top of your face mask, which is way up here, right? And it kind of comes down, you try to catch it in your mouth. (laughs) If you miss it, it ends up thawing on your body somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, a lot of beef jerky, like dried meat and um, crackers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like a sandwich if you have crackers and beef jerky that you're that you're eating and then coffee and juices. So 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 during a race like I did a rod, do you lose a lot of weight? I do. How much? Mm -hmm. Um, To be perfectly honest, 
prior to the race is so busy and stressful that I'm usually very light when I start the race mm -hmm. and oftentimes very sleep deprived before I start the race. And that's something I've really tried to get better at. Why? Uh, the week before the race is always mayhem. It seems like almost every year I'm building a new sled right before the race or replicating <laughs> You never learn, huh? Alaska sled. <laughs> you, uh, Dallas, you need time management class. Yeah, there's, well, there's just too much stuff and not enough time. But um, many years I'm up past 4 a.m., uh, like three or four days out of the seven days leading up to the race. I now have a thing that the night before the race, I go to bed at 8 o'clock and I take like a, a NyQuil or something that helps you go to sleep. I will go to bed at 8 o'clock. Whatever isn't done is just simply not going to get done. And I have that one night before the race. But to answer your question, um, I remember a couple of years ago, I finished the Iditarod at 133 pounds, I think. And I usually walk around at about 155 pounds. So I was light before the race. So I had lost some of that before the race. But I'm just saying the season is hard on us, especially the weeks leading up to the race. And then the race actually starts. And then you reach the finish line and you're a skeleton by the time you've reached the finish for me. Uh, quick guess. I will say that will be seven, eight kilos in the Norwegian terms. Uh, pounds to kilos. So. We get 20, yeah, oh, 23 whatever. or 22 pounds is going to be about 10 kilo. So well, you know, for me <laughs> that's it's, a lot of weight. It's, it's, uh, I also lose weight during the race, of course. And um, for me, it's cool. You know, I'm a woman. When I get to the banquet, my pants are too big. So, <laughs> <that's nice. laughs> so you actually take, I mean, you lose your weight, but you don't want your dogs to lose weight. No. You take more care of your dogs you don't you don't give but the dogs uh, actually have to run the distance yeah, right they're the yeah. ones that actually have to pull the sled and run down the trail and if i'm you know helping them and i get exhausted i can sit down for a second mm. they've got to keep going the whole time and my my time is much more valuable taking care of them because they are such superior athletes so my job is to get this team unit that includes the sled myself the dogs this team unit i have to get it to the finish line as quickly and efficiently and as easily as possible. And so I can deplete the human to help inflate the dogs, and that's the best use of my time. Um, I know my limits. I was in you know wrestling for many, many years. I've cut weight down to very light weights. I know where I can function. I know when I need to eat. I can manage myself. So I don't mind getting down very light, but I've got to make sure those dogs are 100%. Do you say you sit down. You, I mean, on the sled, you can actually sit down. You, you, how much time do you actually sit down and stand up? I mean, I have you an need example, to rest actually. a little bit. I have an example. Because of my bad back, the last famine race I did, I have a seat as well, like a sitting sled, as we call it. Most of the long-distance race amateurs do that now. <laughs> and I, uh, since I had a bad back uh, my last race uh, three years ago in the famine, I sat down, uh, I would guess, more than almost 60% of the, my race time. That's a lot. That's a lot. I was running up hills, of course, but most of the other times, going flat, a little bit downhill, I would sit down. I actually, um, I was actually the number five finishing that race, and I was so surprised because I did not help the dog as much as mm -hmm. I normally would do. So that mm -hmm. was extreme. But it's really nice to have a seat on your sled when you are going along stretches of uh, rivers, yeah. like in the Finnmark race, you have long stretches of rivers, like going on the Yukon in the river in the uh, Iditarod. It's really nice to have the possibility to sit down, just relax a little bit. You know, sit down and let your legs rest. Yeah, I, I would have a hard time saying over the course of a whole race. Again, I tend to break the race into sections. So in the first third of the race, I'm sitting down quite a lot. You're riding um, the brakes, right? Yeah, I'm on the brakes. Um, <laughs> and most of the time that I'm standing up, it's because I need to have better leverage on the brakes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't put enough pressure on the brakes yeah. when I'm sitting down. Um, towards the end of that first third, I am going to be helping the dogs, uh, of course, up the very steep hills where the speed you know, mm. comes down. Um, but I'm sitting quite a lot in the first third. The second third of the race, I'm probably running, either running beside the sled, particularly on the hills, or ski pulling on the flat ground, probably about 30 to 40% of the time. Um, may, again, towards the end of that last, or the middle third, it's probably closer to 50 to 60%. On the last third of the race, I'm running or ski pulling probably 75% of the time mm. that we're on the trail. Mm. So it's a majority of the time that I'm going to, be standing up, physically doing something. And then if you have a long, gradual downhill, I'll sit down. Or when we reach the top of a hill, I'll sit down and give my legs just a 20-second break as we go down the hill, and then I'll stand up and run up the next one. Whoever invented the sitting sled 
should have a Nobel Prize. Jeff King. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, King yeah. Comes yeah, 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 for yeah, the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I know, but we still have some Nobel Is it comfortable? You have your pillow to sit on and... Oh, there's a they're, they're <laughs> getting elaborate now. I mean, some of them are putting their cooker on the seat so that there's actually a little Look bit heated. Look at this coffee machine. Yeah, and all espresso this. machine back yeah, there. You yeah. know, sandwich shop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you guys listen to music when you're out there mushing? I don't. I no? I prefer the uh, sound of the na of the nature. That sounds pretty romantic. But I mean, I like to be in contact with uh, my um, the environment. Yeah, yeah, in the environment, right? Um, but I know you do. Yeah. No. Uh, not so much audiobooks. Not you? so much music. Mostly, I listen to audiobooks because oh, really? it uh, actually engages your brain a little yeah. bit. Um, music will put me asleep. <laughs> so. Uh, that's where you end up falling asleep on the Iditarod is when, or on any of these races, is when there's the rhythm, the pattern, nothing's really changing, and you know the, the dog's feet is hitting the snow and it's making that kind of constant patter, patter, patter sound. It just eases you to sleep. So I like having an audio book that your brain can engage in and you're actually thinking about what's happening. Of course, if something's going on, right? if there's a technical section of trail, I turn it yeah, off. And I do a lot without any stuff. But um, at night, it is nice to be able to plug in and listen to stuff. I know on the Iditarod, I always plan on listening to books. I always have it downloaded yeah. on my iPod or on uh, some player. Um, <laughs> How many books can you read in the Iditarod? How many well, books are you this able to? This is what I was going to say. Is <laughs> generally, I listen to very little. Like I, I plan on doing it on the race because I listen to books all year in the training. But come race time, I end up not doing it because I have my schedule that I have in there. It has all the distances and the times. And I've studied this up stuff so much. It's almost like a playbook where I have different plays for each section of the race. And I'm flipping through this. I'm trying to figure out what's best for the team. So I'm busy and I'm engaged with my, my schedule when I'm not doing that. I'm looking at each dog in the team for about a minute, a minute solid. Not just glancing at everybody, but you know, lead dog on the left. I'm just sitting there watching that dog for a minute. And then move to the next dog, next dog, next dog. And you kind of work your way through the team. When you get to the back, you go right back to the beginning. And so what I'm looking for is anything that's abnormal about this dog. Not a limp. Um, you shouldn't see that. But I'm looking for a dog that should be trotting at this speed and is instead loping. Or a dog that started pacing. And these are different gates that the, the dogs use on the trail. Because that change from what is normal for them is our very early warning sign. It doesn't mean something's hurt. It just means that the dog is utilizing different muscle groups, trying to shift it around a little bit. So that's what we're kind of watching on. We're busy. Uh, looking for lost booties. I mean, yep. if you're gonna <laughs> put a booty on a dog, you need to know who, is, who needs it, and you want to see that before you stop the sled to save time. When you, you were talking about, you know, the, the there are several levels you can do dog mushing, and you guys are obviously very professional, very experienced. And when you see, I'm gonna look at my lead dog, and I'm gonna next to the next dog, and just scrutinizing and see how things are doing. If you're a musher with less experience, and you're about to do one of your first races. How do you read your team when you don't have the trained eye? Well, that's a good question. Well, it's a difficult question. Yeah, no, I, I but think because I you, you you know you have to f look at your dogs, but how are you going to do that without the long experience that you guys have? Well, you got to start somewhere, yeah. right? So how many of these mushers are going to start is uh, working with another experienced musher that's been doing this. And maybe they're running, helping that musher train their dogs, um, learning kind of how it works. I have many mushers that come to our kennel and start mushing there, and they may go on to start their own kennel later on. But those mushers, I'm going to have them in a team behind me. And I'm so familiar with this that anything that's abnormal stands out really obvious to me. So I can look over my shoulder at the team behind me, you know, my own second team, and I can look back there for 10 seconds and turn around and see that there's a dog that has stepped over his neckline. <laughs> and so then I'll stop and say, you need to walk up your team, or first, you know, look at everybody, what's not right? You know, and then they'll look at, oh, okay, I see it. Or if they don't, say, walk up the team, look at every dog from the front, right? Because for me, it's just how the dog's head's moving, how its ears flopping, yeah. I know what's happening in its feet. Um, so what I was talking about looking at each dog for a span of time is even more important if you are not experienced because the more experienced the musher is, their, their eye is drawn to the thing that's not right. For a less experienced musher, they have to look for it a little harder. So again, this is all about being good at the basics. And that's also a thing that you should start. You should start with a smaller team. Yeah. But less, less going you on. fewer dogs, it's easier to have control and to have full quality uh, eyes on the, the different dogs. Yeah, if you're only having to watch six dogs or eight dogs, it's, you know, instead you're of 16 dogs, it's yeah, a lot easier. I mean, if you mesh two dogs, you're still a musher. 
it's a great uh, and interesting discussion we're having right now, I think. And we should have a look at what's going on in Beer Grease and have a look at the graphics on, on the race and have a slight update. What can we see here, uh, Nina and Dallas? All right, so we've got um, the top four mushers are into Mineral City Checkpoint. Um, that was Ryan Reddington, Keith Eiley, Ryan Anderson, and Martin Massacott still on the trail. We have Colleen Wallen. Um, and right behind her, I'm getting my stuff pulled up here, we have Blake Frecking just a little ways behind her on the trail. We should be seeing them into the checkpoint not too terribly long here. A little bit farther back, there's Blake Frecking in number six. Number seven, we have Nathan Schroeder. Um, He's a past champion of this race and has just kind of had a little bit uh, more steady run this time. And as we've talked to him throughout the trail, he keeps reporting that his team's just not quite catching that next gear. Very steady team, though. Moving back, we have Peter McClelland in number eight, Jennifer Frecking and her team of Siberians in position number nine. They're staying fairly close together. I think we got uh, McClelland pulling away a little bit here, but they're staying very similar speeds. Then we see a long gap on the trail uh, with not many mushers. Um, and we go back to Jay Fouché. Uh, she's coming along a little while behind. I'm hoping to see her reach the finish line this year. That would be really neat to see. Behind that, we have Laura Nice um, using this race to prepare for the Iditarod. Um, had a little bit of trouble early on taking a, a wrong turn and losing some time there. Still in the previous checkpoint of Skyport, we have Kevin Mathis. Lisa Dietzen and John Fisher was um, has dropped out of the race after having taken a wrong turn and gotten a little disoriented last night. Um, so we're now down to 13 teams in the race, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing Kevin Mathis and Lisa Dietzen leave that uh, checkpoint of Skyport not too long. Uh, these other mushers will kind of be trickling into the um, Mineral City checkpoint over the next while here, but the next one we should be expecting in um, is Colleen Wallen, followed by Blake Frecking. Sounds good. And now uh, we're going to have a look at a uh, little bit of the highlights of the, all the, the mushers that already has uh, arrived into the Mineral Center. <clears throat> yeah, in the in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series, we actually have a few different race structures yep. um, that allow different type of handler access and handler assistance. The Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon it allows the most handler assistance, like Nina was saying, where the dogs can help, yep. or you, the handlers can help take care of the dogs. Other races, the handlers can help take care of the musher, but not the dogs. Yet other races, like the Iditarod, there is no assistance. Mm -hmm. It is just the musher and the dogs. Nobody can help you. I wanted to take a look here with uh, Ryan Reddington. Um, he He's got eight dogs into this checkpoint, I believe, yep. um, in his team. So that's plenty of dog power. I think we've heard you know, Bruce Lee in the field, Greg Heister in the field, and us here at the desk as well, what? talking about the different number of dogs. Okay, coming in here, Keith we have Keith Eiley. Yeah. yeah, coming in. Now, he's got, I think, an 11-dog team coming in here. Um, Nice-looking gang. He was about two miles uh, uh, behind uh, Ryan, so... That was 3.5 kilometers or a little bit more than two months. Yeah. No, that's a nice looking dog team. Sorry, I was just focusing on dogs there for a second, trying to see what these guys look like. Nice looking dog team. Everybody's moving pretty smoothly. Um, and he's got a full 11 dog team, or a, a, I shouldn't say a full, they started with 12 dogs, but an 11 dog team. That's pretty Reddington good. has an eight dog team. What I was noting from last year is Reddington came into the same checkpoint last year with nine dogs and left with six. Um, and then this, this next run proved to be very challenging. He had a run time of almost twice as long as some of his competitors. So while Ryan Reddington has a commanding lead, um, as last year's evidence of, everything can still change. So yeah, it's going to be Because really he was in lead at the same moment, the same as checkpoint last year. He had year. about a two hour lead yeah. at this point and last year. And, yeah. and yeah. he ended up taking about four hours longer mm -hmm. on the next run. So it's easy to say, oh, we got us a winner and it's looking <laughs> clear. But no, everything oh. can change. Um, I've had races that it has all changed in the last, you know, 30 miles of the race, 40 miles of the race. Um, in fact, one of my Iditarod wins, I finished and I thought I was in third place because uh, when I had passed the other mushers, they were off the trail and it was a very bad storm. So and everything can change and the musher is not always aware of what's going on out there either. Mm -hmm. A little bit back to what we were talking about, the, the handlers out at the checkpoint and the difference between mm -hmm. the, the, the events in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. Um, the big race, uh, you can, you're allowed to use the handlers and they can help you out. Is it also um, a different level of mushers, uh, their, their performance level or their experience? Is it also 
adapted to the measures to take place in these races, like like the more performance guys and those are experienced do the I'd add a rod here there are measures that are not that experienced so you could, you could have more help or I think you're gonna see overlap in all of that uh, I know we got another team coming in here very soon uh, oh. so I'm gonna answer that question in a yeah. second but this coming one in first. here yeah we got another Let's nice looking team this is Keith Eiley again um, coming in the checkpoint I'm seeing a lot of happy dogs smiling faces <laughs> and a not so happy looking musher <laughs> he's just from he's focused very tiny. Say that. he's yeah, focused yeah, here yeah. Um, you know, they're all looking good. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him leave at least one dog behind here. Right. I'm seeing probably one, maybe more. But, but Dells, do you remember the time difference between uh, Ryan Reddington and Keith Ailey? Because uh, Ryan's got to rest 15 minutes more, I suppose, because he's still, he needs four hours rest. They're all going to need to take four hours. I know, I know, but yep. he still has 15 minutes. Uh, he needs to take extra. If I'm no, I, I believe long. he's taken 15 minutes extra. Uh, we, we can take a look at that here yeah, in a second. Yeah, because but, they might um, get close. Yeah, no, it is going to be interesting to see how much time we have between these two mushers coming into this checkpoint. Now, it's, again, important to remember that these two mushers are actually running from the same kennel. Um, so I don't think that means there's any cooperation necessarily, but uh, from that kennel particularly, they're sitting in a pretty good position because even if Ryan were to have trouble, kind of like he did last year, and not be able to post another fast run time for this last leg, um, your second pick is Keith Ailey. So <laughs> I think it's kind of, uh, they've got, they're in a good position right now. A very nice looking dog team here. I like seeing perky dogs, wagon tails. You see the handlers are having to hold pretty hard here. The mushers got both feet on the brake. This is not a tired dog team. This is a team that's, that's ready to, you know, keep on trucking. Mm, they have and more under their belt. Yeah. Huh? So we have a little, little uh, have highlights there. package coming in. Um, Nina, let's talk a little bit about the area that the Beer Gris, uh, Marathon is taking place. These uh, trails are all on the west side of the Lake Superior, the Great Lakes of the uh, United States, all north, close to the Canadian border. And in this particular area here in the last part of the race, these are native uh, areas, Native American areas. We have reservations here, and especially here where they are right now at the Mineral Center, that's a very, very uh, decent place. It's not much going on right here. This used to be... Come along, Dallas. Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> this area, these, uh, the Mineral Center is actually just an intersection, a road crossing, actually, a road intersection. This used to be the old uh, main road to from the States and to Canada until they built a new road. So that's the Mineral Center area. As long as the last part of the race, the last uh, the last leg of the race, will go in loops out from Mineral Center, like different loops coming back without going into the checkpoint, and then they will go to the finish line, which is actually at this very moment the finish line is actually in one straight line, only five miles away from Mineral Center, but they'll make the trail longer by these loops. The f finish line will be in uh, Grand Portage, which is has a very cultural, historical, interesting uh, story. Uh, that's where the Native Americans traded their fur from uh, hunting with the Frenchmen in the 17th century. And mm -hmm. later on, the Brits took over in the 18th century. And uh, they had... Um, so this is like a fur trading area between the Europeans and the Native Americans. And the, the word portage means like a passage or like an area they had to carry their canoes and their equipment uh, from water system to water system, like a, uh, without touching water. And that's where they met. So it has a lot of interesting uh, cultural, historical uh, points is. And also uh, at the last part of the last leg, they touch very close to the Canadian border, close to a river called um, Pigeon River. And these areas are beautiful. We have some national parks here as well and with beautiful waterfalls, gorges. Uh, well, it's a really nice area. I have been looking at the picture and I would really like to go there. And then in Grand Portage, where the finish line is, that's a small community, actually. It, basically, it's a place where you would go and have as a base uh, if you're going to do outdoor things like canoeing, skiing, snowshoeing. And it's also consists of a lot of casinos, actually. So this is pretty close, just some miles from the Canadian border. After three days of broadcast and coverage of the races, it's uh, it's 
it gives you you want to go there. <laughs> what do you think, uh, Dallas? What was I I think it's very likely that I'll be uh, competing in this race next year. Um, you know, I was I was signed up for this race previously and was you know looking at uh, going there. So I had done a little bit of research on the race. I have followed this race, or at least been aware of this race since I was very little. Right, this was kind of the the big race in in the lower 48, as we call it, mm -hmm. um, the continental U.S. So it's one that's very historic. It's been around for a long time. It's a little bit of a different mushing. Um, Group. I don't know what the right word would be, but you know, I don't want to say different mushing culture, but it's a different you know group of people that are primarily competing down there, and so I would really like to get down to this race, and I'm excited to do this uh, probably next year, but I will do it. Uh, I would love to do all the races can at some I, point. Can in my I life. mush your B team? <laughs> 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 but how, how long time will it take to get from Alaska down here? Actually, it'll take some days. You no, know, I was driving. actually sorting that out. It was it's quite a long drive, yeah. but you can also fly the dogs. Obviously, I've flown entire teams of dogs over to Norway. Um, it is a process, but it's a lot less of a process to fly from Alaska to Minnesota than it is from Alaska to Norway. So it would be probably we probably take a flight. Um, but my lead dog's kind of preppy, so he wants to fly first class, so that gets a little more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark and Massacott's come all the way from Quebec in Canada. We'll plan everything, that the logistic part of the next year's uh, Big Race. But first, we're going to go to Greg and Bruce with an update from the Mineral Center. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Mineral Center. Greg Heister and Bruce Lee. And we are waiting another dog team, we're being told, shortly. Could be a minute, could be 10 minutes, but it should be Blake Frecking. But we want to update you, and, and, and it's possible they're already doing that back at the studio. We can't hear uh, what's going on there in Norway because of communication, because we're out here in the middle of nowhere, frankly, and so that makes it very difficult. But we do have the number, so let's go through it. Ryan Reddington will leave first at 1228 locally. Right. That's that's here. Right, and, and this is what the officials are saying right here. They're the ones now, the race marshals here, the race judges, and they're calculating the times. And they went through this, and they got adjusted a number of times. So we don't know what they're seeing on, like you said, the screen with the computer, yeah. but this is the times they're going to go out here local time. So, yeah, 1228 for Ryan yeah, Reddington. Which, let's make this easier. So what time is it right now here? It is uh, 20 to 11. So in if, if you consider it this way, uh, the, top, the top of the next hour, 28 minutes after, so depending on what a time zone you're in, it's 1228 locally, and it is tw uh, 20 minutes before 11 now here. And then we have Keith Eiley going out at at 101, yeah. which is so the difference there. The breakdown is he's going to be going out second, and there's a 33 minute time difference between them. It can be made up yes. in 40 miles, but he's going to have to work for that. And then we have Ryan Anderson's official time out here at the checkpoint at 133. So again, we've got a 35 minute. 136. Yeah, at 136. And between him and, and Keith, who is in second place, then we've got a 35 minute gap between them. And again, that can be made up, yes. but he's going to have to work for it. I will remind everybody the reason uh, Ryan Anderson felt like he didn't make up more time was because he had to load a dog. So that could happen to any of these guys and slow down their run. And then we have Martin going out the fourth one here at 1.58 local time. Yeah, so to run through these numbers again, so Ryan Reddington, a 33-minute lead when they leave here over Keith Eiley, and then Ryan Reddington with a one-hour and eight-minute advantage on Ryan Anderson when the top three teams will leave here. So a lot to be decided, certainly first and second, not decided with a 33-minute lead, although it is a significant lead with 40 miles to go. But the battle for second and third also uh, wide open. And so, and, and Bruce, I know you've been around this for, for a very long time and you've been in these races. You want to win, but at the end of the day, you're here to race. So whether it's first place, second place, third place, or 10th place, you're still going to try to take down the team that's in front of you. Yeah, you want to sh you want to get the performance out of the dogs that you think they're capable of giving you gracefully. So, And that means to race, show off what they can do and give them the opportunity. So whether you're racing for first and second or 
fourth and fifth, you're good. The, the, the dogs and the mushers are going to race just as hard for those positions. Yeah. And just to, to add a little color. So again, right behind us in this historical cabin, man, there are some people in there cooking up some beautiful vittles. We've got homemade chili and cornbread in there. And the other, there was potato. Well, we had, ham, wild, they had sort of uh, wild rice uh, chowder that was in there. And wild rice is one of the traditional native foods yes. from this area it grows wild out in the lakes here and northern minnesota is really known for wild rice and it's a traditional uh, indigenous to the area wild food so that was great for them to share with us yeah and if we can pan the camera down to the left or, or maybe they can just take one of the other cameras i don't want to direct from on site here but you see all the dog trucks that are now in here uh, anticipating other teams and their arrivals you can see everybody milling around some are fans uh, some are checkers some are support crew and then those in the uh, bright yellow or bright orange jackets or vests they're actually uh, volunteers that are helping uh, the Bear Grease uh, hierarchy kind of get this race together. So they're support crew for, for anything and, and everything that could happen uh, uh, here. So, again, we're just reminded on a daily basis on this trail how important these volunteers are. Uh, kind of an update on the weather. It is warming up. You can see on the horizon down there the sun starting to, to poke through. A few flurries falling. They are flurries today. They're not embers from a fire behind us. That's <laughs> what was happening the other day at Highway 2 when we thought that were, at least I thought that was snow. It was actually embers coming from the fire. <laughs> but it's one of the more funny moments on the trail. There is a fire going over there. They love their they love their campfires here in Minnesota, that's no doubt. Hey, I might let's... mention, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. We're out here and, and times are being figured on paper. There's not internet and all of that. And they might wonder, well, how are you guys getting this yeah. out to us? As I look over your shoulder, it's a real collision in cultures. It is. Because we have a historic dovetail jointed <laughs> log cabin and behind it, you can see the truck that we managed to get here with a satellite dish to upload this. Yeah. It's like worlds colliding, dogs, uh, historic cabins, yes. and connecting on a satellite to get this yeah. out. If you're familiar with, with Star Trek, it's very similar to being teleported, right? <laughs> and so uh, we don't have a lot of connection out here. We don't have connectivity to, in, in a general sense, with Wi-Fi or Internet or even cell phones. It's not even electricity. Yeah, it's, but we've had to go general. to outer space uh, to beam these pictures back. And so uh, we appreciate everybody's effort. There's a, a lot of people here as members of our crew that have been working very hard over these four days. So general thoughts, and I know we'll get a, an opportunity probably to do the same when we get the Grand Portage later day, today and, and for the championship, but this is your first opportunity. This is my first opportunity to come to Minnesota and to see this Bear Grease, a race that we have heard about uh, for so, so many years. And so some general thoughts now on this event in, in the eyes of, of Bruce Lee. Well, I'm really impressed with the community support and all the volunteers that make this race happen. And the energy level from northern Minnesota to support this race and all along the North Shore here, Lake Superior, is is really impressive and that's great to see that energy for these dogs and dog mushing as a sport um, i'll say when the race started the first areas we were in were fairly settled around duluth and i went what are we doing racing around neighborhoods you know <laughs> and i guess it's the same thing in anchorage but i've got yeah. used to that and i did a ride but you know what's coming but as we've come up the north shore of lake superior here Really impressive rural countrysides, uh, rolling hills, uh, northern boreal forests, and of course always that gigantic lake out there uh, that's in the distance that we're traveling along Lake Superior. So it, it's it's a it's a feeling of real a real northern uh, just environment and hospitality, and we're just miles. We're a stone's throw from the Canadian border right now yeah. so yeah it feels really good and the enthusiasm for sled dog mushing here is very much alive yeah I was just gonna follow up with that that you know we spent a lot of time around uh, dog teams and, and mushers and, and the lifestyle in the state of Alaska and of course mushing very much alive here but what I'm finding out is that it's very much alive in the state of Minnesota as well when you consider there are over 50 teams in this race uh, this year 
you, who knows how many more kennels are out there that we're unable to get a team together for uh, this year's Bear Grease. But there are a lot of people in this community that love these dogs, that love this lifestyle, and they still dream and desire to travel across these landscapes on a dog team. And, yeah. and these are tremendous images. Yeah, and let's remember, it's a part of the native heritage here. We yeah. are in a northern climate, and just like John Bear Grease delivered mail, and you should know that he's not... In those settings, they don't have 12 dogs and the mushers riding behind. They used in northern, northeastern Canada and the northern United States, they used toboggan sleds, which were a flat sled. They load them with gear, and, more, and the mushers weren't riding. They were usually on snowshoes out front in, of the dogs, and the dogs were pulling the supplies behind them. So it's a different thing than we're seeing with racing. It's still sled dogs, depending your survival, depending on the dogs, the dog's survival, depending on your care. It's still that same mutual thing. But dogs throughout these northeastern parts of North America are a part of this landscape. And here they ran often because of the thick forest, uh, one dog in a row, just single tandem, yeah. we call it. So it's always one dog behind another dog, where in Arctic areas like Alaska and uh, where you had open tundra, you had more room, so you ran them in tandem side by side. And then you get to Greenland, and it's a different environment, yeah. and the people adapted, and they're on sea ice, so you don't want your dogs all going uh, in a single line in case there's a break in the ice. So there they run a fan hitch, and each dog is individually th tethered, and they can spread out in a fan shape. And it's just interesting how the indigenous people adapted their use of sled dogs and how they ran them to what the environment uh, set up for the conditions they would be in. And it should be pointed out too, back in the day when John Bear Grease was uh, delivering mail in the wintertime along Lake Superior, he didn't have 12 dogs. I read that he oftentimes would do those runs with four or five dogs. Yeah, I talked to his great grandson and he said actually he did some mail runs with three dogs and they would pull a sled with hundreds of pounds of mail and supplies for people so but he said typically it was a four dog team with him on snowshoes out front and them pulling a toboggan sled yeah and how great i hope you saw that interview earlier today with the great grandson of, of john bear grease and and when i asked him the question about um you know, is there pride that wells up still to this day in the Bear Grease family when this dog race begins every January? I don't know if you noticed, he got emotional. Yeah. The, the tears welled up into his eyes. And so, uh, again, we're reminded, you know, we're here to cover a dog race. We, we love uh, the dogs and, and we love what these people are choosing to do and to be in this lifestyle. But for so many others, this race commemorates something very very much different mm -hmm. and it affects everybody differently yeah it's it represents history and mm -hmm. a continuation and adaptation of that history and i've noticed in this area just looking at people you know the fans that are here i've seen people in the traditional uh northern capone jackets uh <laughs> mucklucks and we saw the fur you know yeah, hats Fisher and King, ruffs yeah. and and that's a part of this landscape too and it's it's history it's relationship with the land yeah and i like that yeah and i hope uh, for those that are out there that maybe haven't been to this part of the united states uh this territory is big and i am just still shocked and i gave those stats the first day of the race how big lake superior is and it's almost like when you're driving along it and you look out there it's it's like looking out across an ocean it's not like looking yeah, out it across. is, it is an is. ocean yeah. and, and i can only imagine uh throughout the years in these 36 years of this race that mother nature had to throw a lot at these dog teams at times a lake that big can can create its own weather uh, certainly there's a lot of wind uh, that would come down it and it's not covered with ice this year but I'm sure there's years when that lake has been covered with ice and so you I'm sure you get cold winds uh, that could really rear up uh, off that lake as well yeah well like they said here it was 30 below last year so yeah we're at, and that lake effect is a part of it you know and and this lake it, it has a lot of history too like we were talking about just previous here I mean this was the way people, the voyagers, got around and explored the North Country, meeting the native people of the area and finding out where 
uh, rivers went that fed into this, uh, trappers making their way along the, the shoreline and the Great Portage, the Grand Portage, which we're going to, that opened up all of the Northwest Territories of Canada. There's a lot of history here. Yeah. Okay, and so from this point forward, when uh, Ryan Reddington will be the first team out of here, what was it, 1238, 1233? No. No, he's 33 minutes, 1228. 1228, he'll leave out of here. And so actually, as the crow flies, it's only about seven miles to the finish line. But as the trail goes, it's about 40 miles. So they had to do a lot of crisscrossing out there. Right, and to make sure that they get the mileage that they needed to keep this as an Iditarod qualifier. Mm -hmm. Anytime you do crisscrosses like that through the forest, and I'm sure there's a lot of recreational snow machine trails out there, a lot can happen. It's not just a straight line now to the finish line. There's right. a lot of twists and turns. And that's an element we haven't talked about as far as the race within the race and, and these guys all being with, we'll just call it approximately 30 minutes of each other. Laura Nice took a wrong turn back there at one of the other checkpoints, yes. and she lost an hour. So you, there's just so many elements that can affect who gets to the to the finish line first. You can have the fastest and best team, and you make a turn out here and go two miles out of your way and then have to turn around and come back two miles. You've lost 20, 30 minutes right there. And so it does sound like a fairly confusing trail because of the different loops they're doing out there, circling around and crisscrossing. Yeah. And it's a really heavily used snow machine recreational area. So there are hundreds of trails in this country where people come up here and ride on the weekends. Yeah, and I've been told that our satellite window will go to the top of the hour. That may be changing, I'm not sure, but the last time I was told that's true. So we're going to try to keep it here and keep the uh, the conversation going until we get another dog team in here. We believe it's Blake Frecking, our, our defending champion, and he's had another great race. We've enjoyed hanging out with Blake uh, throughout these 250 or so miles uh, in this race, and, and he brought a team here this year that uh, is not the same team that he won with a year ago. So uh, there was a, kind of a fact finding mission for him he wanted to find out if, if these dogs had it in him or in them to to go ahead and, and win the race but he's been great to get to know even more yeah he's always jovial and uh real great with the fans and and just enjoys being out and like he was saying their whole family loves just living out they've committed that life of being out having a kennel living off the grid pretty traditional lifestyle and you know one of the elements is it, in thinking about it, last year's 30 below, this year it's been 30 above. That changes the performance of a dog team. Even though he has a different team, those little things make a difference on how one team runs compared to another. So weather makes a difference, soft trail versus hard trail. All those things we've been trying to explain about the dynamic of this sport. And you could change the weather by 60 degrees and have a different first team in here. Yeah, for sure. And, of course, Bruce and I will be live at the finish line when the eventual champion gets there. What will these dog teams do? They've just run 300 miles over a few days. They will go home uh, to their kennel. When will they run again? When, when will training continue? When will preparation begin for the next race? Most mushers, like everybody has their own protocol on how they handle their Dogs, but most mushers will give their dogs three or four days off just for those little muscle dings and hits to to heal up real well. And then you'll take them out on a short training run just to look them over, let them stretch out a little bit. Uh, I guess I should back up. The first thing that will happen is over the next few days, those dogs will get walked a lot, not running. But the handlers will put them on a lead and just walk them around, get them up, let them feel good, stretch their muscles out. Uh, some mushers like Martin Boozer and others, they will turn them all loose and just let them run around and be free. And it's the same thing, a, a light exercise just to stretch out. The dogs are going to sleep a lot. And then, and then usually a short run, like a short run for a sled dog is 10 miles or so, you know, a five, 10 mile loop to look at the dogs over. And then Ryan Reddington is heading right off to another race. I don't know the exact date of it, but it's coming up here close, the UP 200. So these guys are going right back into it. And then he'll make his trip north for the Iditarod. 
If I can get our director in the truck, Art Aldridge, to answer this question for me. Art, are we still staying on until the top of the hour? Has the window been extended? Okay, I'm not hearing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll just continue on, and, and hopefully Blake, Blake will get here before we, we have to sign off. He may not. Uh, and then if the picture goes out, you, you understand why. Well, it, it is a long season for these sled dogs, and really the racing season for many of them is we're halfway into it or so now. Uh, and some I know in, in the world that we cover most, like uh, they only run the Iditarod. Uh, but a team like, obviously, like Ryan, he's, he's already running a race. He's running this one. He's got uh, another race coming in a week or two, right, the UP200. UP200, and, you know, up, up north in Alaska, they've already had uh, the, Copper the Copper Basin, Basin 300, the Cusco 300. There's a whole circuit around the world of these different races yeah. that are run. So mushers are going to those, and... Yeah, you said it's kind of a long season to a musher. It's a really short it's season. It's too short, yeah. You know, the worst thing <laughs> is summer. seeing the snow melt. That's just such a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> and Christmas Day, and I've, a lot of us have said this, the peak of the year, New Year's celebration, Christmas, and yeah. Thanksgiving rolled into one yeah. is the beginning and the end of the Iditarod. Yeah. That's where the year begins. And, yeah, it's a short season. It's not a long season if you love doing this. Yeah, and I, I follow several mushers on social media, obviously, and it's always fun to watch them with their wintertime posts in July when they're reminiscing about what uh, they they dream about most and they can't wait for winter when, you know, 98% of the rest of the world is enjoying their days on the summer beach or, mm -hmm. or out camping in the summertime with their family. It's We're, mushers that are dreaming. And some winter. stay in perpetual winter yeah. because... Got a dog team. Yeah, got one. Yeah. I don't see it. But yeah. you can explain. Uh, in Alaska now, they take their dogs up onto the glaciers. You yeah, went up do. onto the glaciers and yeah. and filmed there. You could explain a little bit about that. I'll watch for a dog team here. But yeah, yeah this, you got to see that. Yeah, I went up uh, on one of the glaciers just out of Seward and hung out with uh, a tour operation. I know the, the CVs are, are up there. Linwood Fiedler, a, a longtime Iditarod veteran, has a, a tour company that's up on a glacier outside of Juneau. And so, yeah, some of these dogs, you're right, are spending 12 months out of the year uh, on their native snow. And so uh, we do have a team coming. Everybody kind of hustling, bustling. The cameras are rolling. Everybody's iPhones are out here. So it should be Blake Frecking. And I believe, well, we've, we're just after 11. Art, are we still on? Thumbs up? Okay, we're staying on, I'm being told. So that's really good. It should be Blake Frecking uh, any moment here. And you can see up in the red coat there, that's dog a, Okay, dog team. There is the official, official statement. Modi. Yeah, and, and Bruce, what do you see? You're, you're the guy. Well, they look happy coming in here. They look like uh, <clears throat> nice and smooth, and it's not Blake. Jim. No, it's no, Colleen. Colleen, Colleen yeah, surprised us with the data we got in here. Yeah, Colleen is here. Not nine dogs? Yes, sir. Okay. Nice run. Hey, thanks, you Hi, guys. Hi, Colleen. Hey. How How's it, how'd it feel? It felt good. Yeah, you're, you're running yeah. great. Typical day run. <laughs> yeah, but good. Yeah. But good. A little bit of everything. Fast, yeah. slow, fast, slow. Lakes, fun. Yeah, they yeah. look lively. They do, yeah. yeah. They're ready for a little snooze and a little food, and um, so they're normal. Yeah. Yeah. And so. a run to the finish line. Right. Are you ready for that, or do you want the trail to continue? Well, how far? I mean, we could go back to Duluth and <laughs> do it like the old days, yeah. the old Bear Grease. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it'll be good. We're, we're running the way we train, so we're ready for the finish line. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. Right, and welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Either from Vern Schroeder or some mini donuts. Oh, mini donuts. We enjoyed I some of those. corn dogs on the trail about yeah. um, an hour no, ago. Well, you're going to enjoy those mini donuts. Yes. They're still hot. All right, Vern. Yeah, they're good. Covered with All some right. nice cinnamon brown sugar. Yeah sugar Pretty and uh, she'll enjoy those a lot well that was a surprise by the data that we had got trail it was. trail data trail data yeah just through. but uh, man they look nice yeah. they look perky they're really smooth i like seeing a smooth dog too yeah. and you've heard me say that before i like them where they're just a nice even gait and yeah. uh, boy she's perky so yeah. 
you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's a nice run for her. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to wrap up our coverage from here for now. We've got to get the satellite truck tore down and get it moved up to the finish line as we prepare for another championship here at the Bear Grease. And I'm sure those watching the tracker and you guys back there at the desk probably knew exactly who was coming in. We don't have communication, certainly don't have the ability to check that tracker. So Colleen is our next musher in. For now, we're going to sign off from Mineral Center, but we'll be catching up with everyone very soon from Grand Portage and the finish line of the Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. Back to you. Thank you so much, Greg and Bruce. Hurry up down to Grand Portage to give us a lots of interviews of the mushers, of the atmosphere at the finish area. And in the meantime, we're going to talk a little bit about, we just saw uh, Colleen Valine coming in to the, to, to the Mineral, Mineral Center. City checkpoint there. Yeah. No, it looks like a nice looking dog team to me. Um, she's obviously perky and upbeat about how things are going here. Um, seems to be doing quite well in this race. She's quite some time behind the leaders, but having a very good race. And you know, here we see the team coming in. You know, just like Bruce was saying in the field, what I like to see is a steady team where everybody's pulling. Um, it's a good gang, lively, they're alert, they're looking around, checking out the, the scenery as they're pulling into the checkpoint. She's having a great race. She's having a really good race. And uh, again, everybody has different kind of goals in this race. So I think she's probably pretty pleased with how things are going right now. Yeah, she seems like a quite easygoing woman, huh? She, mm -hmm. She's not stressed. She's enjoying the ride. and Then there's also a, probably a little bit of, um, when you're, like it or not, you always end up racing the teams around you, right? You might not be racing for first position, but there's teams behind you and teams ahead of you. I think she's looking at a solid dog team. There's a big enough gap ahead of her that she's not concerned with catching up in, with the teams in front of her. Um, there's a, not that long of a gap behind her. But it should be a nice stress-free run for her, not worrying about catching up with other teams. So it makes it easier for the musher in, a little, in some ways. What about the numbers of dogs? The, did we have a manage to see how many yeah, dogs she was coming nine. in with? She's yep. good nine. Nine? She had nine out of Skyport, and she's still good nine in, uh, in the gang line. Oh, okay. Yep. All, yeah. all looked good and yeah. pulling strong. Um, again, <laughs> we see happy dogs, wagging tails, um, you know, leaning into the harness. They're ready to go find <laughs> some food here. And this is, uh, again, middle of the day, so they're not... Uh, no, it's not their normal sleeping time or anything like that. So <coughs> we're going to see probably them go and eat a good meal, uh, take a little snooze here, and get ready for a nice fun run over to the finish line. And hopefully she'll get a short nap in here as well, just since it is kind of well, you know, she's middle of the day really, makes it harder. But you know, but she's really familiar with the trail as well because she's done it many, the sure, what, what many times before. 21 times? Well, it was a lot yeah. of times. Yeah, yeah. She's a local. <laughs> yeah. She, lives close to uh, one of the first checkpoints actually mm -hmm. yeah so i think i think she's in a, a good position to have a successful race right and again that you don't have to win the race to have a successful race and she seems to be running a, a good race that she can be very proud of how the dogs performed and like we talked about before what i enjoy most about this is watching a team develop and do well and have a successful race and a successful race for them means finishing with a strong team mm -hmm. and feeling like yeah we did a good job out mm -hmm. here regardless of if somebody else has a faster team so what can we now we have the five team, teams in do can we expect any surprises coming up in the fifth leg, in the last leg? Well, if you expected it, it wouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but is there a good chance that there will be a surprise? Absolutely. I mean, That's we've a got good... teams that are spaced out, uh, like you're sitting in the field, about 30 minutes apart, uh, a little bit less for some of them. And so I think it's quite likely if something happens, it could cause the order to change. Now, I can't predict if something unpredictable is going to happen. But if something happens, they're close enough together where they can't afford to make a major mistake. So if somebody gets lost, if somebody needs to load you know, one dog or certainly two dogs in their sled, and that could change it. So as a musher, when you're strategizing and deciding which dogs to bring with you, whether the musher has seven dogs or eight dogs isn't going to make a difference um, of half an hour. What will make a difference of, eight, uh, of a half an hour is if you take eight and you need to carry that dog in your sled. So at this point in the race, a dog that is not 100% becomes a liability because carrying that dog could cause you to slow down by half an hour. If you do the run, just start out with one less dog, that won't cost you half an hour. So it's a safety move to drop down to your smaller, more solid team and probably also a smaller, faster team in some cases. So certainly when I'm in this position in a race, I'm thinking about risk management. So if there's a 
10% chance that this dog is going to have an issue or a 2% chance, I want to leave that dog behind. I don't want the, the elevated risk, and leaving the dog behind isn't going to change my performance, only if I have to carry that dog. If we have a little, we have a lot of uh, social media questions, people are sending us questions, so I can ask you guys here at the studio. There's one question here, like Reddington, Massicot and Nice is running for Iditarod this year. Which do you like the best for that race, based on what you're seeing here at, at the Beer Grease? That's, that's a tough question. Um, you know, Laura Nice is uh, kind of hard to get a read on here. She's running a steady race. I think what she's doing now is very good training for the Iditarod. But it's how she's running this race is not giving us, as spectators, a lot of information about the team, which is fine. She could have the best team um, on the Iditarod. But we're we're not getting that insight here because she's mm. not really racing at the front. Um, Martin Massacott, and I, I, let me go back to Laura Nice real quick. She was a rookie in the 2017 I did a rod, mm. successfully ran that race in about 10 days, three hours, which is a very respectable time mm. for a rookie in the I did a rod. That's a real race. Um, anything at that 10 day mark, you're not lollygagging, as we she say. Was number you're, you're moving along right down the trail. She finished in 42nd place. Yeah. That's a good finish. Um, but you're still well off the racing pace. Martin Massacott is a rookie in this year's Iditarod. However, he's not a rookie 2,000 mile races. He has finished the 2003 Yukon Quest and finished sixth place in that one. I'm really liking his team. Ah, so, uh, yeah, you like his team. So last one there was Ryan Reddington. Just mm -hmm. to touch on him real quick. Um, Ryan's our wild card here. You know, he has the ability to do the Iditarod very well. I would say of these teams, he's probably got you know, he's got 24 dogs that started this race. He's got the depth in the kennel. Um, he's had good Iditarod finishes before. Uh, I think his best finish is 14th in the 2017 Iditarod. That's a respectable finish. Twice he's been in the top 20 of the Iditarod. However, the reason I say wild card is because he's done very well in these races and not finished. So I think Ryan, what we'd see from him is he's either going to do really well <laughs> or may not make the finish line. So that's that's a tough thing from an analysis standpoint to say what's going to happen. But I'll be honest with you, I am really liking Martin Massacott's team, yeah. the way he's running this race. He's on a serious schedule and the team's handling it very well. That's a team that could be very, I mean, honestly, I'm seeing this team thinking that could be rookie of the year in the Iditarod. <laughs> and he has a lot more experience than just Yukon Quest uh, and the Bear He's done a lot of races in the Quebec area as well. All right, yeah. So this is this is Martin's team coming into mm -hmm. the to the um, last checkpoint there, the Mineral City checkpoint. That at 250 miles into a race is exactly what we want to see on the Iditarod. All these teams look great. This team looks phenomenal. <laughs> you know, so that's that's kind of the thing. Okay. Again, these other guys are focusing on racing though. So, well, you got your, your answer to your question. The what the person that sent us that. Another one uh, for you, but you guys. Last year, Ryan had an issue with a final leg in flat tire Alaskan style. What might be some what might be some causes of a dog team to shut down or parking? Yeah, this is a really tough one to kind of discuss here. So we've said it many times over the course of this last couple of days that we've been calling following this race, but realistic expectations. That's very, very important. So if you think that this team can go 11 miles an hour the whole way and you go 11 miles an hour the whole way, great. But if um, you misjudge that and go too fast in the beginning, you don't have enough fuel to make it all the way to the finish. Now, in my mind, I see two different forms of you know stopping on that last run. One is a proactive stop where the musher recognize their mistake. They set a pace too fast in the beginning and they take the initiative and say, all right, guys, instead of doing this last 40 miles, we're going to break it into two 20 mile runs. And we're going to finish strong. That's the correct move at that point. So if it's by the musher's choice, what is not good is if it's by the dog's choice where the dogs have to make that call and they say, look, you know, we've, we're stopping here. We need more rest, right? So that's really a touchy area. From my perspective as a musher, I never, ever, ever want to put the dogs in a position that they have to make that call that we need extra rest. It always needs to be the musher's decision, and it's the musher's responsibility to give them the rest they need when they need it. Um, so what can cause that is generally a, a little bit too brisk of a pace early on. Perhaps um, if the dogs encountered something like a sickness that the musher couldn't really anticipate for, um, usually it's going to be something along that, those lines, but typically we see too of a pace in the beginning causing soreness and or fatigue. But it has a little bit to do with experience as well, would you say? But I mean, lots of these measures are really experienced, so it might happen to the experienced ones as well. But uh, Anybody can make a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, another question for Dallas this time. Do you ever make relatively late changes in the team prior to the race given forecast conditions? An example, shower, uh, slower, slower trail, fast, cold trail forecast, etc., etc. Yeah, I'm yes and no. I'm going to go back to what we talked about before with picking our teams. I think we generally have a 10 or 11 dog core that are the best dogs in almost every condition. I like training my dogs in such a way that they are ready for a broad spectrum of environment because on a race like the Iditarod, we are going to see cold, we are going to see warm, we are going to see deep snow, we're going to see fast trails. So I try to train a team that's not specialized in one category, but can handle everything. Yeah. So as a result of that, my top dogs are my top dogs in almost every spectrum. However, I will make that change to the selection in those final two or three positions that I'm filling out in the team, those are the, the dogs that we do see, all right, it's going to be a slow race. I'm going to take an older, more experienced dog that knows how to pace himself, mm -hmm. or it's going to be a really fast race. Maybe this is one that I take a young guy that's ready to set that fast pace where the older dog might be comfortable at nine miles an hour, but not comfortable at 10. So I will make that late, late race, or right before the race call based on weather on those final dogs. Fa last decisions before going out. Now, there's another question here because this is an, an international broadcast. And why is your tracker and your commentators, including Dallas, it says, kilograms and kilometers while we are in the US and use pounds and miles? Well, that's. It's, it's, I understand the question. That's a frustration of our American viewers. But let us, we have to explain a little bit about why. We yeah. do this. No, it's clearly this is um, an international broadcast. This is going to an audience all over the world. Um, believe me, <laughs> with my native uh, measurements being miles and pounds and, you know, um, in Fahrenheit, not Celsius, it's difficult. And I have the advantage of having a laptop in front of me and having the conversion tables right in front of me that I can make these translations. I, I think that down the road, we're hoping to be able to have it where, based on your geographic location, you can select which one yeah, we're using. I think we'll have miles for the editor as well. But uh, you've got to remember that there is a big mushing community, can, mushing countries in Europe as well. And the whole of Europe will use kilograms, for Celsius, not Fahrenheit, and, uh, and the metric system. So, of course, uh, this is uh, difficult to, to please everybody, but there'll be changes. We might say we will do as best as we can. You, we with the Europeans and, and you, Dallas, you will help out with the miles and... and, and Sure, and I, I would like to pounds. love to say that this is one of the things, while we hit it from this angle, what's cool about this is this is the whole point of the Krill Pet Arctic World Series, right? We have audiences from different geographic locations watching a race that maybe they've never seen before. You know, like the Bear Grease, if you're in Europe, they probably haven't watched this race. And here in not too long, we're going to be following the Femin race in Norway, and that may be new to many of our uh, you know, North American followers there. So cool. this is cool about the Arctic World Series that we are mm. kind of trying to bring different audiences to different races. And some of that's going to be dealing with international things like which measurement system are we using? <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, just use, if you have a computer, it's really easy to go in the computer and ch uh, try to find a, a place to change the, the scales. I have one more question. Why do the sleds look more empty in this race compared to other long distance races? Well, I'll answer that one, Dallas. Yeah. Um, there is different mandatory equipment in all kinds of uh, long distance races, right? In the ID Detroit, you have a lot of mandatory equipment and you have a lot of stuff you need to put in the sled to go to the finish line because you're self sufficient. You have to fix everything yourself. Uh, in the Femin race, you'll have help from the handlers uh, with food for yourself and clothes, but you have to feed the dogs. But there is some sort of depot as it is in the uh, ID to ride. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to carry the meat for the dogs or the uh, kibbles for the dog all the way around. They'll, the handlers will help you with that, giving you that on each checkpoint. In this particular race, the bag race, the handlers are allowed to f help feeding the mm. dogs at every checkpoint except one, which means that the sleds don't need to uh, be filled up with everything you normally would have in other races, like that we believe that the food cooker can be in the car, traveling with the handlers as long as well as the cooler, which means the volume in the sled will be much smaller because these things take a lot of space, right? 
So uh, that's why uh, I also noticed the sleds look smaller and it's more space if you have to uh, to carry a dog, it's more space. Mm. So uh, they actually don't have so much yeah, yeah. mandatory. And additionally on that, you're absolutely right. The mandatory equipment is less. But also on this race, we see the longest run of the entire race is 51 miles, right? As opposed to a race like the Iditarod where you might have 80 plus miles between checkpoints. So on top of the mandatory gear is just the things that is smart to have. When you leave one checkpoint here and you know that you'll be in the next checkpoint in four and a half, five hours, of course you want to have additional safety equipment, but the weather isn't going to change extremely. You're only going to be out there five hours. Well, this, is, this is in the forest, right? Sure. So this is not the high mountains. It may be 24 hours on the Iditarod from when you leave one checkpoint to reaching the next checkpoint. You may get wet in a river and then have to live with that for mm. 24 hours, not just two more hours to the next <laughs> checkpoint. So it's additionally to the mandatory gear is just the fact that they're mm. out there for less amount of times between these depots. You'll definitely see it bigger slides in the feminine race and the, in the ID trust as well. Thank you for that. Continue to send us questions because it's we can answer a lot of questions here and you can see, go to the websites and post the questions to us. We can see on the screen now we have some footage from Grand Portage where the, uh, the finish area is. We will soon be, be waiting for Greg and Bruce to get down there and we will get some live interviews and, and, and interviews from the people on site. In the meantime, we will be send, giving you out a little review of what we've seen so far from Mineral Center. So please enjoy it and we'll be right back at the Grand Portage right after this. Welcome and to the third and final day of this live coverage from the John Birgir Sled Dog Marathon in Minnesota. The Mushers has been on the trails now for 45 minutes and now they're entering the final stage of the race. Later today we'll figure out who will come in first to the Grand Portage finish line and then claim the victory of this edition of John Birgir Sled, Sled Dog Marathon. Very happy to have with me here with some great measures in the studio. And I'm very happy to introduce you once again to Norway's Nina Skramsta and Alaska biggest star, Dallas CV. How are you guys doing? Ready, ready to roll. Are you yeah. ready to rock yeah. and roll? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's going to be a fun uh, uh, finishing of this race to watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's getting exciting. Um, I'm having a blast doing this, analyzing this race, watching this race play out. We have some good dog mushers and great dog teams out there doing what they do best, um, getting into the exciting part of this race as we close in on the final hours. Exactly. We've been there on the trails for 45 hours. It's not many sports that you have to wait so many hours to figure out who's the winner. Tell me, what's the beauty of this sport? Well, the beauty is that for me, the experience with the dogs and the nature and the landscape, of course, and also I'm a bit of a, a well, competition person as well, competitive person. So yeah, but the beauty is actually the experiences in the nature together with my dogs. Absolutely. I love the the long aspect of this race. The fact that it does take you know three days, or some of these races you know nine or ten days, or maybe thirteen or fourteen days for the last person to cross the finish line on a thousand mile race, because this is not just about one aspect. It's not just about running fast. It's about caring for a team day in and day out and addressing all of their needs. You know, everything from their physical abilities to their emotional, you know, stability and everything else. So I love that complete aspect of the sport that it's not just one thing. How long can you jump? How far can you run? Right? It's a it's a bigger, more encompassing sport between species, right? You have dogs and humans working together. You need to be patient also. Patience is an endurance racer's best friend. It's an absolute 
prerequisite to have any success in this race. You have to be patient and be aware of so many different things at one time, have this long view, but then also in these intense moments, focus in into a very narrow view. What do I do in the next 10 seconds? But in the back of your mind, you have to be aware, what do I do in the next 10 days? Well, I like the idea that you're totally on your own. Yeah, everything you do is depending on what you do yourself. Um, and you're kind of in a bubble. And well, it's not kind of, you are in, you are in the bubble. You yeah. are in your own little world during the race. And for me, it takes a pretty long time after finishing the race to land again or to feel down to earth again. You're in a bubble <laughs> after the finish as well, actually. Yeah. And, and like you say, it's patience is the best friend of a musher. And also, but you still have to be focused. And there are a lot of details to take care of all the time. How do you manage to keep focused and stay concentrated over such a long time, it's it's tough. That mentally. is a real challenge. Um, that is a huge challenge um, for you know the thousand mile racing. I call it the never ending day, right? Because we are constantly going, and you are constantly have to be your best performance for such a long period of time. It's mm -hmm. it's very hard to manage your dog team and also yourself to make sure that you are 100% on point when you need to be, knowing when you can take a step back and relax your body, but your brain has to keep functioning. And so it's, it's the never ending day. You have to stay on your A game the entire way. And it's those collections of 30 second mistakes over the course of nine days that adds up to a two hour difference between first and second. And we're seeing the same thing here in the John Berger Sled Dog Marathon, where it's gonna be little seconds they picked up on the trail, you know, how they manage their team over these hills. Um, did they go let the team go fast enough down the hills, but not too fast? Were they helping the dogs up the hills? Those seconds add up to the minutes and hours we're gonna see that separate these mushers coming into the next few checkpoints and then ultimately the finish line. Uh, one way to, to stay sharp for such a long time is to maintain uh, as a human a uh, uh, right uh, amount of drinks and food. Otherwise, if you don't eat and drink, you're gonna be really tired. We have to be sharp for a long time as well, but the mushers, what happened? What, can, what, what kind of consequence can it have if you don't manage to stay focused and don't manage to stay concentrated on what you, what you should do? What can happen? Well, there, there's yeah. very much a snowball effect here, right? <laughs> you make one little mistake, you let that bother you, it leads to the next mistake because now you're focusing on what I did wrong yesterday. Yeah. So in some regards, you have to be very focused but have a short memory, right? <laughs> so whatever happened yesterday is done. It's behind me. I can't do anything about it. Focus on what we can affect, what we can improve. Um, and so, yeah, staying focused is absolutely crucial. Uh, staying focused on what's important is absolutely crucial. So it's easy to get wrapped up in, oh, where are the other mushers or what are the other people doing? That's not going to help me perform better. What's going to help me perform better is focusing on what does my dog team need right now. So that's, again, putting that your limited energy where it needs to be is really important. As long as trying to keep a good uh, positive spirit. Yeah, <laughs> positive spirit. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, is it hard to do that as well when you have a lack of sleep? Because the guys, they don't sleep much. You know, Karan, when you <laughs> have a lack of sleep and you're getting more and more tired, I do, for some reason, get some strange uh, songs in my head. Songs I would never listen to. That just goes on repeating. So who's the favorite the artist oh, to I, come I into your head at that you. time? <laughs> That'll be uh, really stupid songs going on repeat in my head when I get really tired. What, what, do you <laughs> have any songs? Like what happened to you when you get tired and you're kind of, you're kind of losing it? Um, I do. I, <laughs> many things happen. One, I'm trying to focus on what do I need to do to race? How do I create the best strategy for my dog team in the next miles in the trail? Um, a lot of these close races, it comes down to properly using 15 minutes of rest. Do I take it now? Do I take it later? Um, so I end up doing a lot of math and I find myself trying to do this, you know, very simple math in my head. And it, I keep going over and over and over. When and it you're takes on the sled. Me, yeah, it takes me two hours to figure out what should have taken me two minutes. Um, <laughs> just because you're sleep deprived. You're not functioning well. And then there are some hallucinations. Uh, I, then you can you make know. some bad decisions as well, as well, no? Yeah, but that's why I do this for two hours on the trail, not in when I need to be taking care of the dogs in the checkpoint, right? Mm. So the things that like this I should be doing on the trail. Um, so that when I get to the checkpoint, I can be focused on what I need to do. I also plan, what am I gonna do when I reach the checkpoint? What needs to happen when I arrive yeah. so that when I get to the checkpoint, I'm not trying to think, I'm just moving. I've already done the thinking on the trail. 
this night, the mushers, they've been not been sleeping very much neither, I imagine. And um, they've been doing on the leg five. And Colin Valin, she's going to go take us through the leg number five. So have a look at what she's saying and about the challenges on the leg five. So heading out on the fifth leg of the race from Poplar Lake, we do a loop over to the west, and then we come back, and we have to go past the checkpoint where we have just rested, which is really tough for sled dogs. I'm picking up speed, my foot's off the drag pad a little bit, and I have a ski pole, and I'm pulling, and, and I'm pedaling like I'm on a scooter. Uh, the musher starts working and running up all the hills. We're stopping still every two hours to snack our dogs, and we're on our way to Devil's Track Lake, and it's always as windy as windy can be at that checkpoint, and it's cold, and we get the dogs all bedded down in their straw, we get them fed, and now it's time to really take a look at dogs. Who's doing well? Who's pulling? Who's eating? Is there any dogs that need a break, need more of a break? Um, when a dog is running, if they're having a little uh, wrist problem, their, their head will bob. Once again, the veterinarians are all over the dogs, whatever you need. Um, they'll check a dog out. They'll take care of the dogs. Um, but the key is get them fed and get them rested and get them in the straw because they, they know we're on the final push. No, I got all that. They are on the final push. We are on the final push, she says, uh, Colleen Valin. What is that? What does she mean by that? This is the uh, kind of closing in on the end of the race here. You know, they're within the 100 kilometer mark now. Um, you know, I guess leaving this checkpoint, they've got a little farther than that to go. But this is time to start focusing on actually getting to the finish line as quickly as possible, right? The first two thirds of this race, I think, is really about certainly the first third is about positioning your team, building the team, getting them into a good routine. The second third is a little bit about uh, moving up, getting into position. You don't have to be in front, but you do have to be within striking range. The final third is about closing the deal, getting to the finish line. Um, if your goal is to win it, then you know trying to get there first, um, or more realistically, as quick as your team is capable of. So this is the first time in the race that I would really start to look around, see where the competitors are, and see what I need to do. Is it realistic to catch up with that team, or should I be more concerned about staying ahead of the team behind me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this this leg was just going in. It was going on this night, so it was night in the middle of the night, and, yep. and we're going to have a look at a little bit of recap of uh, of the the fifth leg. If we can have some pictures, that would be great. So here we have they have them coming into the trail center yesterday. The four first coming in to that uh, trail center. Yeah, coming into the trail yesterday. center. Um, this is where we started to get the teams kind of organized as they took a little more of their mandatory rest. Here we have Ryan Reddington pulling into the trail center checkpoint. He was actually second into the checkpoint, but had a commanding lead based on the amount of his mandatory rest that he had already taken. Um, nice looking dog team. Uh, to this point in the race, he's been consistently kind of the, the fastest team. I guess he hasn't posted the fastest time every single time, but he's been within a minute of the fastest time, or in fact, you know, much faster than everybody else. Nice team. Um, Ryan seems to be in good spirits. I think he's pretty confident in his both his team and his position at this point in the race. See a lot of happy fans seeing that team coming in there. He's smiling, <laughs> waving to people. You know, it's good to see mushers that are chipper and aware. Um, but it's still daylight. It's much easier to be alert and aware when you have the sun out. Uh, mm -hmm. Once the sun goes down, it's maybe three in the morning. That's when that sleep deprivation is going to start kicking in. It's going to be a little harder to stay awake as a musher. Yeah. And this here, here's a, now the second one is coming in. Yeah, this was uh, Keith Eiley that came in. Um, operating from the same kennel as uh, Ryan Reddington. We can see the same you know, green booties and sled bag there. Um, had a nice run time over there as well. Uh, solid looking dog team. I think he's sustaining a little bit larger dog numbers as we go through the race here. Or, you know, more of the team is still in the team there. You know, he had had a little bit of issues he reported to us in the previous checkpoint with getting the dogs to rest next to another team that had some distractions to him there. Also, he's a little bit concerned about the number of lead dogs that he has in the team. And that can make a big difference in your ability to sustain a fast pace. Because what's really important about a lead dog later in the race is that you need somebody to go up there and set a fast pace. Mm. And that's easier to do if you can switch out that dog. Yeah. Give a dog a break and let somebody else go up there and set a fast pace. 
So, again, so this is, we just remind that this is the pictures we had from the trail center checkpoint yesterday before they go out to the fifth leg. Yep. Um, Coming into trail center, completing the fourth leg of the race there. Uh, next coming in there, we should have had, uh, I believe it was Ryan Anderson or Martin Massacott. I'm trying to see who we got here. Mas Masicott. That's Martin Massacott coming yeah. in, yep. Uh, so Martin had, actually, he dropped down to a smaller team than some of the others early on, but he's actually been sustaining that team. And so I've always said this, you know, as long as they're the right dogs, it's not a big deal if you have a smaller team. Uh, this is a really solid looking gang coming in here now. Um, all, I mean, that's one of the nicer looking dog teams I've seen, and that could be just because they're traveling at the speed that that team should be going at. Um, I don't know if he's going to have the upper end speed to compete with these guys all the way to the end, but uh, this team is traveling comfortably at the speed that they're doing, and that's really nice to see, and I think this is a very steady team that won't waver much to the end. But, when you uh, say this early. is a really one of the better looking teams with an expert eye, how do you, what do you say when you say, what do you mean by saying that? <laughs> I think the expert here would, reading the teams would be Dallas actually. But, uh, <laughs> Some would define a good-looking team just by the look of the, uh, the look of the dogs. I mean, the, the exterior the posture, of the dogs, the posture yeah. of the but, dogs. But a trained musher eye would look at the gait of the dogs, the the uh, the, the, the looks of the dog. Yeah. You know, like, not the exterior looks, but I mean, no, more like the dog. How the dog <laughs> is uh, behaving in front of the sled, actually. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'm looking at. Um, Everybody's working in a similar gait. They all have tight tug lines. The dog looks comfortable. You know, their lines are tight and they're all firing on all cylinders, smiling. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm had, looking for the happy dogs. Yep, next, we have Ryan Anderson coming in here. He was the fourth, uh, kind of right now, he's the fourth in our pack, was in here in a little bit uh, different position. But another very nice dog team, sustaining a little bit slower speed um, than the guys ahead of him at the moment. I do think on one of the previous runs, the run directly before this one, he actually had the fastest run time, which could affect him on this run, slowing down just a little bit, coming on the heels of that other time. But, but another solid looking dog team, all of them firing on all cylinders, tight lines, you know, they're, they're perky, they're aware. This is not a team that's depleted in any way. So we're looking really good in this team. Um, they're coming in here again, they got their rest. There, there's quite a lot of variation in the amount of rest that mushers have taken to this point. That's all we but really I think as about. we see them leave Trail Center, the checkpoint they're now pulling into, those resting times are really going to start to even out. And you're not going to see two hours difference in the amount of rest that mushers have taken. So, so I think by the time we leave here, we're going to have a much clearer view of who's actually in lead of this race. Um, and again, the, the differences we're going to see in the times are based on their traveling speeds, not the amount of rest that they've taken to this point. So that was Ryan Anderson coming in there. Uh, again, four really nice looking dog teams mm -hmm. coming in here. Um, I, I like those steady teams. And my, my eye is drawn to those teams that uh, I see that they can do this for a thousand miles. And so I have to keep reminding myself that this is only a 300 mile race, which is still a long race, of course. But um, you know, the upper end speed can be beneficial in a race like this, but I still like looking at those teams that are at a steadier pace that can do it for days and days and days. And from Trail Center, they went out to the fifth leg. Yep. And we're going to have a look at the graphics and have a look at how it all turned out over the race uh, from that uh, fifth leg. So leaving out of Trail Center, we had Ryan Reddington out of there in lead. Um, he had stayed there about four hours. Eiley, Keith Eiley was right behind him, and Martin Massacott, and then Ryan Anderson. Um, all four of those top mushers uh, leaving Trail Center took very close to four hours of rest. Martin, I'm sorry, Ryan Anderson took 4.51. He had the longest rest. Keith Eiley at 3.56. Like I said, they're going to be making up any difference in uh, the total amount of rest that they've taken. So they come back by the same checkpoint there. We see mushers passing head on. Kind of a bit of a confusing mess there with yeah. GPS. Because going you see, like, they directions. actually go back up the trail and down again, the same direction. Yep. So it looks a bit confusing. But and now. So pulling into uh, Skyport there. Um, we had the same four mushers that left the previous checkpoint in lead, still in lead. Uh, they In Skyport, those top four mushers took all, again, pretty close to four hours with the one outlier being Martin Massacott that took four hours and 50 minutes, which I think put him pretty well even with the rest of these guys. They should all have about, about 20 hours of rest accumulated now um, as we head to the, the final checkpoint here. But now you see, you, where we see them now, they're actually, it started out from this checkpoint and then they're on the leg six yep. actually. So they're so on their final leg here. 
We're closing up the live update now, where they are. Yep, so and as it stands right now, we have Ryan Reddington in lead, Keith Eiley in second, just a short distance behind him there. Um, I think there's only a few kilometers separating them, about four kilometers. Then there's a bit of a gap as we go back into third and fourth place with Ryan Anderson and Martin Massacott. And again, they're right close together. But there is a gap between our first two mushers, mm. then the second two mushers, and then there's a fairly good gap going back from there. So I'm pretty sure that uh, right now we have Reddington and Eiley out in front there, then that second group with Anderson and Massacott. Um, I would say 99% chance one of those four mushers is our, gonna be our winner. I think there's about a 70, let's call it an 85% chance that Eiley or Reddington are gonna be one of the winners here. So they should be arriving in the next checkpoint fairly soon here. Mm -hmm. um, and at this checkpoint, it's a mandatory four hour rest. So like I was saying, the resting is gonna even out because they all have to stay for here uh, before they can continue onto the trail. And if they haven't taken, you know, they have to have a total of 24 hours and at least four here. Mm -hmm. So like um, Ryan Reddington has actually taken, I think 20 hours and 15 minutes. So he's gonna have more than his required amount of rest because he has to stay here four hours. On the fifth leg, there have been some action though. There is yeah. uh yeah, John I Fisher is having some problems, had some problems this night. Uh, should we have a look at uh, what what happened to him? If you have a look, if we we'll have the graphics have of of uh, graphics. John Fisher when he this on the fifth leg.
just a little bit, but there again, they have to use their full 24 hours of mandatory rest. So yeah, it is where they're going to be more alert, more aware of where the other mushers are, though there's not a whole lot they can do about it. When it comes time to leave this checkpoint, there's one simple strategy, and that is get your team to the finish line over this next, I think we got about uh, 40 miles of trail, 64 kilometers. Get over that trail as quickly as possible, right? So you're going to see mushers, um, you know, I don't want to say being, they're, they're certainly not going to be reckless, but they're going to be, you know, taking their foot off the brake a little bit and covering this trail because when the dogs cross the finish line, it's over. They can sleep all night, right? There's no four-hour stop. There's no time rush after this. So, yeah, it, it is a very fun time in the race. You know, Karen, I think we should repeat that in this kind of race, in this uh, uh, bear grease race, it's uh, legal for the handlers to help the teams on every checkpoint except uh, sawbill checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see people, uh, the handlers here, helping out uh, Ryan, Reddington, and uh, the checkpoint is also with the cars close by to the dog mm -hmm. teams, but the dogs are not allowed to sleep. In so what area. you're saying that that's not normal? No, no, come on. No, in the editorial, there are no handling uh, mm -hmm. whatsoever during the race. And what about the feminine race? In the feminine race, the handlers are allowed to help uh, the mushers with dry clothes and uh, food mm -hmm. uh, for the person, for the musher. Okay. The musher needs to do everything with the dogs himself or herself. So you, yeah. you can, they can be there to get, provide you with help yeah, you but need, but you allowed, have to do the job. That's right. They're yeah. not allowed to, to get close to the dogs. They're not allowed to pet the dogs. They're not allowed to walk around the dogs. Mm -hmm. But they've got to be outside, call it like a fenced area. Yeah. yeah. So they can watch. <clears throat> yeah, in the in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series, we actually have a few different race structures yep. Yep. Um, that allow different type of handler access and handler assistance. The Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon allows the most handler assistance, like Nina was saying, where the dogs can help, yep. or you, the handlers can help take care of the dogs. Other races, the handlers can help take care of the musher, but not the dogs. Yet other races like the Iditarod, there is no assistance. Mm -hmm. It is just the musher and the dogs. Nobody can help you. I wanted to take a look here with uh, Ryan Reddington. Um, he's got eight dogs into this checkpoint I believe yep. um, in his team so that's plenty of dog power I think we've heard you know Bruce Lee in the field Greg Heister in the field and us here at the desk as well talking about the different number of dogs okay coming in here Keith we have Keith Ailey, Ailey. Yeah. yeah coming in now he's got I think an 11 dog team coming in here um, nice looking gang he was about two miles uh, uh, behind uh, Ryan so that was 3.5 kilometers or a little bit more than two miles. Yeah. No, that's a nice looking dog team. Sorry, I was just focusing on dogs there for a second, trying to see what these guys look like. Nice looking dog team. Everybody's moving pretty smoothly. Um, and he's got a full 11 dog team, or a, a, I shouldn't say full. They started with 12 dogs, but an 11 dog team. That's pretty Reddington good. has an eight dog team. What I was noting from last year is Reddington came into the same checkpoint last year with nine dogs and left with six. Um, and then the, the next run proved to be very challenging. He had a runtime of almost twice as long as some of his competitors. So while Ryan Reddington has a commanding lead, um, as last year's evidence of, everything can still change. So it's gonna be because really he was in lead at the same moment, at the same as checkpoint last year. He had year. about a two-hour lead yeah. at this point and last lost year. It. And, yeah. he, lost it. and yeah. he ended up taking about four hours longer mm -hmm. on the next run. So it's easy to say, oh, we got us a winner and it's looking <laughs> clear. But no, everything oh. can change. Um, I've had races that it has all changed in the last you know, 30 miles of the race, 40 miids of the race. Um, in fact, one of my Iditarod wins, I finished and I thought I was in third place because because uh, when I had passed the other mushers, they were off the trail, and it was a very bad storm. So and everything can change, and the musher is not always aware of what's going on out there either. Mm -hmm. A little bit back to what we were talking about, the, the handlers out at the checkpoint, and the difference between mm -hmm. the, the, the events in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. Um, the big race, uh, you can you're allowed to use the handlers, and they can help you out. Is it also um, a different level of mushers, uh, their, their performance level or their experience, is it also adapted to the mushers to take place in these races? Like, like the more performance guys and those are experienced due to add a rod. Here there are mushers that are not that experienced or so you could I have more help? Or? I think you're going to see overlap in all of that. Uh, I know we got another team coming in here very soon, uh, oh. so I'm going to answer that question in a yeah. second. But this coming one in first. here. Yeah. We got another nice looking team. This is Keith Eiley again. Um, 
Coming into the checkpoint, I'm seeing a lot of happy dogs, smiling faces, <laughs> and a not so happy looking mushroom. <laughs> He's just probably <laughs> He's focused, let's say that. He's yeah, focused yeah, here. Yeah. Um, you know, they're all looking good. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him leave at least one dog behind here. I'm right. seeing probably one, maybe more. But, but Dallas, do you remember the time difference between uh, Ryan Reddington and Keith Ailey? Because uh, Ryan's got to rest 15 minutes more, I suppose, because he, he needs four hours rest. They're all going to need to take four hours. I know, I know, but yep. he still has 15 minutes. Uh, he needs to take extra. If I'm no, I, I believe he's taken 15 minutes extra. Uh, we, we can take a look at that here yeah, in a second. Yeah, because but, they might um, get close. Yeah, no, it is going to be interesting to see how much time we have between these two mushers coming into this checkpoint. Now, it's, again, important to remember that these two mushers are actually running from the same kennel. Um, so I don't think that means there's any cooperation necessarily, but uh, from that kennel particularly, they're sitting in a pretty good position because even if Ryan were to have trouble, kind of like he did last year, and not be able to post another fast run time for this last leg, um, your second pick is Keith Ailey. So <laughs> I think it's kind of, uh, they've got, they're in a good position right now. A very nice looking dog team here. I like seeing perky dogs, wagon tails. You see the handlers are having to hold pretty hard here. The mushers got both feet on the brake. This is not a tired dog team. This is a team that's, that's ready to, you know, keep on trucking. Mm, they have and, more under their belt. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The light, uh, nice looking gang there. Uh, Greg Heister told me last uh, night that, that Ryan is probably racing the A team. So that will be uh, Kate Ailey and Ryan Reddington are racing uh, dogs from the same kennel. And uh, Ryan has probably the, uh, the best team of those, the best dogs from that. Kennel. I would, I would That's assume what, uh, Greg, so, yeah. Greg told me actually. Yeah. So that's what he believed. <laughs> But as we know, that will be a mix of those two teams with Ryan going to the Iditarod. How, how different is, is there a huge difference? I mean, the way you, you train your dogs. There is some basics that everybody has to do, but do, do Reddington and Ailey do anything different from you guys, for example? Oh, I think uh, most all mushers train a little bit different. And that's something that I think most mushers keep a little bit close to their vest, right? Um, that's not something that I'm posting online. Oh, this is exactly what my team is training like right now. That's some of it is a bit trade secret. Um, there are, there is information that I share very openly, particularly as it pertains to dog care and dog welfare, um, the different medicines we use, the, the supplementations that we use, the nutrition that we use, the sports medicine, like as far as massage and um, mm -hmm. therapy like that. We're very open about that because that benefits all the dogs. But when it comes to training, um, that's the part that I kind of, training and equipment, I'm a little bit more secretive on the research and development we do about that stuff. What about sports science? And dog mushing. I mean, in sports science and training, you know, you can use heart rate to 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 monitor how tired you are. Mm -hmm. Are you? Is this something you could do in dog mushing as well? Use like, <laughs> you know, really scientific there data is. to use to do your training. There is a lot of very scientific stuff you can do. Um, is it common to do it? Yes and no. And I just was talking about the stuff that we keep kind of close to our vest. <laughs> and, and I think this would fall into that category yeah. pretty squarely. So there are certainly things that I, I do when I'm developing my dogs, training my dogs, the research that we do that helps inform us as to what is the next best thing for them to do training. And that's really important. You know, knowing how to best develop these dogs, knowing when they're ready for a little bit more, knowing when you need to back off. Human athletes do that with heart rate monitors. Um, particularly when they're sleeping, their resting heart rate. Um, yes, there is a lot of that. Some mushers are more scientific than others. Um, and, you know, honestly, a lot of mushers that you would not say are very scientific are still very successful. So uh, the, the jury's still out on how effective it is. We do have people in Norway uh, working on that from the scientific point of view. And uh, I've actually been taking a course in these things just to learn a little bit more. Uh, you know, we have a lot of dogs and it's difficult to monitor all the dogs regularly when you have a full-time job on the, on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for sure, it shows that dogs with lower heart rate, low 
over. Call my dogs at the starting line. That's a that's a good thing on the contrary to those very hectic dogs when it comes. That's what science really shows. Because uh, it's also because if, and, um, you know an eye and an experience an empiric uh, <laughs> knowledge. It's obviously very important, but also at some point maybe. Not because you've been doing like this for the last 20 years or 30 years. Maybe there is some science to, you know, really to... There is. And, uh, and you know, there's other tests, um, you know, more related to the blood test. And with the Iditarod, we actually, it's mandated before you start the race, all the dogs will go through a blood test to confirm that they are healthy, not just to the, the naked eye, but on the inside, right? Exactly. Um, so we've done those same blood tests so after the race measure the, to yeah. measure their recovery times, the how much time do they need so to on. bounce back. Yes, there's numerous things, everything from you know, lactate to hematocrit, um, white blood counts, if those are elevated, right? There could be indicative of an infection of some sort so it's it's done for a health reason to safety reason as with our ECGs or EKGs which is just making sure that there's no irregularity with the dog's heart right so the dogs go through all these tests as well as numerous physical exams before they're allowed to set foot on the Iditarod trail and each race has a different kind of collection of pre-race health checks that the dog must go through mm. and then I've replicated n many of those health checks after the race um, immediately after the finish six hours after the finish 12 hours after the finish 24 hours after the finish to kind of track how that dog's recovery time looks like. So we look at the screen here. Um, one other thing I want to point out is we see a lot of dogs eating. <laughs> and that's a good sign. This is a sign of a team that's not too tired, right? If they just had a really hard run, and if the run was hard for them, they would um, want to curl up and take a little nap first. When you see dogs still eating like this as soon as they get into the checkpoint, that means that yeah, they're ready for a nap, but their battery's at 60%, and they're going to rest back up to 90% in the next four hours, and then they're going to take off again. Um, we, what we don't want to see is a dog team that their battery's down to that 40 30%. That's where you're going to see them curl up and take a nap and need to sleep an hour before they're ready to eat their meal. Do you, need, do you give them any different food when at, the, at the end of the race than you did at the beginning? Do you mm. give them more fat? Ca what kind of calories do you give them here? Well, this is this where, stage. yeah, for, for me personally, this is where speed becomes a factor. Um, and the number one question is, what does this team need? And so when I pull into a checkpoint, maybe I've had a team that's been eating everything in sight. They've been snacking great on the trail. But you know what? They're getting a little bit tired. I want to focus on sleep. I may actually just give them a quick snack, make sure they have enough calories, and then just let them sleep. Other teams, maybe they're well rested, but they're starting to get a little thin. Their body score is not great. I might keep them awake longer during that resting time to get more food in them. I would say one thing that's important um, on maybe not so much here because they're not going to be feeding again before they leave the checkpoint, but not overfeeding your dog before the last run. I've seen mushers make that mistake mm. where their dogs are really eating well after like a mandatory eight hour stop at the last checkpoint in the Iditarod. So they feed a really big meal and then the dogs are rather sluggish on that last run. So there is a right amount of food. Um, it's not you know, you don't want them looking like uh, little manatees here with big, <laughs> big bellies on them and, uh, you know, not ready to go run. So the right amount of food, but as far as what that food is, um, I wouldn't adjust that based on where they are in the race as much as what the dog needs, right? Does and what it, need likes, and what it likes. And what it likes. Yeah. When you talk about amount, how much does, does each dog get to eat right now? Is it, like, are you talking kilos or are we talking grams or? Uh, yeah. What's the amount? Each dog eats. It's really. Uh, I would I say, it's, uh, first, well, yeah. talking in the metric system or in the uh, European system, I would say we are. Uh, each snack given on trail or at checkpoints will be between 150 grams and 200 grams. That's mm -hmm. a snack, That's snack, right? Yeah. So that'll be beef, chicken, salmon, or some kind of special made sausages or for dogs. Or uh, that will be, for example, as I told you yesterday, I would use horse or uh, beaver as well, if I can get a hold of that. And each snack will be, depending a little bit how, mu how much calories it is, mm -hmm. that kind of meat. Mm -hmm. but Basically, 150 to 200 grams, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a snack. And a meal like this, in a big meal? Uh, they're having a real meal now. Yeah, I'm going to say they're going to eat probably at least, and, and what, the reason I was hesitating before is a lot of the food we feed has a very high moisture content. Like when you see these pieces of frozen beef that they're handing, and it, I like having them sliced, 
First of all, the beef comes in a tube that looks like a loaf of bread. I then slice it like a loaf of bread, about the same thickness, and then I cut it once lengthwise. So each snack is half of a piece of bread, essentially. Mm. Um, so it's easy for the dogs to chew, especially if it's cold out. You don't want a, a you know softball-sized chunk of meat that the dog's having to gnaw on and work at. It needs to be very easy for it to snap apart when they chew on it. Um, but that's mostly moisture. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about food, the, both the volume and the weight is skewed by the amount of moisture in that food, especially when we then make up a soup to try to get moisture into the dog. So as far as the actual weight of the food, I think it's possible that the dogs could eat up to a kilo of food in a checkpoint like this very easily, not counting the additional weight of the water that yeah. we have going in there. But on, on a cold race, which this race has not been thus far, I believe last year was much colder out there, you can see dogs easily burn 10,000 calories a day. And just to put that into you know, human terms that we can comprehend, that's nearly 40 Big Macs every single day. So when we think about the volume of food, you know, they're breaking that into maybe three feedings plus a number of snacks over the course of the day, but you still got to put 40 Big Macs into a 55 pound dog every 24 hours. I get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of food. Look at, we, look, we can see on the screen now, Okay, ladies. Greg and Bruce are getting ready. Maybe we can have some chat with them soon. That'll be nice. Yeah. And behind them, you see the kind of, in Norway, they'd call it the camping car. In the U.S., we'd call it an RV or a, a camper truck. Um, that's going to be pretty common here that mushers have a place to go inside. Yeah, yeah. looks like they're getting lined we, up with Ryan Reddington, which the tracker hopefully we can... Uh, the numbers here. Have you uh, taken care of all of your chosen rest at this point in time? You just have your mandatory four-hour here, or do you have to add I, on? I think I got like four hours and 12 minutes or 15 minutes, Some a little bit of change on there. Okay. But, yep. So you got eight? Eight dogs left. Will you leave here with eight? Um, I think so. We'll see. Um, yeah, I'll give them the rest here and see how they look when we wake up to get ready. Yeah. Are you happy with their performance into here? Yeah, This there's only one dog in that team that ran berries um, last year. So it's a new team, so I'm just checking them out for what what ones for I did or not. Yeah. And so you saw Mr. Eiley come in here shortly after you. You must yeah. be uh, yeah. glowing with pride right now. Yeah, yeah, um, very much so. Reddington dogs are are making me proud. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and his they, team and and uh, Keith's team, I'd say, man, they look really smooth, really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, um, it's going to be a nice team when it, for Iditarod when I put together the two teams, the best of the two teams, and um, there's one. My main leader is at home, so um, so it would be nice to have him in there too. Your main leader is at home. Why is that? I, I just wanted to give him the, the rest here, and um, he'll be in for the UP200 and everything. Yeah. Okay. His name's Archer. And so that is the plan, to take the best out of your team, the best out of Keith's team, and then take them north. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, you put two teams in the UP200 as well? Yep, two teams in the UP200. Okay, Ryan, so you, you got in here in the lead last year with a two-hour lead, yep. and you didn't win. Nope. Right, and I know it's probably one of the more frustrating runs of your entire life. And so, uh, take us back there last year. Uh, what happened, and and how do you ensure that it doesn't happen again this year? And is it in your mind at all? Well, not really on my mind too much because um, uh, there's only one dog in the team from last year, and uh, so. But yeah, I had a couple dogs that were um, that wanted some more rest, so we gave them more rest out on the trail and. And, um, but I don't look for that this year to happen. Yeah. yeah. So on this next run, if Keith is able to close the gap, <laughs> <laughs> how does this happen going to the finish line? Well, I, I told him from the beginning when I first called him in the fall that he can run his own race, and I'm not telling him one. Um, if he beats me, so be it, but he's got a really good dog team, and that I'd be honored for him to, to mush him in the race. And so, yeah, um, I, I, I've been saying it all year to my handlers and my family that um, – I'm worried about that team. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, he's been running his own race, um, so that's really nice as well as to not have that stress and have such a good dog musher as he is to take care of him. And, man, he's looking like he's doing a really good job with him, and I, I'm very proud of him. And who will be in the lead out of here? Out of um, Art, I mean, uh, 
Ghost and Ghost and Henry will be in lead out of here. Ghost and Henry. That yep. ghost seems really tuned into you. I noticed at the oh, other yeah. checkpoint, he stands there and looks back at you for like when you're going to pull the hook. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, um, Henry, he's um, finished the last two I did rods with Anna Barrington, and uh, I um, borrowed him from my dad and the, for the Cobuck 440, and then this fall we were able to buy him and good addition to the kennel. Yeah. yeah, he's the brown lead dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, how will you spend the next four hours? I'm gonna get a little bit of sleep and and um, eat a little bit and and um, and relax and and um, wake up here and and tell the dogs that we got one more run and, and love on them and and uh, and hopefully have a good run to the finish. We wish you luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, All right, Ryan. Yeah. ladies and gentlemen, that's Ryan Reddington. He's in first place right now, but you did hear from him. He's got 12 or 14 minutes or so of added rest that he needs to put on his team before he can leave. So he'll be here for those four hours and, and some minutes. And we'll have to check with Keith, too, to see if he's got any uh, time to, that he has to kill. But this could be a really, like, if Keith has taken care of all of his rest, they could be leaving here almost side by side. Yeah, it's not. A, well, even if they don't, with that little time between them, going 40 miles it's going to be right down to the finish you're not really going to know who's going to win this thing to yeah. right at the end and i just saw that uh, before ryan came over and talked to us he went around and checked on which dogs had eaten and then he pulled out these big chunks of of chicken and uh, man those i know what those dogs like the best they hammered <laughs> that chicken and the chicken skins that have a lot of fat so uh they're gonna be tanked up and uh i'll check back with keith's team a little bit and see how they eat. they were all drinking plain water of course they're all the reddington dogs so they've yeah. all been there there won't be any differences in how you know the feeding protocols and all because they're all from the same kennel I tell you, if I had my second team behind me that looked like Keese, I'd be running up every one of these hills because <laughs> that team looks like they can catch him yeah. to me. But that's the fun of this. Yeah, it's and awesome speculation. There's a little town in Alaska called Kinnick, Alaska, and right now uh, the the Reddington clan is swelling with pride with all these Reddington dogs up here in, in the front of the Bear Grease. I'm sure it's crazy for them back there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's got to be be a great feeling to have that both first and second place. Yeah. 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 So, ladies and gentlemen, let's send it back to the studio in Oslo right now. We've got a gentleman walking up on us that we're going to come back here shortly with an interview, and we'll tell you who he is when he comes when we come back. Let's go back to the studio. Thank you, Greg and Bruce, for that update. Um, Ryan Reddick, how did he look? <laughs> he looks like uh, he's got one more run to go. <laughs> it looks like he's made it about 200 <clears throat> miles into a race, so um, understandably a little bit tired and probably a little bit wind burned from being out there and just not getting a lot of sleep. But obviously he's excited about not just his team, but the team that's behind him also are his dogs. And like he was saying, he's going to be combining those dogs for the Iditarod later here um, as part of the, Arctic World, the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. And um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. That's a great position to be in, to have your you know, one and two in this race at this point still can change, but at this point, one and two and being thinking that I can choose from these dogs to pull together my best 14 dog team. He's actually been testing 24 dogs for, for the Adada Rod. That is an important test for him. Yeah, they need 14 to start the Adida Rod, so he's got 10 dogs, uh, which don't, doesn't, don't have to make the team. You yep. know? So that's what we would call a lot of depth in a kennel, mm. right, where you have choices. Mm. And so on a team like that, that's where it does get harder to pick who's going to be dog number 13 and 14. A lot of times you see that there's a core group of 10 or 12 that, you know, when you go down your list, who's definitely going to be on my team? Check, 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 check. You tallied up. Yep, sure enough, there's 10 or 11 of them. It seems like that's always what it is. And then you sort through all the rest of them to try to fit who's going to be the best one in this in this team. You know, you might say that through all the training, dog A has been really consistent, but dog B, who's a little bit younger, man, he really shone on the, the bear grease, so that's going to be a tough call for them. It seems like we might be seeing Greg, and uh, they, they're, they're walking around trying to... No, we'll let a little bit, wait a little bit. Um, I was thinking of the lead dogs. Yeah, for, yeah, for the selection, like you, choosing the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 dog. What makes a difference of making the team or not making the team? It can be something very, very small. Um, one classic place that you get up against, um, this, every musher has been in this situation where you're trying to pick that 
in the Iditarod, it's a 14 dog race now, trying to pick the 14th dog. Maybe you have a, a three year old dog that's a young up and comer and not yet proven, mm. but shows all the signs of being great. And an older dog that was great, but maybe on the other end. So it's always that decision. Do I take the proven one that might be older or the younger one that might be the next superstar? And we are supposed to have some contact with Greg and Bruce in at the Mineral Center. Do we can break Greg, can you hear me? No, you can't hear me. But it will be uh, we will soon we will hear from Greg and Bruce, so over to you guys. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Mineral Center. Greg Heister, Bruce Lee, and we are joined now by Mr. Mike Keyport. I got that right, right? You did get that yeah. right, yep. And this is the great-grandson of the legendary John Bear Grease. Right on, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's phenomenal. And so I don't, I'm not even sure where to begin with this, but let's talk about, uh, like, family legend. Who, who was John? What was he like? And, and what, what do you know about him? You know, there's many, there's been books written and there's uh, so many stories about John Bear Grease, it's incredible, but I, I consider him to be a part of the history of the North Shore on Lake Superior here. He was quite the, quite the guy. He, uh, he's been, he was been called the jack of all trades because he was not only a musher and if you can, as you drove up the highway today, if you can picture that highway not being there and John Bear Grease you're just on a very narrow trail, not nothing fancy like we got now, yeah. you know, with old mutts. They weren't Alaskan Huskies. These were just good old dogs that he trained. And, and uh, I guess one of the most unique things is he trained them in Ojibwe. Okay, the language. So, the language. Yeah. So when he'd give the dog command, it would be in his native tongue. Oh, it wouldn't be in English. Cool. So yeah. that that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, was he? A, oh, we got a truck pulling right in front of our camera here. We'll continue to talk. But uh, was he a big man? Was he a physical man? Like what? He, what was he? He like? was a. He's about our size guy. He yeah. was six three. Yeah. Let's just move over this way, Mike, a little bit. We'll get out of the way of the truck. And we're letting the camera guy know we're walking. If you pan right, you'll see us. Pan right a little bit. All right, tell your camera to pan to his right. Okay, Mike. Um, so, yeah, tell us about him. Yeah, yeah, he was a good-sized guy. And uh, and they, he, he actually had, had brothers that would run the mail route with him. And they, they went from... Uh, they started, and he lived in Beaver Bay, if you can picture that on your way up. So he had actually backtracked to two harbors, which is about 25 miles, get the mail, load it on a sled, sometimes up to 600 pounds, we're wow. told. And this was a toboggan-type sled, not the sleds we see out here today. And then he would head up the shore and stop at the towns along the way and, and end up in Grand Marais. Yeah. And then... Uh, pick up to make and make the return trip and he'd do that about once a week yeah and uh, he not only he not only brought the mail but if you can picture back in the early 1900s late 1800s he not only brought uh, the mail but he brought news you know people didn't know oh, if, uh, if aunt, sure. aunt betsy died down in duluth yeah. or something and he'd, he'd have that information he he had uh, bells he would put on his dogs like okay. Christmas bell, jingle bells, yeah. and people would hear him coming in the small communities, and they'd all gather around to see what he had to say. Yeah. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And we're talking with Mike Keyport. He is the uh, great grandson of of the legendary John Bear Grease. Your family must swell in pride uh, every January when this race comes around. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I, I give the uh, board of directors a lot of credit for for keeping that part of culture in this race i'd be disappointed if they didn't yeah well we bruce and i uh, were affiliated with the iditarod this is our first time to this race and it's been uh, a glorious four or five days for us we've learned a lot we've seen a lot and uh we get to meet there's so many great people there is like, there really this, is in this race there, there really is and people people will tell you that there's different parts of the world that's god's country but you're you're standing in it right now i'm telling you yeah <laughs> And what, what do you do the rest of the, the year? Or what do you do for a living? I, I actually, I'm the emergency management director for the for Cook County here. Okay. And, uh, I've, I worked for the tribe for a number yeah. of years, and I just recently uh, went to work for the county. So. Yeah. Well, Mr. So, Keyport, we appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys yeah. for uh, being out here with yeah. us. This is pretty exciting for our race. Yeah, and it's great to meet everybody 
everybody that's been associated, the number of volunteers, and, yes. and Bruce and I have been talking about it, you know, so often in these mushing events, uh, there are people that are so committed, so passionate about something, and, and they don't even have dogs, right. but yet they put right. so many men and women hours into an event like this to put it on. They really do. It's, it's, it, it, never, it never ceases to me, amaze me how how many people it draws and, and the people, like you say, they take vacation to come yeah. up here and stand out in the cold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Keyport, let's send it back to the studio in Oslo. We're efforting an interview right now with, with Keith Eiley. We hope to have that for you momentarily. So for now, let's go back to you. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you to Mike Keyport. Look at now as our dog teams are getting into min uh, Mineral Center. And uh, it's the last checkpoint uh, before the finish line. So they're taking their four hours of mandatory rest there. Colleen Walden was uh, coming into uh, the checkpoint just a little uh, while ago. And uh, how does her dogs look, uh, Dallas? I think we got a nice looking dog team coming in here. Um, she seemed uh, perky and you know, happy with how things are going. Dogs are looking really good. A uh, little bit out of the, the running for the front of the race, but having a very successful race all the same. Yes, and um, we, uh, we got an interview with her, uh, with Bruce, and so uh, we get to talk a little bit to Colleen Wallen. Let's hear what she had to say. Come back to Mineral Center, Greg Heister and Colleen. And so tell us about, uh, you had an encounter out on the trail on the trip in here. Beautiful, be beautiful. About 12 miles back, I came around a corner and I saw something in a snowbank and out popped two bull moose, still had their racks on. Whoa. I mean, they were probably 50 yards in front of me and the team and I stopped and they looked and then they just started moving. It was amazing just watching a move. I've, I've never encountered that so close. Yeah. We followed them, I bet, I, maybe for a minute. So it was probably 20 seconds. <laughs> and then they <laughs> lumbered off into, they took, they took it into the woods and uh, the snow was up to their shoulders. They could hardly move. And then I, I passed them. They stood there and watched me pass them. And that was it. But. We were going about 20 miles an hour, so wow. it was a it was really a beautiful, beautiful, yeah. yeah. So did the dogs smell the moose? Did they see the moose? Yeah, did they, my their, leaders, their attitudes yeah, change when yeah. they saw it? My leaders perked up about I don't know 20 seconds before we came around the corner. I mean, I could smell them. I could smell the moose. Yeah. So, so you I'm know looking they at did. yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at my leaders and I'm like, what's up, you guys? Wow. Yeah. yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you weren't frightened at all that like they didn't make a, a, an attempt to get on the trail? I was really frightened because yeah. I didn't know if they would turn around and not want to give up the trail, which is typical of moose. The snow right. is so deep. Yeah. Um, but we were staying behind them. I let the dogs go. You know, we were just trotting behind them while loping, but um, we didn't get too close and just in case something, if they were to turn. Um, I don't know what my plan would have been, <laughs> but it was very beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Thanks, me too. Guys, See, yeah. Let's go back to Thanks. Oslo, to the studio. What a story. Thank you, Greg. And uh, Colleen had met a moose. Uh, have any of you met a moose before out in the trails? That's a pretty common occurrence in Alaska, particularly. I've seen many noose, moose on the uh, Norwegian trails as mm -hmm. well, but um, in Alaska, they're everywhere, right? And moose are a real concern, particularly later in the season when you've got deep snow. It's been a long winter for the moose. The deep snow covers up all their food and then cold temperatures. They can be very possessive of the trail as they feel a little bit um, endangered when they get out in the deep snow where the, their legs are just buried in snow, they're up to their belly. So yeah. you will see moose have a bit of a standoff with the dog team where they don't want to step off the hard pack trail. 
I've had a number of encounters with moose, only one serious one. And in Alaska, we can carry a handgun with us <laughs> to kind of protect our team. So in, in bad conditions or very cold, deep snow winters, I usually do carry a, a handgun or a rifle with me, particularly when training. Well, that's not legal in Norway. Well, I, I also uh, experienced almost the same thing. Uh, there was a neighbor training his dogs. Uh, the, uh, the moose charged his teams, walked into the, the team, and he was driving matching 14 dogs. And uh, he actually used, uh, he had an ax in his sled. So he actually tr uh, was able to kill the moose. That was in Sweden. And I was the one coming straight after, so there, there was a lot of blood on the, in, in the trail, but they moved the moose out of the trail with snow machines. But uh, I got the opportunity to see a bear on that moose later on. Ooh. Yeah, when <laughs> the snow melted. When the snow melted. Yeah. yeah. But that gun or rifle is just to like frighten the moose, then just to fire off uh, oh. in the air. Basically. That's no, I've, I carry a handgun. I've actually, yeah. in training, I killed a moose that was attacking my dogs. I actually have a, one of my, the oldest dog in my yard right now is a three legged dog who we lost a leg after the encounter with a moose. So, hmm. yeah, it is um, it is a real concern. Uh, most Iditarod mushers will carry a gun, at least for most of training. And on occasion, you will have to use it to defend your yourself and your dogs. Hmm. But if you have to defend the, or kill the moose during the ID trot, you have to, to take care of the moose before you can move on, right? Yep. Um, that's state law. You have to, uh, if you t kill a moose or any large game animal in defense of life and property, you have to gut that moose so that the meat can be salvaged and used. So you have to clean it up before you can continue on the race and no other musher can pass you. So if you're stopped dealing with this moose, nobody else can pass you until that chore is done. Hmm. Which means you don't want to kill the moose. <laughs> no, you don't. You're going to lose a lot of time. Real yeah. It's a real yeah. pain. It's definitely something you were going to try to scare them off as much as possible. And of course, actually killing the moose is your last case scenario. Yeah. But what I do, I put a little bell on my lead dogs when I train in areas with lots of moose or reindeer for that sake. Because oh. I've been living in northern Sweden, training a lot. And I put a little small, a small bell like the ones the sheep would use. I put it on my lead dogs, one of the lead dogs. So it, my team will make a little noise mm -hmm. to make sure that moose will be aware that you're actually coming. Yeah, so that you don't frighten them. Yeah. Uh, we actually have some uh, graphics to look at for where uh, on the rankings for where our dog teams are right now. All right. This is in Skyport. So this out. is actually working back up the trail from the previous checkpoint of Skyport. Um, so I guess we're going to go through this in reverse order. So we have in uh, kind of the back of the pack, but on the trail is Kevin Mathis. Lisa Dietzen was still in the checkpoint. Laura Nice is on the trail in 11th place. Um, Jay Fouché in 10th place, making her way towards that Mineral City checkpoint. Um, nine is Jennifer Frecking. Should be a little ways up here. There's a pretty good gap between these two mushers here, but there's Jennifer Frecking, Peter McClellan, Nathan Schroeder has just reached the checkpoint not long ago, and prior to him was Blake Frecking, Colleen Wallen, Martin Massacott, Ryan Anderson, Keith Oily, and Ryan Reddington was the first into the Mineral City checkpoint. Yeah, and the reason why they're there is because they have to have that four mandatory rest, four hours of mandatory rest. Yep, everybody's going to have to stay at this Mineral City checkpoint for four hours, um, plus there's a little bit of differentials that they have to account for all the mushers have to have stopped for 24 hours over the course of the race and they have to take at least four hours at this checkpoint so they may take more so here's ryan reddington when he pulled into the the mineral city um, checkpoint there and had a nice looking team and he's probably uh, ready to go off soon this is oh, are you ready for more yep so he will probably leave. I heard that he will yep. leave soon. We're getting close to his out time. Yeah, it's, um, he'll leave in six local minutes' time. time. Is twelve twenty-three, no. and his out time is uh, twelve twenty-eight. So, so yeah, it's six just minutes. A few minutes. Yep. Um, no, so these dogs have had a full rest here. They've all had a little over four hours, yeah, yeah. and they're going to be getting ready to take off. We see a perky team. Everybody is alert and aware coming into the checkpoint. We saw a little bit when they were caring for the dogs. The dogs seem to be eaten. Um, you know, Ryan's obviously in a hurry to get out of here, but we did get a brief interview with him certainly after you arrived at the checkpoint. And he's aware of the positioning with the other mushers by now. I know when he first got here, he wasn't sure of the time. But as a musher, I know that while he's been taking his rest here, he'll know how far behind him Keith Eiley is going to be taking off. Um, and he's going to be focusing on getting over this last run, you know, quickly, but most importantly, doing it at a pace his team can do the whole way. Last year, he ended up having to take an extra break during this last run to be able to reach the finish line. Um, I don't think we're going to see that this year. He seems to have a pretty lively, perky team. He's um, run a fairly smart race here, 
and I think Ryan Reddington's probably our number one pick to win it. And he's going to have a 33-minute lead at Keith Ailey yep. out from a mineral center. It's nice to see this here with the dogs lapping up water and food. I mean, it's, you know, obviously their batteries aren't drained. They're still at, you know, a full, or not a full charge. They're ready for a rest, but they're still plenty well rested to drink some water, um, be alert, aware, see what's going on. They ate their food there. So, um, yeah. So now they're in harness and uh, ready to take off soon, I think. Yeah. Four minutes. Yeah. In four, he'll he'll get a leave on time. Of course, this, this is the last leg of the race. He's not gonna waste. He's not gonna waste any minutes before leaving. No. He's gonna leave on time. Mm. The question is how many dogs he will keep in his team. Oh well, he got he had eight dogs coming into Mineral Center. So the question is, is he gonna drop any dog or is he dropping any dog at this uh, checkpoint? Will he be leaving with all eight or would he be down to six or seven? they got to have six dogs to uh, cross the finish line. Mm. And they started with uh, 12 dogs. And uh, does that often happen that he has to pull out, out because of the race or get scratched because you don't have any more dogs? Oh, like, you're, you're talking to somebody fire? who's actually experienced that. I was uh, placing very well in the Finnmark race. I was at the last checkpoint of Karashok uh, as number six. I uh, had some dogs and I had to drop out of the race because I was down to five dogs because my dogs caught pneumonia. Mm. That was uh, a very sad experience, but all dogs record well. So. Yeah, and you it just had to do it. Well, we, absolutely, because I had to have six dogs to finish and I only had five dogs, so that was I was able to do a race. And uh, that's probably the worst experience I ever had. And uh, that year was very special. So uh, that was very sad for me. I cried a lot. <laughs> and uh, we actually have uh, more of uh, Eilie when he came into the, um, the finish. No, yeah, the this is Keith Eilie coming yeah. into uh, the last checkpoint of the Bear Grease 300 race. Um, nice looking team. The dogs charged in here. He covered this run, I believe, about uh, almost two minutes faster than Ryan Reddington, which is not a big difference, right? They were out there for just shy of five hours. Uh, Ryan Reddington at 446, okay, Keith Eilie at four hours and 44 minutes. So a two minute difference is not significant. But again, a nice looking dog team here. Um, I was very, very pleased to see this whole team looking, looking strong. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he did leave one or two dogs behind at this checkpoint before proceeding on. Um, but it's, yeah, because he has very many. He had 11 dogs there. Ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, at this point, everybody's unless there's something serious that we're not seeing here. I think everybody's going to have an, enough dogs at this point. The concern is if you drop down to, say, your six fastest dogs for this last run, and in Ryan Reddington's case, where he has eight, it would not be unrealistic to leave the two slowest ones behind. But then, man, if you only have six dogs in the ground and one little thing happens and you have to load a dog in your sled, now you only have five because you have to have six on the ground pulling the sled at all times, not just, you know, so if one of them's riding and five are pulling, that's not okay. We saw that last year in the Finnmark race as well, uh, top three runners, uh, one of them had to quit our scratch at the last checkpoint due to, to a few dogs. Mm, so then it would be good to have eight then, to have a safety. At least one extra is always kind of nice. Um, you know, if it's a six dog minimum, I'd like to have at least seven, just because you never know. I mean, I've had uh, dogs that were perfect, very strong dogs, and just took a stumbling step and kind of strained a muscle because they stepped, you know, where we know that there are moose on this trail, and they can sometimes leave a hole. That's the size of a moose foot, which is not very safe for a dog team if they step into that hole. Um, so it's nice to have a few extras. This team's, um, like we are saying, they're, they're looking good, perky. Um, <laughs> they're they're mellow, which you would expect to see, especially as we're getting straw. These are professional dogs that know that this is resting time, right? So when the straw comes out, it's time to lay down. But still, the dogs are you know alert and awake and aware. Um, and I'm I'd be curious to see you know how well are are they all eating? As long as they've been eating well over the course of the race, you know they don't have to devour a huge meal here at this last checkpoint. But as long as they're all getting a little bit of calories in at this point, I think is good. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he did leave one dog out, you know, again with that 11 dog team, you have to assume that he would be faster with the nine fastest ones. In my thinking, and I know everybody, every musher is a little bit different on their opinions on this. But we see dogs um, eating a food. This one is a little concerned because there's a camera in his face. <laughs> and I 
I've definitely experienced this as a musher where I'm trying to get the dogs to eat and I want this to, you know, to get their food. And sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating when there's a camera, I know, camera I know. sneaking up on them. But being there, don't this is, These are good dogs. You know, they see the camera like, yeah, you're, you're, you're right there, but he's still eating his food. And obviously our camera guy's experience recognized that and then kind of backed off there. Coming in here, we have Ryan Anderson. Um, he rolled into this checkpoint. He had a little bit, uh, well, I guess he had a, this pretty much the same run time. No, I think that's right. He did this run in four hours and 41 minutes. So he was just about uh, five minutes faster than Ryan Reddington, um, only a few minutes faster than Keith Eilie. Um Now he did have to carry a dog with him for the last portion of this run. And that certainly will have affected his run time. But still, he's looking at about an hour and 10 minutes behind Ryan Reddington when it comes time to leave here. So here we see him, you know, oh, his, his team's trying to take off. <laughs> so he's trying to unload the, the dog that got a ride. And there you go, when you load a 55 or 60 pound dog, that's a good sized dog there, that's probably a 60 pounder. When you load them in there, that's gonna affect your team's speed. And there again, there can be many reasons for loading a dog. Most likely as he is trying to catch up with these other guys, and because of that, running a little faster pace, and you might find that one of them's just not comfortable running at that speed. What we've seen from this trail is this last section, at least coming into the checkpoint, was groomed, and it's a wide trail. So uh, it, your team can actually go faster you know, by picking up that dog off the trail and loading it in the sled. But obviously, it's not as good as having all dogs firing on all cylinders. But Maria, you will also see that some of the measures on the last leg here on the way to the finish line might uh, start uh, without or not using booties on their dogs because you might have a higher speed if you drop using booties. But uh, we'll see because if you are in like a, a race uh, where it's very, very tight, very close, it's every second counts and uh, you might get a higher speed speed or uh, okay, shorter leg time will. while uh, without the booties actually. Uh, yeah. Right. Are you, you, do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you would only do that on the last leg in a long, long, long race. I would never do that in the middle of a race. Here we had Martin Massacott coming into the checkpoint. Um, and I think from my, uh, what I've seen thus far, he had one of the nicest looking teams coming into the checkpoint with lots of energy. We just got a quick glimpse of that there where these guys are barking after reaching the checkpoint, yeah. excited to get over there. Here he put down some dog food, just some kibbles of food on the ground, right as soon as you pull in. There is a window in the first about 45 minutes after you stop running where their, their metabolism and their digestive process is very available for the uptake of nutrients and food. So you do want to get a little bit of calories uh, into them, particularly kind of the, the carbohydrates they need, which isn't a lot. It's not a large portion of their diet. But in, get that into the dogs right away when you mm. get to the checkpoint. That's a solid looking team. I think it'd be safe to say that his primary focus, again, we're talking about Martin Massacott here, yep. is going to be the Iditarod. Yep. And where is not, that? Not very long. Where is that so this is undoubtedly being used as a training run. Uh, I'm sure he wants to do well in this race. He is doing very well in this race, but I don't think over the course of the last couple of days, I don't think he's going to be stressing that team to try to catch up with Ryan Reddington to try to win the race. I think it's more important that to him that he runs this at a pace that primes his team, that his team is better after this race and ready for the editor. And we don't know how many dogs he got at his kennel, so he might be careful with uh, uh, this race to prepare these dogs for the editor. I don't know whether he's going to use the same dogs or not. but probably I think it'd be safe to assume that the dogs that he brought with him here Absolutely. are the prime candidates candidates for his idea to I would, I would guess yeah. so too, but I mean, he could have a lot more dogs at home as well. We don't know. We don't know yep. much about him. Hmm. But he's uh, been doing a lot of races in uh, Canada and uh, the, the, in the United States, uh, smaller races or races. Where we ha he's done pretty well as well. And he has also been uh, finishing the Yukon Quest as number six in uh, 2003. Yeah, so that was a while ago, right? Yeah, um, so the, the dogs in his kennel are undoubtedly very different. Or at, at minimum, we're looking at a few generations later than the dogs that were in his team in 2003. But clearly, as a musher, he has experience. Mm -hmm. He's experienced a thousand mile race. But I, I will say that thousand mile races in general have changed in the last, you know, what are we looking at? Almost 17 years That's now from then. So, um, yeah, it's a different well, game. Well, since Robert still... Shirley won the Editor in 2003 with his special race arrest race schedule after that there was a lot kind of change changed. actually yeah yeah and I, would, I guess what i would touch on is um you know we regularly do thousand mile races a day faster than they were done back in the 2005 was my first i did a rod it was a different era different type of mushing but the crucial element is can you travel with a dog team 
for a thousand miles mm. and doing that well. And especially as a rookie in the Iditarod, I don't think we're going to see, you know, Martin Massacott trying to win the Iditarod. But man, from what I'm seeing here, I'm liking this team for rookie of the year. Yeah, I, I need totally, to look at the Iditarod totally. closer and see who else is in there. But he's running a really smart race. The dogs look great. Um, you don't need to have a huge team to do really well in the Iditarod. If these 10 dogs that he's running now, I believe he has 10, um, if they're still, if, the, if that's his core group, I wouldn't be afraid to start the Iditarod with those 10 dogs, right? Um, especially since there's obviously a good connection here. He knows what those dogs need. To be able to keep a dog team looking like that, he knows what they need. He, he knows what's sustainable for that team. Well, right now, now we're talking about uh, building a team because you don't know how many dogs he has, but maybe this is uh, mascots. Um, the winning team that he will bring to the Iditarod. And um, we actually been talking to Jennifer and Blake Frecking about uh, how, who would you bring along? Because when you're building a dog team, you want to bring your best companions with you. Let's look at this. In building a team, you have certain essential components like trust and respect and those things. I can't just say, I'm the alpha dog, guys. That's, that's the way it's going to be. You have to earn that trust. <laughs> keep building and building and building and never break that trust, they'll do anything for you. And just like a human, once you do something that does kind of break their trust or break their faith in you, you don't get that back. I mean, you can earn some trust back, you can earn some respect back, but it's probably not gonna be the same. With our puppies, it's different because it starts at such a young age. It's essentially at birth, you know, we're working with these puppies and, you know, after a while, you know, they can smell us, they can hear us, they can see us after a couple weeks. And at that point, their mother is the nucleus of their world, and we're just kind of this outside component. But after a few weeks, you know, we start bringing them into the house, and now we're that familiar component that they can kind of bond with and look to you as that safety place. You know, then we start doing adventures out in the woods, and they're seeing the world as this great big place. And, and again, now we're that familiar thing to them. And I think that's a big part with building them from the very beginning to have, you know, that kind of trust and we just build on that. Most of the dogs we've raised and trained ourselves here at our kennel, um, but this is a group that was born in another kennel and uh, I'm helping them train up for some future Iditarod races. So these guys are mostly two and three year olds. A lot of these guys have only done 17 mile runs prior to coming here. Um, most of them have never run a race. so. So it's a group of rookies and we're pulling them together and, and they're looking great at this point. So couldn't be happier with the group. You know, we started out you know, just doing a lot of this kind of work, just free running and socializing and getting them to get accustomed to one another. You know, it allows them to play around and be dogs in a little different atmosphere than when we're hooking up, there's a little more stress and a little more pressure to drive forward and that natural instinct for them to drive kicks in as well. You know, one of the things we're always striving for is, you know, never ask more than what they can give you. And, you know, just keeping an upbeat attitude, they're, they feed off of us. You know, how we're feeling is how they're feeling. And they know when we're faking it. So you, you have to be real and, and always be upbeat and they follow along. Always be upbeat, did Beck say. And that must be a little bit hard sometimes to always be upbeat for your dogs. How do you feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, you know, I try to sing sometimes. I sing pretty bad, actually. But I do <laughs> try to sing to keep the dogs upbeat and also get some energy from me to the dogs. Although I might not be upbeat, um, although I can't sing, I do feel that for some reason Everything seems to be more uh, playful, which affects the dogs as well. And yeah, well, <laughs> I'm just happy there are no competitors in the area at that time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my dogs would not be happy if I sang. <laughs> I think that would definitely be disappointing for them. But um, no, I, 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 he's right. You need to be upbeat when the dogs need to be lifted up. When the dogs need to be calmed down, you need to project that calm, confident, you know, you got to keep them, you got to temper their feelings, if you will. So in the starting of this race, we talked about trying to keep the dogs mellower, right? Because they're going really crazy. You don't want to be crazy, bubbly musher picking up the dogs at that time. What they need is you to be 
confident because this is a weird environment. It's an exciting environment for the dogs. They need a solid leader there. And I think to try to mellow them a little bit later in the race, yeah, it's good to you know have an upbeat attitude. And more than anything, the most important thing is the dogs need to know everything's going to be okay, right? Mm-hmm. As you're going through different trails, different environments, and that confidence can be derived from the musher. And one of the ways that we can project that confidence is by being upbeat. But some mushers are not generally super bubbly people. They're just mm-hmm. mellow, steady people. And so if that's what the dogs are used to, as long as they're projecting confidence, that's what the dogs are going to pick up on. Yeah. And he said that uh, he had these dogs from while they were puppies. Like they could see them and suddenly smell them and hear them. Uh, have you had puppies that you have raised? Oh, yeah, many yeah. times. But I'm not, I never had a big kennel, but I've had many, many litters. And uh, mostly I keep all the puppies myself. Um, mostly because I don't breed as much, but I hate selling my younger dogs. I never, I have sold puppies sometimes when they're eight weeks old, but most of the time I try to keep them and try to make the best dogs out of them as possible. And if they don't function for my use, I would tr- maybe sell them uh, when they're a little bit older, but normally I keep all my dogs. Yeah, but are there some dogs who's just... No, they don't work in my team. Like, no, this dog, I need to sell him because he doesn't work in my team. I think I can touch on that one for a yeah. second. That um, we very rarely sell a dog that's young. Uh, what we breed, what we want to have for racing, right? Um, but as they get older, our job is, how do I say this? Our job is to make sure that that dog is a success. And sometimes where that dog can be a success or be a successful dog isn't necessarily in our kennel. So it's funny, we talked about this when we were watching earlier, a couple days ago, and the 120 race was starting, and one of the mushers said that they had a few dogs that came from a dog they got from me. And that dog we sold there because yeah. it was it worked way too hard to be a 1,000-mile dog. It needed to be running 120-mile races or 300-mile races because that's where that dog can be successful. When we do find a new home for a dog, one of my standards is I want that dog to be one of the best five dogs in the kennel that it's going to. That means it's going to be successful. It's going to be in the top percent of the team it's running with. The musher is going to value it and you know be happy that it's here. The dog's strong, successful, and they're always going to be able mm. to accomplish the goal or the tasks put in front of them well. So when the dog's born in our kennel, you're responsible for that dog through their entire life, even if that's not necessarily in your kennel. It's about finding where they are successful. I think that's a very good thing you're saying there, that you take care of your dog, although it moves to another kennel. Yep, and that's sometimes that's the best thing you can do for them is put them where they can. That's a very positive thing. And As a human athlete, I hate running with people in better shape than me or faster <laughs> than me. If you can run consistent six-minute miles, we can be friends, but we're not going to run together. So <laughs> um, such a I would act. rather go run with a team that runs at the pace that I'm comfortable running at. Yes. <laughs> and you all, that it goes for dogs too that you have to make it fun for the dogs if not they will just exactly again like every day we're asking these dogs do you want to go do you want to go mushing and the answer will be yes if it's easy for them if they're going to run at an eight minute mile pace like i mean you know then i can have fun doing it but if my friends say do you want to go running and i know they're faster than me not really <laughs> i'll stay home <laughs> yeah but you might get even better <laughs> but uh, in the dog team if there are two dogs who's pretty similar like both sort of very leading types and they they conquer the same things it will it be too much or do you sometimes have to not use those two good dogs at the same time is it something like that or do you oh. have to make them work together Let's see. Uh, let's find an example. Uh, okay, I got two b- brothers at my home. They're eight years old now. They're from uh, Roger Dahl in Alta, who's been uh, racing the editor, and uh, the mother is from me. Uh, these two boys are quite energetic. Uh, they always play together uh, in the dog yard and at the property. And most of the time, I like to keep them together as well in the team because I know they really enjoy running together. So, and one of them is a little bit better lead dog than the other one. So I might use him a little bit more in the front uh, with somebody else, mostly a female, because he loves females. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these two guys are so happy being running together. And when they're resting at the checkpoints, they will start licking each other's fur if they're wet or full of snow. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I try to keep uh, dogs that uh, was word thrive together. That I want to thrive. Yeah. Thrive. Yep. I want to keep them together in the team as well, because then I feel they have much more um, 
ple- uh, pleasance while running. I, I were, uh, probably using the wrong word here, but they, I see they enjoy being together. Mm-hmm. Why separate them? If they are having fun running next to each other, barking at each other, and they're like so close when they're also in the dog yard and at home. Well, then go, and I'm never going to sell one of them. They're going to live together for the rest of their life. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that their two dogs are very similar. No, yeah. no, no. no, no. no and, and, but the, sometimes I think what you're asking is, are there dogs that um, contrast each other or have conflicts with each other? Is that what mm, you're thinking? Yeah. And I have had dogs that just simply do not get along. <laughs> you know, they're both very um, dominant males. Yep. Um, and so you can have some resistance. Now, I think it's pretty clear in my pack that I am the pack leader. So I don't have real fights or tussles between dogs. That's very, very rare. I mean, of course it can happen, but it's very rare. Um, but what you can have is resistance. And so this is a lot of what a long distance racer is doing is trying to reduce the resistance on the team. We want to travel as smoothly, as easily as possible. And one of the things that causes resistance is stress. So you might have these two dogs and yeah, they'll run together. They won't have an outright fight between them because they know that that's not allowed, but they will both be posturing and kind of, you know, puffed and, up a little bit. And at the chicken, and they might not like to eat together. Oh. Exactly. And so there's, there's places where there's friction between those two dogs. Mm-hmm. So as a musher, what I'm trying to do is find, like, like uh, Nina was saying, dogs that thrive together. And this is streamlined. This is relaxed. This is comfortable. And I can put them together. Other dogs, I might want to put them apart. Now, not one right behind the other, because that's stressful for the one in front. If he knows right behind him, there's somebody he doesn't like. So I try to space them even farther in the team. But it's been a few years since I've had anybody in my team that there was real friction between two of the dogs. This is like being a teacher, actually. You don't want to put <laughs> the students uh, in junior high school just next to each other if they hate that's each exactly, other. That's exactly. That's a great analysis. I know, I've been working as a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, cool. And uh, also, uh, you've been uh, breeding some of your dogs, and both of you, I know, have Alaskan Huskies. But uh, we went to talk to Blake and Jennifer Frecking because they're really fond of their Siberians. I don't really mind selling a great dog because if we can send a great dog to someone who's into Siberians and they have some success with that dog, they're more likely to stay in the breed and not you know, make the switch to Alaskans. Our kennel, we specialize in our in the purebred Siberian Husky, and that roots back to my youth, actually. My mom had a team of Siberian Huskies, um, and we both worked at a kennel in Alaska that was one of the big historical kennels of Siberian Huskies, the Anadir Kennel in Willow. And so it's where our foundation is with the with Siberian Husky. We're very passionate about the, the breed, the working aspect of the breed. Most Siberian Huskies in the world aren't bred for racing. They're not specifically bred to be working dogs anymore in general. The Alaskan Husky is, is also bred for the purpose of running and really solely bred for the purpose of being a sled dog. There's no, they're not an AKC registered breed. The Siberian Husky, we are staying with the AKC registered dogs, and, and so we can't just go breed to, to anyone else's sled dog that happens to run really right great and doesn't have AKC papers. Uh, so it's, it's we can find ourselves to that genetic pool. But they're, they have amazing coats, they have amazing feet, they're tough dogs. Every single puppy we raise knows they're a sled dog. They love what they do. Our breeding program is, is maintaining the diversity of the genetics we have in the yard uh, and, and improving our our line of Siberian Husky. We have some diversity. We have a dog we've imported from Sweden and another one will coming next year. Um, and so we've maintained, that's why we have as many dogs as we do to maintain a few different genetic lines in the kennel. We don't raise puppies to sell. We sell a few good dogs to other kennels every year. And part of that is also helping the breed as a whole, because if we can sell good dogs to others, you know, that just perpetuates the breed. My goal for starting a dead ride with my Siberian Husky team is definitely set on doing the best my team can do. I'm really not worried about placement. We're probably gonna finish in the middle of the pack, but I'm not gonna worry about that. It really is just running that team to the best of their ability. So that was the Siberians. And this time, uh, Blake Frecking is actually running a mixed team with both Alaskan and some uh, Siberians. Isn't that right? Mm-hmm. He's got two Siberians and ten, started with two Siberians and eight, uh, ten Alaskans. Yep. Yep. And, his, you know, Colleen, or I'm sorry, um, Jennifer Frecking has a full team of Siberian Huskies in this race now. And then I think Jay Fouché has a few Siberians in her team as well. 
so they can they can be mixed up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they work the same way. But what are Alaskan huskies? Yeah, so as they were just talking about, the Siberian husky is a purebred AKC registered dog, right? So like they're saying, you can't just breed to some other good dog. It has to have papers, which for some of us feels like, you know, we're trying to breed the best possible sled dog. So what difference does the paper make, right? Um, that's just for the accounting. Now, what I race is Alaskan huskies and Nina as well, I believe. So. The Alaskan Husky is a mixed breed dog. It is a breed of a dog. Like these guys that we're seeing on screen now, we see all different colorations. Um, oftentimes you'll see consistency within one kennel where all the dogs in one team, they're mixed breed, but they have a similar look. Other teams, it can be anything in there. Um, the Alaskan Husky is derived from Siberians and Malamutes and the Arctic pulling dogs. Mostly Siberian Huskies and the Alaskan Malamute. And especially during the gold rush era in Alaska, the very late 1800s, the early 1900s, we saw a lot of people coming to Alaska and gold mining, and with them they brought any dog. They brought these random large, usually working breed dogs, sheep dogs and other similar dogs, brought them to Alaska, crossed them with the Malamutes and Siberians that were native to the Arctic. And the resulting mutt that came up around the gold rush was just generically called the Alaskan Husky. So you couldn't recreate the Alaskan Husky. But what is cool about it now, we see mushers that have had their same line of dogs for 30 years, and it almost has become a purebred or a very line-bred dog. So now there's so much between breeding a Jeff King dog and a Martin Boozer dog and a Mitch CV dog, and you will get predictable results by crossing these established lines of the mixed breed Alaskan Husky. Yeah, and these dogs, they used to bring supplies into the gold mines and then bring gold, gold out. Gold out, yeah, yeah, a lot of gold out. Cool. <laughs> yeah. My great-grandfather was actually a gold uh, digger in um, yeah, it was a miner in yeah. Alaska. So cool. maybe he used uh, these kind of dogs. <laughs> oh, yeah. time. Yep. There's a lot of different modes of transportation that were tried, but you know, Iditarod, the, we know it as a race, right, in the mushing community. It was at one time the third largest city in Alaska. The town of Iditarod had 10,000 people living there. Um, during the gold rush, the Iditarod Trail was the route to get to Iditarod to go pan for gold or prospect for gold. Uh, so a lot of our culture and history around mushing in Alaska goes back to the gold rush. But now Iditarod is nothing. It's just uh, a... It's a ghost just, town and no, the closest yeah. uh, po permanently populated area is Shagaluk, some 54 trail miles away. Um, it is a remote area, <laughs> uh, but at the time it was the third largest city in Alaska mm -hmm. and everything in the winter months came and went by a dog team. Mm -hmm. That was the lifeline to keep that place alive with almost 10,000 mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And then we have the story with uh, the, the, the run with dog teams uh, uh, to Nome uh, to, to carry the serum, the serum uh, to, to help the people of Nome uh, suffering from the, the diphtheria. The yep, it's just the pronunciation here. <laughs> <laughs> Mind my language. <laughs> uh, where they used the dog teams. That was the only means of transportation to get the serum out to Nome. Where we had Norwegian, uh, Leonard Seppala, Gunnar Korsen helping out, uh, bringing the serum. And um, some of the dogs being used became really famous uh, later on. Example, statue in Central Park, New York of uh, Balto. <laughs> yeah, Balto and mm. Togo. Togo, Balto, yeah. yeah. Mm. And then you have the new movie now, the Togo movie. Yeah. Or Togo, as we say in Norwegian. Togo, mm. yeah. Which uh, explains this amazing story about uh, the dogs who brought supplies in and out from uh, these gold mining towns. And actually, um, we're uh, going, some of our measures are starting to leave the last checkpoint towards the finish line in Grand Portage. And uh, we spoke to Colleen Walden about the la very last leg of the John Berger Sled Dog Marathon. So you leave the seventh leg and you do a loop. You're very, very close to Canada running on um, trails up in Grand Portage. And then the dogs start sensing and they know my dogs are seasoned. And I think the younger dogs that don't really know they're going to the finish line, they just glean all the confidence they can for that seventh run for the final push. The other dogs let them know, hey, it's okay. We're going to groove and we're headed to the finish line. And then you get to the finish line and you think, I wish the race wasn't over. We're, we're just having so much fun. I wish it wasn't over. 
and soon we will know who's the first one over the uh, finish line, but they have this leg in front, the, uh, in front of them first. And Dallas, it looks pretty short on the map <laughs> between this last uh, mineral center and to Grand Portage, but it isn't. Or is Five it? miles out. We, yeah, the, yeah, I mean, as we see it, as the crow flies, it's approximately five miles here between these two locations. But they're going to do a 40-mile run in this section. So they're going to go out and actually go do a loop over here and then come back. There's going to be a section of the trail where teams could pass head on. Then they're going to go do yet another loop and then yet another loop in another direction. So they're going to rack up a 40-mile run. Or 64 kilometers. Yeah, 64K. And they're going to get this distance in. Um, there's probably going to be a number of road crossings. You're going to see uh, more spectators on this section as we are getting close to the end. Uh, last year, this run... Um, was taking the mushers about, I want to say it was, uh, I'm pulling up my numbers here, four hours and 16 minutes for Jennifer Frecking. Blake Frecking did it in about four hours and 21 minutes. You know, I think we're going to see similar times this year for this last section of the trail. Um, yeah. And so it's going to be a challenge for some of these mushers if they want to make up a 30 minute gap between mushers to kind of try to catch up. And here we can see the loops. And is it hard, is it tough on the dogs, Nina, to make them cross paths that they have uh, run Well, before? as long as they're used to tra uh, this kind of training, passing their kennel while training is not a big problem. These dogs are so trained for this. Uh, it's fun for the handlers, though, because they can stay put in a mineral, mineral center and wait to see their mushers uh, passing close nearby uh, before going to the finish line. And if they're going to drive down, they'll uh, reach that in time. Sure. And, and when we look at this map, you just saw the whole kind of squiggly trail in here. Of course, the trail they're supposed to be mushing on is the one highlighted in white there. But what I see when I see this map is we probably see 10% of the trails that are actually out there. There's going to be a lot of other skiing trails and snowmobile trails and recreational trails. Mm -hmm. And of course, they picked the ones to make the race trail that got the right distance and probably maximized that distance. It's going to be very important that the mushers follow the markers because there are going to be other trails in here that we don't see on this map um, that could easily, you know, you come around a hard turn on the trail and you, your dog, your lead dogs are some distance in front of you. They already might be three steps down the wrong trail before you come around the corner. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need to be on your toes, paying attention. Um, you don't want to go take the wrong turn or the wrong exactly. direction, the no. wrong trail, the you last part of the race. You don't want to get on a wrong turn here. And like I'm saying, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of trails in this area that aren't showing up on the map. What we're looking at right now is Ryan Reddington, who was the first musher out of the Mineral Center checkpoint. Um, he left there at about 12.28 local time. Actually, he was about a minute behind his his allowed departure time. Not a big deal. He, he does have... He dropped one dog. Yep, he dropped yeah. down one dog, but he does have about a... We're looking at about a 33-minute lead, 32-minute lead over the earliest that Keith Eiley can leave the checkpoint. He did go from eight dogs down to seven dogs, yep. and that's something we talked about a little bit before before the teams departed. You know, is that too few? And we're saying we wouldn't want to have six, but having your core team is ideal. So I'm, I'm thinking that Ryan probably had some of the same process. He's got seven good dogs that are ready to do this run fast. Um, it's about risk management. That eighth dog, uh, if it's a little bit slower than the others, could be more of a liability. The only way that he's going to lose half an hour at this point is if something really goes wrong or he has to carry a dog in his sled. So if there's any dog that I'm concerned about having to carry my sled on the last run, I'm going to leave them behind and just mitigate that risk altogether and take a smaller team. Ryan's an athletic guy. He's going to be able to help the dogs out up the hills. Now behind him, Keith Eiley came into the checkpoint with 11 dogs. So he might have a significantly larger yeah, team. Yeah, absolutely. But, and he's leaving in four minutes time, actually. Yep, leaving very soon here. And I would I would not at all be surprised if we see Keith Eiley do the same thing and leave one or two dogs behind, slim down to that core group that are ready for the final push. But these dogs are from the same kennel at the boat, the, f the, the, the leading teams, which means that they are trained probably in the same pace, in the same manner. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, Keith is able to catch up a little bit on our uh, lot. Yeah, I, I, on, uh, on Ryan now if he's gonna move out or start with uh, all 11 dogs. I'm gonna predict that he will do this run a little bit faster than yeah, Ryan. He will make up some time. I think it's unlikely that he will catch Ryan. 
-hmm. but I think he will make up some time. Mm -hmm. So I would, I mean, again, there's so much that can happen. Anything yeah. can happen. But looking simply at the numbers, Ryan's down one dog. We're going to know a lot more here when Keith Eiley leaves. What number of dogs does he have? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say he's going to make up 10 Make that uh, 12 and a half minutes, <laughs> maybe 15. Well, we've seen um, it in it races before that people are able to catch up 30 minutes or in this case, 33 minutes uh, at the last part of the well, race in the last leg, actually. And uh, this is only, only because it's not a long leg, it's only 64 kilometers or 40 miles. Uh, technically, it's absolutely possible to have a faster team, but these two teams are f from the same kennel, they train Mm. Probably last, together. So. Yep. Last year, Blake Frecking left this checkpoint um, in second place, and Ryan Reddington was in front of him. That's Blake right. Frecking did the run four hours and eight minutes faster than Ryan. Now, Ryan stopped and had to rest his dogs along the way. So, again, barring any you know unforeseen, I think we're going to see um, that, that gap between those mushrooms narrow, but not completely closed. Yep. But anything can happen, so that's why this can be fun. And this is where watching the trackers gets really exciting here in the next couple hours, because you can watch those little dots get closer and closer together as they progress and, and maybe overtake them. I feel the excitement right yes, now. Yes, no. It's because I know so right? very well that it's possible. Yeah, it and the last time they did the King's Road turnaround, then, they, uh, uh, then Fisher was scratched, right? Oh, he uh, had took a wrong turn. Yes, and, uh, and that might, it can happen now too when it's so many yep. uh, roads all, all over. Yep. So yep. When, real quick, let's just take a look. As we're going to be watching the trackers here on this final run, we're going to be pulling them up quite a lot, seeing where those mushers are. Yeah. We look at the statistics bar here with Ryan Reddington, who is currently on the trail. Um, the first one there was looking at how much of the, the trail that he has covered to p this point. Of course, he only has okay. about, uh, well, he has about 54 kilometers left to go. Um, he's taken thus far about equal run rest. And this is something that's neat about this format of a race with so much mandatory rest that it stays close to that 50% mark. On longer distance races, you're going to see more run time than rest time. Um, but it used to be the standard, I mean, used to be that you would do equal run and rest. So we still see that in races like this. Obviously, he's completed 100% of his mandatory 24 hours of rest. So that's completed there. Mm -hmm. So this, this stat bar is kind of helpful as we see in the race. But um, at this point, it's more of an assessment of the race. When we see the other teams, that uh, the ratio of run to rest is going to be different because their run times were slower. So by time, their run percentage will be greater than their rest percent. This is also going to change over the course of the run because obviously he isn't going to rest anymore before the finish, and he's going to spend the next four hours approximately running down the trail. So that will change a little bit. Here we have uh, Keith Eiley. Um, he's at right 50% run and rest. Um, he's completed his... Uh, his full-time about of rest. More than 100%. It's, 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 this one will round it up a little bit. And so some of this is their start differential that was added in. So that he was required to take additional rest, et cetera. Um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. Did he make it out of the checkpoint? He, I know he's... No, he's, he's, uh, he's in this very moment. take a look I'm at the map. I'm, I'm uh, updating. It says he's got 11 dogs here. It says 11 dogs. I will yeah. probably check that. Let's uh, see if Keith Eiley has left uh, Mineral Center. He was scheduled to depart at 101. Yep. It is currently That's 101. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> so he's so leaving this minute. So should start minute. moving here within the next 10 minutes as the, the GPS tracker update I'll keep you a little updated, bit Dallas. later there. So he's going to be hitting the trail soon, shortly behind him. And uh, let me go back to Eiley. What I'm excited to see there is how many dogs will he leave with? I'm, I would be willing to bet he's going to drop at least one dog in this checkpoint. Um, but I may be wrong. We'll, we'll see. I'll I, keep you posted. I know Reddington's uh, got to be very excited right now because, again, both of these teams are running from the same kennel. So when this race is over, Ryan has a deep pool of dogs to select from going into the Iditarod, which is the final race of the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. So he's going to be in a good position with a lot of depth. And I've been watching some other races in Alaska where kennels are doing the same thing. They're fielding two teams. You know, they've got 24 dogs on the trail. That's probably all the dogs that they've been training this season. And then ultimately will pick their top 14 mm. for the Iditarod. Mm. What about Keith Ailey? Do you think he will join the Iditarod or? Nope. He's, um, he's simply uh, what we would call, well, in this case, he's handling with Reddington running the second team. Um, Keith is a past um, Bear Grease champion, so he, he knows the trail. He knows the race. Um, 
And that's very helpful for Ryan to have somebody that experienced running that other group of dogs. Because as a, as a musher preparing for the Iditarod, that is a challenge where I want to work with my core 14, but then I have to have my extra dogs. You know, So I've got another 8 or 10 in training, and I need somebody that's experienced working with those dogs, training those dogs, and it's kind of like your, your JV squad. And some of them may get called up into the varsity team. So it, it is nice that Ryan has such an accomplished musher helping him. Now, he may get beat by that musher yes. <laughs> on this race. Um, it's still very possible. We'll see that in the Femin race as well. Last year's winner of the Femin and the Finnmark race, Thomas Vane, who's going to the Iditro this year, he's probably uh, more mostly having two teams in the Femin race. Probably somebody's doing the eight-dog class with his dogs as well, which may, means that he'll have a, a, a group of dogs to choose from before deciding who's going to Alaska. Yeah, and uh, earlier today we had Fisher, he was scratched and uh, yeah, because he, he, uh, he missed took the, the trail, wrong right? Okay, we yeah. just have some information. So oh, we have I some information. Fine, here we have 10 dogs with okay. Kate Ailey. Kate, 10 he, dogs. Yep. Ailey. So he dropped so one he's dog out, out here with Here is Fisher uh, earlier today. He lost, uh, he got yeah, off the beaten track. Yeah, he was north, uh, the, the, um, uh, John Fisher was north of the Twin Lakes and uh, close to Buff Creek. He went off trail, took a detour probably. There are other trails in the area. He m missed the markers, hit the wrong trail in the middle of the night and uh, was uh, <laughs> on a big detour. We're seeing it right here. He is getting close to the main trail, to the race trail, but he's probably not seeing it because now what's happening? Yes he's turning going south again and he keeps going back and forth this is you can see this at the tracking system you just have to adjust uh, the the settings to find this uh, replay function yeah um it's quite interesting if you're interested in uh, this technical part of the software machine as we call it you can uh, do the replay thing and you can see what what's happened with the measures in the race before what we haven't seen as we saw this happen while we were asleep in Norwegian time yes. and uh, he had a big detour and he had to scratch from the race. Mm. And it's getting uh, darker in uh, Minnesota too uh, after uh, when the mushers are finishing up and so maybe somebody can have it, it, there is a, a risk that somebody can be well of course you're tired at the, at the end of the race yeah. but personally i would be when i'm in not in the lead but when i'm doing a very good race and I have the possibility to catch a team in front of me i would be very awake like mentally awake on the last leg that's for yeah. me that would be natural although i'm really tired hmm. and then uh, because you know that well, you it's smell, the last you one. You smell the hamburger at the finish line. Do <laughs> so you want to get to the finish line quite fast? You're hungry. What yeah, about you, Dallas? In, in uh, Duluth, they're going to have a sunset of about 5.05 p.m. Mm -hmm. Ryan Reddington should reach the finish uh, shortly before that. I'm going to predict somewhere around 4... 48. <laughs> okay, you said that. 448. So somewhere right around there. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm, I'm ballparking here. I've got a lot of numbers going on. But I'm, I, mm. the point is, he should be getting there before it's dark. Or obviously, this is sunset. It'll be a little bit longer before it's actually dark. But he's the first musher. We're going to see more mushers coming across the finish line for the next many hours. Right? We have mushers that are still just now arriving in the last checkpoint, some even farther back on the trail. So yeah, many of the mushers will be doing a majority of this run after the sun has gone down, which doesn't necessarily make it harder to find the trail. In my experience, I actually like running in especially wide open country at night because our headlamp picks up the reflective markers and it makes them more visible. What it does do is it makes it much harder to stay awake, right? So once the sun goes down, it's dark, your body starts thinking it's bedtime, especially since you haven't hardly slept in the last three days. So that's when mushrooms will start nodding off. So anybody that's on this trail between midnight and 6 a.m., I said there's a good chance that they're going to be doing the head bob as they're mushing along, and that's when you're going to catch a wrong trail. Kind of like what happened, I suspect. I'd love to catch up with Fisher at some point and see exactly... Did it, when did he know that he was on the wrong trail? Mm. Was he dozing off? I think that and, or sleep what deprivation... What happened? What actually happened? Yeah, I, I would be willing to bet that sleep deprivation was a contributing factor <laughs> to getting on the wrong trail for him. Yeah, because all of our measures has been on the trail for a very long time now. Yeah. And uh, as they're uh, approaching to the finish line, some of them and some others are uh, resting at the mineral, uh, mineral center, uh, we will take a look at today's highlights.
point. All right, let's Maybe. see who we got here. This has got to be Ryan Reddington right here, bib number four, I believe. Yep. Getting um, close to Mineral Center. Have you uh, taken care of all of your chosen rest at this point in time? You just have your mandatory four hour here, or do you have to add I, on? I think I got like four hours and 12 minutes or 15 minutes, Some a little bit of change on there. Okay. But, yep. So you got eight? Eight dogs left. Will you leave here with eight? Um, I think so. We'll see. Um, yeah, I'll give them the rest here and see how they look when we wake up to get ready. Yeah. Are you happy with their performance into here? Yeah, This there's only one dog in that team that ran berries um, last year. So it's a new team, so I'm just checking them out for what what ones for I did or not. Yeah. And so you saw Mr. Eiley come in here shortly after you. You must yeah. be uh, yeah. glowing with pride right now. Yeah, yeah, um, very much so. Reddington dogs are are making me proud. Yeah. <laughs> coming in first. here, yeah, we got another Let's nice looking team. This is Keith Eiley again, um, coming into checkpoint. I'm seeing a lot of happy dogs, smiling faces, that's, that's, and a not so happy looking musher. <laughs> he's just from <laughs> he's focused. Let's say that he's yeah, focused yeah, here. Yeah. Um, you know, they're all looking good. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him leave at least one dog behind. Man, you're in position to win a dog race. Yeah, yeah, I could if I really tried, but <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a little bit too much distance, maybe, but I'll still be trying. Yeah, well, you're not that far behind, right? Yeah, but still, it's only like a 40-mile run, so. Yeah, you've got 11 dogs still on the team. Yeah. You've yeah. done a great job keeping them together. Yeah, yeah, it's been worked out good, but you got to, in this race, I've run this race so many times in the last 30 years, if you don't know how to control the speed on these hills, you'll you'll injure dogs so it's a really balancing act of how fast you can go and when you can go fast right here we have another team coming in that's ryan is this uh anderson yeah that's ryan anderson yeah. it's just from another angle yeah so he'll be in uh, about one hour five minutes four or five minutes after ryan reading i believe yeah actually nice yeah. looking team you know it's a smaller team nine dogs where are you at now where's your where's your mind at you're in here what is it about an hour behind or so i think so yeah i was hoping to maybe make up some time on this last run and then about well two hours from here so i had to haul a dog so yeah i kind of put the kibosh to that but i think i still ended up fairly close to the run time as them with the dog in the bag but and you don't run with a gps so you have no idea how much that slowed you down by carrying a dog no i i really don't know how much it slowed me down but you know, I kind of knew there's a road crossing out here called Arrowhead Crossing, and I know being over these trails so many years that it's about 12 to 13 miles from there to here. So I just looked at my watch, and I mean, I was right at 10 miles an hour coming here. So, And so, uh, obviously, something's got to happen with the two teams in front of you for the, you to yeah, get there first. Point, or, yeah, but point. that doesn't mean, are you going to get off and still try to catch them? I had to run here because I had a dog in the bag. But <laughs> so you're tired. <laughs> no, I didn't run too much. I mean, I paddled up a couple of hills, but yeah. that was about it. Yeah. How will you spend these four hours? What will you do? Uh, I will probably just rest, um, make sure the dogs, I mean, they all drank finally. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll just kind of go through feet and get them ready for the last 30, I think it's 36 miles. I haven't done this course, so, yeah. We heard it's about 40, but you know how yeah. that goes. They yeah, can yeah, get yeah. 42 yeah. or 38. Yeah, they it doesn't matter. This, than them, but <laughs> they it does call this one a 40, 48 or 49, and it's, yeah. it can't be. But because I don't think I averaged 10 for the whole run. But but the rest of the ones in harness that came in here looking really smooth, yeah, no, and I noticed they ate better than any dogs I've seen. For they finally. Uh, it, it was funny, like the first three checkpoints, they were real picky. They wouldn't eat out of the bowl. They'd only take snacks, and then they'd eat maybe if you dumped the bowl. And now, like, finally the last three checkpoints, they've been eating out of the bowl like alligators. So I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a dog race. Um, it's a good dog team. It's probably one of the best dog teams I've ever had. Mm. But, uh, you know, it either comes together or it doesn't. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's just it's a dog race. So. So, so here we have Martin Massacott coming in. I mean, that's that's what you want to see at 300 or 250 miles into a thousand mile race, right? That's what you're expecting to see. And so this is a team that I'm looking at here that can go the distance. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Martin is uh, looking at running some some races later in the year here. So there might be something to that. But that is a beautiful dog team. That's what you want to see. Now he is an hour and a half off the pace, but. 
I mean, yeah, so they just covered a 46-mile run. They came into the last checkpoint of the race, and uh, they look as good as they did on the first day of the race. So when I'm racing a 1,000-mile race, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm shooting for right here is to come into the third way in the race. We start thinking about where we're going to take our mandatory 24-hour rest on that race, and that's what I want my team to look like. So he's got a smaller team with 10 dogs. I want to say he dropped down to 10 earlier on in the race than some, but he's, like, again, it's the right 10 that look really good. That's a solid unit. Well, they look happy coming in here. They look like uh, <clears throat> nice and smooth, and it's not Blake. It's good. No, it's no, Colleen. Colleen. Colleen yeah, surprised us with the data Colleen we got Colleen. in here. Yeah, Colleen is here. Not nine dogs? Yes, sir. Okay. Guys, nice run. Hey, thanks, you Hi, guys. Hi, Colleen. Hey. How How's it, how'd it feel? It felt good. Yeah, you're, you're running yeah. great. Typical day run. <laughs> yeah, but good, yeah. but good. A little bit of everything, fast, yeah. slow, fast, slow, lakes, fun. Yeah, they yeah. look lively. They do, yeah. yeah. They're ready for a little snooze and a little food, and um, so they're normal. Yeah. Yeah. And so. a run to the finish line. Right. Are you ready for that, or do you want the trail to continue? Well, how far? I mean, we could go back to Duluth and <laughs> do it like the old days, yeah. the old Bear Grease. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it'll be good. We, we're running the way we train, so we're ready for the finish line. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. Right, and welcome. Thanks. Thank you. And that was today's headlines. Uh, it's been an interesting day. In the beginning, we couldn't say for sure like where the dogs teams would be at and now we have a, some a pretty clear idea of uh, at least the four first uh, mushers right yeah i think we're going to be pretty solidly seeing ryan reddington keith eiley ryan anderson and uh martin massacott coming in the top four positions barring any craziness <laughs> uh, that is our lead pack in this race there's a fairly good gap between uh, martin and then colleen and this is kind of the next next group of mushers that we have with colleen blake frecking and nathan schroeder so they're about an hour and a half kind of behind the the fourth place musher they're just shifted back a little ways uh, but that's not uncommon in these races to kind of see a, a lead pack out there and we could even break this down farther to say you know ryan and keith eiley are the first pack ryan anderson and martin mascot are the second pack then colleen blake and nathan would be the third but uh that front four is still close enough that anything can happen but it's just not that long of a run to the final checkpoint with only 40 miles so uh, i think we're we're starting to have this race shake out and see the basic look of it some positions will change one i want to keep an eye on it could be fun is uh blake frecking and nathan schroeder are going to be leaving mineral uh city here um a mineral center checkpoint um within just a few seconds of each other and these are both past champions of the race. And so they're running a little bit farther back, but there's always races within the race where you're obviously trying to position and move up, even if you're not going to win. And I think they're both going to be leaving at about 3.54 this afternoon, and it looks like about 30 seconds separating those two. So that could be an interesting race later on this evening. Right now we see Ryan Reddington out in front beginning to do the, uh, the few loops and hoops that we have to get rack up the distance between the checkpoint and the between um, Mineral Center Checkpoint and Grand Portage, which is the finish, Keith I. Lee is on the trail, and he's a, a short distance behind Ryan Reddington. Right now it's saying 11.9 kilometers behind. I think that's gonna be a little bit too much distance mm. for him to make up over the course of this run. Uh, their, their speeds haven't been that difference, different. I think Eiley will gain on Reddington, but not catch him. When right we now, have a, Reading is going 8.5 kilometers an hour, yep. kilometer that is. Most of our mushers are in that Mineral Center checkpoint. However, not yet in Mineral Center. We have Jay Fouché there in 10th. Um, that means that third through ninth is in the checkpoint. Uh, 10th is Jay Fouché out of the trail. Laura Nice, number 11 there, is I think catching up with Jay Fouché a little bit. Um, she's training, our, Laura Nice is training for the Iditarod here, so uh, kind of doing a steady training one. And then Kevin Mathis bringing up the, the back of the pack with um, Lisa Dietzen. I'm sorry, Kevin Mathis is on the trail, but in the back, Lisa Dietzen is still in the Skyport checkpoint and uh, probably will be on the trail and not too terribly long. And um, then John Fisher, of course, is no longer in the race after having taken a bit of a detour yesterday night, or last night, I guess. 
That's right. So that's how we are doing right now. All right, so we got the update. So now the distance between Eile and uh, Reddington is 9.4. And usually when I'm watching a race like this, you see the, you know, on our upper left-hand corner there, Reddington has 47.9 kilometers to the finish. Eile has 9.6 kilometers that he is behind <coughs> Reddington. So what I do is when I'm checking these GPSs, I keep logging those numbers as they update. And you start to get a trajectory of... Is he gaining on him? You know, did he go from 11 kilometers behind in the beginning and halfway through it, has he made up half that distance yet, right? And so it's kind of fun to track those as it updates and changes throughout the throughout the race. Of course, be cautious because sometimes those GPSs update at different times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it can give you it some faulty vary. data, perhaps, yeah. Yes, these are satellites in the space. So uh, we just had an update at uh, local time, uh, 20, uh, 10 minutes after 8. Yeah, that's the projected time. Or no, that's, that's just uh, when the GPS is updated. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. the last update. There, yeah. uh, and they, uh, the both Ailey and Reading was updated at the same time, which uh, shows also that Reading yeah. is now got, uh, running at 10.6 kilometers an hour. Hmm. So we still have about uh, <laughs> 17 minutes, I think, until our next musher <coughs> hits the trail out of the mineral center checkpoint there. Yeah. So there's going to be a few minutes until we get the next musher on the trail, and then about 22 minutes after, and that's going to be Ryan Anderson. It's going to be the third musher on the trail. And then shortly after Ryan Anderson, we're going to have Martin Massacott. This will be about 22 minutes later that's hitting the trail. Yeah. And one of the fun things to see here is how many dogs are they going to leave with. Um, and you know, this, I'm, yeah, and this is the Grand Portage, the finish line we're seeing, looking at right now. And uh, uh, this is where, and we have a, a question actually for one of our viewers who is asking, when Ryan leaves, what will be his projected finish time? And you said that earlier, but maybe you can repeat that. <laughs> what yeah, I, I was just doing quick math. I don't want to be, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not betting on this time just yet. I just said uh, 448, I think would be as soon as is realistic that he could be there. Um, as he gets farther into this run, we can start to see what is his average traveling speed. And then using our GPS trackers, we can project how much distance he has left to go. And if he's going to hold that speed or if that speed is going to fade a little bit as he gets near the end. Or is he going to you know, speed up a little bit as he gets near the end? You know, Maybe we'll start whistling up the dogs as he knows that he's only a few miles from the finish. Um, so I think that would be a ballpark, but that can obviously change. So I'd say... Yeah, it was, I don't want to say the soonest, but 448, I think, is a realistic ballpark. That would allocate four hours and 20 minutes for this last run, which looking at some previous stats, I don't have a whole lot of the past year's um, stats here, but would be a realistic run time for this this section of the race. Yeah, and uh, Keith Eilie's dogs are from the same uh, kennel. And so these dogs sort of know each other, probably know their smell. Will that make them more eager towards the finish? You know, that's a really good question. Um, Clearly, the dogs can pick up the scents on the trail, particularly of you know the teams ahead of them. If it's not that far ahead, you know, dogs are, as they're running down the trail, they might you know run over and pee on a tree, <laughs> and so the next team behind them, the dogs go over there, sniff, and mark on top of it. So yeah, I think it. Um, obviously, they're aware there's another team, but the dogs being from the same kennel, that's an interesting question. If anything, I would say that they'd be less excited than dogs that they weren't familiar with the smells, right? Oh. Here they might run over there and smell and be like, oh, that's Joe, I know him. <laughs> okay. But if they smell somebody, a different dog, a team that's completely unrelated, then maybe they would be more excited. Um, you know, mostly they're just happy to run down the trail. So I don't think it's going to affect the dogs too much, depending on which team it's, or which, the, the fact that they're from the same kennel. I don't think that'll affect the dog's performance very much on this run. What will happen now when they get into the finish line? Well, I'm... Assuming, uh, well, first of all, let's say, assuming the mushers stay not within sight of each other, because that changes the dynamic of the race when you can actually see the musher in front of you, which on certain trails, I mean, depending on the terrain, I mean, you can see hours in some places, but let's say, you know, within 10 minutes, it's realistic that you're going to catch a glimpse of the musher in front of you, particularly if you have some long lakes that you're going across. Um, but if, if we do get mushers close, a few minutes apart, then as they get close to the finish, they're going to be looking over their shoulder. They're going to be pedaling. They're going to be using the ski poles to help propel the sled down the trail. Um, the mushers kind of get that increased energy, and they know that when you get close to the finish line, 
there's this sense of we're almost there and you know, okay, now I can start pouring out a little more fuel because we can make it to the finish line. You can start rationing that a little bit. Um, but you're going to see that, that finish shoot area fill up. The crowds are going to start to come in. It's an evening finish. It's going to be exciting. Um, hopefully we get people, you know, getting off work, get down there to watch the finish of the race. Um, it's probably going to be a festive atmosphere, I would say. You know, you get your handlers that have been working this whole race, managing their dog teams. They're here. This is the final, final stop. They're going to be excited to have their dog teams back into their care and being able to get them fed and taken care of, despite the fact that it's the end of the race and we can kind of let our hair down a little bit for some people, probably not me. Um, <laughs> I think despite <laughs> that, the first priority, of course, is to get the dogs taken care of. There's going to be all the photos and, you know, the whoo, just there is a sense of relief, I guess, yeah. that whatever stress you've had of trying to manage the team and manage the race and get to the next checkpoint in time, if you're a handler, all that is relaxed. It's time to get the dogs a good long sleep tonight, a good meal, and um, you know, probably enjoy the festivities a little bit. You're gonna see mushers once they finish, probably coming back over here to watch their, their competitors come across the finish line. Uh, within reason, we have to understand that you know, a musher that's been out here for three days is probably going to want to go to bed at some point, so might not stay up until two in the morning to watch, you know, somebody come in on the race because they are spread out. But mm. it's going to be a fun, festive atmosphere. Yeah. And what about the day after a race? Will the dogs just get completely rest then? or? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, the day after the race, um, obviously we're going to be still doing the massages and the vet care and the kind of the post-race care, putting the ointments on their feet. I like to get all the dogs out for a nice stretch, um, take them for a kind of a prolonged walk, I guess. They will, they're gonna sleep pretty soundly. They're gonna be in their dog boxes tonight, which the dogs love sleeping in those little dog boxes. It's like a little nest of straw in there and it's warm and um, it's secure. You know, they, they're enclosed on all the sides and they really, it's a relaxing and comfortable environment for them. So they're gonna sleep soundly. And after that long sleep and having run a 300 mile race in the morning, they're gonna probably have breakfast and then go for, a, you know, I take each dog, on, I put them on about a 30, 40 foot leash so that they can run around, sniff on stuff and walk half a mile down and back with each dog or maybe in pairs of dogs just to stretch them out, let them go to the bathroom. Um, make sure that if there's any muscles that have kind of gotten stiff or a little bit sore after having that long rest that I'm aware of it and doing the proper massages and vet care with them. But tomorrow is going to be a down day. It's going to be a fun day. Um, just doing dog care, which all these guys love. That's why they're in the sport is because they, they love working with dogs and they love doing the massages and putting the ointment on their feet. The dogs are calmed down and relaxed and very easy to work with because they are they just ran 300 miles. They're relaxed. So I love the day after the race. Um, the mushers feel a little beat up, but it's also relaxing for us. It's the most comfortable thing for us to do to go just massage dogs and be with your friends after having, you know, accomplished a really cool 300 mile trip with those friends. Yeah. The dogs I'm talking about, the, you know, <laughs> the friends I'm speaking of here. <laughs> and uh, uh, I know of one who has a, a really special friend. Uh, now we are going to meet Indy. Uh, she said, uh, was an inspiring lead dog, but due to a rare disease, uh, he lost uh, his uh, sight on both eyes. Uh, this year he competed in the Bear Grace mid-distance race. When he was two and a half, he lost his sight in one of his eyes, his left eye. He had what's called lens luxation, and the lens actually separates from the eye and floats in the eyeball. And it, it uh, causes the eye to swell and it could get infected, so we had to have it removed. He raced that next year with one eye and actually and recovered pretty well. At the end of that year, though, he uh, lost sight in that other eye. We were pretty heartbroken, you know, for for him, for us. You know, he was, we were training him to be a leader. We thought he was going to be one of our stars. and. Uh, but we just let, gave him about a year to get used to being blind because he was he was very, you know, I mean, you lose your sight and then you just, you're very unsure of yourself. And, and after, you know, a few months, we started taking him for walks. <laughs> yes, you did. And uh, the next year we, we thought, you know, we're gonna put him in the team with some of the older dogs and just see how he does. And, and he loved it. I mean, he stumbled and he had difficult time doing it, but he was clearly happy doing it. You know, he wanted to be back with the team. Over the course of the next two years, he just got better and better. 
And last year we ran him in a couple short races. And he did really well, you know. He um, he was a little nervous, but by the end he was he was just like, you know, I can do this. So uh, we said, well, yep, he's ready to race the Bear Grease. He's on the team. And we were, um, I mean, when I got back to the truck with him after the race, you know, Sherry and I were both crying. You know, we gave each other a hug. We were just like, Indy's back. What a touching story. Uh, have you ever heard of a blind dog running a race before? Well, not at both eyes. I've seen dogs blind at one eye, and I oh, I have some extra sound. And I have actually had a, a deaf dog in my team, mm. deaf one, but never a blind one. But how did that uh, affect the dog to well, not have um, a hearing? I would move to to say hello to him. I would come from in front instead of just patting him on the back because he's going to be Whoa, what's going <laughs> on. Mm. But uh, he was, uh, he's a nice guy, he's still alive. Yeah, and he run, ran the races. Well, he ran some shorter races, yeah. Mm. And he functioned well, he just was a bit, I don't know, I was worried, he was a bit un um, unsure about what's going on around him because he couldn't hear anything. Yeah. But the most important uh, sense uh, that uh, a dog has is probably uh, the smell. Or the sight, yeah. Mm. I, I think they rely on many of their senses okay. more than we do. I mean, yes, their sense of smell is definitely more vivid to them than it is to us. Obviously, their sound, you know, their hearing is very important to them. Uh, so that'd be challenging. I, I, you know, with a, with a deaf dog, things are going to be, more things are going to startle that dog, right? It's going to surprise them. But as far as running down the trail... Your eyesight's pretty important, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, seeing what's in front yeah. of you. And so oh, it's kind of interesting those. to see we have a, a dog with a seeing eye musher here, right? Um, but it's, I think it's always cool to see stuff like this because it's about doing as much as that dog can happily and comfortably do. And it is heartbreaking when you have a young dog that's bred to run and pull and be out there. And then there's something that causes them not to be able to do that. You know, they're so passionate about what they do. So it's really, really fun to see a, you know, a dog blind in both eyes, able to do that. But that dog was actually smiling. That yes. was a happy <laughs> dog. Um, my, my deaf dog was born that way. I just had to say that. Like, he was born that way. So he, when he was a little puppy and all the small puppies, four or five weeks old or three, four weeks old, was moving around, were moving around, he was just sitting there screaming, looking around, what happened? Because that was also before they opened their eyes, about three weeks old. Oh. So he wasn't, he didn't see them and he didn't hear his brothers and sisters. So that's the point where we understood that was something wrong with him. Yeah. Uh, he, he got to his side though, but yeah, he was yeah, still that's deaf. Good. Yeah. One dog in my team that actually won the Iditarod with me in 2012 was blind in one eye, mm -hmm. um, but she could see on her right eye. So she usually ran her on the right side of the tow line so that she would have the other dog on this side of her and she could see, you know, everything on th on the other side. Um, and she did very, very well. It didn't seem to be a major handicap, but of course she had that one eye. So again, both eyes is pretty, pretty impressive. And it's, it's mm. just fun to see that, you know, taking the time to make sure that dog can, can do what they love to do. And it is hard to keep a sled dog exercise without running them in a team of dogs because you have to, as far as like walking it on a leash or something like that, you're going to be out there all day <laughs> yes. trying to get the dog to exercise. They need, they <laughs> need to right. be in a yeah, team. they need to be uh, exercised. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, I'm, I'm charmed by this dog, Indy. It's a real charming story, really. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, I also heard that uh, dogs has incredibly large hearts. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's one of the many aspects that makes the sled dog the world's premier endurance athlete, right? There is no mammal that can travel as far as fast as a sled dog can. Um, there are a few migratory birds and fish that do this the same distance, a thousand miles, in as little time as a sled dog can do it, but no other mammal. And that is partially due to the fact that canines have the largest heart proportionate to their body mass of any mammal. And sled dogs are arguably the best conditioned um, in the best, you know, in the best uh, athletic condition of any canine out there. So yeah, it's a phenomenal heart in part that makes these dogs mm -hmm. the athletes that they are. So when we see what a sled dog does and try to understand that, we naturally understand that from a human perspective with our human limitations. The dogs are not humans and they don't have the same limitations that we have. Most, uh, most all mammals have a heart starting out that's about 0.06 
or 0 0.6 of their body mass, and we can develop that to about 0 0.8 of our body mass, whereas a, a sled dog starts with a heart that is 0 0.8 of their body mass and can build it to over 1% of their body mass. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously heart size is a huge factor in an endurance athlete. Another incredible aspect of these dogs is their digestive tract and their ability to take calories that they bring in and either mm -hmm. immediately burn that in the form of fat, which is one of the most efficient processes or store that fat or rely on their fat reserves to provide energy. And they can switch between these systems very efficiently. Yeah. So while humans after a marathon needs sugar and carbohydrates. We need carbs. We need sugars. Yep. Yeah and maybe a nap, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, these dogs can just eat proteins and fats and then yep. they're good to go again? Yeah, and they do need some amount of carbohydrates. Uh, they do need that, but they run on fats. Where if you talk to any endurance athlete, let's say um, Ironman triathletes, ultra marathoners, you know, I've kind of dabbled in some of these other sports, mostly using myself as a human guinea pig to test training or other methods that I want to use with sled dogs. But all of these endurance athletes are trying to train their body to burn fats because that is sustainable. If you're going to be an Ironman triathlete and be out there for nine or 10 hours, you can't solely rely on blood sugar. Yes, we're going to need that, but you're also going to need to burn fats. And your body's going to have to be efficient at taking the fat from its storage in your body to actually producing energy. Um, sled dogs are phenomenal at that system. They already burn fats, and that's why they can do the endurance the way that they can. Yeah, so the largest hearts on the planet, the, the mammal with the largest heart, is the blue whale, right? Yeah. But then it's uh, the dog who has it... Uh, uh, Proportionate to its body mass. Okay. So body mass of this and the heart is the largest percentage of that body mass relative to any other mammal. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. And that's yeah. why they love dogs. You gotta to run. love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you gotta love dogs. Uh, now we're gonna take a quick look at the seventh leg. So you leave the seventh leg and you do a loop. You're very, very close to Canada, running on um, trails up in Grand Portage. And then the dogs start sensing and they know my dogs are seasoned. And I think the younger dogs that don't really know they're going to the finish line, they just glean all the confidence they can for that seventh run, for the final push. The other dogs let them know, hey, it's okay. We're gonna groove and we're headed to the finish line. And then you get to the finish line and you think, I wish the race wasn't over. We're, we're just having so much fun. I wish it wasn't over. We're getting closer and closer to the finish line and very soon we will see who we can call the Beer Grease Champion 2020. Yep. The Krill Pet Arctic World Series is continuing with the famine race in Norway on Friday. Stay with us for a meet with one of the biggest favorites. And we're closing up to the finish now. Uh, Dallas and Nina, how are we feeling right now? It's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting. Very exciting race to be following here. This race is starting to pan out, starting to get a little more of an understanding of where mushrooms are going to end up in the final uh, hours of this race and who we might expect to see across the finish line. First, second, third, fourth. <laughs> At least we're getting the basic structure. We don't know the exact individuals yet, but it's starting to take shape. It's a long wait, isn't it? Uh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, not going to lie. I love watching dog dog sled races, but um, or sled dog races, but it is, it happens a little more slowly than watching a hundred meter dash, <laughs> right? It plays out over a greater amount of time, which honestly lets a lot of uh, kind of anticipation build. Um, and of course these races can be very exciting at the final miles. Um, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of close finishes and especially at the end of a 300 mile race or a thousand mile race, when it comes down to seconds between mushers, you're going to see all the crowds come out there and they don't care if they're racing for first or 20th. Everybody likes seeing a close finish at the end of a long race. <clears throat> we'll probably uh, there is a chance that uh, uh, Raiden and Ailey might meet at, at the trail as well. Yeah. The last leg, because there are so many loops, so uh, we don't know. Yeah. It might happen. We might as well have a little look at where is the standings right now. If we can have uh, some graphics ups. Hey, uh, in uh, Dallas, what do you think? <coughs> and our what do you think, Nina? 
Well, I just uh, had a look at the map and uh, there was uh, were 11 kilometers behind the two of them and now it's only six, seven kilometers. But that means probably because uh, they are moving towards each other, that's because the satellites and the GPS system, the, the gap between them has been closing by because Reddington is on his way out of the loop while Ailey is getting into the loop. Ailey will turn right in the next uh, trail section here whilst uh, Reddington is going uh, the direction of Ailey actually. So they are into all these loops and uh, well we got to keep our mouth <laughs> the concentration here right now to find out which way are they actually going. Yeah I, I think um, I think we're seeing Ailey uh, make up a little bit of time on Reddington. I think he, like we said before, I think he's going to close this gap a little bit. I don't know that he can make up as much time as he needs. There is a three dog difference, and I know I've been saying that, you know, it's not a problem to have a small team as long as they're the right dogs. And what I mean by that is you can have seven dogs, but those seven have to be in tip top shape. And that's what I, I don't know. So I think Ailey can get closer. He may even catch Reddington. I'm not going to rule that out yet, but, um, it's just not that long of a run on on a race. I hate to cut to other races here when we're talking about this one, but on the Iditarod, it's a 70 mile run for that last mm -hmm. last section. So I've made up two hours on mushers. Um, so obviously in a 40, you can make up an hour, um, but they've had fairly similar run times prior to this. So on the last run, I think there was only about two minutes difference in run time. So I would be surprised if it went from a two minute difference to a 30 minute difference between the last run and this mm -hmm. run. We should be seeing the next musher on the trail here fairly soon, but right now we just have Ryan Reddington and Keith Eiley on the trail and within the next few minutes we should have um, Anderson. Ryan Anderson, Anderson following these guys out on the trail. Is there going to be a fight for the third place here as well? Is the, is the match going to now be between Reddington and Ally for the first and second place? I think the, I mean, things can change, but yes, what it looks like right now, Ryan Reddington and Keith Ailey are racing for first in this one. Ryan Anderson um, was faster than both of them on the previous run. He was about 35 minutes behind Keith Ailey. That's, again, it's a lot of time to make up. So it is possible, but it's unlikely. Um, Martin Messicott will be out in fourth, and he's about 22 minutes behind Ryan Anderson. That's one that he could catch third. Um, looking at his time, he ran only about five, almost six minutes faster on the previous run. But the way I saw Martin's team moving, he might stand a chance to catch up with Ryan Anderson, but Ryan Anderson's team also looked good. Well, it's, it, it isn't over before it's over, as we say, right? Yep. Uh. So the close race here, I think, is going to be between... Uh, Blake Frecking and Nathan Schroeder, at least they're starting out very close together, just seconds apart. Of course, we, as soon as they hit the trail, one of them may come out and be very clearly a more powerful team. But um, at least leaving the checkpoint, that'll be exciting to watch because they're only 30 seconds apart, at least when they're allowed to leave. They may end up leaving you know, behind their allowed starting time, but I think that's probably unlikely. Are you, are you guys a little bit surprised about Blake Frecking? He won the race last year, but this year he's not been up at the top. He's it seems to be comfortably you know, at five, fifth, sixth place yeah. all over the yeah. since the start of the race, actually. The team he is racing uh, uh, that he won with last year is being raced by uh, Laura News this year, so uh, he's actually not racing the same dogs mm -hmm. as last year. So something that's that's important to remember is from year to year when we watch these races, we see the musher's name, it's not the dog team's name, mm. right? We don't see the name of each individual dog. Dog teams, or let me rephrase that, sled dogs win races. Mushers can help that sled dog do well, but the, the musher's not going to win the race. So my name might be Dallas Eve and I might sign up for the Iditarod. That doesn't mean I'm going to win the race. <laughs> it doesn't mean I even stand a chance at winning the race. If you have a team of Labradors, you if wouldn't I win. Have, that's what you're saying? Exactly. If I don't have that superstar team. So... You know, especially especially here where he's running dogs from another kennel, his abilities as a musher haven't been affecting this team their entire life. What I mean by that is these aren't dogs that he's raised since they were little puppies. So he might be the best musher in the world. But if you get handed a dog team weeks or months before the race, there's only so much you can do in that time. So when we see mushers that are consistently in the top of, let's say, the Iditarod, there's a few years in a row where the same four mushers left the last checkpoint of the Iditarod in the top four spots. That sort of consistency says more about that musher's 
training and development program that happens before the race. So much of these races is already decided before they set foot on the trail. The decisions they made five years ago in choosing which dogs to breed, the knowledge that they've gained over the last 20 years about nutrition for the dogs, how to train dogs, how to you know, develop equipment that works, that sort of knowledge that the mushers hold, you know, their abilities to continue to finance a top-end team. Those decisions were made years ago. In the last six months, they will have been making the decisions on how to train this team. And that's something that you can do really well or ruin your chance at winning the race, right? If you have terrible snow conditions and you can't get the, the training your team needs, you may have had great genetics and a great feeding program, but the team's simply not conditioned. So by the time you get down to the start of the race, a lot has been decided. But the last step, which is how you actually run the race, is obviously still in front of you. So oftentimes we see 10 or 15 teams that are capable of winning the Iditarod at the starting line, maybe more than that. Um, but obviously by the time they reached the finish, only one of them got there first. In the last stage of the preparation before a race, can you temper uh, um, uh, a dog, t a team, like rest them to be more performance, like in any athlete? Peaking is very important. Yeah, yes. peaking. Um, I've seen teams that have been overtrained. Um, I've seen teams that were better in February than they were in March when the race starts, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, we see teams that peak at the wrong time. For example, they compete in some of these mid-distance races and they look phenomenal in the end of January in you know, the Kuskokwim 300, which is a big mid-distance race we have in Alaska. But then come March, they're just not on their A game. So yeah, peaking at the right time is really important. Getting the training and the conditioning on the dogs, not just in the six months prior to the race, but the dog's entire career, making sure that every dog in your team that their entire career has been constructive and beneficial both physically and mentally so that they know to, that they can expect that their musher is going to be um, trustworthy reliable consistent not going to ask them to do something insane <laughs> just because it's a race right the dogs don't care if it's a race or not um, so there's yeah peaking is very important there's a lot of right ways to do it i don't want to say one way is the best obviously i do it what's the, way the wrong that way I think to do it best. what's, what's the wrong way to do it then that you can say <sighs> there's a lot of wrong ways to do it too <laughs> <laughs> you know um, so and this is another thing I, I i try to figure out how to do it best for my dogs so when i say this is absolutely 100 the wrong way to do it for my dogs which means somebody else's team that might be the right way to do it because we all have different genetics. And that's where the information exchange that goes between mushers is, you have to be careful with that because you can see a musher be really successful. I'm thinking um, John Baker, Sebastian Schnula, Lance Mackey have all had success in the Iditarod with doing these very long runs. And then because of that, you see other mushers emulate them. Okay, if you want to win the Iditarod, you have to be able to do a 100-mile run. But the problem is, they're copying somebody else's style who is using a different type of dog. The best mushers match the correct style with the correct dogs. So you can win the Iditarod and never go over 50 miles in one shot, or you can win the Iditarod and never go less than 75 miles in one shot. It's just a matter of making sure that your dog's been trained for that style, you have the right genetics for that style. My dogs are hard driving dogs. I can't put them on the trail for 100 miles at a time. They just, they work too hard. They won't pace themselves. I have to do shorter runs, maintain a higher speed. But for maybe Sebastian Schnula to try to do that same style would be terrible. His dogs are never going to have that speed. He would be putting his dogs at a high risk, asking him to go that fast. He's better off to slow it down and let the dogs march to Nome, stay out there for many hours at a time because they're running at a more even tempo. So to answer your question, how do you do it wrong? You train your dogs for a style that's not ideal for their body type. That's what you do wrong. So I can't say that this one specific <laughs> no. thing, it's, it's if you don't have the right style for the dogs you're actually running. Well, this is a complicated thing to do. This is I a mean, 400 level class. Where... <laughs> But any performance at this level is complicated. Well, he's the best to explaining this. It's extremely complicated. There's so many parents. You're very shy, uh, Nina. Well, I'm shy. I think you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of, I'm under res great amount of respect for the way he's been uh, having this scientific uh, uh, approach to machine. That's a lot of people think about that. It's, he's a scientific person there. But I mean, 
There are so uh, many parameters which are uh, important and which are you can't do anything with or you can do with something with them uh, before you have success as a dog musher. Mm. Sometimes it's just pure luck. I feel when I'm listening to him, how the heck did I do so well? I didn't <laughs> ever have that <laughs> scientific approach, and I've done pretty well uh, um, some years ago. And uh, well, was that just pure luck? I don't know. But I mean, I have a totally, totally different approach. For me, it's not that scientific approach at all. And I have had pretty good runs and pretty good races. But you know, there's a, a there great... Hope. There is actually <laughs> hope. <laughs> there's a great athlete, Ingmar Stenmark. He said, the more I train, the more lucky I get. Yep. The more lucky I get. There's so it's, it's, it's not really luck. It's the more you train, the more lucky you get. You create get. your own luck in some places as well. And I, I think you're right that the more you train the more luck you get, but there's also the aspect of the more you think, the more luck you get, right? And that's where, when I say think, think about why am I doing this training run? What is this particular exercise supposed to do for the dog? Because we see some mushers that do overtrain their dogs, and it's because they don't know what else to do. And so mushers, we always compare our total number of miles. So you'll have, you know, the rumor will go through the mushing field that, oh, so-and-so had 5,000 miles of training, and he had a really good race. So then everybody's looking at this total number, and it's almost like what they're focusing on is doing as much training as mm. possible, and they've forgotten that there's a race that they're supposed to get ready for, right? So But well, that's interesting, Dallas, because... Uh, Although I don't have the uh, scientific approach to this as you have, I kept all my training schedule books because I like to write them down. I don't want them at the computer. I want them to have them in a book so I can pick them out, read them, <laughs> and sit in the sofa and read them. <laughs> Anyways, I have all my books since 2003. And what is interesting, my best season ever, uh, that was like 2008, 2009, I trained, that's the season I had less or a lot less training miles or kilometers mm -hmm. than the other seasons. So when I did really well that season, the next season I was going to do even better. So I used, I had more training, more hours on the sled, more um, kilometers, more miles. I did worse. So, but, and that's kind of exactly what I'm talking yep. to there is, it's about training with a purpose. So knowing what are we trying to accomplish? What is it that I want to see change in this team with this training run? Do I, do I need to slow them down? Are they charging too hard, which means I need to put on more miles, bring down the speed, or is this team overtrained and we're going too slow, so I need to space out our runs, do shorter runs, pick up the speed, uh, you know, kind of create a faster tempo and training with a purpose because that is the problem is mushers are trendy and we hear what other people are doing and we're a little bit unconfident sometimes. So we want to boost our confidence by, by Coffee, doing what yeah. other mushers, other successful mushers are doing. But what makes that musher successful is they're doing the right thing for their dogs. We right? seen so that. it comes yeah. full circle. The key, the best mushers are the ones that can pick the right training schedule to develop their dogs. And that is the art of mushing. It doesn't have to be scientific, but it has to be intuitive and in connection. And I do like thinking about this stuff. I mean, what, I mean, that's what I do when I'm standing on the back of the sled. A lot of the <laughs> books I listen to on audio. You must have a lot of time thinking about it. this, right? <laughs> and then you have a lot of hours to think. <laughs> but this is interesting because you've seen that in Norway, that when somebody wins the uh, long Finnmark race or the Femen 650 race, they have a certain race, schedule, rest and race. And the next year, we'll see a lot of people trying to do or racing with exact the same uh, rest and race schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, people with probably less experience. And they're trying to copy last year's winner. And we see that they don't succeed. And then the last year's winner are trying another different race schedule than the other year. But we'll see so many people trying to copy that because he had four hours there, six hours there last year. I'll do the same. But they forget. They don't train the same way. They don't have the same dogs. <clears throat> so they won't succeed. But, but also in the race, I mean, you can set up a race strategy or a plan, but you always have to adapt that plan compared to what's happening. There could be snow and stormy oh, and... Yeah. Yep. So there's, uh, there's many different variations on this um, parable or analogy, but, you know, the best laid plans never survive the first contact with the enemy, right? <laughs> but it, especially the longer the race, the more the plans are going to change. If you have a 100-meter race, there's not that much strategy. Your plan is to go really fast. If it's a 100-mile race, okay, there's time for strategy. How fast do we start out? But still not that much. A 300-mile race, all right, now there's starting to be some mm -hmm. real strategy. A 1,000-mile race, there's 
so many more possible ways to run the rest, Especially more variables. Especially if, if it's not too much uh, mandatory rest. Yep. If you have to plan all your rest, and uh, like this bear grease like race. Nobody tells you not to stop. Do you need somebody to tell you to stop? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think on that, with the Iditarod, I look at it more like a playbook. It's a, I, I'm a student of, the, of this race of dog mushing as a, as a whole. So I've seen a thousand different right ways to run each section of the race. This is why I break the race into thirds and I kind of plan out each third. I then have several ways that I can run each section of that race. Strategies that were, if, we start to get lots of snow. I can run the middle third in a different way, but it's still a smart way that sets me up for an aggressive finish. So you always have to think about how this move today will affect our ability to make a move three days from now. And that's one of the most common mistakes I see in the Iditarod is people are too excited to make a move early on and it limits their ability to make a move later in the race. So I have more of a playbook and 90% of it's just in my head. I study it, I research it, I write schedules mostly because that helps me memorize the different possibilities. And then when I'm on the trail, I can be sorting through different styles and say, what gives my team a chance at winning? And that's the best I can do is I can give them the opportunity. And if they're, you know, hitting their high notes every single time, they're having one great run after the next, then it will be successful. There is no style or strategy that you can write that will guarantee success, but we can give our team the opportunity to succeed if you know, things go our way. The weather works for us. Uh, our dogs stay healthy. There's all the variables out there. But you have to find an opportunity that gives your team a chance at winning. You, something interesting you were just talking about, I'll, I memorize things. Mm -hmm. Like memorizing, that's very, very used in other sports. Uh, can you memorize the, the 10 days of I, I did a road race? Yeah, I, I know that trail inside out. Um, both memorize and visualize, yeah. right? So I've been through all of these sections of the race. I, I find myself, I, it's a fine line between visualizing and daydreaming. So <laughs> in reality, I've won the Iditarod four times. In my mind, I've gone through this thousands of times. Since I was probably five years old, that was different races that I have visualized all the way through to the end and had a successful finish there. So yeah, memorization and visual, visualization, I think are important for all athletes. Um, particularly for us. And again, when I'm faced with a situation, it's not the first time that my brain has encountered this situation. I visualized these races that, okay, we're six hours behind when we hit Caltag and there's bad weather, or I'm five hours ahead when I hit Caltag and there's good weather. Or how bad do you weather. talk to yourself when you're visualizing? How, how you, okay, I'm going to go from there. Are you going through with your head? What's, what's going on? It's, uh, do you talk to yourself? Uh, how do you visualize that? That's a really Mentally. good question. It's, it's, it's mostly actual like uh, image based, I think. Yeah. Um, I know the trail and it's, it's a lot of times almost a third person visual base, if yeah. that makes sense, um, where you're actually seeing yourself and dogs. Uh, so more from that perspective, a lot of times it's from a first person perspective. I've never really thought about that before. It's oh. really interesting, but yeah, yeah it's, it's mostly visually based, but then, um, I like numbers, numbers work for me. So, <laughs> um, I also do a lot of the math when I'm visualizing it, I'm calculating what does my speed differential need to be? How much faster do I need to be than the teams ahead of me to make up a six hour difference? And most of the time when I'm visualizing it, I am coming from behind. I always feel like this is just me, I guess. I always kind of feel like the teams on the trail are better than me and I'm going to have to outrace them. Now that's maybe that's because where I started out, I didn't have the best team on the trail and we did have to, you know, out race teams that were better than us. But I think that's how I can help myself be on an A game is set up for a perfect race. And don't assume that we have the best team. Don't assume that we have extra fuel to burn. I want to make this race as easy as possible for my dogs. I never want to put them in a position that it makes the race harder for them than it should be mm. or than it has to be. If everything goes as, as we, I can hear in my ear now, I am supposed to have Greg and Bruce on site in Grand Portage. Is that right? You pause. Um. It's, they're not there, but they're not far away, huh? No. So uh, I think they're quite as impatient to come and talk to us and give us some inside information from on site and we're impatient to have them as well. I wanted to touch on one thing real quick if we can here. Um, we have, we've have of course, uh, both Ryan Reddington and Keith Ailey on the trail. They have yeah, been maybe joined we can have some trail. graphics on on the standings yeah, yeah, for the moment. Our, our, um, yeah, there, there we go. go. They've been joined on the trail uh, just a few minutes ago by um, right. Ryan Anderson. He's hit the trail at uh, 
looks like 1.36 p.m. Um, now he left there with eight dogs and so he's on the trail with eight. So Ryan Reddington is out in front there. He's running a seven dog team and he left at 12.29. Um, he's followed by Keith Ailey, um, Ailey and he, I want to pull up this real quick. According to our tracker, he's about six kilometers behind, and I'm not sure that this is updated immediately, but he's uh, making good time out there. He's on the trail with 10 dogs. Um, behind him, we have Ryan Anderson. I'm not sure that the GPS has got him on the trail just yet. Yep. Oh, there he is. All right, perfect. So he's on the trail as well, following these guys now. He has an eight dog team. He left one dog behind in the previous checkpoint. So, so far we've seen um, all the mushers that have left have left at least one dog. You know, Ryan Reddington left one, Keith Ailey left one, Ryan Anderson left one. So they all have slimmed down their team just a little bit, you know, and that's very common. Leaving the last checkpoint, leave the bottom dog. You're only as fast as your slowest dog, right? And so that's the dog that's probably not going to enjoy this run as much um, as the ones that are able to go a little bit faster. So this race is starting to take shape here. We have a large group of mushers in the checkpoint of Mineral City, still on the trail on the way into Mineral City. We have Jay Fouché, uh, followed by Laura Nice. And she's a little ways back on the trail there. There's Jay Fouché um, getting qualified for the Iditarod. Laura Nice getting prepared for the Iditarod here, kind of using this race as a training run. Behind her, we have Kevin Mathis um, running a good race. Uh, I believe he still has a pretty large dog team in here. I think we got 12 dogs still in uh, Mathis's team. Um, and then Lisa Dietzen is uh, still in the previous checkpoint, Skyport. which was Skyport. How is it to be like Dietzen? She's at Skyport. Everybody's finishing the race. Is that morally difficult to be that far behind? Huh. You know, I I don't have that. As you don't have experience. that experience, do you? <laughs> you know, I just. Um, what do you think? What do you think, Nina? I mean, everybody's finishing off their race, and you're still at the last checkpoint. Well, <laughs> It depends or what the, your uh, a long way plans behind. were or your yeah. uh, idea your of how you were going to yeah. race, your goal, yeah. Or I mean, if you race, you always like to good, do a good performance. And know, if you're all way back... But you know, Karen, it also depends whether what kind of dog you race, because there are yeah. some people racing uh, pure breeds uh, of the bigger polar dogs, like the Malamutes and the Greenland dogs. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you know you're not going to be first. You know you're going to take... It's going to take more time, but you are a hardcore, pure breed musher. That's what uh, what's in it as well. You had to take a longer time. Mm -hmm. but, but in this marathon at Big Race, there yeah. is mostly Has uh, there Alaskans are. or sure. Siberians. And Siberians. So, but, uh, yeah. All right, let's, let's think about a uh, human marathon here for a second, right? I like using this analogy because it's something that we can relate to a little more easily, especially if you're not an experienced musher. There are those competitors that are here to win it. They are going to run a marathon in two hours and five minutes or whatever they're going to do, and it's impressive. Um, and, of course, they want to win. There are also people that it is inspirational to have finished a marathon. You know, for whatever reasons, whatever they have going on in their life, that, you know, this is a, a huge goal. It is not easy to run a marathon. And if they finish it in eight hours... That's impressive. That's an accomplishment, a sense of accomplishment that they have overcome this. So that just like humans, there is a wide range of abilities for sled dogs. And I would much rather see, uh, and I, I don't want to compare this to Lisa Dietzen because no, no. I don't understand that situation. Yeah. But, you know, I would much rather see a musher come into the finish, you know, 12 hours after the winter. With a and, big but, smile on their face. With a big smile on their yeah. face and doing what that dog team was uh, capable of and not trying to race with somebody who's better than them uh, or would race with dogs that are better than their dogs physically. That's not fair for their dogs. So running a smart race is a good musher. You know, there could, could be every bit as good of a musher with lesser dogs. You know, if I had a team of dogs that was not the best in the world, as I think mine kind of, they're, they're close to it. I'm very proud of my dogs. I think we're all proud of our dogs. But... Um, you know, the best race I can run is maximizing their abilities, setting those dogs up mm -hmm. for success. And if it takes me twice as long to the, do the race, so be it. Mm -hmm. That was the right race for those dogs. Well, so. you know what is nice in most long distance races is that if you're the last man or woman standing, you're the last one crossing the finish line, you do get a lot of recognition. A lot of mushers already 
pass, uh, cross the finish line, the, the volunteers they will and the spectators, they will actually be there for the last person coming in. And that's they will even get a uh, special prize as well. Yeah, I was so they do get a lot of recognition. I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, in mushing, most of the races we have our le red lantern presentation, which the red lantern or the widow's lamp um, goes back in mushing where they would keep a lamp in the window of the roadhouses along the Iditarod Trail and other places as a kind of a beacon to help the mushers find the way to the, the way stop. And so on the Iditarod, the last musher to cross the, the finish line, mm -hmm. there's a, a lantern that's hanging there and they take it down and they blow out the light. It's the closure of the race um, and they're awarded the red lantern. So it's a symbolic uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a closing thing. Well. The last yeah. musher is off the trail. We're all here safely. And you do sometimes see on the Iditarod mushers actually racing for last place. <laughs> um, so they're saying they're staying very long in the checkpoints. They're like, oh, you go ahead. You go ahead. And then finally the race official has to say, like, you get guys out. need to get out of here. The, the volunteers want to go home, right? Waiting but, in the last hill going into so, home. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is also a big thing when you ask, is she going to be demoralized? That's, that's totally personal, right? That you have the power to decide how you uh, react to life. Life can do whatever it wants to you, but how you react to it. She could be upbeat and happy. And you know what? I've got a good, uh, good, solid dog team. I think she's still running a decent number. Well, she had, I think she has eight dogs here. She could be very happy about these dogs, excited about the next run, <laughs> and the dogs will probably do great on the run. But if she's sitting there demoralized that she's behind, then the dogs are going to reflect that. <laughs> Well, we are going to try one more time because now I hope I have Greg and Bruce with me from Grand Portage. How are you guys? We're doing great and thank you for your patience yeah. and welcome back to Minnesota. Greg Heister and Bruce Lee. We're at Grand Portage and uh, we are at the finish line, Bruce, and at the last check uh, on the tracker, we have Ryan Reddington about 40 kilometers or 20 miles from this finish line. And you've won races before in the past. Let, what's welling up into him as he, uh, he gets closer and closer to this finish line? That I'm 20 miles from the finish line and I don't want to get caught right now. Yeah. So it's not over until he comes around that corner and sees this banner and finish line behind us here. Yeah, and truly anything can happen, right? Like 20 miles isn't that far for a dog team, but it is when you consider Murphy's Law into the equation, and that's a law that says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and it seems to happen a lot on a sled dog trail. Well, and there's another aspect of it. I mean, fans know more than he does. We know more from talking to guys that are coming in support system on the trail. The musher doesn't have all of that. I mean, he's running his dogs out in the northern Minnesota forest, so he doesn't know if a team's, you know, a mile behind him or 20 miles behind him. And so all those things keep you focused on the goal of getting to the finish line gracefully. Yeah, and of course we've talked uh, at our last checkpoint there in Mineral City about Ryan Reddington was in position to win the race last year, had a really bad run, one of the worst runs I think of probably his mushing career on his way to the finish line and he didn't get here first. And so is that, are these thoughts that are are going through his mind right now and if they are, how is it that a musher can fight those thoughts off? By being aware I mean, yeah, you're aware of this is the place that happened before, but he's got a totally different team on a diff totally different type of trail. So you're not going to be haunted by those ghosts. You're going to be committed to doing the best job that you can for those dogs in front of you. So that's what you do. Take it as a learning experience and just don't try and miss any details that would prevent the dogs from getting here gracefully. Yeah, and so just to kind of give you a lay of the land, we're here at, at, in Grand Portage and not really a town of, of much. There are some houses nearby, but we're at a casino and behind us is the finish line shoot. And if Kevin Bodie, our camera guy, does a simple pan uh, to his right out there, one of the great bays here on Lake Superior. And we do see some ice out there in indicating that it's still winter here in Minnesota. Uh, the temperature kind of stayed consistent today. The sun getting lower in the sky, so it will continue to cool off and possibly put a, an upper level crust on this trail for maybe the last 10 or 15 miles or, you know, 20 or 25 kilometers or so. And these teams should only possibly pick up some speed because of that. Well, it's remained 10 degrees ever since we got up before light today, so the trail should be nice and firm. The only thing that could possibly change that if there's places at road crossings where they've 
transported snow in for the you know for those areas that are normally roads that could be soft or heavy snow machine traffic but it is midweek here you don't have recreational snow machines I, I expect it's going to be a pretty decent trail for them the whole way here because the temperatures remain the same 10 degrees Fahrenheit that is yeah and Bruce you've won races including the Yukon Quest back in the day and and you've been involved in, and you have felt great pride uh, with a dog team that has performed extremely well and has gone on and, and talk about the pride that one feels it's great to win the championship great to win the trophy and and to get your name there and placed in in line to, to live on and on as, as time goes on but it's the it's the pride that one feels with these dogs that you have raised since birth and trained and you see them reach these great heights yeah the person who might be the most excited might not be the winner who comes in here. The greatest amount of self-pride and pride in the dogs could very easily be the person who thought their goal was just to finish and found themselves in fifth or sixth in any given race. I mean, it's pride in the dogs and their performance more than in the position. And it goes the other way too. If you think you've got a winning team and, some, and everything falls apart, and maybe you finish, you know, 15th, then you're going, well, what did I do wrong to let these guys down? And then you got to go home, do your homework and start over and figure it out, figure out what the dogs needed more. But yeah, there's pride in it, but it doesn't have to be winning to have yeah. pride in them. It's what, whenever you allow them to reach their maximum performance and come in with a healthy, happy looking dog team. They can be tired. It's an athletic endeavor. Any athlete should be tired at the end of their performance yeah. in any given sport. Uh, but, but you know, you just want to see those dogs come in and feel like we did a good job. We got you here. And it was interesting uh, earlier today back in Mineral Center uh, that Ryan revealed to us that he indeed had left his best leader at home. So that leads me into this question about leadership and the dogs that you choose on these final legs of a race like this. Your very best dogs now are in the front. Maybe. 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 So why wouldn't they? Why, why would there be a situation? Well, first you, you got to determine what you consider best. Is it your best speed leader? Is well, it best, your, best for best the situation. Control? Okay, yeah. best for the situation. Yeah. yeah, you would use your best for that team. Yeah. And for a situation like Ryan say, yeah, my best leader's at home, there's two things that that could be. One, he has a bigger goal at some point in the Iditarod, and, and he knows that dog. And so he doesn't need it. He wants to give these other dogs an opportunity to step up and to be a training build up. And then for the Iditarod, he wants that dog pretty rested and you know it's probably a veteran leader that he knows he can trust and just have that dog there in the stable so to speak then there's the other aspect of that mushers lie all the time and his best dogs may be the one he's got and he's hoping that all yeah. his competitors here yeah. wow he's winning the bear grease and he's not even using his best dogs and thus what we see all the time the head games begin yeah. so there's that aspect yeah uh, we interest, we, we witnessed some, some great moments today uh, back there at Mineral Center when Ryan Anderson pulled in, and I know he was hopeful for making a late-game push to try to get up and, and win another championship here at the Bear Grease. It was revealed there that he had had a, to put a dog in the basket and really hurt his speed, but uh, you and I have both witnessed he, he had a, a tremendous dog team in this entire race. If I, were, if I were picking dog teams, if my pay for this job was you get to pick the dog team you want, that would be the one I'd put in my pocket and take home. Yeah. They're really evenly matched. They look like a great Iditarod team. Really fast, steady trot without a lot of uh, awkward body movement. You're just looking for that line to be both, dog, both sides just going straight down the trail, not a lot of bouncing, just... And each dog equally matched, so one dog's not doing this while the other's doing this. You know, it's all that pulling. It looks like an engine. Where all, if you think of them as cylinders, everyone's firing in place, and you've got a smooth-running engine, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to see. I like to see a fast, steady trot where dogs don't get hurt. They're, they're lightly built like him, like mm -hmm. Ryan himself, and they're muscular but lean, and that's just a beautiful dog team.
And I know he was disappointed. I know, you know, this was the, that pass run that we saw him come into there at, at Mineral Center. There was the situation where he thought, okay, I can make up some time. I may not get first, but I can get second. And then when he had to load that dog and throw an extra 50 pounds in the sled, when almost everyone's running near empty yeah. because of the handler assist, uh, that's that's a lot of weight to throw in there for them to pull up those hills. So he was a little disappointed. And we hope you saw the interview with Colleen Wallen. That she came in right, literally minutes before we had to to leave Mineral Center and get here to Grand Portage to hit our satellite and get our satellite truck up and logistically get everything set for this great finish uh, later today. But she revealed while we were there that she actually had an encounter with two bull moose. We hope you saw that interview that we did with her, and perhaps they'll play it again for you when we throw it back. But that is, I think when you get on the other side of the encounter, you look back and say, wow, that's really cool. Like I was out on this wilderness trail and, and wildlife uh, made itself presentable and we, we get to, to tell these stories, but it's actually a dangerous situation for a dog team. It is, but it's part of being in the outdoors. I mean, thin ice can be dangerous, you know, just there's a lot of things. That's part of what, climbing mountains. You could get caught in an ice fall or a crevasse. It's just part of the score. And if it wasn't there, it wouldn't be near as rewarding of an experience. And what she's got now, I mean, she was just lit up with yeah. excitement, too. So that's kind of why we do all these things. It's not to go out and try and cheat death but it is to be out there where the real world is yeah. and and yeah i mean team, as we know dog teams have been stomped dogs have been killed and it, and it certainly could stall or end your race for you but she was just surprised to see them step out there and then the snow was deep and they don't like going off in soft snow where they can't use their legs to defend themselves. And really to a, a moose, you know, I'm a wildlife guide at Denali National Park in Alaska, and a sled dog team to them is just a bunch of canines, which wolves are. So their defense mechanisms when you're around them are the same as if it's a wolf pack. It just happens to be a sled dog pack in their eyes. So they're not aggressive. They're not going to come after you. They want to be left alone, but they're sure willing to defend themselves. and. She got a great view and got a little wake up call and you know, you're just tooling down the trail and all at once there's two, you know, thousand pound, 1200 pound animals standing in front of you. Yeah. Deserves a little respect. Yeah. And Colleen's had a, a great race, first out of Sawbill in her 21 years uh, of racing here at the Bear Grease that had never happened. But these moose and animals like that, with all of this deep snow this year in the north woods of Minnesota, they're looking for easier ways to get around. And it just so happens there's this nearly 300 mile trail going along the entire coast of Lake Superior. We call it a trail, it's actually a groomed road. <laughs> I mean, it's that wide. And so it's a great spot for, for moose to come out and, and find it easier to move around and to walk around without having to expend so much energy. And so uh, I, I'm sure, and, and oftentimes, Bruce, you know this, when those moose do find the road and they find it easier going, they don't always leave. And so I wonder if more teams behind Colleen are dealing with those moose as well. It's speculation. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, they're out there, and sometimes they're out there whether you see them or not. So yeah. you have to assume they're always out there. Yeah. But again, it's just part of being in the outdoors. It's really no big deal. It's just, as long as they don't end up in the middle of your team. Yeah. Well, that's but that's the big deal yeah. of it, right? Have you ever had a moose encounter with a dog team? Uh, four or five. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah. I think anybody in Alaska does. Yeah. 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 And you get through it. Okay, uh, Ryan Redding, Reddington and, and Keith Eiley. Can, can Eiley do anything at this point in time to get up in front of Ryan, or is he hoping Ryan makes some sort of mistake? Well, without seeing the tracker at this point, being out here, I mean, we walked out a while ago to do this broadcast. Uh, it, it's The mileage is getting really, really short. I, I think we're in that situation where it's Ryan's to lose, which he can, and we've yeah. seen other mushers do that. Uh, but that's not very much trail to make up some time at this point if things are going smoothly for, you know, just even consistently yeah. for, for a team. Uh, there might be some real interesting changes or battles, though, going back, you know, second, third, fourth, or third, fourth, fifth place. You know, those guys are close, too, and that's always fun to see. Yeah. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to send it back to Oslo right now, and so I'm going to get busy. I know I'm going to go inside that casino. There are a lot of people who have put a lot of energy into putting this dog race on this year. I'm going to see if I can pull a few of them out and get their thoughts about the Bear Grease and why it's important to this community, why it's important to the world, especially as we you know, stream all of these moving images and, uh, from this, this race across the globe so that people can watch it. Why is it important that we get these images out to everyone? So for right now... We'll send it back to Oslo. I've lost IFB, so I cannot hear you. But we'll be right back with more live from Grand Portage, Minnesota. We're at the finish line of the Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. Thank you, Greg and Bruce. So far, we're waiting for you to get in contact so we can talk to you directly. But go to the casino and pick some uh, good interviews for us because we need some... Some food, f some food to talk about. Yeah. We're, we're impatient to see the mushers coming now. And what he was talking about, mushers are good liars. Is that true? Are you good liars? All right, well, I'm going to date. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I got you. Right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm, <laughs> um, we got Greg and Bruce out there. Bruce comes from a little bit different era of mushing. So okay. <laughs> I want to be careful here. we go, here, careful. Because we're right? going to have some, uh, I'm sure we're going to have to have this conversation later in person. And his name is Bruce Lee, so we're going to have to be careful <laughs> about this. But um, <laughs> So back then, how mushers raced the Iditarod, and this was a slowly changing phase, and some of it still exists, was they didn't really have a solid plan. They were constantly reacting to other mushers. You know, these guys talk about, oh, they're all sitting at the checkpoint, and, you know, one of them says, oh, I'm going to go, you know, check on my dogs, and they try to sneak out of the checkpoint, right? Or one of them goes out and says, I'm going to go all the way, and takes off and stops two miles down the trail. They were playing these head games. Uh -huh. Now the race, we understand it so much better. More of the racers are running a tactical race that's right for their dogs. We know what our dogs can do. We have mushers that have raced this race 30-something times. They have enough depth of knowledge that they are confident to watch a musher go out there and leave, and they'll say, that's a dumb move. <laughs> and they'll sit right here where you know, and let their dogs have the rest they need. So the days of the head games aren't gone. The, the chain, it's changed a little bit, though. There's less of that. Because more mushers, of the top mushers, are confident in what they're doing, they're confident in their team's abilities, and they're running better tactical races. And that's why, instead of doing the race and, you know, the winners crossing the finish line in 11 days on the Iditarod, we're now doing it in sometimes as close to, you know, eight days, three hours, and 40 minutes is the standing record on an alternate route. We'll get into that later. But um, it's, it's a different era. So... Do mushers lie? I think that's a, a historical thing where this false information to, you know, to mm. where the other mushers did react to you. Now, I don't think mushers really react to you that much. So there's no sense in it. So no, I don't, Somebody, I don't lie yeah. about stuff. Nah. I mean, I'll tell people I'm not going to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll ask yeah. me questions. Well, what are you going to do from here? Well, if somebody <laughs> asked me how long you're going to stay, I would either answer three hours. Or you say, I don't know. I Probably would have a strategic lie. <laughs> I would probably leave after two hours and yeah. say. Uh, but, all right, so that's a great question. Do you think that anybody would change their schedule because that you said you were leaving well, on why, three why instead of two? Why do they ask? Why do they ask? Of course, somebody would ask. Just yeah. be curious what my plan is. I, I, yeah, I, there are some. I don't think they would change just because of me, but I know people. Uh, I do know people that change their rest plan just by talking to other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I probably don't like myself. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps on the f f last little bit of the Iditarod, when it's a really close race, we are dictating what we can do. Um, we're taking calculated risks on what we have to do to give our team a chance to win, yes. But I think we, we don't change that much based on the other mushers. And we're talking the last 150 miles on the Iditarod, maybe the last three runs, perhaps two to three runs. So I, I don't think it's as much of a culture as it used to be. Okay. But uh, yeah, when it comes to like, all right, so if Ryan Reddington, for example, did leave his best lead dog at home, mm. what am I going to do differently? No. You know, what, what's the point of the head games? I'm not going to change anything. So does it really matter if that yeah. was because the dog was sore and wasn't able to do this race? Or is it going to make any difference if he did, in fact, leave his best lead, lead dog? Or maybe it means... Maybe it's a mythical dog. Maybe there is no lead dog at home, yeah. right? It doesn't really change anything that I'm going to do as a, you know, as, as a, a competitor. In I the mean, race. haven't you ever, haven't you ever 
sneaked out of the cabin to, 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 to go out to your dog team and get away from the checkpoint? Haven't you ever done that? Um, Without hoping anybody would see you? Yeah, like I've said, in the final miles... But how I, can you do that with a dog team without making any noise? Well, of course, they'll see you I mean, when, you go, uh, go, when you're down at the, with your dog team. They'll see you. But, I mean, it takes some time if your competitor is still asleep. It takes some time for the handlers to run up. Hey, Dallas is gone, or Dallas is on his way out, or Nina is... Yeah, uh, but on, on the races that we run, like in the Iditarod, there are no handlers. So That's you the point. can I was legitimately... That. You know, a lot of times, you will see mushers say, I, you know, I got to go... Uh, you know, feed my dogs. And really, they go out and they leave, right? If they're saying that they're going to feed their dogs, they're indicating they're going to be here at least two more hours because the dogs are going to need to have time to digest. That might be something at the end of the race. But again, I'm not going to... If my dogs need three hours of rest, <coughs> they need three hours of rest regardless of when the other musher leaves. So if he leaves after an hour... I'll be faster than him because I have more rest. I'll catch him later. But maybe, actually, this is a cultural thing as well, that this is a little bit different between the Alaskan races and the European races or the Norwegian races. You've done the Finnmark race. Didn't you feel it was more like uh, people talking behind their backs? Uh, not negatively, but I mean, <laughs> no, sorry, not negatively, but, you know, sneaking around, maybe dressing another's jacket just to show... Oh, oh I mean, you, is, uh, we have right, that so here. To, to answer your question... Mushers in the 80s and maybe in the 90s in Alaska lied, and Scandinavian mushers lied. <laughs> or I should say, are, are, are well, sneaking. Lying. It's no, just it's, strategic, it's, it's strategic um, misconception. Yeah. Strategic Exa misconception. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that, that's right. We just heard him talk about Colleen Valiant, who met into some moose on mm -hmm. this leg, and we're going to listen to her interviews she did with Greg and Bruce just after. Come back to Mineral Center, Greg Heister and Colleen. And so tell us about uh, you had an encounter out on the trail on the trip in here. Beautiful, be beautiful. About 12 miles back, I came around a corner and I saw something in a snowbank and out popped two bull moose, still had their racks on. Whoa. I mean, they were probably 50 yards in front of me and the team and I stopped and they looked and then they just started moving. It was amazing just watching him move. I've, I've never encountered that so close. Yeah. We followed him, I bet, I, maybe for a minute. So it was probably 20 seconds. <laughs> and then they <laughs> lumbered off into, they took, they took it into the woods and uh, the snow was up to their shoulders. They could hardly move. And then I, I passed them. They stood there and watched me pass them. And that was it. But... We were going about 20 miles an hour, so wow. it was a it was really a beautiful, beautiful, yeah. yeah. So did the dogs smell the moose? Did they see the moose? Yeah, did they, their, leaders, their attitudes yeah, change when yeah. they saw it? My leaders perked up about I don't know 20 seconds before we came around the corner. I mean, I could smell them. I could smell the moose. Yeah. So, so I'm you know looking they at did. yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at my leaders and I'm like, what's up, you guys? Wow. Yeah. yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you weren't frightened at all that like they didn't make a, a, an attempt to get on the trail? I was really frightened because yeah. I didn't know if they would turn around and not want to give up the trail, which is typical of moose. The snow right. is so deep. Yeah. Um, but we were staying behind them. I let the dogs go. You know, we were just trotting behind them while loping, but um, we didn't get too close and just in case something, if they were to turn. Um, I don't know what my plan would have been, <laughs> but it was very beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Thanks, me too. Guys, See? Yeah. Let's go back to Thanks. Oslo, to the studio. What a story. It's a nice story. Have you experienced that meeting moose out on a training or during the race? Yeah, that's a fairly common experience, particularly in Alaska, I think, to encounter moose. In fact, just this winter, I have about four or five moose that live in the field, I mean, not a mile from when I leave my dog yard, I see them almost every day. The moose are used to us. We do a bunch of hoops and loops around that field, and we see the moose. In fact, right before I, I left home, we had a very cold spell, and unfortunately, one of the, the calves, the young moose, died uh, um, over there and right on the trail. It laid down, and we were mushing over there, and we saw it, and we said, right, let's not go over there anymore, and two days later, it had, it had died. Just cold winter and that's when it's really scary because the moose are struggling this time of year in alaska it was 20 below zero fahrenheit that's pretty cold celsius um 
And it had been like that for weeks. And the, the moose's food is all buried in snow. The cold is taking a lot of energy. That's 30 below Celsius approximately. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that's when moose get angry. They get aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. Some amount of research has gone into that. When the moose have no more body fat, they start metabolizing their muscle. And it can actually cause the moose to hallucinate. And it does cause them to become very aggressive. So moose are a real concern. I've had one serious encounter where a moose actually was not on the trail. It came from beside the trail, T-boned right into the side of my dogs, kicked one of the dogs. Um, this was December 2011. The dog ended up paralyzed from the ears back, and the vet said, you know, there's nothing we can do for the dog. I took it to Oklahoma. It was there for 18 months getting specialist treatment, and I got three out of four legs working. We ended up having to amputate one of the legs. Now that's uh, actually the oldest dog in our kennel right now, and that was, you know, what, eight eight yeah almost yeah eight years ago yeah. now um still going strong he has a f litter of puppies since then one of those puppies i raced in the finmark last year so um anyway moose are a concern on that incident <clears throat> fortunately only one of my dogs got injured because i carry a gun with me and i was able to you know kill the moose um but that's very scary do you <laughs> always scary. have a gun with you when you're training in alaska not not always maybe uh, i shouldn't say that i always have a gun with me when it's dangerous conditions later in the winter really cold deep snow and you can tell i mean we see so many moose you know in the early in the winter as soon as the moose see you they run away you, there's no need at this point yeah. winters that there's very little snow you hardly ever see the moose because they don't need to be on the trails but on bad winters deep snow and cold weather then yes i definitely carry a gun with me um and fortunately, I had a gun because otherwise, you know, many of the dogs would have been injured in that case. What about in the springtime when the bears start to wake up after the winter? Is that I've, it's a concern as yeah, well? Or? I've personally never had any issue with bears. Um, I, I know of one instance. I mean, this is one instance in all of mushing in Alaska that I'm aware of that uh, a bear actually did attack a dog team in the spring. And it was devastating. Um, but this and I. I I unfortunately saw photos afterwards, um, mm -hmm. and this was years and years ago. So it's not not at all common. I don't want to say it's impossible because it has happened, but that was long, long ago. I'd be more concerned mm -hmm. with polar bears in the farther, farther northern regions. Um, that would be the biggest concern. Only once that I know of, mushers have actually seen polar bears on the Iditarod Trail, but that is typically too far south for them. Was that close to know? It was close to Koyuk, okay. um, which is actually yeah. actually the farthest uh, north yeah. checkpoint on the Iditarod, because yeah. uh, from there you're mo going mostly west. west. Yeah. So that one, I, I I was this was before my time, so I've heard stories, right? Yeah. But as I understood it, you know, mushers came in and said, "I saw a polar bear on the trail." And they said, "No, it's too far south. Polar bears don't live here. It must have been a piece of ice or something." <laughs> and then another musher said the same thing. And then later, some people filming said, "We uh. filmed a polar bear," and then they believed him. <laughs> um, but nobody carries a, a gun big enough to deal with a polar bear on the trail, so that would be very scary because everything a polar bear sees is food, right? <laughs> if it moves, it's food from a polar bear's point of view. So. Yeah, I've never had an issue with bears, though. So. What do you mean by it's, the, the gun you carry is not strong enough for a polar bear? Uh, generally it's not. not you know, and this, this is an important thing with, with carrying a gun with dogs. Um, one thing is you've got to be very careful that you don't want to hurt your dogs, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of scary when you're trying to shoot a moose that's also attacking your dogs. Um, but people who always say, oh, you need a big gun for moose, the problem is they end up putting it in their sled. And what happens when you put it in the sled is it's not something you use very often, like once every 10 years. Mm. <laughs> so it ends up at the bottom of your sled. Yeah. And if there's an issue, it's going to happen fast, and you're not going to have time to dig around in the sled. So I carry a smaller gun, but it's in the pocket of my parka. It's small enough that I don't really notice it. It's not such a bother that you take it out of your parka and put it in the sled. Um, my brother had an incident with moose. There was actually three of them mushing, and that was a problem. That you know They had three guns between them, but some of them it was in the sled, and that was... Mm. An, a bad situation, but I think they did end up killing the moose, and that one was actually attacking the people. It saw the, the light on their head, and it was going after that. So a uh, very good friend of ours got quite hurt from these the are moose These these stories, actually. Mm -hmm. We do have... Uh, yeah, in Norway, we do have a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, there are a lot of well. moose in Norway, Sweden, Finland, a yeah. lot of them. Um, but we do have a uh, much stricter uh, weapon policy. Yeah. So it's, it wouldn't be legal just to go for training run with a gun in your jacket or sled. Yeah. But still, I have experienced something myself, but I did not have the 
moose in my team. It was in my neighbor's team when he was training and I was coming directly after. Mm -hmm. And he was actually carrying an ax in his sled and the, the, the moose was tangled in all the lines in his team, which made the moose fall. Ah. So it was all tangled up, right? And the dogs were starting to get, uh, to, uh, to chew on their fur or just to chew on that moose. It was still alive. And the, the, the person was able to use his axe, the backside of the axe, and uh, uh, make uh, the moose uh, unconscious. Oh, okay. And so on. It was actually killed. And I was coming directly after, and there was blood all over. And I was able the bear. Oh, the, it's a nice sport. This uh, lots of blood, <laughs> <laughs> with fighting these, with wild yeah. animals. Ariana, so. these are extreme situations. Yeah, really. yeah. I mean, but it's it's really interesting extreme. that you know it's it, it it can happen. You're out in the wilderness. It's 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 nature. But I do take you know? precautions. Me, yeah. I don't carry a weapon, some kind of weapon, not at all. But I do carry a small bell, like the ones you would use for sheep. <laughs> like I would no, and not me, the dogs. <laughs> The lead dog is carrying the bell in his uh, or hers uh, collar mm. to make a little bit of noise, not enough noise, so the moose will know you're arriving, that you're on your way. Um, the thing is, it's too much snow, the trail is really hard and flat, that's when the moose gets out in the trail. And when you that, keep that little bell, I'll well, make that noise, so the moose will hopefully run the other direction. Mm. From Colleen's experience here, though, when I think of moose on the trail, I don't so much think of the danger that they present. When you see a big bull moose, or in Colleen's example here on the race, with two big bull moose, that has to be one of the most majestic animals on the planet. Mm -hmm. A big bull moose moving through the snow. It's just such a huge, powerful animal. Um, it's really impressive. It's so 99% huh? of the time yeah, so that you see a big moose, it's just, it's awe-inspiring, right? It's a huge piece of stick. Yeah. The, the animal that I'm most concerned about on the trail is actually a porcupine. What is that? Uh, porcupine. That's because the porcupine. Are, <laughs> we don't have porcupines in Norway, but that okay. will be similar to pinsvin. But they uh. live in the trees. Yeah. The thing is, they're they're a coat. You can explain. Yeah, they they have. I mean, a porcupine has long quills. Yeah. That um, they don't move very fast, and a lot of times they're in the the pine trees or the spruce trees, and they will cross the trail. They leave very cute tracks because their little paws go, and then their tail swishes over behind them. But you'll come around a corner, and they're maybe this big, not not a very large animal, and the dogs will go over there and. If they try to bite the porcupine, their their mouth can get full of quills and around their face and in their arms, and it's a real real pain. So I'm mostly concerned about porcupines because you don't see them, right? You'll come around a corner and there's one. So fortunately, I haven't had any incidents with them in a long time. But we, we don't have them here. The the ones you're talking about, we have yeah. something some similar, but they're we, they're not out on the trails. But these porcupines are they active during winter? Yep. No, okay, I mean, so I, mean I, I thought they were just. I'm not a porcupine some... expert, but I see them all the time. <laughs> oh, well, we think you are. Uh, <laughs> but you've been picking quills. Yeah, it's not fun. Um, if if the dog actually bites the porcupine, you have to take him to a vet where they can sedate the dog and get all the quills out. Um, and especially when you're just loose running the dogs, like you're out just in the woods and they're running free and most of the time the porcupines are in the tree so it's not a problem but if you come across and they're on the ground the dogs will go over and you know they're curious and they want to taste this animal <laughs> and but you know what it doesn't fun? taste very good they, that's not a mistake they usually make twice though yeah <laughs> but these are quite sad things or things it's always nice to see an animal in the nature of course but these are situations that can be bothering or dangerous but there are nice situations as well we with animals on trail, a lot of them. I, I, that's why I love mushing, because I have so many r fantastic moments in the nature. Mm. I was on the last leg one time in a race in northern Norway. I actually had a rabbit coming, because I was going on top of, like, of a hill, very narrow hill. Like It was actually a, a, an old train um, uh, track. Railway? For, yeah, the railway. Yeah. And I was going on this railway, uh, and there was actually a rabbit coming up from uh, my right side, straight underneath the legs of my dogs in my team, going down on the other side. And there was still like five k's, five kilometers left to the finish line. <laughs> and what happened that was that I never had such a good speed to the finish line <laughs> ever. <laughs> and luckily, there were some people sharing for me, and there was some. Uh, TV um, people filming, <laughs> and I had that, the worst pace ever because the dice just saw these uh, had these uh, rabbit crossing out of my team. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd like more rabbits. <laughs>
<laughs> no, we should have maybe have a look at the map a little bit and yeah, see what's going on in the race here. Here All we right. go. So it's a little bit confusing here because as you can see, we're doing some loops. So out of Mineral Center there, um, in first place, we have Ryan Reddington, and he's kind of doing the second loop here. He's going to come back fairly close to Mineral Center um, before he heads on towards uh, Grand Portage where the finish is. So he's out in front. Behind him, we have Keith Eiley. Um, right now, I'm getting a reading of 6.3 kilometers behind Ryan Reddington, um, traveling at a similar speed uh, at this point. They've been varying as they go up and down hills. Eiley, we have uh, Ryan Anderson in third place. Uh, he's at the kind of the apex of that loop up there. Um, moving at a good pace as well. He's running, uh, I'm trying to pull up. He's got eight dogs right now as well. He left one behind in this past checkpoint. Now, about um, five kilometers behind Anderson, we have uh, Martin Massacott, who has also left a few dogs behind in the previous checkpoint. He went from 10 dogs down to eight dogs. So on the trail right now, we have Reddington with seven, Keith Eiley with 10, Ryan Anderson with eight, and Martin with eight. Um, here fairly soon, we should also have uh, Colleen on the trail soon. Um, in just a little bit, uh, I have to pull up our exact time there. I guess that's 325 local time. So it'll be a little bit before she hits the trail. We have numerous mushers in there. Jay Fouché, uh, you can see the green number 10 there. She's gonna be reaching Mineral Center fairly soon, as will Laura Nice in 11th position, a little farther back down the trail. Now, both those mushers will take their mandatory four hour stop when they reach Mineral Center before they can continue on. Um, now behind Laura Nice, we have uh, Kevin Mathis, who is also on the trail. And it's a fairly big gap. And this is where the, the back of the race, they can start to spread out. And now if we go all the way back to last place on this race, we have Lisa Dietzen uh, is in 13th place. And she has just left um, the Skyport checkpoint. She is on the trail and making her way towards the final checkpoint. So it's good to see that she's on the trail, she's moving, she's uh, getting closer to the finish here and hopefully we'll keep on going. By race rules, uh, they're supposed to be in that last checkpoint within 12 hours of the leader, um, but sometimes they will make exceptions on that rule. So there is Lisa Dietzen and I need to see and we can get an accurate count on the number of dogs she has. But everybody's moving here. The race is playing yeah. out. Um, we can expect Ryan Reddington to be, you know, getting towards the finish. Um, we expect him to be first at this point unless something changes. It'll be interesting to see, though, as they get later in this run, if Keith Ailey can uh, make up some more time there. Um, yeah, it's, it's starting to become a dog race here. <laughs> it's starting to become a dog race. And... We should have uh, Greg and Bruce with us. If they understood right, you were guys were going to the casino and talking with some of the people. How's the atmosphere? You have a great style with your sunglasses out today. <laughs> well, that's simply because the sun is starting to break through the clouds and, and we're looking into it. But, you know, what the heck? We're going to go with sunglasses for a while. And it should be pointed out. I've been hanging out in the casino a little bit, but just eating. There's been no bets placed. Not that there's an issue with that, and not that it won't happen later today. Okay, I'm joined by MJ and Binner, and I'm going to let you guys uh, talk about your roles and your titles here with the Bear Grease. Oh, sure. Well, I'm the race coordinator this year for the Bear Grease. Um, I've been a volunteer for this is my 30th year. Wow. Yeah, so it's not that long. There are others that have been longer, but it's pretty yeah, long. I've been around. Um, and so I do a lot of the behind the scenes things in the office, you know, pulling permits and getting insurance and doing all that paperwork stuff and getting all the things in order back starting in like September, October. And then when it comes race time, and that better. we roll. Uh, I've been helping out since 91. And wow. um, yeah, I started out with dog crews because I was younger and more agile. And um, have kind of <laughs> done, I think I've pretty much, I think I've covered most of the different jobs over the volunteer opportunities over the years. Um, and now I kind of help out with MJ when she when we're out on the course and Patty Pruden who's usually here with us. Um, mm. She is homesick. Get well, Patty. Yeah. Um, she the three of us usually start at the start and then we help out with that. Go to the finish at the mid distance and then we come over here and um, we check in on a couple 
trail center, that kind of thing, make sure they don't need anything. Checkpoint. Checkpoint stuff. And then we come to the finish and, and um, work with the people here to put this finish up, put, put all this stuff up. So. And so I look behind us, and, and what a great setting this is yeah, with Lake Superior in the background and, and the, the finish shoot is here, and you got your banners up and, and all of the flags. And uh, is it all ready? Like if the winner showed up right now, would be we be ready to go? Is there some frantic things going on? No. We, You're ready. If he came around that corner, I have my watch. So <laughs> I'd have to run in and get my clipboard. But that's about it. And have our crew come out. Um, you know, the judges are right there. Everybody's waiting. So, yeah. I mean, we've got a couple hours, so yeah. quite a few hours. And I would imagine uh, this being the 36th year of, of the Bear Grease that northern Minnesota wouldn't be the same without it. I mean, it's become oh. very much a part of the fabric of this country, hasn't it? And it seems like there's so many people that live in these local communities up and down this trail that are so passionate about mm -hmm. it. Like, there's uh, so many people, and nobody's earning money. No, right, but yet no. they're so committed and they, they've taken ownership yeah. of this event. It's really great. Right from the start at Billy's, that community out there will do anything for the Bear Grease, and they do. Yeah. It used to be a checkpoint, and it was the first checkpoint out of Duluth, and when I ran it one year, it was really warm. Um, oh, it was a finish, too, and so they finished there, and it was really warm that year. And I called Billy at 4 in the morning. I said, I don't know what we're going to do. Look at the parking lot. And he came back and said, it's almost all mud. It's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I said, do you think you could get Lauren out there with a skid steer or something? We could move some snow in there. He said, I'll work on it. Just get over here. So, like, half an hour later, I get there. There's a front-end loader. There's a skid steer. Yeah. There's guys with equipment everywhere. The whole parking lot was a snow was covered in snow and yeah, we had how about it that? and those people come out of the woodwork to help same yeah. um, all the way at every checkpoint the yeah. communities you yeah. know just pitch yeah, in yeah. they love it they have a yeah. lot of pride yeah, yeah they do they take ownership yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's crazy the more of these <laughs> events that I get to come and witness and it's just I don't know if it's it's because we love mushers or we love dogs or we love something to do in the winter time. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it, that's a consistent element throughout these races that they really can't happen without this tremendous volunteer oh, army oh, of people yeah. that, that really pitch in. Hundreds of volunteers, yep. yeah. hundreds. Yep. Benner, you're holding something in your right hand here. Let's hold it up and yep. let's explain to the world what it is. Okay, speaking of Patty, Patty Pruden makes has been making this for a few, couple years now, and um, it is the Frank Bishop Lead Award, and um, it goes for the lead dog, and she hand makes it. She just finished it. Oh, she just finished it. Yeah. And um, yeah. yep, the bear. It's paw, all the hand egg, All handmade. All handmade. Hand beaded, and it. Um, we had a life. Very. I'll, I'll just read it. It's yeah. the Frank Bishop Lead Award. It honors the life of Frank Bishop. Um, 1924 to 2015. Um, Frank's love of racing went from <clears throat> oh, from <laughs> racing his motorcycle in the Isle of Man to a passion of dog sled racing. He became a John Bear Grease volunteer in 1988 at the age of 64, and for 27 years of volunteering and dreaming of one day mushing, his dream came true wow. at age 90. No way. <laughs> yep, and yep. Frank was able to experience riding out of the starting chute with fellow musher Blake Frecking. So um, the award honors those teams <clears throat> with the same qualities as Frank, never en a never-ending passion, drive, and preserver. <laughs> Perseverance, sorry, from the very start to the very end of the race. Um, and Frank was so much a part of this race. It's, I mean, there's so many fun stories. So Patty, in fact, well, we don't have time to go into that. but We Patty, have all kinds no, no, of time. Patty found him <laughs> at one of the finishes down in Lester Park back when the race finished down in Duluth. And she comes upon this old guy sleeping in a car and he, it was parked like right in the middle where the dogs were going to come in, you know, like two hours before the end of the race. So she knocks on the window. It was and really, really cold. It right? was like a was million below, of course, totally below like last finishes. year. Yeah. Knocks on the window, gets no response. And she's going, God, is this guy dead or what? You know, so she knocks and knocks. And finally, he looks over and she goes like this to roll down the window. And he rolls it down. And she goes, are you OK? 
And he goes, oh, yes, I was just taking a nap, you know? <laughs> and he's this little Englishman, and I can't do the accent, but he was just sleeping there until the, the first dog. Are the dog teams in yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are the dog teams in yet? I was just waiting for the first team, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But so Frank's been with Patty ever since then. She goes, you don't have to sleep in your car. Just come to my house. So she grabbed him and brought him. And, yep. uh, yeah. So this is in honor yeah. of Frank. And Patty puts a lot of time into these. This is all hand beaded. And this is for the dogs and Lake Superior and the Sunrise. Yep. And this is <clears throat> the Grand Portage Band of Chippewa. It's part of their logo which we see in the background, yeah. but she's done very Yeah, useful. so it's, yeah. it's a cool thing that just another volunteer did. Yeah. You yeah. know, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you, you guys were a little uncomfortable with coming out and talking to me, yeah. but <laughs> I, I have to be honest, it's, it's one of the best interviews we've done the entire trail. And well, I, so I really appreciate you guys coming out and explaining. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, equivalent to the Golden Harness yeah, award is. that would, would be given to the, the, the lead dogs yes. or lead dog in, in the yeah, Iditarod. Iditarod. Right. And so, uh, uh, thank you for coming out and explaining welcome, because we're going to see that presented to a dog later today and now yeah, we know yeah. the special story behind yeah. it. It is pretty cool. And now we know who Mr. Bishop is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Everybody loves Frank. Yeah. And if he was here, well he is. He is here. here. He is. Here. He is. He's here. Yeah. Well, we can't tell you why, but he is here. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's cool. Okay, <laughs> MJ Benner, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for all you do for this race so the world gets to enjoy it. Oh, I know. And finally, yeah. we get to come down and see the Bear Grease uh, Sled yeah. Dog Marathon yeah. in person. Yes. And we've been we've been talking about it, hearing about it for years and years and years. And so we're yeah. finally here. We're so excited about it. Well, we are yeah. too. Yeah. And yeah. it's just Absolutely. a couple hours away, and it we'll is. have a finisher here. We'll yeah. have a champion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Oslo, your turn. Back to the desk. Thank you, Greg, and make sure to thank these two uh, lovely ladies for the introduction of the special award at Beer Grease. And... Dallas, special awards, it's a part of mushing races, yeah. right? Yeah. No, and, and almost all the, the major races have some special awards along the way, and there's some that are very structured and very specific. For example, you know, we have the Yellow Rose presentation in the Iditarod where the winning mushers, two lead dogs, the musher chooses those dogs, not necessarily the two that cross the finish and line and lead, because as we've learned, there are many lead dogs in a team. So the musher can put those yellow roses on their lead dogs, and this kind of goes back to like Kentucky Derby racehorses being wreathed in the, in the roses there, in the presentation of roses. Um, and those ones are a fixed award. You know, they're going to go to the winner's lead dogs. And then there are other awards that the mushers might vote on and select. So, for example, the, the sportsmanship award, right, where... You know, if, and this is yeah. for exceptional, excep yeah, exceptional sportsmanship. You know, it's kind of expected that if somebody, you know, drops their thermos, you're going to pick it up and get to the next checkpoint and, you know, here's, yeah. here's your thermos or your water bottle, yeah. right? But there's also the times when mushers go way out of their way and they stop and they help a musher fix their sled or repair their tow line. Or, um, you know, if a musher loses their team, they'll pick them up and they'll ride with another musher for sometimes hours until they can catch up with that other team. You know, so there's different types of awards there. Um, in the Iditarod, we have the Golden Harness Award, which is one that the mushers uh, nominate different lead dogs mm -hmm. in the race, and it's not necessarily the winning musher's lead dog, and then the mushers are voting on, you know, one of the other dogs in the race that's um, pretty much the MVP, the most valuable player, or most valuable dog in this case. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's usually, yeah. oftentimes, a really inspirational story. There's been, you know, mushers that have finished in third or fifth place, and you know, it's not just this one race that the lead dog led through a phenomenal storm or something. It's, it's a lot of times uh, recognizing the career of that dog. Yeah. You know, it's this a, a dog that's maybe raced eight Iditarods or nine Iditarods and always has been there, and they may have never won the Iditarod. And for as a musher, when you're when you see another team go through a checkpoint and you see that lead dog, you know, driving out the, of the checkpoint, just excited to get back on the trail to do what they love, and you think. I wish that dog was on my team. You know, that's, that's the dog that's going to get nominated for that award. Um, there's also many of these races have awards for the first musher that reaches a checkpoint. Maybe it's the first to the halfway award mm -hmm. or, you know, on the Iditarod, first to the Bering Sea coast. And these are things that a lot of the, the villages really rally around. And it's some, some neat awards and neat presentations. And sometimes you'll see mushers that maybe know that they're not going to win this race. They might push out a little bit to, to get that first to the Bering Sea yeah. coast award. That one, I think, 
think, is twenty five two thousand five hundred dollars in golden nuggets, oh, yeah. which is kind of kind of cool. Um, I've won the halfway award. Yeah, I was going to ask you which one is the the most emotional award you won in your career. You must have won quite a few. Um, but actually, who's the one that's actually most surprisingly to you? few. Um, I've won surprisingly few because I generally am farther back in the race, and okay. in my thinking, it's about. The only time I need to be in front of the race is at the finish line. Mm. You know, if I took the lead 100 yards from the finish, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I generally am farther mm. back in the race and try to accelerate to the finish. Uh, so I've won surprisingly few partway awards. Um, what about one? One is special for you. The one that's the most special to me. Uh, the one that stands out to me is in 2012, I won my first Iditarod. And I had a very small lead dog named Guinness. And... Um, she was one that, I mean, when I started started racing, I had very few dogs, and she wasn't supposed to be a racing dog. She was supposed to be for breeding and kind of the matriarch of the kennel. But because I had so few dogs, of course I was going to train her. I needed her. <laughs> um, and, and over the years, she so much surpassed what I thought she sh could be. And it was really a learning experience for me to realize that we sometimes put limitations on the dogs because we don't expect them to be that good. So we don't give them the opportunity to be that good. And Guinness became that good. She was one of my main lead dogs when I won the Iditarod in 2012. And then she won the Golden Harness Award. You know, the highest honors a sled dog can receive, winning the MVP award at the biggest race, you know, the Iditarod. Um, that one was probably the most emotional for me, was um, just... I don't know, her being recognized. Is you know, that an Olympic done. gold medal for the measures? Uh, yeah, I mean, the Iditarod, winning the Iditarod is the Olympic gold medal. Um, but I still think as far as winning that race, what I was most proud of was her getting that, that uh, you know, MVP award or the Golden Harness Award. So that's a pretty, pretty special moment there. And she has many puppies in our kennel now. So even though she's since passed, um, those genetics are still in the kennel. Her puppies are still on my team in 2015, 16, 17, um, and 14, I guess. Yeah, from 14 on, I had her, her puppies in my team at the finish line running with me. So it's pretty pretty special dog. What about the r rookies? The, uh, the, the people that do they have special award for the rookies the first time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's actually a highly coveted award is the Rookie of the Year mm. Award. Um, of course, the first uh, rookie to cross the finish line. Now, in the Iditarod, that must be a true rookie, you know, yeah. their first time on the race. So if they've started the race but didn't finish and they come back the next year, they're actually not eligible. Yeah. Um, and that's a highly coveted award. And it, I think it's a good one. It, it's it's nice to see because it's, for any sport to be healthy, you need that next generation coming in. You need talent coming in. It needs to be a, something that keeps drawing people in and getting engaged. And mushing is not an easy sport to get into. It's not, you know, it's not like you just need to buy a football and away you run, right? Mm. There's a lot of equipment involved. So I love seeing these other races um, that encourage new mushers. That's where we've talked a little bit about the eight dog class that we saw in this race. That is... While it's not exclusively for beginning mushers, it encourages new mushers. And that's what I like to see. The junior races, the 40-mile races, those are all great things to see in a sport. Um, but yeah, Rookie of the Year is a highly coveted award and uh, is always kind of the race within the race. So on the first part, you were watching you know, who's going to win the race. And then it's like, all right, who's going to be Rookie of the Year? It's something fun to watch. Look, Nina, you're coming with Norwegian waffles. <laughs> These are waffles with strawberry jam. <laughs> you're hungry? I was I hungry. Am. <laughs> I had to go out and get some food. This These is, are, this this is, is a, a very typical Norwegian waffles. Yeah. But Where's in Minnesota, the there is a lot There is a lot of Norwegian uh, Influence. heritage. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we so do, you we could uh, probably get waffles in Minnesota as well. So. But you asked for the, uh, the brown cheese or the goat cheese. We, yep. we actually uh, eat these with the, the, the brown cheese as well. Yeah, that's what I said. It's where we're missing the brown cheese on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And some uh, also have sour cream on it as well. Yeah. So, and sugar. So, uh, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put it there, yeah. If you leave it within reach, I can't guarantee I won't eat it all. <laughs> we'll fight about it. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Maybe we'll arm wrestle. Are you it. as competitive as me? And we'll <laughs> gotta be fast. We have been talking for three days now about mushing, and you're the biggest experts, but. You know, there are hopefully some of the viewers who's not the experts and, you know, people watching this is passionate. But there is a report that I introduce you to, to have a look at. This is Mushing for Dummies. If you crash, never let go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Blake, you got to explain to me everything I need to know to take my first trip. All right. So the most important thing is never to let the 
sled creep up on the dogs. Okay. So we use this drag to kind of keep our speed moderated. And this is for stopping. So we have our snow hooks. And they are a parking brake. Parking brake. So we need to, need to stop if you have to get off the sled and go forward. Okay. We set that in the snow. This, it looks easy. The important thing is... <laughs> it looks really easy, they, but yeah, I'm, I'm not too comfortable. <laughs> they never want to stop. Okay. So an important thing is, if you drop something behind you, yeah. you never go backwards from the sled. Okay. Because if they pull this hook, yeah. and they can if it's not the perfect snow conditions, they can pull the snow hook and they will not stop. They okay. Won't. And you're left. And then I'm lost in the woods. Yep. Okay. Then here, if I want to break, I put this one here. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. gonna try it, You're and if, if I get lost, I'll thank you, everybody. <laughs> so we have directional commands for the leaders. Mm -hmm. So we say G to go right. G, okay. And ha to go left. And we G say and whoa. 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 That's but, but they don't listen. Okay. To that. If you crash, never let go of this. Never let go of that. Yes. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. It was really, really nice. And I might take four dogs next time. <laughs> well, one has one time has to be the first one, and I had a really good coach, though. Blake mm -hmm. Breaking as the coach for my first ride. Can I have some comments on my perf my performance? Well, all right, I want to see, do we just see the highlight reel there, or is that the entire thing? For example, did you have any good crashes that they didn't catch on camera? No, no, no. <laughs> I kept it on, I kept on, on the trails, and, but you know, I was, he wanted to put me up with four dogs, but that, I kind of felt three dogs was a you're good, still a good start, yeah, you know? You're still a musher. But, um, you know, it was a really nice experience. It's, um, I've been a lot, doing a lot of skiing, so I kind of had, you know, I felt, yeah. you know, and he said, you, you kind of feel like you have to ride like a, a motorbike when you're doing the turns. And I, I, I kept, it was really nice experience. I invite you to my kettle. Oh, you'll, give, you'll give it a shot at my kettle as well. I, I think you did quite well. I mean, seeing there, you can tell, I was just going to ask you, how long have you been skiing, though? That may have been your first time on a dog sled, but you've been skiing for a little while, I suspect. Yeah, I've been <laughs> skiing professionally for, for quite a long time. Yeah, so. So, so it, I know skiing. So, um. But it was, it's complete, it was so nice going out. What you, when you talk about being out in the nature, I can totally understand why people get so passionate about it. You know, yeah. because it's, you're out there with the dogs alone. And it's quiet. But I, I didn't want to go too far though, because I don't know, I didn't know what I was doing, you know? I'd prefer to go with somebody and then go on a longer trip. Yeah. And, and, you know. and that's baby steps, right? So yeah. first you get comfortable riding the sled, which is much easier. I've trained many people to drive a sled and mush a dog team. And, um, you know, once you get are, are able to control the sled, which I will say training athletes is much easier to teach them how to drive a dog sled, partially because they understand balance and, and all that stuff, but also um, – especially if they've played sports for a long time, they're used to things happening quickly and not freezing, right? They're used to the ball flying at their head and dodging and, and moving and, and perceiving many things and reacting to many things and not freezing up. So that's very important when you're on a dog sled and maybe you go up by your lead dogs. Like, like he said, you never go behind the sled, right? So you might be in front of the sled and the dogs lunge and they pull that anchor out of the snow and now here comes the sled at you and you have to jump on it or else you're going to be standing by yourself out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So it is typically easier for me to work with athletes that have are accustomed to things happening fast. And it's not always athletes. Maybe it's somebody mm. who's grown up roping cattle, right? And they're used to stuff moving yeah, and yeah. happening. But uh, no, it seems like uh, Blake put you on the right path there. Once you get the sled driving down, then what's fun is to go out behind a team. You know, maybe you go out with Nina and she'll yep. take 10 dogs and you'll have five or six dogs exactly. and follow and go for 40 miles and they'll be in sight in front of you. So you're not all by yourself, mm -hmm. but yeah. you still get the experience of being out in nature and the vastness. And then for me, it's just the, the limitless potential with the dog team. You can go anywhere. You're not relying and, on. And what is interesting is that at any level, you can have an experience doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had an experience as a complete beginner, mm -hmm. and it was great. 
and you guys have an experience at your level. Well, so it's about mastering and managing uh, a new thing. And as long as you feel you're managing things, mastering things, if that's the right word mm -hmm. to use, you will grow. So it'll give you more experience. And then the next time you will try four, five, six dogs and it'll be another experience. And you'll feel that, oh, you have another level of this. And that's one, I think that's actually what brings us to racing. Yeah. To take this full circle because it needs to keep being challenging, mm. right? So once you've mastered mushing with four dogs, yes, it's fun, but you want to continue to improve. You want to improve your, your, your dogmanship, if I can use that word, you know, your ability to care for them and your mastery of the sport and the understanding of the dogs themselves. And so how we challenge ourselves in that setting is by going to these races where we get to get set up on a different course and there's new challenges, you know, going all the way to the Iditarod where now it's all the experience and all the challenges of traveling a thousand miles with a dog team. Mm -hmm. But then it's that extra level of the competitive aspect and managing this team. And now we have that extra pressure of time. That's another element that we have to mm. deal with. Mm. And so then beyond that, you know, like in the past years, I've traveled to Norway to compete in the Finnmark because yet another course. So it's always challenging yourself to improve. And the more you understand about the sport, I think the more you learn how much more there is you need to learn, right? The more you know, the more you see that you need to learn even more. And that's why you don't see mushers retire very often. Mushers just get older and older and keep doing it because there's always more they can learn. You'll never master it. But what I would recommend to rookies or new uh, mushers is that they want, don't start with too many dogs. A mm. lot of people think, oh, I need at least 12, 14 Yeah, I need 16, 16 dogs. dogs in my yeah. backyard to be able to do this. It's nice. not true. No, you can have... absolutely not. And what we see is people, some people do start with too many, too many dogs and they... Mm just realize this is too much work, mm -hmm. this is too much job, this is Cause difficult. I need to, instead of scaling down, they're actually just selling their whole kennel. So I tell people, mm -hmm. when people ask me for advice, when there are new ones coming into the sport, take it slow. Start with six dogs. Buy, <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> try, to, try to buy yeah. a good a retired sled, a re uh, lead dog. Start with a good lead dog and then try to build up your team around that retired lead dog. Then you're going to feel safe. You have an experienced mm -hmm. dog. And that's the start. Instead of buying six puppies and trying everything on your own, well, yeah. you might or, manage that way. Or spend well. a season working with another mushroom Absolutely. where it's, it's helping them that already have dogs and see if this is really what you want. Because when you make that commitment and you now have dogs, you have dogs mm. for many, many, many years. Years. And it's that's not something you can just park in the garage and, and decide that you didn't right. like playing golf that and much, if right? if you want your one week on vacation, you need mm -hmm. to have people you trust to take care mm. of your kennel. You need to know that your dogs are okay to have in your neighborhood. There are mm. so many things to, uh, to think about. But what can you do if you would like to do mushing? Like, for example, somebody like me. Oh, can I go and rent some some dogs and go for a ride, or how how does it work for like people like me? Yeah, I mean, there's on a for like a weekend. There's a lot of tourism type setups, and and in Scandinavia, there's a lot of multi day stuff where you'll be out there for a week or three days, or yeah, and that's a great way to experience it. If you want to, you know, get more involved, then I would say you'll find a kennel that you can work with on a regular basis and maybe go there on the weekends if you're considering starting the sport or starting your own team. Spend a, at least a full season working with another kennel and understanding the sport a little bit deeper before you invest in dogs. But absolutely, there's there's tourism options that can go from a 10-minute ride to, you know, a two-hour ride up to... You know, many week, days or week. weeks yep. even, yeah. Well, we, here in Norway, we do have a lot of very active sled dog uh, racing clubs, mm -hmm. like regular clubs with all kinds of levels of measures. And a lot of these clubs arrange what we call a rookie course. Okay. So to do the longer races, you need to be qualified. And one of the qualifiers is that you have to do a certain distant race, and you also have to be a part of a rookie course to learn long distant racing. You can't just but I'm not talking about racing. It's no, just you're to be able kennel, to, yeah. you know, but do... But here in Norway, we do mm. have also a lot of the tourist uh, yeah. kennels where you can, if you have your holiday vacation, you can just ask, do you have three-hour rides or runs? But you know, Nina, I know this guy. His name is Dallas. He lives in Alaska. Uh -huh. And I'm going there in March. I think I'm going to, you know... Ask him to find again two or three old dogs and take 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 me out for a ride. Is that a deal, Dallas? 
I think we could probably make that deal. Yeah, <laughs> let's get you out there for a mush. Uh, I see that you've already had Blake. You know, yeah, I, I, have, I have a quite start. high level of, of, of yeah. coaching. So, hey, so question. Her, give her 10 dogs. 10? <laughs> yeah, give her 10 dogs. <laughs> we, we want her to still be alive. <laughs> um, so do you remember the commands? Ki, ha, uh, okay. yi, ha. Yeah. Well, Almost. Close yi, enough. Ha, yeah. ho. That was stopped. Yeah. yeah. No, so, I mean, there's a, some language yi, translation ha. there. For yeah. me, it's it's G and ha. G, but we're not ha. really saying them in those drawn out words. It's more of a short, sharp command. So, G, G. ha. You know, it's, it's like these short, sharp commands. And what I find is I talk to my lead dogs differently, uh. right? So s because it's, it's not just one word. So think of it this way. If you were blindfolded and you're walking and somebody's going to navigate you through the studio, if it's, first of all, you have to trust their commands and trust that they're not going to steer you into something and laugh, right? Yeah. Um, secondly, when they say turn right, how much right? Am I supposed to go five degrees right? Yeah. Am I supposed to go 90 <laughs> degrees right? I need yeah. more information here, yeah. right? So now clearly on a, with a dog team, if there's a Y in the trail and you say right, okay, turn right. Mm. Um, but if you're on a whiteout, you're on a, maybe a lake that the wind's been mm -hmm. blowing and there's just not a, a scratch on it. Now steering just became a conversation. So usually when I say G, again, this is where the different dogs are different. It's the how you say it, uh, just G. They might just turn a few degrees to the right or it's G. You know, and they'll actually swing harder. Other lead dogs, it's G, 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 and they start swinging. And then when they are pointing in approximately the right direction, it's straight ahead or all right or hup. You know, and this is where I, I find naturally I talk to each of the lead dogs differently. And uh -huh. you kind of like tune into what are they perceiving? Not what am I saying, but what are they perceiving? Mm -hmm. And it can have to do with how sensitive the dog is, how receptive the dog is. But it really is a conversation. And that's where it's important to have many lead dogs. Because if you do this for four or five hours, it's tiresome, right? They're, they're taking and these And you have to adapt commands. your language to each different lead dog. Yeah. And, and, and the, the way turn, a, a, a really strong right turn, you will talk differently. Yeah. In a different way to each lead dog. Or I'll get them swinging that direction and then give them the command to pull out of this turn, right? They start sweeping to the right or sweeping to the left and then straight ahead. But yeah, there's definitely a different, and it's not intentional, but it's just almost a subconscious yeah. thing that I've then realized. I'm like, I actually talk to these two dogs differently. <laughs> we, so. we do have the same commands in Norway. A lot of people, and a lot of Norwegian mushrooms would use the G and H, but normally we would use the left and right commands as in Norwegian, høyre, venstre. Okay. And Depending on how you're pronouncing those words in Norwegian, the dogs will understand if it's going to be a sharp right. Mm -hmm. I would say like, hey da, mm -hmm. or I would say, hey da. Mm -hmm. The way I pronounce okay. uh, the, 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 uh, the, the command of my directions, that's how they respond. So it's almost like you say, it's just that the, our words, the words I would use are longer. So they're easier to uh, differ in certain ways you want yeah. to use them. You know, see, every time we talk about uh, an aspect about dog machine, there's always, ne ne you know, different, so many details. Yeah, <laughs> it's a deep sport. It's a deep it's, sport. It's much deeper than what you see on the surface. On the surface, it's very simple, um, but it's uh, it's also very deep, right? When you look at it, there's dogs, there's a sled, there's not fancy equipment. It's not a it's not a million dollar race car with all these different little tiny moving parts, but yet it's just as complex. There are just as many moving parts, if you will, um, and every part of this, and we also are managing not just the mechanics, not the physical movements, but also the mental aspect mm. of both the dogs mm. and ourselves. And that takes a really interesting twist to this where you have to be able to take uh, an unbiased view of yourself. I think we touched on this a little bit earlier where you can look at yourself and say, why am I feeling this way? Why is this what I'm perceiving? You know, it's really complex. It's a complex sport and uh, we will for sure continue to talk about it. But now Greg, he's supposed to be ready for us with some more interviews from Grand Portage. How are you guys doing? <laughs> We're doing great. Welcome back to the Northwoods of Minnesota. I love calling it the Northwoods. I just love being in the North Country. And uh, we're with Gene Vincent. And we talked to Gene earlier in the race, so I thought it was a good time to check back with Jean. Of course, she's the, the coordinator for the volunteers, just one of the many hats that she wears for this event. And Jean, let's just start broad. Like, uh, we heard about the story of Frank Bishop a, mo a moment ago, and what a great story that is. How many years have you been working this race? Only 15. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to Patty and Binner, or I mean, yeah. Mary Jo and Binner. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, Patty, who <laughs> makes it award, has volunteered for every race but one. Yes. Yeah. So, fifteen is is substantial. Well, 
<laughs> so t talk about the process. So it looks like the finish line is ready. And, and you talked about the fact that, you know, there's food waiting for the mushers. And, of course, there's a restaurant here as well. The coordination that goes into the finish of any of these dog races, I know it's as big as any of the other checkpoints. It is. Um, and Mary Jo has been doing the finish lines for years, so I just watch, actually. Because I usually, I also coordinate the road crossing, so yes. I'm usually out on the roads yeah. making sure people are there. But it's a, it, it, she's made several trips up here to make sure they've got everything in place. And then there's lots of phone calls and texts and whatever, and a, a lot of community involvement bringing in the community for what we need, and they love it. Yeah. yeah. And so, obviously, a lot of these dog races, it, it seems like in the eyes of the public culminate with a champion. Yeah. But there's always dozens and dozens of other teams that are still coming in later, right? Right. And so the Bear Grease, maybe our coverage will end. I, I don't know exactly when tonight. Obviously, we're not going to be here for all the teams getting in. But your team will be. Yes, our team will be, and we um, we stay to the bitter end, um, and we actually make an effort to get people out for the Red Lantern winter. Yeah. And um, in years past, when we finished at Billy's, where you started this year, we've had a Red Lantern party to encourage people to stick around, and the mushers tend to stick around for the last one, yeah. too. So it might not be as big a crowd as when the winter comes in, but we do a good job of cheering them on. Yeah, and the road crossings. Any cool stories this year? Anything that jumps out? Anything out of the ordinary? Well, not that I've heard yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, one team um, early on in the 40-mile race yeah. uh, um, did have trouble making it. It was a team of Malmutes did have trouble making and had a scratch, but uh, yeah. people were walking in to find her and she, yeah. her dogs were just new to race trails, so they yeah. were sniffing everything, but yeah. that's about the only excitement we had in road crossings. And we like that, that there's no excitement on road crossings. Yeah, true, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's Matt Rossi. Yeah. He's winning. That's um, Ryan Reddington's father-in-law. Oh, okay, well, he cr just crossed under the, the arch. Yeah. We, we better get the trophy. We've got a winner here at the Bear Grease. So, uh, Jean, when will you guys start planning for the next Bear Grease? When, when do the next meetings start? Um, in a month. In one month? Yeah. So you guys get to, like, kick back and breathe a little bit for, well, a, for really. a month? Well, not truth, really. And truly, you've been involved with the yeah. idea to rod long enough to know that the planning for next year's already started, truly, yeah. Yeah. And, and financing and volunteers. I've had all volunteers already that are done who said, sign me up for next year. Very good. So the, so the planning is truly year-round, but yeah. we will get our group t uh, together and review how this year went in a couple of weeks, and then the next month we start for the next year. Yeah. yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jean Vincent. She's one of the stars behind the scenes here at the Bear Grease. Let's go back to the studio in Oslo, and I'll hunt somebody else down. So, Greg, I just have another question. Is there a lot of people at the yeah. start, yeah. and is there a good atmosphere? At the finish, of course. Well, so, yes, and, and, and I, there are a lot of people here. The problem is if, if Kevin would depend, they're, they're not outside yet because there's a casino, <laughs> and, and there's a restaurant, and, and, a bar. And, and there's a lot of stimulus right inside here. So, yes, there's a lot of people inside the building kind of hanging out and waiting for the champion and uh, the finishers to get here later today. So there are a lot, the parking lot is definitely starting to fill and all the support crews uh, are here. The media is starting to show up. It'll also uh, be broadcast down in, in Duluth, uh, the local station. I'm sure uh, those in Minneapolis will be able to, to get this. This race is big news throughout the state of Minnesota. So there'll be a lot of eyeballs on this tonight, uh, regardless of whether they see it here or locally. Uh, in one of their local news stations, or they'll see it here in person. But yes, there are a lot of people that are milling around. There's just a lot going on. If you've ever been in a casino, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot going on inside that building. They'll be out here shortly. Yeah, Let's go I back can under you. I can understand. There's so difficult to go in there with the camera, but still, we're st going and get some people out to you so we can have some more interviews. It's great to have some interviews from on site right now. Okay. Thank you. We'll work on it. Are we done? Yes, thanks. Are we done? <laughs> they are done for the moment, but not, not completely. Now, should we have a little look at um, the recap yes. of the race of Reddington for the f f first? 
Let's he's take a look at him, he's in lead, but let's have a look at his uh, his so race from the, the beginning. The one that's leading the race, um, he's not too far from the finish line now. But if we go all the way back to the beginning of this race, he took off with bib number four from the start there um, at Billy's Bar. Nice looking dog team. Um, you know, when you're going into a race like this, you know. You have your best case scenario, and I think you try to see, visualize what this race hopefully will look like, and then you try to make that reality. So. All right, so yeah, nice, strong looking team. You know, you're getting settled in, waving to people, having a good time. He's smiling. <laughs> yep, <laughs> smiling. Still smiling. Happy to get out there. <laughs> um, and, you know, for, for Reddington in particular, I think after having kind of a, a disappointing finish to last year's race, I think he was probably particularly focused on um, running a clean race, having a good run all the way to the finish. I think that would probably be a pretty high priority, avoiding whatever he perceived as mistakes in last year's race that didn't lead to a successful run as far as finishing first. Um, so I think that would be pretty, probably pretty important for him. And here we got him coming into the first checkpoint of Highway 2. Still a very strong looking team. He posted a good run time, but it wasn't an outrageously fast run time, which is maybe one of the things that he saw as a mistake from last year's is a little too much speed mm -hmm. early on. So probably dialing it back a little bit. Um, obviously with more experience, you, you know what you want to do different next time. And here he's, um, I think, heading back out, out of uh, Highway 2 there, getting back on the trail. Now this one, a little bit later on the race, I think we've got him coming into trail center here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. So in between what we just saw in here, he went through Finland checkpoint, um, posting some of the fastest run times, um, or at least close to it. I think he had the second fastest run time. Going to Sawbill, he had another very strong run, run time there. Not quite the fastest, but almost. <laughs> at the previous checkpoint, he had dropped down to 11 dogs, leaving one dog behind. Um, then he got over here to Trail Center, and with, a, with an 11 dog team, he posted a pretty good run time over here. Um, he was quite a bit faster than, I'm looking down my line here, yeah, he had the fastest run time over there. I think this was kind of where he made a lot of his lead in the race, uh, one of the places at least. Nice looking team, um, he's still happy, a little more uh, subdued now after a night on the trail and things are kind of starting to settle in. Um, yeah, I think this is where he's probably kind of at this, I think that was approximately our halfway mark there. Uh, a little bit more. <laughs> um, you know, I think this is where you're starting to see that your race is yeah, coming together yeah. the way you want it to or or not. We're over right? the one third. We're starting to the towards the last part of the race. Yeah. Coming in and so by going now you can this. see if, if we made it work out correctly or not. Uh, where are we here? This is just coming into Skyport, I think. Mineral Center. Mineral Center, there we go, yeah. So they, they went through Skyport, I'm sorry, they yeah. went through Skyport. Um, going over there, he had a good run, um, dropped out eight, and then he made it into Mineral Center here with eight dogs. Um, still looking solid, has a pretty pretty good lead at this point, right? You know, coming in here, he understands that he's got about a 30 minute lead approximately um, over second place, which is also his team. So when he's coming in here, I think they're realizing, yeah, we played this race well. I'm sure there's always so far, something so you can good. do better, but yeah, yeah, so far so good. It's shaken out. The race that we visualized beforehand is actually materializing. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some things you're thinking, man, I, I can maybe adjust this. Also, this is uh, undoubtedly helping formulate his plan as he's thinking about which dogs are going to join yeah. him on the Iditarod in you know, a little over a month here. Um, obviously, we see his handler there smiling and pretty happy. They're, they're happy with what these dogs are looking like. Sometimes the mushers are not um, quite as uh, expressive, expressive. Yeah. <laughs> at this point. So I like talking to handlers if you can and, um, and kind of seeing what's their perception. Because mm. these people know what the dogs usually look like. Mm. So when they see them 250 something miles into a race and they're smiling saying, yeah, they're, they're looking good, two thumbs up, then uh, that's a good indicator. Um, Seems like he's got a good uh, supportive handler crew, which as we know with this race, with the handler assistance, is really important to running a successful race. You know, having good um, cohesiveness with the people you're working with, having people that are familiar with the dogs, if they're gonna be working with the dogs. What is he feeding them there? This is uh, sled dog soup. Sled dog soup. <laughs> yep, so what I'm seeing here so is they've got beef thawed out in water. It's probably lukewarm, you know, like mm -hmm. a, a room temperature, let's say, because that, that water was very hot. They added the meat to it, it thawed it out. 
right before they feed it to the dogs, they're gonna add um, the, the dog food, the kibbles to it, so that's still yeah. crunchy. And uh, the dog food's very flavorful as well. I've tasted it. Um, Did you taste it? Taste good is not the right word for a human, but it's very potent and it has a lot of flavor. So the dogs tend to like that. Um, and now he's out of Mineral City, Ryan Reddington, mm. and he's on his way to the finish line. Um, most recently that I've seen on the updates here, we've got about 20 kilometers to go out of a 64 kilometer run. So he's about two thirds of the way through this run, closing in on the finish. Um, behind him, you know, we got uh, Musher not too far behind, about five, uh, five and a half K behind him. So he's in lead and it's fairly comfortable. And he's in lead ahead of Eile, and we're going to have a look at his race as well yeah, from the back, very take beginning. Let's look at Eile here. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, Eile, again, a team from uh, Ryan Reddington's kennel there. Um, taking off, Eile is a very accomplished musher in his own right, having won this race previously. So as he takes off out of the starting chute, he's... He knows what he's up against here, right? He knows what lays in front of him as far as the trail is concerned. Um, we heard some interviews from him talking about, you know, proper pacing and knowing how these hills affect the dogs, keeping your speed down. Um, seems to be a very accomplished musher and aware of what needs to happen. And he's also racing with the dogs of Reddington. Yep, these are the dogs from Reddington's kennel as well. Um, so it's, in, it's a little bit tricky for a musher running a race with dogs that aren't theirs, right? But um, a good musher can bridge some of that gap. Mm. Not all of it, but some of it. So here we see him getting parked in uh, in Highway 2 at uh, that first checkpoint, kind of doing the lap around the vehicle and getting situated. Personally, um, I'm always uh, excited to get out of the starting line, get on the trail, and then secondly, to get out of that first checkpoint where it's generally busy. And that's what we see him doing here is getting ready to leave that first checkpoint of Highway 2. Um, you know, just can kind of hear the dogs in the background barking and lunging. There we go. <laughs> we see good enthusiasm here. We've got that big white lead dog up in front there. You know, I think we're going to see that guy in lead quite a bit uh, as this race plays out. They're charging out of that Highway 2 checkpoint, looking really solid there. And here we come at Trail Center. Coming into Trail Center, um, Eile uh, had 11 dogs coming in here. Um, you know, nice looking team. We saw most all the top teams coming in here and they this team definitely looks solid coming in. Uh, still have his white dog up front. Still got white boy up there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to say, I'm going from memory here, I want to say that dog's name was Splint. Um, I, I think there was an interview with him somewhere along the way. So I, forgive me if I got that wrong, but I think that's Splint there. I uh, see these guys coming to the checkpoint. Sometimes these lead dogs are great at charging out on the trail and they start looking around. I see those guys both looking back and forth, seeing all the people screaming. They're like, wait, you want me to run right through the middle of that mess? <laughs> um, they'll go down 50, 60 miles of trail, the most confident creature on the planet. And then you run into a crowd of people like that. They're like, what the heck? <laughs> What's happening? Coming in here, um, I think John figured out like, hey, where's, uh, where's our handlers? We need a checker. Because as a musher, your first priority is I'm here now get these dogs on straw, get some food in their bellies, and let's get them some sleep. So, you know, as a musher, you always got to be very kind to the volunteers and understand that they're taking time out of their busy lives to do this. But yet there is a sense of urgency, of a responsibility to these dogs. I've got to get them bedded down. i got to get them food. They deserve that and for me not to be lollygagging. So, I, you know, yeah. be patient and kind with the, the volunteers, but if, uh, you know, Greg Heister comes over to, with a camera, you can say, no, I don't have time. I'll talk to you once the dogs are sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but if he, he's, he asks nicely for one question. Oh, yeah. No, Greg's always a good one out uh, there. I, I enjoy the interviews with him. <laughs> All right. So then I think we're... Uh, but, you know, that is also an important thing that we have to remember when we start to broadcast these races. We need more from the mushers. Yep, yep. To make it interesting. There we have the white dog splint and lead again. I think we're coming into Mineral City here. Um, and in the previous checkpoint of Skyport, he mm -hmm. had uh, left there. Uh, he still, I guess he still has all 11 dogs here. Yep. Um, came in here with 11 dogs. So he ran with um, 11 all the way to the last checkpoint. Um, then here he'll ultimately leave one dog behind, slimming down to a little bit lighter, faster team. You know, leave your bottom dog and head for the finish line. Um, you know, he's got a smile on his face, as he well should have, with uh, a nice-looking dog team. You know, perky, aware dogs, wagging tails. That's what you want to see. He's obviously pleased with how things are going here. Um, I, I always like seeing this this next few steps here when they you know stop and then 
go slowly because that's where you can actually see the dogs when they're walking. You know, they're pulling into the harness and they're going slow. And that's a nice, even looking team. He did leave one dog behind there. Um, but there's nothing that I see. I'm guessing it's probably the wheel dog, the one right in front of the sled. But um, there's nothing that I'm seeing there that's anything to be concerned about. Nice looking team. Dogs are all uh, in tune with him as well. So despite not working with uh, these dogs their entire life, he's clearly got a uh, connection with them, which even in the 250 miles, you can build a pretty good rapport with a dog team, especially if you're a good musher and you're aware of what needs to happen. And there's our big white boy Splint. Getting them kind of settled in for their little nap. <laughs> and you can see he's parked right behind uh, Ryan Reddington, who's the bib yeah. number four, sitting yeah. on the sled in front of him as they're working out of the same truck using the same handler staff, which can make it a little bit challenging for the handlers when you have two dog teams to take care of, especially when they're running close together and in, you know, in this case, first and second place. Yeah. I was surprised to see the dog as being laying down, eating, laying down. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, everybody likes breakfast in bed, right? Yeah. So <laughs> these guys are so the same situation. It depends on what the dog feels uh, like, right? One thing I was would comment, these dogs are eating the same meal. And obviously, you know, this guy here has got the, a little bit, the, the dog right in front of us there has a little bit of a distraction with the, the cameras and all. But these guys seem to eat fairly well. They're not crazy hyper. They're not, uh, you know, attacking the food. But they're, they're eating. The ones that were laying down stood up. They're, you know, interested in food. And what that means is that they're they're ready for a nap, but they're not tired, right? When I get to a checkpoint, it's very important that food is the priority, not sleep. I don't want them to curl up and go to sleep without getting a meal because they need to be processing those calories while they sleep. Um, so that's pretty important. But this is a nice looking dog team. They look like, like nice, calm, happy dogs. <laughs> And as a musher, I, I've never done a race where I have full handler assistance like this, but I can't imagine letting somebody else feed my dogs, to be perfectly honest with you. Really? Yeah, once I cross the finish line, even in, in Nome, I'm <laughs> exhausted after nine days of racing. And it feels really strange when somebody else feeds my dog. I totally agree. I would not leave my dog team at all after finish line to yeah. somebody else. I want to be with the dogs as long as possible so they can go to sleep, they will eat, oh, eat go to sleep. I want to mm. see everything before they go to sleep in their dog boxes. So you're a control freak. You want to take <laughs> Yeah, it's just <laughs> such a personal connection. Like yeah. when, it, when I, I have such a personal connection with each dog, I know what they want. I know which ones want the water. I know which ones want me to strain off the water and give them more solids there. I know which ones like the chicken skins and which ones like the beef. So when somebody else is, you know, I pull in the chute, my you know, handlers are there and they start handing snacks. I was like, no, 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 he doesn't like that. You know, yeah. there's or, a way or, it needs to be I've done. Been, uh, I've been around these dogs the whole race. Mm. I want to see who keeps eating after the finish line because yeah. I know who's been eating good or bad during the race. I want to continue following my dogs. Mm. So again, this is uh, Keith Eiley in uh, second position right now and his dogs are camping in the Mineral City checkpoint there. Um, then they took off out of there and he is now running, uh, looks like about five kilometers behind Ryan Reddington mm -hmm. on the way to the final, final. I, I was going to say checkpoint, but to the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, this is the final run of the race and uh, posting good speed. He's... Um, do we, oh. can, we can have a look at the, at the, G, at the GPS uh, map right now. Yeah, let's take a look at that. All right, so <laughs> on your bottom side of the screen there, we have Ryan Reddington in first position, who we just kind of went over his race a few minutes ago. And uh, presently, I've got him about 17.2 um, kilometers from the finish line. And uh, it's, it's hard to judge speed as their speeds are kind of fluctuating and depending whether or not they're going up a hill or down a hill. We're going to go back down the trail just a little ways here. And that gray dot is Keith Eiley. Um, and he is about 5.6 kilometers behind Ryan Reddington presently. Um, and that's a, he's made up a little bit of time if the GPSs are updating accurately here, as I think they are. A little bit farther back, we're going to see here number three at the top of your screen there in brown is Ryan Anderson. And he is a little ways behind both these guys at about 12.7 kilometers behind Ryan Reddington. Um, putting him at about 7.1, I'm going from memory here, behind Keith Eiley in second place. A little bit farther down the trail there, we have um, Massacott. Massacott. Uh. Yeah, that's Martin Massacott. And he's setting a pretty good pace right now. He's running a, uh, I believe an eight dog yep. team. Eight dogs. And uh, he's got about 18.8 .8 kilometers between him and first. So 
probably not going to be a, a contender at the first place. But, you know, Anderson is moving up there. Um, and Eiley's moving up there. You know, this might be closer between Eiley and Reddington than I had previously anticipated. But we also are getting quite close to the finish line. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do see some nice uh, speeds here at the f uh, last leg of the race. I think they're having a good speed so far, uh, considering this is the last leg of the race. Yeah. So the next one that we should expect out of the checkpoint is Colleen Wallen. Um, also in the checkpoint of um, Mineral Center is Blake Frecking, Nathan Schroeder, Pete McClelland, Jennifer Frecking, Jay Fouché has arrived there. Laura Nice will be there in just a few moments. Um, that's bib number 11, the blue dot that you see. Farther back the trail, we have Kevin Mathis. He's uh, quite some distance behind uh, Laura Nice and on his way. And then Lisa Dietzen is also on the trail on her way to Mineral City. Center, sorry. Hi, that's good. But that's We have an update. And Greg, are you with us again? Did you manage to take somebody out from the casino for I us? Am. <laughs> and welcome back to Grand Portage, Minnesota. The film is called The Great Alaskan Race, and it benefits uh, the Iditarod Sled Dog Race, and it also benefits the Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. And this is John Robleski, and he's with P12 Films, who put this film together. It's awesome if you haven't seen it. But John, let's first by talking about the purpose of the film. Yeah, so we're a philanthropic film company out of LA, and uh, what we try and focus on is partnering with nonprofits. Um, and as we monetize our films, uh, giving back to those and spreading um, a message that coincide with the narrative of our film. So for this particular project, we wanted to focus on the Iditarod and the Bear Grease, along with four other nonprofits, and give back to them and support what they're doing. So that's why we're here today. And, and it goes hand in hand with what's going on with the Arctic World Series, because yeah. what we're doing here is trying to to build a community and to ensure that sled dogs continue to go across these great landscapes that we have on this planet. And and your film, in your way, is trying to do the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, as we've come out here, I mean, we've been able to see, like, how close the community pulls together and how they support each other. And for us, what we want to be able to do is shed light on that nationwide, right? Um, so for us, as the movie comes out, uh, we just want people to like pay more attention to races like this that are yeah. doing great things in their community and then continue to support, uh, support the sport. Yeah, and so you've seen the Bear Grease now firsthand. Yeah, yeah, Thoughts? yeah. yeah. Thoughts? No, I mean, you know what? One thing that's amazing is these dogs are amazing athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and the care that the mushers um, and the attention to detail that the entire staff has. Um, I mean, you have so many people out here that are looking after these dogs. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. And to see how happy they are, you yeah. know, it's great. It's great. And, and quickly, the thought that just came to my mind, uh, John's from Los Angeles. Right. He's got a, a thin little coat on. I, right. I, I live where it's cold and I got a big heavy parka on, so I don't know what that says about him or me. I'll leave that up to those at home. <laughs> but you, Appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> but you'll be You'll be heading to other events, right, to help yeah, spread yeah. Uh, not only what the, the message in your film, but also the message of trying to rebuild a community. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. We're trying to support the dog mushing community as a whole, um, and we feel like there's a lot of smaller races um, and, and big ones um, that really could benefit from us being there. Mm -hmm. um, and we honestly benefit from them. I mean, it's just really great for us to be a part of it, and we're really happy that they're so welcoming to have us. And, John, where can they see the film? Oh, so you can get it now uh, nationwide on Amazon and iTunes, um, and it's also coming out on DVD. So please go support the Bear Grease and the Iditarod and the other nonprofits. Yeah, and a cut of it goes to these races? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're different than other film companies where they say, like, you know, yeah, we're going to donate. Um, they actually make money right off the top as we make money. Okay, very good. So there's an opportunity for everybody out there watching to get involved. Okay, guys, we're getting close to crowning another champion here at Grand Portage in the Northwoods of the great state of Minnesota. The excitement is building. I promise we've got more interviews coming your way. Let's go back to Oslo. I trust you on that, uh, Greg. Keep on uh, annoying people and have them come to your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Making films around around sl uh, sled dog racing and, and, and the sport of, of mushing, how important is that for to, to bring it out to a wider public? Yeah, I think uh, I think awareness is really important, right? And um, and that's why I love watching races like this. This is the real race, not 
you know, somebody's perspective of the race or, oh, it's great or, oh, it's terrible. We're getting to see it, right? <laughs> We're seeing dog teams coming and going from checkpoints. This is sled dog racing, right? And uh, the films do the same thing. You know, it brings it to a broader audience. It lets more people enjoy the sport. Um, and I encourage people to see mushing firsthand wherever they can, whether that's a tourism kennel. They're all over in the lower 48, Alaska, Scandinavia, Europe. They're, they're all over the place. Go see some sled dogs, right? So it's, um, I think it's very important to get the films out there and also the particularly the films that kind of cover some of these historic events like the diphtheria outbreak and the serum run of 1925 in Alaska. Um, you know, I think it's kind of fun to have those there. And I would love to see something more on um, the John Bear Grease. Right. This is an incredible story and kind of the mm. connectivity mm. between, you know, the animals and people working together. You know, humans have been able to be where we are, live the places we live now because of animal support. It's only very recently that we didn't directly rely on animals and have that partnership. And we're losing that. We don't rely on horses for transportation or to, you know, mules and oxen to plow our fields. We're losing that connection between the kind of the interspecies connection. Mm. And sled dogs are one of those links that we still have. It's an important part of history we always need to remember. Mm. Absolutely. And also bringing this d d m sport of mushing to a wider public, is, is it also a sport that a dog owner can, re can, can relate to? Just being a dog owner, not, mm -hmm. not doing mushing, you know, but, you know, the relationship to the dog and understand the communication with the dog. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I really hope that when we bring mushing to a broader audience, um, you know, through things like the Krill Pet Arctic World Series that we have here, through following these races more closely and the sled dog films that they were just talking about there, um, there's a lot that, that just your lay pet owner can connect with. The relationship with the dogs can be improved in a lot of places. All of us can have a better relationship with probably people that we know and also with the animals that we work with and also being aware of what your dog needs. That's really one of the cru crucial messages here. What makes a successful musher is being aware of what your dog needs so that you can provide for those needs. They can thrive. That allows us to be successful as racers. But as a pet owner, you know, knowing what your dog needs, is the dog misbehaving or does the dog just need more exercise? And that's one of the things that we can bring out here is that there's a lot of ways to have sled dog sports. And I know Nina has said this many times that you can be a musher with one or two dogs. Yes, 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 yes. There is can across where you are literally running and you have a belt and the dog is pulling you. Bike joring where you're on a mountain bike and you can have one or two dogs running in front. So you might not be a super marathon athlete, but you can still get your active dog the exercise they need with a bicycle or a kick bike or a kick sled like you guys have here in Scandinavia. There are so many ways to get your dog active. So if we can bring more awareness and knowledge about nutrition and exercise, I think we can help pet owners be better pet owners and more active and happier pets. I think that's the end goal here. Oh. Yeah. I could fulfill you so much on this <laughs> subject because I've you, been writing a book about this actually in 2010 about using your dog uh, in, in the different season. What can you do? And I'm not just thinking about the uh, polar bear dogs and huskies. Mm. I'm t thinking about every kind of breed. Use it. No dog is born to lie on the sofa. No b dog is born to be a, a coach potato. They're, they're born to use their body, their muscles to experience things. I mean, you don't have to run for 10 Ks every day with your dog. I don't mean that. But I mean, if you have like a Chihuahua or Golden Retriever, try to do new things with your dog. I know people actually going hunting uh, for birds and they bring their Chihuahua with them. Although it's not a hunting dog, but it's still with them when they go hunting. Mm. Or do you have a Golden Retriever? Put on a harness. Try it slowly to um, familiarize it with a bike. Try to bring it on some bike rides. Just don't go when it's too warm. Mm. But you know, uh, Karina, the, uh, mushing is not only what we see right here now. As you said, Dallas, that's canicross, running with a dog, that's bike during, that's ski during, that's kick biking. And I've been uh, in Italy and watching how they do races in dryland season. It's interesting. There were so many uh, people running Canicross with mm -hmm. their dog. Uh, those dogs were mainly uh, Australian shepherds. A lot of Australian yeah. shepherds and other breeds, naturally not 
a, a born sled dog or a race dog or whatever. But they had so much fun. Mm -hmm. But these guys or girls, women running here, they were extremely well trained and they had their dogs. Yeah. But you know, there is, you wouldn't probably know because you used to have a handler from Australia. In Australia, there is a lot of mushers, but a lot of them do dry land mushing. Sure. Yeah. And the, the last. Okay, I get excited <laughs> yeah. because there are so many ways the you can have fun with your dog. You don't need to put the dog in harness, but you can use it. Yeah, and, and just to touch on that, the last um, mushing symposium that I presented at, that I spoke at, was in Madrid, Spain, mm -hmm. right? And I can guarantee you that snow mushing wasn't the primary <laughs> way that they were using dogs. And like you were saying, there's so many different breeds. When I talk about doing these other sports, absolutely, we're not talking about just Alaskan Huskies. We're not saying go buy an Alaskan Husky and do, take it on the bike. No, take the dog you already have mm -hmm. and you know, consult with your vet or whoever you have and let's get some good, get, find out what is the proper weight for this dog and help get the exercise for that dog um, so that they can maintain do the proper weight, have good nutrition, <gasps> learn how to train them. And that's where doing, st uh, you know, coverage of the races and these videos of the races can help spark that idea yeah right and it yep. doesn't i'm not saying get a different dog i'm saying take the dog you have and give that dog a more fulfilling life the dog doesn't need to pull you on the bike it just needs to be able to jog along beside and when it wants to stop and smell let it smell that's how they experience life you know they're going to take in all these scents and that reacts in their brain in a very different way or more elaborate way than in a human and see things and get out and especially if uh, you know you're off at work and the dog is going to be contained for many hours in the day. Make sure that it has a fulfilling life and it has that exciting stuff. And so hopefully through this, we can learn more ways to do that with dogs that people already have and provide those dogs with a more fulfilling life. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and well, it wasn't too preachy, was it? <laughs> I, mean, that, that's, I just get so excited about this. It's it is passion. something but, I'm passionate about, but it's right? Passion. But so. it's an important purpose we have as well at this point. Here, absolutely. That's why I wanted to be a part of it when I was asked to, because I have so much passions for uh, dogs in general, but especially uh, sled dogs. So the way to present this, I want to show that this is so fun. It's fun for the dogs. They really, really enjoy it. It's not bad to see a. T uh, it's not bad for a dog to be tired. It's it's good. I mean. These animals are so tra dogs are so trained for this, but I mean, just use the dog you have, and if you can get some inspiration from this uh, World Series, Krilpat World uh, Arctic World Series, well, <laughs> let me complete. Mission completed. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, people what like to watch football, top level football, but they also play football. Yeah, yeah. At their level. And that exactly at their level that they're comfortable doing. And obviously, we're probably not going to take golden retrievers on the Iditarod or the Bear Grease, right? <laughs> that's going to be a little much for them. But just getting out and doing something, enjoying the sport, and, and just understanding that that's okay. And, and having the information resources to figure out how do you safely teach your dog to run with you? And what's too much? Because a lot of humans are in better shape than their dog. Mm -hmm. And they, they can't just take their dog and go out for a long run, right? So how to train your dog as well. They need conditioning just like a person. And we are supposed to have Greg with us again from Ground Portage. How are you, Greg? I'm doing well, and we're joined by Monica Hendrickson, and she is the spokesperson for the Bear Grease, and, and, uh, and she has many other hats as well, and she's <laughs> going to tell us about them. But let's start with your duties with the media. Yeah. The media needs anything. You're who they I'm seek the out, I'm the one, right? yeah. It's, I need a snowmobile. I need internet. Where's the coffee? When can I sleep? Yes. So we, we try to help as much as we can. We appreciate our media partners. That's how our race has gotten to where it is. It's important for us to let all of our fans know what's going on with the race and yeah. they're a huge part of our team. And, and there's always logistics involved, right? Because the media <laughs> yeah. will show up here and they need a story that's back that, there yep. and you're down here and now you're tasked with finding out how to get them in touch. Like it's, yes. it's a, not an easy job. It isn't, especially when you get to the north side of our trail. There's The communications is tough because of Wi-Fi and no cellular. And yesterday was very challenging. So it was yeah. hard to get communications back and forth all of us understand it we all live up here we know it um and we do the best we can yeah 
Give me an, a sense of how many media members have been here covering this race this year. Oh my! Know? Well, we have our standard. We have a standard group of six for sure. We have we have kind of six standards. Um, the Star Tribune has come in this year as a major media partner with us, nice. and of course, WDIO has been amazing. We have our KBJR affiliate, the CBS affiliate, the Fox affiliate, <laughs> the Duluth News Tribune, the Midwest yeah. Communications. So it's we pretty much handle all of minnesota yeah so it, it's great and then of course everything with coupons yeah. we've had a lot of extra traffic on our site we're getting oh, a lot of extra fantastic. questions fantastic so people are watching from all over and and that's yeah. the fun part is we're able to really share the race and share our, share our communities yeah and and it, look the media is here because there's interest right Right, right. <laughs> which bodes well for the future of the yes. Bear Grease as it's in its 36th yeah. year now, right? Yeah. And so for going forward, you guys must be tickled when the media calls up and oh. say, hey, we need this. Yes, right? we don't want to tell them that we bend over backwards for them, but we will <laughs> bend over backwards for them. Shh, don't, Shh, tell, don't tell them. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and so when will your duties end? They don't. They don't, do they? No, I, I'm hoping to sleep on Wednesday night, maybe. <laughs> and Thursday morning, I already have a sponsorship meeting for yeah. next year. We start right away. Yeah. And I've already noticed there's another live truck here besides ours. So yes. it's beaming out to the world in many different directions yes. and cameras everywhere. Yep. The media is out in hordes here for this yes, finish Yes, it is. They are. And it's, it's amazing. And I think really in Minnesota, the sport of mushing is picking up. We have another race that's okay. going to be starting um, down in Minneapolis, the Klondike derby yeah. um it's a it's a smaller race they're just getting started and so the sport is actually picking up within our state so i i assume that that will just kind of continue throughout the upper midwest yeah. um there's a lot of interest in the sport because there's a lot there's a lot of vet care that goes into yeah. it um there's a lot more education pieces a lot more support yeah and you know i i just think uh, too the more we're around these events and we learn about the tradition and yeah. the culture and yes. you know we talked to john bear Grease's great uh grandson today yeah and you kind of like you, you feel how these races are sewn through the fabric of yes. these different communities that yes. they travel through yes. they're very much like christmas coming on the calendar it, <laughs> everybody you know looks forward to those days yeah we kind of have the we like to call it it's you know it's kind of like thanksgiving day where the whole family's coming back together for four mm. days um, if you go up and down the North Shore, you go into any restaurant and there's a beer grease poster or a musher bib, it's it's ingrained into what we're doing. Um, mushing was a huge part of our culture and yeah. we want to make sure that people remember that and, and to treat the dogs with respect and honor them because they do an incredible job. I can't imagine running 300 miles. No yeah. way. And for those watching at home, you've met Alex Angelos throughout this trail. You've met Gene Vincent, and now you've met uh, Monica Hendrickson. And these three people are absolutely vital, along with hundreds of others. But you three guys are like, hey, I need this. Okay, no problem. Like, yeah. you guys get it done. I yeah, love that. Yeah, we do. We also we have another great team member. We call her MJ. Yeah, Mary we, Jo oh, gets MJ. it done. Yes, yeah. yes. We have an incredible board, probably yeah. one of the best boards that I've worked with for many yeah. years. Really lucky to, to have some new board members and bringing some different perspectives. We have board members from all over the state of Minnesota. Yeah. So it's not just a Duluth thing. It's not a northern Minnesota thing. It's a state of Minnesota. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty incredible to see how the race is changing yeah. for us. And now it's a world thing. It's a world thing. We're excited. Yeah, we We're are. We're really excited. Guys, this is Monica Henry. Hendrickson. Let's go back to Oslo. Thank you, uh, Greg, and make sure to say hello to uh, Monica from us here in Oslo, and I wish her good luck for the end of the race. Yeah, she has a pretty stressy job, being a, a, a marketing coordinator and, and to, you know, to try to bring press out about the big race, have people invest in this, this event. It's tough nowadays. And, and one of the things she touched on is really uh, constant around mushing. And she was talking about all the different hats she wears, <laughs> the saying we would use, right? Mm -hmm. She's doing so many different tasks. And that's, that's really common around these races. Everybody's pulling together. It's like a big team of dogs, right? They got to be pulling together to try to get the job done, to pull off a successful race and provide the media content over here and make sure that we have a trail put in over here. There's so many different things that need to be done. And a lot of it's volunteer based and a lot of the people that are staffed for the race, they have so many different jobs to do. And for the most part, they're great people to work with. And it's, it's one of the fun things when you are signing up for the races and, you know, leading up to it as a musher, we're always calling them saying, Hey, where do I take these food drops to get delivered? Or, or when do I have to sign up for the vet check? 
text or who do I talk to about this or, you know, how do I drive to this place? I lost it. And so they're talking to you on the phone, helping you get to this location. It's just a great community. And it takes people like that that are, you know, willing to do all the different jobs and just see it through to the end and get the job done. And they, they have different jobs in the, their lives. So this is just yeah. voluntary work. Some races do have people full-time working, though, but the bigger races. Yeah. And and also, it's... it's uh, it's tough to get sponsors nowadays. Nowadays in these sports as well. Yeah, I mean this is not <laughs> basketball. Yeah, you know. Well, you got to show results, of course. I mean, it's if tough. you keep on winning and winning and winning like Dallas has been doing, of course it'll be easier. But still, it. Is but also for the organization of the races, I'm yeah. talking. Yeah. You know, to have the really to, to be able to organize yeah. it, you need it, financial. It takes, help. it takes funding. Yes. It takes funding for all these, and some of these races are. You know, some of it's directly off of sponsorships. Some are run on some very small budgets, and it's more of just a community effort to have yeah. the race, right? And it's a very small budget. Um, others do have significant support. I'm thinking of a few races in Alaska that are in, I'm thinking of one in particular in the villages. It has a lot of local support and some corporate support around there. And, man, all the local businesses really pitch in and see that race through, and it has a really good purse. But for the most part, and this is one of the things that's kind of cool about it is mushers don't run races because of the big purse. It's not like you decided to go play this tournament because you need the paycheck. It costs everybody money to go experience this. The mushers, the volunteers, it costs them time. The sponsors, they want to donate to a good cause in the community and get the fans to mm -hmm. come out and have a good weekend, right? So it's a really um, pure sport, right? There's the People are doing it because they love it, right? They're all investing it. There's no other aspect to it. Everybody's really cool. pulling the right the same direction. Yep. <laughs> So, so to speak. It is literally. a challenge to get sponsors in there, and that is something that races are always running up against is is getting sponsors. And as an athlete, you have to recognize that. And so when I go to a race, you know, a lot of times, especially now having ha having won the Iditarod, you say, hey, what what can I do? Like, mm. can I do anything for your sponsors? So when I came over here for the Finnmark, we did a couple special events. You know, all right, this, this sponsor is holding this event prior to the race. It would be great if you came by and just hung out for a while. So as a musher, support the race's sponsors, right? Do what you can to, to support them and be grateful because without races, it's kind of hard for us to be dog racers. <laughs> you know, we, yeah. we, we need races to go to and everybody's working hard to get these things done. And, you know, by helping support those sponsors of the races, it's easier for the races to keep them coming back year after year. And this makes it a fun and grateful environment. With the social media, is it easier to communicate better with, around sponsors or, or, or partners? <laughs> well, that's a little open question, actually. Yeah, it's an open yeah, question. <laughs> yeah, it is, but I mean, I'm, I'm I would I like to answer more about social media in uh, as a whole, because after social media made its entrance in the dog racing communities as well, we're able to follow the races uh, between the continents and between the countries, which we are doing right now, mm. and which means it's easier to have control of what's going on in the other races. You get more people interested, and hopefully more sponsors will find interest in this extremely exciting sport we're actually doing. Mm. And then, uh, I mean... What, as we talked about late earlier, uh, about early times when people were just waiting and waiting for the message to come to the checkpoints, not knowing anything. Now we have the GPS tracking system, we have the maps, interactive maps, we have the all kinds of social media, TV shows, which are all the broadcasting, hmm. which means we're opening up our sport to a whole, whole new audience, which means also the sponsors should absolutely pay attention to what's going on. Yeah, I, I would say on the, one major difference that has happened with the social media in mushing um, as it pertains to sponsors is that we have more and more kennels that are able to f help um, finance their kennel through smaller sponsors, right? So you get yeah. people just small amounts donating because through the social media kind of um, – outlets, the mushers are able then to put out videos and photos and information that people enjoy watching this and they become connected with the dogs and mm -hmm. the people. And it's a great way to share what we're doing, our life. We get to, I mean, we're so fortunate that our, my job is to spend my time in the wilderness with dogs. So it's really cool to be able to share that through the medium that is social media. And then for example, last year when I raced in Finnmark, I mean, a majority of the funding there for to be able to get over here and do this race, um, or let me reword that. I would not have been able to do that without 
our fans and followers sponsoring dogs, right? You know, they're going to sponsor us to, to, find, or to pay for this dog to fly to Norway. And just the smaller level sponsors that are able to pitch in and help out and, and kind of in exchange or in return, what I was trying to do is every day putting information about our journey, stuff that I generally, I'm not generally going to post a lot on social media. Like I don't have a personal Facebook page that I post on or anything. I have the racing page and I like to talk about mushing and sled dogs. Mm. But as we were traveling, you know, going through the airports with a bunch of dogs, how do you do that? What do you have to do for vet checks to get dogs ready to go from Alaska to Norway? Logistically, how do you get all these pieces to line up? So we were really able to follow kind of that, that progression and that journey that both myself and the dogs got to enjoy. Um, and share that back with the people in exchange. They were the ones that were made it possible for us financially. So it's, it's changed the dynamic where it's not just a corporate sponsor or just a bigger entity that's one sponsor. No, it's a, it's a lot of little people that love the sport, mm -hmm. love the dogs. They, they're excited to see what you're doing and following a team. And I don't care which team you follow. It's just great to see people that are invested in a team and they're going to you know, have that kind of vicarious connection with this dog, this one puppy that now is racing the team. So it's, it's, know, it has changed it that way. Yeah. Dallas, I, I have to uh, say something here because that's the tradition you have more in uh, the States than we have in Europe and uh, especially in Norway as I am from Norway. We don't have the same tradition for personal sponsors sponsoring kennels here. There are more corporate sponsors if you have a sponsor. Uh, the tradition you have that certain private persons go in, sponsor a dog, it's not as common here as it is in uh, the States or in Alaska. So um, there is something we can grow on here as well and learn more about. Do you think that the Krill Pet Arctic World Series can change anything? Oh, yeah. Cause what we're seeing here right now is that there is our passion, our sport, these fantastic animals are brought out to the world, which means uh, more people will be watching, learning, educated. And what, well, this is Tour de France, this is Paris, Dakar, this is all the big, long distance human races. But now we're seeing dog mushing, long distance going global. As I've said for a while, mushing to the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a passion. And if people are nuts about watching some guys in tight, Pans riding a bicycle in France. I mean, this <laughs> is action as well. <laughs> Something that I like to think about, you know, I do this all the time in my sport and other areas of interest that I get involved with is where do we want this to be in 10 years? Or where is it going to be in 10 years? So I do this with mushing all the time. Where is this sport going to be in 10 years? What is the record going to be in the Iditarod? And how are we going to do it? And then how do I be the one that does that, you know, in 10 years oh. from now? We've got to have that long view. So when I look at Krill Pet mushing here in this uh, Arctic World Championships that we got going on, or the Arctic World Series, where is this going to be in 10 years? What could it be? Where should the sport be in 10 years? And what could that provide? So when I look at the long vision, and maybe we get there, maybe we don't, but we're not going to know if we don't try, right? You have to take those first steps. I want to see mushing become a, a series, right? A, a collection, of, uh, a season, Right, we're a collection of these races that we can follow from one to the next. We can get to know the mushers. We can get to know the dogs. We can follow them through a season and through their career. I would love to see the education about uh, pet ownership be elevated. Right, and that's something a lot of people own dogs, and, and that's a great thing. We all can kind of relate to that connection and the value of having that bond with a pet. Um, but I think we can actually do that better. I think we can be better pet owners. I think we can be better, you know, caregivers to the animals and better animal husbandry in general. And some of that comes through awareness. So in what venue is this going to happen? Where is the research going to happen about nutrition? Where is the research mm -hmm. going to happen mm -hmm. about, you know, your pet's yep. physical needs and their mental needs? And then how is that, where's the medium that's going to get that to the population where it can actually benefit the dog that's sitting on a couch or sitting in the kennel waiting for its owner to come home from work and the owner might take it for a five minute walk and say yeah i walked the dog today and put it back in the kennel exactly so that's when i look at the long view this is not just about mushing it's about the human dog human canine relationship mm -hmm. in a much broader scale and mushing can be the fun sport that it happens around where this research takes place the sports that we watch that we tune in that then can backfeed information that helps us be better pet owners and I, I mean like we had talked about a little bit before the other ways to exercise the dogs that are fun for people you know go out on a kick bike with your dog it's fun the dog doesn't need to be a sled dog it doesn't actually need to be pulling you but it's fun to have a dog in a harness and a kick bike and go down the sidewalk right yeah now we have healthier humans 
healthier pets and everybody's happier. What I don't, what I don't like are people saying that now my dog is just a family dog. It's just a uh, pet. It's just a family pet. It's well, no dogs are born to be p uh, coach just potatoes, as I've been <laughs> using the word for many times now. All dogs deserve to have an active life. Mm. And that's what I want to show by this show. Uh, the, we're <coughs> going to show that uh, we can do something about that and educate people. In the Krill Pet Arctic World Series, we're doing the first event here now. Mm -hmm. But there's another event coming up in Norway, and it starts already on Friday. It's the Femin Race. And Nina, you've been racing that race Ten times? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be ten times. Ten I times? Yeah, I've done uh, started first time in 2005, and then my last race was in 2017. So we're actually going to look a little a report with Nina explaining what is the feminine race as we're waiting from still waiting for the finish at the beer grease, but let's look forward to the feminine race with Nina now. <laughs> from Rødals, which is a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's uh, actually an old mining town. The Femin Race has been arranged every year since 1990s. It's the race which has the most participants in the world uh, among the long distance races. The race is, uh, consists of four different classes actually. We have the longest one, 650 km, we have the 450, we have the 200, and then you have a junior class. areas and trails over the mountains above the tree level, long stretches in the pine woods, the woods of birch, uh, frozen lakes, frozen rivers. Some years, some dog teams have actually had to stop and wait out the weather before continuing in the race. And there are about seven checkpoints and you are able to follow most of the checkpoints by car. So it's quite a crowd-friendly race. It's a very beautiful race, actually, if you want to see it from the romantic point of view. But of course, it can be extremely tough. Feminine race, um, you know that race. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the feminine race as we're waiting for the beer grease to finish. Um, tell me, 10 times participant. Mm -hmm. What you What's the challenging, the most challenging with this race? Well, as a Norwegian, I don't think it's very hilly, but I know the foreigners, they believe both the shorter family races, because there are four different races here, mm -hmm. and I've done this longest one, 650K, or uh, about 400 miles, 450 miles. I think the most foreigners believe it's pretty hilly, mm -hmm. I would say. I... Well, I'm used to it. This yeah. is the kind of mountains we've yeah. got here in southern Norway. It's hilly. But, and uh, it's one of the biggest races in the world. The I, I believe it's the biggest one in concerning uh, participants in the world, the biggest long distance race. I mean, in the longest class, we will have about 40 participants. But in the 450 class, where they use eight dogs, it'll be about 100. Mm -hmm. um, at least, and then there is a 200k, and then also a the junior class, which is very nice, where the juniors from age 14 and about up to 18 can compete, and that's about 150 kilometers. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very nice race. The start, the atmosphere at Rodas, which was, a, as I explained, a heritage site, World Heritage Site, mm -hmm. UNESCO. Uh, it's hard to exp explain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very beautiful atmosphere, ambience at Rodas. Mm. And uh, the, all the mushrooms coming the days before the race, everything is very centri centered. So you have a lot of mm -hmm. people moving around. You meet friends all over. And, but the thing with the feminine race is that it also p crosses uh, about uh, quite high mountains. There yeah. will be a lot of the race above a tree level, which means it's a very tough race concerning uh, uh, bad weather. We s for many times I've been racing, we've had really, really bad weather. And uh, some teams do have to stop and the musher will get down in his, in her or his sleeping bag to rest and wait the weather out before continuing the race. Yeah. And it's also famous because it could be extremely cold. 
Robert Surly, he's a very famous musher in Norway and he's also known, very known internationally as a two times winner of the Idata Rod. He's been winning the feminine race 10 times yeah. and he's participating this year for the 31st time. That's right. That's having, a, a, having a musher like this in the in the feminine red, what is it? How important is that for the the other musher? He's a crazy man. I mean, last year it was his 30th race, and he told me, or he told everybody, that's good. Well, he got a race last year because then he's got done it 30 times, but he's still here today, here, and he still have a big chance of winning. This man is. Really, really, uh, something one to look at, look for uh, uh, on the top of the the race. Have you met with uh, Robert Surly uh, either in the Idata Rod or in the Finnmark's race, or have you met? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, the first time I became aware of Robert Surly is when he won the 2003 Idata Rod. Um, my dad was competing in that Idata Rod, and obviously I was following the race very closely, and I believe. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the first time I kind of became aware of him, met him there, of course. I was pretty young at the time. And then I raced my first Iditarod in 2005, which was Robert Sorley's second win in the Iditarod, um, which was a, an interesting race. My dad finished third in that race, I believe. So he was right up in the front. So I was competing in the race, but of course, still following the action up in the front. And then, yeah, so I've been aware of Robert Sorley, met him many times, super nice guy. It was very helpful the first time that I came over to Norway. Um, to race in the Finnmark. I had a couple great conversations with Robert, and I don't know if, and I guess I never really told him this, and he probably doesn't think that it was anything special, but for me, it was really, I really appreciated I'll, I'll getting to talk to him about that, and I felt like it was some of the best information I got, just an honest, this is what the race is. No frills, no, nothing fancy, none of the Bruce Lee mushing, musher lying going on here. <laughs> just like, this is what it is, and I really That's appreciated that. That's the kind that. of guy. He's a great guy to have Yeah, he's with. a great guy. That's the kind of guy we just love to have. How important is it to have a guy like this in a mushing community in Norway. That's what I was going to say. He's been a mentor for me. I was re uh, dog sledding before and I got to know him, but he t taught me a lot about m uh, racing. Mm -hmm. But he talks to everybody. He talks to the junior, 10, 12 years old, and give advice. He talks to his com competitors who he actually want to beat. And he he, he, he did. Well, he keeps on talking about how he trains. He doesn't have any secrets as long as his tail tells everything. Well, he's, of course, he has some secrets, but he's such a nice and open guy. He's a been, very good musher. He's been very close to Thomas Werner. He's working very closely with Thomas Werner the last years. And, and um, Thomas Werner, he's the defending champion. He won the feminine race in 2019 and we will have a closer look at who is Thomas Werner. Have a look. The reason why I'm doing mushing is actually a question that I've been asking myself many times because it's a lot of work. For me, it is the nature and with the dogs and building a dog team. I think that's what I'm passionate about. It's uh, the bond actually between the dogs. And you have new puppies, you're working with them, and you're seeing them develop to these great athletes. And then suddenly you have this incredible performance team that can just go for hours and hours. And uh, that feeling is so special, so I can't stop. <laughs> hey, but yeah. It's very important for me that the dogs are feeling good, feeling happy, having good attitude. I think yeah, actually these dogs maybe have a more happy life than us. They actually can do what they want to do every day. And that's actually being out on trips and just having fun. You now we have to deal with bills and people and all the other things, but uh, they can do what they want to do. And that's chasing the trail. That's what I like. The bad thing with dogs that I really, really hate is that it comes a time when a dog has just lost the energy of a living. And that's actually when you have to go to the veterinary and, and say goodbye. And uh, that's always hard because it's, uh, you know, you spend so many hours with these dogs. You've done so many races. You've been so proud of these dogs. And suddenly when they are, you know, 12, 13, maybe sometimes 14, you know, they, something just happening in their, in their life. But I think the years they are living, this is dogs that can actually do what they want. And they are just loving it. When I'm in the competition, I have a, you know, I like to win, but most important for me is to have the great team and actually go to the race and see 
that this is working. We are performing, we are able to go fast, we are doing all the right things. Actually, I think a victory in long distance is actually getting to the finish line. So I think if you're in the last place, maybe you will have a stronger feeling, you know, and you see people coming to the finish line crying and they are so emotional when they're coming in. For me, I get so proud of the dogs. You know, you're so proud of that team, how they are performing and, and you have worked with these dogs since they were puppies and, and now they are so these great athletes that are just performing on the level that, you know, you just think is incredible, almost impossible. That was a presentation of uh, Thomas Werner, who is the defending champion from uh, VMN uh, 2019. Is he ready for this year, would you think? He will, he's among the favorites, but he's not only, only alone, I imagine. Well, uh, if he's ready, I haven't spoken to him. I don't know. But what is interesting here, uh, Karina, is that he actually won both the long famine race and the long Finnmark race last year. And that's the first time in history that, well, in modern history of the <laughs> Finnmark <laughs> race, yeah. the, these early, newer Finnmark races, uh, that some, the same person has been winning the same year actually but now he's going to the id road after the family race so i think he'll he'll be a tough contestant in the id road as well this year as mm -hmm. well as of course feminine and he's actually doing the feminine race as a pre also a preparation, preparation for the id road yeah most of the Norwegian mushers that have been going to Alaska to compete, most of the ones living in southern Norway, because we do have a lot of mushers living in the south here, in the area north of Oslo, uh, most of them would use famine as a training or practice run, mm. as a last long run before they go. Robert's done that all the times he's gone to the Aditrod. He's raced Aditrod more times than the ones he's been winning. His first Aditrod was in 2002. I believe he was number 12. And uh, every year when he's, he's uh, been uh, going to the Aditrod, he's been using famine as a... Uh, well, hmm. a training run, or, well, he's been winning, although, but he calls it a training run. <laughs> Are you looking forward to discover Femin's race, uh, Dallas? Yeah, I've, I've watched it from a distance. Um, you know, actually, I was in Norway for the past two years when the race mm -hmm. took place. Uh, I had just arriving here with my dogs, getting ready for, you know, Finnmark later and later in the season here in Norway. Um, so I've been a little more aware of it in those past couple of years. Obviously, I've known about it for years, but never f followed it very closely. I think that's a great example as we're talking about the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. That's exactly it. You know, I'm a diehard Iditarod fan, mushing fan, and I, I hadn't been aware of these races in Europe, but I hadn't really had a good way to follow it or become connected with it. And I'm hoping that, you know, over the next couple of weeks here, we can bring these sport or these races to an uh, American and Alaskan audience there and uh, all over the world. So I am really excited to follow it more in depth because I can guarantee you this year I will be much more in depth than I was last year. Last year I was checking the stats and the updates and whatnot like like mushing fans do, <laughs> like but I, I didn't dive, kind of dive in super, super deep or diagnose the race that much. So I think uh, this year I'm very excited to really dive into it mm. and understand this race a little bit more. There's a lot of data to be sifted through, so that's probably what I'll be starting to do about tomorrow. <laughs> like at Beer Grease, there's a lot of volunteers involved, 700 volunteers, I think it is, for 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 getting this uh, race uh, under, go, under go. volunteers in the famine race as well. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I, I'd like to uh, to say that the famine race is also very interesting for all the people, the spectators, because uh, on as a, as a, the, in John Berry's, you are able to follow the race by car. As in the Iditra, the only means of transportation will be a snow machine yeah. or a, a plane, actually. But in Norway, you can follow the famine race and the Finnmark race by your own car. And there will be places to stay. And you will see the mushroom many times around the, the, the race. Not only on the checkpoints. You can also park your car, sit on, in your warm car, watch the GPS on your uh, is cell it phone, a, is it a community and then you can see the teams coming, actually. Is it a community of people that come back every year oh, for yeah, this race? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's become a tradition? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when you're at the start, if you're making your dog team ready before the start, there will be people coming to you that you only meet once a year. People, local people, that, oh, hi, 
uh, want to come and say hello to me again. And sometimes they even give me things. I think I mentioned that two days ago. But, you know, they've been giving me handmade socks, handmade mittens, knitted products. It's so nice. Mm. And even the people working in the hotel where I would normally stay in Rödos, they're always giving me hugging coming there year after year. I always get the same hotel room together <laughs> with my husband because they know us. And that's, the, the, you know, the atmosphere, the charm of this race. And also in Finnmark, but the family race is a very nice race. We're obviously promoting our next broadcast <laughs> also. <laughs> it's starting already the next Friday, but, you know, we still have a race to finish here first. But it, I think it's important that we talk about what's coming up next as well. So let's have a look at the graphics of where are the mushrooms now? Are they very far away? Can we have a look at that? Yeah, what we've got here is uh, Ryan Reddington holding on to his lead. He's about 6.8 kilometers from the finish line. Now that uh, last GPS update was a little bit old, so um, he's getting a little bit closer now as they're they're closing in. Uh, behind him, we have Keith Eiley, um, about three and a half kilometers behind, uh, close to Ford here, behind uh, Reddington, moving along at a nice clip. Behind him, we have Anderson at 11.4 uh, kilometers behind Reddington, also keeping a, a nice steady pace here. A little bit farther back up the trail, we have Martin Massacott um, kind of rounding out our top four as this has kind of been our lead pack that we've been following. He's about 18.5K behind uh, behind our leader. And then we can go a ways back down the trail. We've got <laughs> Colleen Wallen, uh, bib number five. She's at kind of the apex, uh, or I'm sorry, at kind of the beginning of this loop, uh, making it around out there. Um, moving along nicely. Uh, you know, I think she's going to have a pretty solid finish here. There's a pretty good gap between her and the chase pack that we have coming along. Behind her, we have Blake Frecking, and he is number six. And he is closely followed by Nathan Schroeder. Both Blake Frecking and Nathan Schroeder are um, past uh, Bear Grease champions. They left the previous checkpoint only about a minute apart and are traveling fairly close together here. So we might see some change in order here um, as they, you know, close out this 40 mile run, 64K run over to the finish line. Uh, we have uh, several more mushers that are gonna be leaving the checkpoint over the next hour, but we're gonna keep a close eye on these guys as Reddington is nearing the finish line. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm getting more and more confident about my 4.48 finish time <laughs> for Reddington. Uh, that's local time. Uh, yeah. It's looking like that's gonna be a pretty close prediction. You know, Eiley has made up some time on him, but he's probably not gonna pass him. Um, so I think that everything is playing out kind of how we saw that it might. Sounds good. You're more confident about, the, about your prediction for the finish time. And now, Greg, how confident are you about the, how things are going over there? Well, I'm very confident. <laughs> I, I know we're going we're gonna to crown a champion here very soon. And we're joined again by Stan Passanetti. He is the race marshal uh, again for the Bear Grease this year. So, Stan, let's, in general terms, has it been a good, clean fight? It's been a good, clean fight. <laughs> it's been a good, clean fight. Good. So we'll see what happens, you yeah. know? I mean, those two teams out there are about two and a half miles apart, you know? I mean, and, and I, I thought I might have seen maybe a mile apart, you know? But yeah. it's still been about two miles apart, you yeah. know? I keep looking. I kind of maybe was hoping it'd be a little closer, but... They are two miles apart, you know. Yeah, a photo finish wouldn't be bad, would you know, it? No, Kennel Club rules. Yeah. First uh, nose across, you yeah. know. A Mackie Swenson finish would yeah. be pretty exciting to see, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course, you're, you you're referencing 1978 and Dick Mackie and yeah. Rick Swenson and the, the controversy. Is it the sled across the line no, or is no, the nose no, of the no, lead no, dog? We won't have that here. It's yeah. first nose across. The... So you're on the record. So if somebody came up and tried to offer yeah. you a little... Uh, the, yeah. I mean, I've got a, my pockets are getting full with $100 bills <laughs> along the way. <laughs> so, I mean, I've had to switch wallets a few times, but uh, it's Kennel Club rule. Here, yeah. first team, you know. Yeah. I, I've watched that. Did you see Mackie running like yeah. that, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. When he almost I, needed CPR when he got to the finish line. You know, I'm, that that was great. Yeah. So, yeah. You, what's the closest finish you've ever had here that you're aware of? Is this pretty close to? This is pretty, you know, last year was a great finish. It was, um, it was one and two, husband and wife. 
It was great, but th truly, he won, but last year's best looking team, hands down, was Jen. You know, it was the Siberians, you know. I mean, they definitely are not as fast as Alaskans. There's sure. no doubt about sure. it. But that team, when that team came in here, it was blowing 50 miles an hour. That team was ready. That team could have won another 100 miles. I mean, that team was there. They were happy. The tails were wet. They were there. They were there, you know. You don't get to see that when they left up on top. They were there, uh, you great. know. So um, they were great, you know. So once in a while in the sled dog world, you get compliments about a team. When you run a team, that's kind of exciting. But when I ran the UP 200, Keith won it three years in a row, and then I ran it, you know. Keith was a big it helped for me. And Mackie was race marshal. And the comment he made that I always will remember to the day I die, he says, you know, he was talking about my team. He says, that team looks like it just left the starting shoot. So once in a while you get a compliment yeah. that you remember. So that was a big deal. That's you know? a big compliment for from, sure. From him, that's a big compliment, you know, so it was fun. So it's been a good race. Yeah, it, it has, and you can tell fans are now filtering out of the casino and the hotel behind us, and so obviously we're getting close to a champion arrive here. So, Stan, talk about your duty when the first team gets here. What is it that you will go through? You know what, for? naturally I'm going to look at dogs. He's going to go up to the dogs. He's going to Look at he's gonna you know look at his leaders everything's out, and then uh, we'll we'll go through the sled we'll kind of take a look at his mandatory gear you know which is what can you you run know that? so he's gonna have to have a sleeping bag you know he'll, if he changed booties out there you know he could have changed booties out there you know so his dog food he might have snacked him out there so he's not really gonna be expected to have that you know yeah. and his snacks with people food you know they're not required to carry an axe out here some races you got to carry axe snowshoe and a cooker you know and then he's gonna have to have two lines you know, he could have dropped one out there, so we're not going to be too crazy about, you know. So and then he's got a mail bag and his GPS tracker that you guys supply. So, you know, we're not so crazy where if he could have dropped something like that. So just mandatory gear, you know, just a basic go through thing. But like his sleeping bag, he better make sure he has that, things yeah. like that, you know. So, you know, and he's got his, uh, he's got to have his flashers for his dogs up in front, you know. You know, just kind of go through it and make sure he's okay, you know, yeah. things like that. So, Is it the same as the Iditarod? He's declared the winner once he, you go through the mandatory checklist, you or is it he, he's the winner when, when the nose of the when dog? When that dog team crosses the line, he's the he's winner, the, he's the winner yeah. you know. So uh, we'll see if he is the winner. If Keith, yes, is, yeah, whoever we, it might be. Uh, yeah, yeah, whoever it might be. Yeah. You know, we'll see. Yeah. It's going to be close. And and it's interesting because and I was wondering as we came down from Mineral Center, we get back down Route 61 and it's a it's a pretty major highway that connects the the top end of Lake Superior down to Duluth. And I was wondering why wow, the dog teams are going to have to go over this crazy highway, but no, there's no, a tunnel no. under there. There is it. a tunnel under there. You know, yeah. and it is I've been under that tunnel a few times and it is kind of icy under there, you yeah. know, so you're you're slipping and sliding. Sometimes they put wood chips on underneath there you know okay. so it is it's kind of it's good and the dogs they, they're used to it these dogs have been underneath there a couple times yeah. so so it'll be kind of exciting and, and, and it's tall enough oh it's like, tall no, no, well not they, for you yeah, it's tall enough for him that's We're, why he can't yeah be yeah way. forget it you know yeah, just no forget chance. it you know keep doing what you're doing you'll be okay <laughs> you know what <laughs> You can run yeah, don't dogs, yeah, don't, you don't quit your day job no, is what you no. say. Yeah. yeah. So these guys have been carrying this mail in a nice pouch the whole way here. Yeah. So what happens to that now? Is that used for fundraising, or what do you guys do with the mail? You know, I, I don't. Uh, well, so, uh, for a sponsor, maybe I'll get some of it. You know, but um, like in the Iditarod, you know, some of that you get to keep. Some of it you give to the sponsors that sponsored you. You know, I have some at home still that I had, but. Um, I would think some of it goes to the sponsor, some of it goes to the sponsor that sponsors the Bear Grease race, you know, things like that, you know, mm -hmm. so. Great collecting item Oh, for it's fans. a great, yeah, it is. Oh, it really is. Dogs, you know, I look back, I got stuff from when I did it. I thought that was a great item to have. Great memory, you know, so. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Stan Passanetti, the race marshal. We've got to let him go so he can get in the shoot yep. and get ready for a champion to be crowned. Bruce and I have to get in there as well. It's getting exciting. We're I don't know, within 30 minutes, maybe less. Oh, less than Oh, that. maybe yeah. 15 or 20 minutes, right, yeah. from yeah. from crowning a champion here in Grand Portage, Minnesota. Two-time uh, champ, two 
two-time champions are yeah either way in. either way yeah either way we'll have yeah. a new two-time champion yeah. of the yeah. race yeah yeah it'll yeah. be exciting yeah okay back to oslo thank you so much greg it's going to be exciting now it's we're closing up to the finish line right and dallas finally we can finally start to th- dream about and think about their coming actually to the finish line. They're closing in on the finish line now. Yeah, this is where it gets fun. You, you see that people are starting to mill around out there, getting ready for the finish uh, of the race, getting excited to see a dog team come around the corner there. Um, yeah, this is where it really starts getting exciting. And obviously people are going to be going uh, checking the GPSs regularly, either up at the building or if they have cell service right down there. You'll see people checking on their phone. Where are they? And as soon as it updates, everybody's telling everybody, hey, I, they, they just updated. They're this far out. Um, and not just uh, Reddington and Eileen, who are going to be the first two mushers in by the looks of it here, but everybody who's on the trail, right? So it's, it's really cool in these races that the focus does extend down the entire trail. Everybody who's participating in it, and again, whether they're just going to finish the race, um, the race is within the race. You know, we have Blake Frecking and Nathan Schroeder very close to each other on the trail. I can guarantee you people are you know, checking on that, seeing if the, uh, who's in lead has changed. So it's going to be quite exciting. We're getting close down to the final few minutes. Getting close. And, and what's going on in the, in the musher's mind right now? What are they thinking about the last kilometers? I mean, they're obviously tired now. And the dog's starting to get tired. And what's going on? There? I think you have mixed emotions at this point on the yeah. race. Um, on one hand... I think that uh, they're going to be ready for a cheeseburger when they get to the finish (laughs) and uh, more than an hour or two of sleep in one shot. Um, That's a big part of it. It also depends on, you know, for the particular musher, is this their big race of the year? Is this the end of their season? Or is there another race that they're looking forward to, right? So let's say Reddington is a very experienced musher. He's run the Iditarod many times. He's run this race a few times. He's run many of the other races around the continental U.S. and Alaska as well. So, you know, it's another dog race. He's been around this stuff his whole life. So he's going to get done, get some food, put the dogs to bed, make sure that everybody's got their vet care that they need. He's going to have another race in not too long with the UP200, it sounds like. So it's going to be a little different experience in that setting than at the end of the Iditarod, where this is the end of the season. And that type of setting, it's a little bit sad because it's over. You spent all year mm-hmm. developing this team. Um, next year when we're training them, even if it's the same dogs, they're all going to be more mature. There's going to be some new recruits in the team. It's going to change the dynamics slightly. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's over. Yeah. And it, it's special. It's great. But now it's, it's um, a new season, if you will. I always liken it to creating this beautiful ice sculpture, right? You spend all year carving and crafting and making this thing. Making this thing that's living, that's finite, and is not made to last. It's not something you hang on your wall for a hundred years and still be there. It's a seasonal thing. And so the joy really is in creating it because this dog team is a one-time thing. And here's the other part. Nobody understands that piece of art that you created, but the one person who's really connected with it, right? There might be some handlers that certainly have a vested interest and a knowledge of it. But when you create a really beautiful team that wins the Iditarod, Nobody understands it to the same depth as the musher, right? So it, it is uh, sad when you finish that race and it's over for the year. Yeah, because you don't take the same t- same team to a... And even the same team, they're going to face new challenges next year, right? They'll be more mature. So next year, the focus won't be on slowing them down. It'll be on you know some other aspect, right? Their, their education continues and changes. Yeah. Now we can have see some pictures here from one mile out of the, from the start, from the finish. Not from the start, from the finish. <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully we'll be seeing a dog team come over the horizon here in not not too long. Yeah. Uh, we're getting very close, and we'll keep an eye on that. And you know, as soon as you see some some fluffy little dog ears peek over the horizon <laughs> or out of the side of the screen, I'm not sure which side they're coming from. So I think if we see here, we should be having a team come up. I'm I'm getting the word in my ear that we got dog teams coming, and and this is the the moment that I think a lot of these fans are waiting for, and the handlers and the mushers for the mushers, the first glimpse of the finish line, the the place that they've been focusing on for some time, you know, for the the fans, everybody's you know seen the last update they know approximately when the mushroom is going to get there so they're focused up to where where are they going to be yeah. are they about to pop over so it's, it's exciting for the mushers um there's always that last push to the finish um as well so you're gonna see the mushers kind of maybe kick it up a gear and roll on into the finish and kind of show off their team um so this is a you know kind of the excitement of the race right uh, this the last part of this race to. is just downhill as well so it'll pr- probably have a nice pace down coming down here Speed. And, and something to remember from the dog standpoint 
they don't know that this is the finish, no. right? So that's another thing. As a musher, you always have to remember that you are the link between the dogs okay, and everything they experience. The so it's your job to help translate that experience. For example, is this scary? Is it scary that we just mushed under a highway through a tunnel that they were just discussing? Um, it's only scary if you tell them that it's scary. If you're confident and, you know, obviously it takes training, but, uh, and you have to prepare them for those situations, but it's our job to prepare them for those situations and help them understand what's going on. Um, and, you know, enjoy it with them. That's part of it is enjoy this with them. And my favorite sled dogs are the ones that are just ex as excited about charging down the trail as I am, right? And they're the ones that when it's time to go, they pop out of their little straw nest and they shake off and they're excited to have their booties on and they lean into the harness and they're barking and lunging and just doing that little sled dog prance as they hit the line, excited to see what's around the next corner, what's down the next hill. And uh, the reason they can do that day after day, not knowing that this is the finish, is because they know the mushers are always got their best interests in mind, and you're never going to put a challenge in front of them that they're not ready, not just to accomplish, but to conquer, right? Not just to survive, but to thrive. Mm -hmm. And that's a really key element. If you want to have a fast team all the way to the finish, you've got to set these dogs up always to succeed because they don't know if, if this is a finish or there's another 300 miles or another 700 miles, right? So setting them up to where every day it's another fun day of mushing, but they're going to be excited when they get here. Um, they're going to hear the, the people line. at this checkpoint. They're probably going to feel, smell the people. Yeah, they're first gonna, of all. yeah, if they're like a bonfire or a fire there, people Barbecue. barbecuing, they will Ooh. feel something going on. Yeah, uh, my I'd, dog, I'd my be... dogs actually speed up coming into checkpoints uh, or the finish line because it's like they, they understand, especially they if they've the done food. the race before mm. and they recognize. Come and do it in the family race, for example. Oh yeah, they, they know what's going on. Yeah, they speed up. And and there's probably people that have walked down the trail or skied down the trail some distance. Uh, here we oh, see uh, mushroom head coming over yep, the hill. There we go. Ryan. That is Ryan Reddington. Um, yeah. Got That's... some dog teams charging along here. We're just Nice little gates, even paces there. A little blur of legs. That's what you like to see, just that blur of legs under a smooth body. Uh, coming down the hill, a couple of them breaking into a lope there. He's got seven nice looking dogs. So that's about one mile out there, saying. Uh, he's keeping the line tight, which is nice. Keeping a little bit of resistance on the brake there, making sure all the lines are tight. And there he dips down. So they're about one mile out from the finish line. And now uh, we'll see if we catch another glimpse of him here. Yep. Yeah, stretching out, cruising along. So we've got about uh, probably six and a half, seven minutes. Uh, let's go back. I want to see just that, that moment when Ryan popped over the hill there. If we can take another look at that. You know, a couple things that I'm catching here when we see those teams come over, I'm always looking at the dogs. And when I see a nice team, here we go here again. We got them up here again. So we just saw this. And Ryan's about a mile out. He'll be at the finish soon. But if you look at those dogs right in front of the sled, their body hardly moves. Their legs are a blur, but their body hardly moves. Now the dog, just you know, two positions up, he kind of broke into a lope there um, to help stretch out. But those two in the back, really even, uh, nice little strides. And when I'm looking at a dog, I love an efficient dog that their body just floats and their legs are a blur underneath. And that's, uh, so when we're talking about, you know, that's a nice looking team. This is a strong looking team. There's only seven of them, but again, seven of the right dogs that are healthy and fit and having fun is what you want to see. The, you want to see efficient use of, of body, of the, of the muscles and, and the movements. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with having a, a loping dog when they start rolling and they're stretching out. A lope or a gallop um, is where, you know, both their front feet will hit pretty much in unison and they'll pull on the ground and then they'll kind of pick up both their back feet and they'll hit in unison. And it's kind of like a rabbit might run or a horse might gallop. Um, a trot, it's actually their front right foot and their back left foot move in unison and then their back right front left and then you have a pacing gate where it's their two right legs and then their two left legs i don't care which gate the dog uses so long as it's appropriate for their body and it's efficient if the dog's a loping dog it should look like a, a wheel rolling a very smooth transition of energy not coming down hard on their front legs um, so i don't care what the dog looks like as long as it's the appropriate gate for his body so here i think we got another shot of the musher at least yeah. should be coming around the corner here pretty quick um, closing in on the finish line He's made good time. He's kind of outpacing, uh, I think, some of our predictions. I was saying uh, 448, I think, was my local time prediction. And I think he's going to outpace that just a little <laughs> we'll bit see here. 448, what, what, what's the seconds? <laughs> uh, I think he's going to be under that here. If he's within a mile, I think he's going to probably uh, beat that. I'm getting, uh, what, about 430, 
two right now. So, yeah, he's going to have had a nice run time over here. Um, of course, we have no information about what the trail is like. <laughs> um, now, after Ryan comes in, we'll have a more accurate guesstimation on what it's going to take the other mushers. And so it's always hard to guess on the first musher because you have no data on what the trail is going to be, right? So you can look at their past run times. But um, especially since this is not a race that I have run before, I don't know if it's a very hilly trail or relative to the other runs So how to compare it to other run times. They've been quite lucky with the weather this year. There's no, been no big storms, no mm -hmm. difficult weather conditions, if you may say. A little bit warm in the beginning, it's, but it's, except for it's been it warm temperatures. Big problem, but a little bit warm, especially for the bigger, the more coated dogs, the more the dog yeah. have more fur. But I mean, Colin and uh, Valencia is talking about they could be really low temperature, like below, very very cold and windy, sure. and you know, and with the wind and the cold, it's mm. it's, it's tough. If the worst weather you have to complain about at the end of a 300-mile race is that it was kind of warm, and by kind of warm, it was still below freezing, yeah. <laughs> that's a good race, right? Because I've been in kind of warm temperatures on the Iditarod where it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit and raining, which is not fun, right? So if it's raining on you, that's not at all fun. So th yeah, this has been excellent weather. Could it be cooler? Could we be more picky by a few degrees? Absolutely. But all in all, it's been nice and uh, nice and nice for the mushers, for the spectators, the volunteers, uh, yeah. the, the everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've, I've raced the Iditarod and it was 11 degrees Celsius, right? So, and it was raining on us. And then the temperatures dropped down very cool. So everything gets brittle because it was wet and now it's very cold. So yeah, this has been a great race as far as weather conditions. And it does make it easier to, to care for the dogs when you're not having to be all bundled up and stuff. Mm. It uh, decreases the dog's caloric needs when they're mm. not running in 40 below temperatures. Um, 40 below is a really tough temperature. I mean, anything below 30, you got to start accommodating for that temperature. You have to kind of change how you race, change how you feed, make sure you have those extra layer of, of clothing on the dogs. But um, yeah, this has been a beautiful race. You couldn't ask for better, better weather. Uh, here we have a dog team yep, cruising around the corner. Ryan. Now they're cruising. Hey. <laughs> sent, pretty much everybody's uh. kicked it up into a gallop now or a lope. Um, you know, Ryan's pedaling alongside the sled here. I think this is one of the first times we've gotten to see Mushers kind of helping the dogs out with uh, that kicking stride, kind of like you'd kick a skateboard. Team's cruising around the corner here. They're making a nice Ooh. show. Uh, that looks like a very light sled, actually. Yeah, he hasn't got much in there, has he? You can see no, that's typically he doesn't. easy. He's cruising in. He's about to be, uh, get his second Bear Grease victory yeah, here. Way. Ryan Good Benjamin. job, Ryan. There we go. First thing first, he's coming straight up saying hi to the dogs. I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to say hi to him and whatnot, but it uh, comes down to visiting dogs. That's Congratulate your teammates wife that got you here. His wife is probably there as well, Erin. Yeah, and I bet she comes after the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. very right. So we have a... Uh, Beer Grease champion, we have 2020. A 2020. Ryan Reddington. Mm. Ryan Reddington. Segway, Alaska. And out with the booties. <laughs> Come on, Ryan, give your wife a kiss now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you see the dogs um, lapping up a little bit of snow off the trail there, helping to cool off just a touch. Mm. Still got some nice little wagon tails. You know, this is what you want to see. I'm not too concerned about if it's a seven dog team or an 11 dog team. What I want to see is that every dog in the team is happy and belongs in the team. And that's what we're seeing here. Now they're going to do the mandatory equipment check, making sure they have all the stuff they need in the sled. Okay, let's have a first uh, reaction from Greg. You're on site. Let us uh, go ahead, Gre Greg. Yeah, congratulations. Hi, guys. Greg and Bruce here. And, uh, of course, Ryan Reddington is home, and he's just won his second Bear Grease Championship, 295 miles on this run. Team looked good, Bruce. They looked really good coming around that corner, and they were smiling, and there's a big smile on Ryan's face. I yeah. think it was a really nice accomplishment for him. That leader that he has on the left side, that dog is really looks like something. big-headed guy. A little fluffy and long furred, but he's setting a nice pace, and I really like the looks of that dog. These wheel dogs back here that might be in the screen now, a white-spotted one and a, a, a gold-colored one, those guys look 
really smooth and nice too. He's pretty proud of this team and he's been smiling since he got in here. And you can see the backside of Stan Passanetti there, the race marshal. He's over checking to make sure all the mandatory gear is in the bag. There you see the shake of the hands. And, mm -hmm. and Ryan last won the race in 2018. And he was uh, very close to winning this three years in a row when you consider what, what happened to him last year. And so two out of three now, uh, Bear Grease championships go to Ryan Reddington. And we know the town of Kinnick up in Alaska is swelling with pride right now. Yeah, and the Reddington should be carrying yeah, on let's the walk heritage. Down here. So. I think they're going to present the uh, the award, Frank Bishop Award. These two dogs been in lead the whole way. Have they? Yeah, they never... Well, they're well deserving of the Frank Bishop Lead Dog Award. This is for the first lead dog into the shoot. Come here, bud. Ryan, can you give us the names? Yeah, Henry and Ghost. Yeah. This is Henry here. Henry and Ghost. Awesome. Good job, guys. Good job. And that's, Patty said that she can't be here, Ryan, to, to actually give that to you, but she made that for you. Yeah. Just for, just for Ghost. <laughs> yep. We. You worked we hard for it. Yep. We won these a couple years ago. Yeah, you did. Right, another championship. Thoughts? Yeah, pretty happy. Pretty happy with the dogs, and what a great race. And this, um, this Minnesota is pretty awesome. <laughs> tough, tough, a lot of hills, but um, <laughs> it's um, a lot of fun. And Ryan Bruce will. We'll take some time now. Uh, obviously, the the priority is to get the dogs down, get them bedded back down, get them some food, and and get them taken care of. And so we'll give him some time to do that, and then he will come back up to the shoot here, and we'll have an opportunity to really do an interview with him. So uh, the fans will be able to hear from him a little bit more. But you can see the smile beaming from his face uh, from just those first few questions. Yeah, and got a great crew of handlers in here that they've had the whole way, and the dogs are getting snacks before they even go to the truck. They're actually eating whole chunks of chicken if people are interested, bones yeah. and all. Yeah. So uh, a lot of fat there, and they all are eating well. They look, but they look great. They kept their weight. Of course, it's a warm race, and that helps. But uh, yeah, I think the big smile is from a well-managed team, and right. the things we talked about before, just that satisfaction of knowing that you did a good job in training and putting a team together. And of course, uh, when you get here first, and, and you're able to acknowledge the performance of great lead dogs, and you know, not that all of these dogs are not special to a musher, but when you're able to look to a lead dog, there's just a, a different relationship or a respect that that is earned uh, by these dogs that are able to lead teams across these environments. Yeah, that dog Ghost yeah. is what he said. Yeah, that's the one I've really enjoyed watching. You know, we you spotted him back in one of the first checkpoints. As I, wherever Ryan went, that dog was watching, and he ran every step of the way here. We heard Ryan say, in lead during the entire race. <laughs> and it's a Reddington winning a sled dog race, and uh, it's fitting for us. Uh, we, we have not seen a Reddington win the Iditarod yet, but uh, Ryan has had a lot of success down on these shorter races. Yeah, and he keeps trying and putting it in there, and it's just a matter of putting in your time and getting that magic carpet ride to the to the finish line. But he's pretty happy here today, and he's going to get, I don't know the total amount they came up with because things sometimes change, but he's going to get a nice paycheck to top yeah. off his, his effort here. Yeah, and it's one of those things, and, you know, we see it out on the trail where, where mushers are, are just kind of versed in persevering. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when you're trying to breed winning dogs and come up with strategies and develop these teams that are able to come out here and really compete on these, on these levels, it's really about that. I mean, it's rarely when somebody hits the magic genetic a circle that allows them to, to find success right away. Yours had uh, great success early in the Iditarod. Doug Swingley had early success in that Iditarod. But it's it's very rare when somebody can show up and be competitive. It takes time. Yeah, it takes a lot of time to put to get to pick up the knowledge to raise dogs and to train dogs and then to race dogs, which is a whole other thing. And then to breed and get the right genetics that suits the event that you want to go into and. The, and it suits you. So Ryan's off to park the dogs. And you hear the applause. Good job. 
and Ryan will be moving down. It looks like Willow's down there, and the truck is parked, uh, I was told, uh, uh, half a mile or, or so down in there, and they'll take care of the dogs, get them bedded down, and I hope Ryan will be headed back up here uh, to address the media, and we'll be able to talk to him more then. I know they have a press conference uh, area set up inside the casino that he will address all of the media, but I've asked for a special permission to get Ryan uh, in the shoot. We'd like to talk to him in his native environment uh, out here in snow. I've always said, uh, and Dallas can attest to this too, uh, back there on the set, when you take a musher indoors, it's like taking a fish out of water. <laughs> so I've never understood <laughs> taking mushers inside to do to do interviews. I would do them all out in a 40 mile an hour wind when it's snowing uh, if they allowed me to do it because I think that's totally appropriate. Uh, but uh, these, are, these are great days in the lives of, of a musher because it's not just about winning that championship because so many people have had their hands on these dogs and uh, the philosophy and making sure that things are in place that allow you to win it. And so I know Ryan is one of those guys. And, and again, he's a lot like Lance Mackey. I noticed in this race, and Lance was always affirming people when he went through a checkpoint. And before he pulled out, he said thank you every time. And I noticed that same thing with Ryan Reddington throughout this race. Whenever he arrived or whenever he left, he said, please and thank you and I know those that volunteer all of their time really appreciate that yeah and I think the more you're into this I mean as a musher and you get off the runner tails and you watch other races you get to see the behind the scenes yeah. aspects of this and sometimes the mushers so focus on their race and their dogs as they should be that they have to go to other events and then and then see all the working parts okay we got to cut you off. I'm sorry, Bruce. We got to send it back to Oslo right now. I think we're losing our satellite window. And here's Ailey. Here we're back in Oslo, and 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 here we see Ailey coming yeah. in. Keith Ailey coming in. Uh, looking like he's going to have a strong second place finish here. Um, not too far behind Ryan Reddington. Um, nice looking dog team. Spread out a little bit. Let's get one more glimpse of him there. Looks like he's still got Splint up there in lead. Yeah, and uh, it's I've short, kinda, but we will, we, I, we will play it again we'll so we go can go back to that in a couple seconds. Yeah. Here, but yeah, that's a, I mean, again, he's gonna have a nice looking team. I guess they're coming over the horizon here again. Let's take one more look at that. You know, we see you guys in a little bit of a brisker pace. They crest over the hill. A couple are trotting, a couple are loping. Um, but everybody's stretching out nice, um, picking up a little speed going down the hill. Tight lines, which we like to see, you know, as they come to the bottom of the hill. We see that, you know, Splint, that white lead dog in front. He's a little bit, we've seen this a few times coming into the checkpoints. He can get a little bit alarmed with the people and stuff. Again, it, just like <laughs> Greg was talking about the mushers, natural environment, being in the wilderness. The same with the dogs. They spend 99% of their time in a remote environment, not with a lot of people. So you have a great lead dog on the trail. And as they start getting close to people, that's the strange environment for them, right? Now that we get to see them. But it's another nice looking dog team. And this is something I'm really enjoying with this John Bear Grease race. It's, it's just good looking dog teams coming to the finish. <laughs> well, we go back to Greg and Bruce at the finish area. Go ahead, uh, Greg. Portage, Greg and Bruce, and we didn't lose our satellite window, thank goodness. Uh, we're back with live coverage here from the, the finish line, and we have another dog team coming, yeah. and kudos to Frank. He really made up some ground in these final 40 miles. Yeah, and uh, that that's what I was hoping people could see, is this how close these teams are coming in and see these other dogs here, so. And it's, again, we're reminded at the end of the day, we talk all the time about, you know, these dogs are poetry in motion and it's all about the, the culture and the lifestyle. But at the end of the day, at these events, you really get the NASCAR kind of feeling. It is still about a race and it's about competition and the, the competitive spirit that comes out of these mushers who aren't necessarily trying to get here first. They're trying to prove that their, their breeding program, that their way of training a dog is better than than someone else's. That's what they're trying to get here first to prove, correct? You've taught me that over the years. Yeah, you just want to do as well as you can with those dogs. And, you know, it was Martin Boozer a long time ago. I heard him in an interview say, it's not about the race, it's about the other 50 weeks. The, the races are just, and that's referring to a two week race, you know, a long race. And, and that, that aspect that that's just where you go out 
and get your scorecard. How am I doing, so to speak? And it's yeah. the teacher's report card. Yeah. And you, you want to hope that you did everything well. But yeah, this has made this really exciting because that they put up a board inside of this casino in the lobby and people have been checking it the whole way, watching these guys, how close are they? Like people are doing probably on their trackers. Yeah. So it's been a really exciting event. I'll be interested to see this team come in here and how they look. Yeah, and of course, uh, Mr. Eiley running a lot of the Reddington dogs as well. And so Ryan has had his hands on many of these dogs, if not all of these dogs, since birth. Yeah, but uh, the way I like to walk around and talk to mushers and get the story behind the story, <laughs> actually, Ryan bought okay. out Keith's team oh. and selected a lot of dogs. And so Keith is actually getting to... They're all Ryan's dogs now, but he's actually getting to run a few of the dogs that he raised and sold. Oh, is so that there's interesting? That con Cause there's always this genetic exchange between yeah. mushers, you know? You can't just breed the dogs you have all the time. And you see little things that you could get from other mushers, kennels. And so there's always this genetic exchange going around with people trading pops or buying dogs. Yeah. So. That improves the breed. That's why yeah. these dogs are so great, really. Yeah. And it sounds like we've got uh, a lot of noise now and, and people starting to move back to this finish line, which means that we've got a dog team uh, that is very close. And so, uh, again, it's not so much, uh, oh, I got second place, I'm disappointed. He should feel really good about the performance of his, of his team and his dogs. Yeah, and for them to finish one and two like this, that's a real compliment to, to the kennel program. I hear people hooping and hollering around the building, so he's got to be coming in here right Yeah, now. here they are. Here he comes. And that big white leader right out front again. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And Keith Eiley wearing bib number six has arrived at the finish line, and you see, uh, Keith's not a real expressive guy, but I did see, see a, a smile, big smile. crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Stan Passanetti up there to uh, to congratulate Keith on a great run and uh, getting here second. Let's go see if we can get a quick word. Hey, great run, you made up a lot of time. Not yeah, not a lot. Yeah, it went good. Yeah. The team's running good. Yeah, congratulations on a great race. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Who knows, if it would have been a little bit longer, you never know what would have happened. Yeah. But yeah, they're running nice, they look real nice. So, at any point in time, could you see Ryan up above you? No. No, 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 no. never got close enough no. to see him. No, Yeah. I know you want to talk, take some time with your dogs, Keith, we'll yeah, let you do but, that. But I'll, I'm happy with second, too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Whoops. Well, we got another dog team here, Bruce, and, and team number two in second place, and, and it's great. We, we've got two former champions, and now a two-time champion, Ryan Reddington, uh, arriving here, and uh, once again proving that once you do kind of find experience and, and you gain confidence, it allows you to show up to these races and perform well. Yeah, and I'm really impressed with how these all these dogs have yeah. yep. appeared, you yep. know, the, okay. how their yep. condition that we've seen in the last two checkpoints and here, they really look good. They really are healthy and strong and none of them look like they wouldn't be willing to just turn around and head right back down the trail. Yeah. And that's as it should be. They should be very proud of these dogs. The coats look great, their energy level's great. And I believe, let's see, two, four, six, eight, 10, I believe he still has 11 dogs. He did when he, uh, when I saw him last. At Mineral Center, when he came into Mineral Center, he, le he, he arrived with 11 dogs. It, it appears that he kept just about the entire string here. Yeah, actually, I think he has 10 right Does he have 10? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, four, six, eight, yeah. Yeah. I he thought has, there was a single yeah. up there, but there isn't. Yeah, he's got 10 in here right now. But that's great. You know, that's really a great yeah. run. And again, the handlers are taking care of him. Ryan Reddington here yeah. congratulating him. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, can we get an interview with you? Okay, come on over. So we just called Ryan Reddington over, so we'll get an interview with him right now. They're taking pictures and stuff. So we, we can also get Ryan to talk about Keith Eiley and, and his decision. Congratulations. And we can do it, and we'll get a shot when we can. But hey, team number two, 
You win it. Team number two gets second. Yeah. Yeah, pretty equal teams and uh, very happy with how things went and pretty fun. Yeah. And you got 10 dogs here, so you're going to have a lot of dogs to choose from for March, aren't you? I am going to have a lot of dogs to choose from, and uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about that, and uh, yeah, it's, things are looking good for us right now. All right, so talk about the pride that you feel. You've won another Bear Grease. This is two out of the last three years. You get here first, and your, your dogs did a tremendous job. Yeah, I'm proud of uh, a lot of pride with how things went, and especially having two teams, first and second, it's, um, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, and uh, Frank Eiley, can you talk a little bit about him, Ryan, and the decision? Or I'm sorry, Frank, Keith. Yeah. I keep saying that, but Keith Eiley, and, and talk about the decision to, to allow him to take your B team, and, and what a great guy to, to do that, and all that know-how and knowledge, right? Yeah, me and my wife, Erin, we talked about it, and um, and we we wanted to get the right right person, and we both agreed that Keith was the guy to to um, have a great race with them and and it was been um, a lot of a lot of fun <laughs> so what will your team do now i know they're down there getting uh, cared for and, and get some water in them some food in them and then what what's next yeah we're um, at once we get home we got a race coming up this weekend um so my handlers will will run that i ha also had a team in the in the eight dog i mean in the eight dog um the Bear Grease 120 and Sarah won um, the Rookie of the Year and, nice. and came in eighth place with the with the yearlings. So it's been a really good weekend for us. Yeah. yeah. Hey Brian, and I, uh, when you're training for a race like this, do you do it any different than you would an Iditarod? No, I'm training for Iditarod. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we just do um, what it works well because um, there's so many checkpoints in this, you know, so, um, and uh, um, it's it's a fast race, but it's hilly too, so we try to keep them happy and, and healthy and, and uh, have, have the most fun we can. So when did you think that you actually were gonna win this? Like when you saw the building, or, I mean, you knew he was close behind you. Oh, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> well, I, I, I um, Mid mid race, when I left Sawbill, um, I knew m me and Keith was gonna start making our move. And uh, but at that time, I knew Ryan Anderson was having a really good race. And um, but in order to come out, we needed to um, to make a move there, and and it worked out really well. Um, but I. I was looking behind my shoulders for Keith here. I know he was um, pushing hard, and uh, it was just a few minutes huh, that he came in behind me, so he gained a lot there. But, uh, yeah, it turned out good, though. Yeah. Right, I know Kinnick, Alaska is swelling with pride right now, and I'm sure they're watching, and I know your kiddos are yeah. probably watching. You want to say hello? Yeah, TJ. Booyah, baby! <laughs> my my four-year-old and um, I want to say hi to TJ and Eve and and um, my my mom and dad back home and yeah I'm pretty pretty happy and um, I can't wait to see you guys soon. Yeah, Ryan Reddington, ladies and gentlemen, Very your champion great, of the 2020 Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. It's the second time in the last three years that that he wins it. And again, you you feel the pride, you feel the excitement, and and it, a lot of work that culminates in these events like this. But already he's thinking about the next race. A lot of work, more than most people would humanly ever yeah. choose to do. I mean, it's it is a lot of work. I mean, not only just taking care of the dogs here and running the race, but like you said, now they're going to load up and they're going to drive to another other event it's driving it's yeah. it's taking care of the dogs on the road in and out of the truck it's all the training and the effort that goes behind building a really champion team any team is tremendous yeah and Keith Eiley getting here in second place of course a, a former winner in the early 2000s so he was that close to getting it done and again in his career you saw the pride in him the smile and he kind of loosened up he loosened up he's been a very focused musher throughout these 300 miles yeah and I'll be honest with the time made up this had yeah. been a if yeah. this had been five miles yeah, another longer, checkpoint. Yeah. well, five, ten miles, yeah. I don't know how this would have turned out. It could, because he was making up time. You know, yeah. maybe they ought to add that extra five miles onto this. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, what a great day it's been here at this finish line in, in Grand Portage and, of course, a lot more dog teams to come. We're going to send it back to Oslo, Norway right now to get some analysis from that set. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Dallas, what kind of analysis can we give at this point? Now, we know the f number one and the number two. They're both on the same kennel, but the dogs are the, from the same kennel. They must have done something right. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, they trained correctly. They have a good group of dogs here, and they ran a smart race, right? They finished with two very nice-looking dog teams in first and second. I mean, what more can you hope for in this sort of a setting? So, uh, good race, and I can now confidently say that Ryan Reddington's going to win this race, <laughs> and uh, Keith Eilis going to be second. So, if we take a look... Um, you know, here's a replay of Ryan Reddington coming in towards the finish line. You know, like I'm saying, a solid-looking team. I'm less concerned with the number of dogs as with what those dogs look like. And these are all dogs that belong here, looking good, moving fast, coming into the finish line, excited uh, to see the, another checkpoint. I love uh, hearing a lot of fans, you know, cheering them on into the finish. Um, Ryan's obviously pleased with his performance and, you know, the second team performance there. And, you know, I think it's... It's worthwhile to, to note that, you know, those dogs that Keith Eiley was running and finished in second place, you know, like they were saying, a lot of them, he did race, right? He had been with those dogs for a lot, a lot of time, and that's kind of neat to see. So here's uh, Keith Eiley coming in, um, a nice-looking team. As we were talking when these guys left the last checkpoint, we were kind of guesstimating how long would it take them, what's going to happen. Mm. And I think we were fairly close. You know, we're saying he's probably not going to make up that much time um, to overtake him, but he did make up 20 minutes. So I think we were, you know, clear on that, that he's, he's got good speed. And as those uh, Greg and Bruce were just talking about there, what would happen if the race was a little bit longer, right? Could we see a different leader? Yes, but the race is this long, right? So Ryan timed it well. He got there first, um, you know, ahead of uh, Keith. Not that there's probably a bitter rivalry between the two as they're friends, obviously. And, yeah. you know, these dogs all belong to Ryan at this point. Um, but, yeah, Ryan's got to be proud of these guys. Keith's got to be proud of the dogs that he's trained, that he worked with that are in this team, as well as the dogs that he trained that are probably in Ryan's team here. So, again, nice-looking dog team. These guys are charging towards the finish line. It's not a team that uh, needs the finish line. And what I mean by that is they could easily go another 10, 20, or 300 miles, right? Mm -hmm. So, wagon tails, happy dogs. This is good dog racing here. And he was talking also that, you know, we, he was talking about a little bit of strategy. And he said that the two of them did a push-up that pushed out from Sawbill. They made a, they made a, made a hit there because mm -hmm. they, that, they thought they had to go a little bit harder. Was yeah, it? that uh, all right. First of all, it obviously worked, right? They're yeah. first and second in here, so um, good thought there. I I don't think it's uh, at some point you have to stay within striking distance. Yes, sawbills probably the point at which you need to start racing, um, or at least being aware of that. I always work from the end of the race back. So what I would be looking at is I want to be close enough, but um, where do I actually need to take the lead? I only need to be in lead for. 100 yards yeah. <laughs> it's more relaxing if you can be in lead a little bit longer than that but yeah they, they started making a push at saw bill you know and that still gave them a three four runs to kind of get through the race and make it you know to finish i would want to stay within striking range but i might hold off a little bit longer but again these guys have both won this race uh ryan just won his second uh, Bear Grease and you know so I'm taking notes because I probably will race this race at some point and obviously it's working for these guys they know the trail I have zero information or first hand information on the trail so yeah started making a push there you know closing in on the finish and uh, obviously they're here first and second yeah you're taking notes <laughs> Mental <laughs> notes, yes. Home, homework? Yeah, um, you know, if you're following a race this close, it's definitely information that's going to help you yeah. later. So I think it's quite likely that someday I'll do the Bear Grease, whether that's next year or in 10 years, I don't know. Um, but yeah, getting information, I'm, I've gotten much more excited about this race having followed it very closely here. Yeah. And we're, we're still waiting for number three. And do we have any any GPS, GPS update on, on the number three, if he's far away, or do we have any updates? Yeah, the GPS is, uh, we're looking at that right now. Um, and, you know, we've got a short distance, about 7.4 kilometers to the finish line. Um, and it's been, you know, updates are coming in at different times. So this one was updated uh, about uh, 12 minutes ago so he's a little bit closer than that now mm. as of the last post he was putting up about 11.0 kilometers an hour um, with 7.4 to go now just 
the update prior to that, he was at about 13 kilometers an hour. And so, you know, each data point is different depending on if they're going up a hill or down a hill or on flat ground. Behind Anderson, we have Massacott, who um, is traveling nicely here as well. And we'll be seeing him across the finish line a little bit later. He's uh, got about uh, 13K to the finish line. Again, that was updated uh, a few minutes ago, but 13 kilometers uh, to the to the finish. Um, going back down the trail, we've got quite a big gap to Colleen Wallen. Um, she's running a nice race here, has a nice looking dog team, last we saw. Uh, she's got about 37K left to go, still a ways out. And then we see uh, Nathan Schroeder and Blake Frecking quite close together. Blake Frecking's um, holding his lead, uh, but Schroeder's not far behind him. So they left, you know, Frecking first, then Schroeder right behind him, leaving Mineral Center checkpoint. They're staying fairly close together. It's been looking to me like Frecking's been pulling ahead a little, little bit, mm. but still close enough that that position could change. In Mineral Center, we still have a number of mushers um, staying, kind of hanging out, waiting for their time to depart. Still on the trail. We've got, uh, I think that's Kevin Mathis there, still on the trail. Uh, Laura Nice, I believe, is already in the checkpoint. And Lisa Dietzen um, is kind of bringing up the, the tail end of the race here. And she's got a ways to go yet to get to Mineral City or Center, where she will then take her four hour mandatory rest and continue on towards the Grand Portage finish line. We might not wait for, for Dietzen to get in the finish tonight. Probably, probably not, <laughs> but, uh, but she, let's, she we're hoping finish. she'll make it there to yeah. the finish. Um, you know, nothing's certain, right? I would really like to see her complete the race, finish mm. the race here. It's always good to, you know, see it, see it through to the finish. And so I hope that she's able to do that. Um, same with everybody still in the race. It's not a guarantee for anyone that's still out there. So hopefully we'll see them all through to the finish here uh, in due time. But for right now, the next one we have coming in is going to be Anderson um, and not so long. So we can kind of look forward to that. I'm seeing about uh, six kilometers to the finish. That was updated just a second ago. Um, so yeah, not long. It's getting close. And uh, obviously we saw our first two mushers in there and yeah. happy to be at the finish line and getting the dogs bedded down and taken care of, um, getting their vet care we're done. And then probably once the dogs are all taken care of and tucked in, it's gonna be time for some food for the mushers. We have a Beer Grease 2020 champion. And we see now the pictures from the Grand Portage. It's starting to get dark a little bit, mm. but you know, there's people waiting, and at, I think inside the casino there is a good atmosphere. Yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty um, lively time there at the at the Grand Portage finish. Um, inside, everybody's warm and toasty. The mushers are going to be coming in there, doing a little bit of a press conference, and kind of visiting with the volunteers and the fans that have been following this race. You know, and everybody's able to take a little breath, relax. There's not not much of a workload left on them at this point. Um, you know, obviously they're going to be taking care of these dogs over the next days and weeks as they have for the previous days, weeks, months, and years. <laughs> so that's just another day in the musher's life and it's what they love to do. But now is a chance to kind of let their hair down a bit, relax, have a good time, and enjoy the race atmosphere. And, and if you're not, uh, you're the mush if the mushers are not going out training again or, or they're just taking their dogs in the trailer now and go home, is there a party? Do you go out party together when the race is over? Uh, there is a banquet, of course. Most, uh, most <laughs> yeah, of a well, banquet can be anything. Well, it's, more long it could be serious and, and it yeah. could be a party. That's why I'm asking, is it a party or is it not? Well, the Norwegian oh, here we banquet. have some pictures from inside. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but yeah. most Norwegian banquets, they are parties, actually. Uh -huh. I suppose uh, some of the American ones are there as well. Yeah, and I would say definitely, um, you know, you have your start banquets where mushers are usually excited to get out of there and and go get their team ready for the race to focus on the race the finish banquet is usually a lot more relaxed right they're going to do the banquet the the banquet's going to be I, w I wouldn't say formal mushers don't do formal real well generally speaking <laughs> um but it's a fun time it's a time to get together you're chit-chatting with friends you know people that have a um similar interest obviously and then afterwards there's usually a, you know it turns into a party yeah. <laughs> there's the, well, the after you banquet have, get together. i have seen uh, dead tired mushers at the banquet not touching alcohol they falling asleep with their head in the food yeah, yeah. so non yeah. With, with, no, without drinking so people are really tired yeah but it could be a party without drinking yeah. Yeah, but Absolutely. I mean, I mean, they are so. T we yeah. are uh, when you're mushing and you've been out yeah. in the race. You're so tired. You just fall asleep in the food. Yeah. Yeah. The the longer races, it's definitely more subdued. Um, immediately after the race, 
However, you know, like the Iditarod, the banquet's not until five or six days after the race, which is a long time to keep mushers sitting still in the same town. It's a remote place. We're all away from our home until after the banquet. So there's been times that you finish the race and it's, I think, six days until the banquet. So by then you're starting to get rested up. You're not fully recovered. A race like this will take them... five days, four to five days before they're kind of back up okay. to normal, you know, normal operating level for that musher. Um, a race like the Iditarod, I've had Iditarods that have taken me over a month to recover Recovered. from where you're just, you're just How destroyed. How do you do anything to try to recover uh, more quickly? Um, yeah, you, you, you're Get sleeping, massage, eating. You're eating or... <laughs> I, I, I mean, no, I don't have a real routine other than, you know, eating and sleeping. But, you know, I finished the race with pneumonia, and it's a beat up, you know, you're beat up. You've dropped 20 pounds. You're like 10 kilos lighter than you were starting this race. And that, it takes its toll on the body. We're in a whole nother range. It is not necessarily healthy where the humans are at at the end of a 10-day race like that. You are beat up. Um, it does take time for your body to recover. It's, it's not a quick thing. So, yeah, I... I feel generally not sick after the race. Like even six or seven days after the Iditarod, I feel okay. But as soon as you get up to go do something, you realize you have no energy. Mm. You're just flat. Mm. So, well, it's, okay. Uh, well, there are some Norwegian researchers, scientific researchers, they have done research on the the, the condition, the physical condition of the mushers after the uh, the crossing the finish line. I've been a part of it myself, and um, one thing I experienced, Dallas, is that I sweat a lot it seems really strange but i sweat a lot after crossing the finish line the next days maybe two weeks i feel like i'm sweating so much more especially in the night <laughs> and, and i believe that it's because you have been uh, turning around your inner body um uh, thermostats for some reason <laughs> We can see here now the pictures. Yeah, I know, I know more, I, I've heard more Norwegian measures t commenting on that as well. It's starting to become dark. Yeah. But we're still waiting for number three, Anderson, to come into the Finnish area. Yeah. He so put some headlights on. Yeah, I, I mean, technically, or technically, sunset was about four minutes ago. Technically. <laughs> um, in this <laughs> in this area, so yeah, it's starting to get a little bit darker out there. Sun's going down. Um, it's going to start cooling off pretty quickly here, and that's it may speed up the trail for the mushers that are still out there. But according to Greg and Bruce, they've been seeing temperatures about 10 degrees um, Fahrenheit, which. Uh, is not super cold, but it's about 12 below Celsius. So cold enough that the trail will be set up hard. I'm sure it warmed up a little bit midday. Um, but generally speaking, dog teams are going to speed up in cooler temperatures to a point. When you start getting to negative, um, let's say, negative 20 Fahrenheit, um, you're going to start seeing conditions that's 28.8 below Celsius. You're going to start seeing conditions that are harder to pull the sleds on. Hmm. And so your speed, there's kind of a, an arc there where as it gets colder, the dogs speed up. But then at a certain point, it starts creating more resistance, trying to pull the sleds over the snow, which has more friction in those cooler temperatures. Um, so yeah, we should see a, a, a brisk pace coming in here for the next mushers. Uh, Keith Eiley should be coming in in not super long. So it'll be kind of fun to see him. Obviously at the finish shoot here, we have some artificial lights. So hopefully we get some, some good I, I suppose you mean Ryan Anderson? Uh, yeah, said <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you I've been following too many mushers here. Yeah. So. <laughs> We're having a marathon as well, Dallas. You're talking about the friction on the sled with the colder temperature. Do you vax your sled? Um, like like actually, with the skiing? That's like a really good question. Um, we have different composites of plastic that we use in mm -hmm. Alaska. That we have, you know, different ones designed for different temperatures. Waxing is something that. In, in the U.S. or in Alaska particularly, most of the mushers kind of view it as something that doesn't last long enough. While racing over here in Norway the last two years, I actually learned quite a lot about waxing the runners because the conditions um, in the far north of Norway, you have to wax or else you don't move. <laughs> it's a really, really um, <laughs> abrasive snow type. And so that's something I'm learning more about and I yeah. think will begin to be introduced back into uh, Alaskan racing more and more, um, especially if I start doing it and having successful the race is doing well, that, we, right? It's, again, we do mushrooms have are trendy. changeable runners. Mm -hmm. We put under the uh, on the sled, on the on the um, underneath the sleds. We change them at every checkpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're uh, in a competitive mood or competitive, you would change every checkpoint, and uh, we would vax these runners before we go to the race. Would you then have different? Yeah, for different for temperature. different type. Uh, here, okay, yep. I think we have another team coming here along we go. here. There we go. So we see that reflective light on, or that that light on the lead dog there. Um, got a. 
Rusher coming on down. Nice looking dog team. Everybody's, again, nice tight lines. All the dogs are happy charging down the trail. This is uh, really yeah, exciting sorry. to see all the teams looking so solid here. So this is Ryan Anderson coming in in, um, in third place, one mile out from the finish line right now. So right as the sun's going down, I'm glad we were able to catch them before it got too dark there. <laughs> you know, Dallas, we never mentioned that, actually, but to have that red lamp or that lamp around the neck mm -hmm. of the dog, that's actually mandatory in this race. So to put it on, turn it on during the night yeah. hours. Okay. Yeah, so again, we're going to see that come up here as mm -hmm. we take a look at this uh, shot of Ryan Anderson coming into, or about one mile out from the finish line. So you see that red light on his lead dog. But again, man, nice looking team. Everybody's stretching out nicely. He's got them at a pretty high pace right now. The dogs are all loping down the trail, um, but they're looking really good doing it with tight lines. That's got to be a happy musher on the back of that dog team and a very proud musher of this team's performance. Um, and they should be very proud of how they've run this race. Nearing the finish line, not far behind the lead musher with eight very nice looking dogs right there. They, we will soon have the third one coming to the finish as well. And... <laughs> then it's uh, we have the top three. Yeah, we Here have the top 2020. three. Yeah, so we're in first race um, of the Krill Pet Arctic World Series here. I think this has been a very successful race. Nice looking teams. I'm really proud of how these mushers have conducted this race, managing their teams, uh, managing their in energy, both the humans and the dogs. Everybody's looking like they could go out and do many more miles here. That's what you want to see at a finish of the race, um, that they could easily continue on farther. You know, they're spaced out enough that they can manage their team um, without having to really, you know, have a neck-to-neck -neck race. It's always exciting for fans to see that. Uh, I think we noticed on these first mushers that crossed the finish line, they were kind of subdued. They wasn't crazy. Yay, we, yeah. we made it, right? Partially because these are professional mushers that have done many races. Partially because dog mushing is a slow sport in the context of Ryan knew that he's going to win for some time. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, oh, yeah. you, you oh, swim, yeah. you hit the wall, you turn around, you're waiting that anticipation to see the clock come out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did win, right? I think they already knew this um, for a while here. And also, it wasn't that neck and neck race. I've been in races where the team behind me, their lead dogs are literally stepping on my runner tails. Their lead dogs are right beside me. And it's you know, everything you've got to the finish line. And that one is a big relief. You cross the finish line, it's, whew, <laughs> we actually stayed in front. Yeah. Um, and I've been in the other position where I've passed teams in those final miles, uh, and it's really exciting when you've, you know, to be but rewarded you know, one with thing catching we haven't actually team. talked about, which I think we could be a little bit interesting to mention right now, that's the last part of the race on the last leg, the last kilometer, the last miles. That's what we call no man's land. We haven't been talking about that, Dallas. You can explain if you like, but I mean, that's the last part of the race. And if you're having a really close race with somebody else, that's the part where you're not supposed to move out of the way if the other one is coming from behind. Sure, just, just to clarify real yeah, quick, when you say yeah, no yeah. man's land, most of the race, if a musher comes up behind you and they call for trail, if you're the lead musher, you have to pull aside and let them pass. It's just good trail conduct because uh, dog teams are long and part to safely rules, pass. Actually. It's part of the rules. Yep. No man's land is a, a, a pre-assigned portion of the trail prior to the finish. Usually it's about two miles, sometimes a little less, sometimes more. But prior to the finish, that is no man's land. So when you reach that, if the team is going to so pass you... You have, a, you have a sign saying that yes. you're entering no man's land. Well, it says like two miles yeah. left. So and then you would know it's... Yeah. And some, so some if races, you're in front, you block everybody behind you. You cannot block. And now this is... It's a little bit tricky. You, you can't... Like on this race rules, you can't use your ski pole. Ski pole in no man's land. Because it might that, be unsafe if you... Mm, you know, it can mm, hit the dog behind yeah. you. So you're not supposed to block the other musher, but you don't have to stop and let them by. Now, mm. most races make sure that wherever they allocate no man's land, that the trail is wide enough that a team can pass, right? So they're going to usually groom it extra wide, or you're going to hit a road, or like a lot of races, it's a river. Um, here we're going to see, pretty soon we're going to see Ryan Anderson come around the corner here, getting very close to the finish line. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to see mushers racing in no man's land here. <laughs> it is fun, but if you see this trail, it is wide enough that two teams can pass. And here we go. They're coming around the corner. Again, nice looking team. They've kind of settled in. A couple of them dropped into a trot there, back up into a gallop, closing in on the finish. At this point, they can see the finish line. They can see the people. And it's uh, getting kind of exciting for them to reach that finish and come past everything there. Yeah, nice looking dog team. A lot of smiling, happy dogs. 
and uh, somewhat chilly yeah, musher. <laughs> Leave Under me the more banner, simple. and there we have our third place musher across the finish line. There's Ryan Anderson Ryan in third Anderson. place. Anderson. <laughs> It seems like a pretty happy, maybe he, jovial he's atmosphere. Maybe the most yeah. happy guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know what they said. <laughs> Congratulations. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Bag check or? Yeah, just go through this quick. You know, you got to get your vet book in the mail book and stuff. And if you want to go handle it, I'll do it if you can. I don't, we're not in a big rush. Okay. Okay, Greg and Bruce. We're back here courtside, as they say, and Ryan Anderson just arrived in third place. And, and I know, Bruce, you've been impressed with his dog team the entire way. Totally, and he didn't just arrive. He yeah. arrived at a lope just coming in here. And this is really a super nice-looking dog team. But, yeah, and, and the funny line, I don't think you could hear people laughing at here or not. They ask him how he's doing. He goes, I don't know. They just decided to run all at once. <laughs> it just really got up on step. And that's what he was hoping for the entire way. He'd, and uh, But, man, this is a nice-looking dog team. Anybody would be proud to have these guys. Great confirmation. And they they just came in at a beautiful lope. And I'm sure they could see that on the cameras. So Ryan Reddington, Keith Eiley, and now Ryan Anderson have found their way to Grand Portage. And Ryan finishing the former champion. Three former champions are the first teams to arrive, and they're going to do the check the mandatory the, uh, gear now and oh, right look we through the that. sled. Well, so let's you, listen. They, the, uh, the, they must have taken it. Uh, did you guys get the? Because uh, there was one there. We got the mailbag. But did you get the? Uh, what, uh, the little she one. She got the little one. You got the little one too. Got them both. Okay, we got them both. Here, I'll take. And then he just gets the new gift. Yeah, the mailbag got in here. Yep, it's all yeah, they went through it and got what we need. So you Ryan, we need your signature. Your official, you're an official <laughs> podium finisher. Here we go. God. It's official when the signature goes on the line. Why are you running like that? <laughs> Pretty much the whole run. Whenever we're not going up the hill, they've been going like that. Holy cow. Yeah. Not hey, Ryan, can you take a minute? Coming yeah. in here. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. They're a fun team. Here. They finally, like I said, the last two runs, but uh, had to bag that dog. And it's a nice team. Yeah. They, beautiful. They roll, they move nice, and uh, they're strong. So. Yeah. And they, the pride you feel about getting a team to this finish line looking the way, that good? The way they started, and I, yeah, they, the way they finished is unbelievable. Like, yeah, I, so I feel good about that, just managing what I had in front of me at the time. Unfortunately, it didn't play out the way in the race the way I wanted, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, yeah so, so um, yeah, no, I'm happy. Dogs are happy. Um, and now they're running good, so. And again, what's no, those, what's those leaders' names up there again? That's Jameson and Tito, their brothers. Mm. So the, it was a. Litter I see of, a theme. Yeah, they're litter of alcohol. So. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was the five uh, the five main alcohols. So there was a you know the a gin, a vodka, uh, whiskey, and whatever they are. <laughs> but there's five main alcohols. Well, they're beautiful. Yeah, they're good. They're my main two, and uh, yeah, so I'm happy with. So. Good job. Congratulations, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan Anderson into third place, and he has found uh, the finish line in great condition, Bruce. And you hear that all the time. Like, the key is is not always about winning the race, but it's about getting to the finish line with a healthy, happy team, and we just saw that. Yeah, and there's always another race to run, you yeah. know, but the dogs the dogs come first, and, and that's what you want to do. And, you know, a musher is always trying to find out the limits of a dog, too. Like, well, how much do they have to give? You know, you take a race like I did, Rod, when it was first run and how long it took. And then it was a 14-day race and then a 12-day race and then a 10-day race. And, you know, now eight, nine days. So you have to learn the capability of the dogs without pushing them over the limit. So who, who knows how he'll do in the next race with that team? Yeah, well, chances are... You know he's he's been around a while, very experienced musher, right? And and obviously he's he's figuring out how to build a team and and how to get them to work together. And I, I just I know he's come up and and run the Iditarod, but it'll be interesting someday when Ryan does come back to the big race uh, if we see progression and development uh, against a, a field of mushers that is like no no others in the world. Well, I think any musher would be happy to get their hands on in, in any one of those dogs i mean 
if he was selling dogs, I might be tempted again because <laughs> it's just fun to watch them yeah. run like that. Yeah. And But I'm saying that it acts in all seriousness as a compliment. Any top musher would be happy to get any of those individual dogs from yeah. that team if you can pry them out of his fingers. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're still uh, efforting an interview with Keith Eiley who got in here in second place. As soon as he makes his way up from his dog truck, we will have an interview with him. I promise. I promise. <laughs> Let's go back to Oslo, Norway for the time being. Thank you, Greg. You better promise and get that interview. Huh? We, we saw Anderson coming in to a third place. He looked pretty happy and uh, maybe even more happy than the number one or two. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of variation in individual mushers and kind of their personalities, right? Um, but yeah, very jovial, outgoing, you know, happy to be to the finish line. And again, it's, it's a relaxing thing in a lot of ways where whew, it's, it's done. Um, and now it's time to have fun, right? And it's, again, these people are coming out here, the volunteers, the fans. You know, it's, it's nice to be interacting. He's making jokes. This is, it's, this is fun. He had some fun names on his dogs. Yeah. He has a theme for... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, having themes is pretty, pretty common in, in litters. Um, I'm not going to say that I haven't had similar themes, but yeah, he has his alcohol leader, litter there with Jameson and Tito as his lead dogs. Um, car brands. Yeah. I have had car brands. And yeah. So cartoons. I only had Splint in, in lead there, and I'd love to know if there was any more of that litter. And uh, Ryan, you know, the winning lead dogs with Henry and Ghost up front. You know, it's been kind of cool to see the different dogs coming through here. And it is interesting as we watch this race, you know, there's a couple like uh, Splint and Keith Eilie's team, you know, that white lead dog in lead every time, right? And so so we're thousands of miles away and getting to know these dogs as they're racing. And uh, it's one of the fun things about this sport is getting to see more dogs and, you know, understanding the personalities in other people's teams. Because I know all those little personalities in our team and in, in my team, and I love every one of those and they're all unique. And so to, to see that in other people's teams is fun as well. Mm -hmm. Anderson, he was happy with a third place. It, it's he, the, the top three spots. They're all having done great result at beer years before. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think all three of them are uh, past uh, Bear Grease champions yeah, here. they will be. Uh, mm. So that makes sense. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They're running good races. Uh, you know, the, here we see uh, Ryan Anderson coming into the finish once again. And I think uh, Bruce said it well there also. You know, anybody would be happy to have this, this any dog from this team. It's a really nice-looking team um, coming into the finish of this race. And, and that's always exciting and fun to see in these races. Just These dogs just ran 300 miles. <laughs> <laughs> and they're charging across the finish line. You know, they accrue 24 hours of rest while out on the trail. Um, and this is what these guys are bred to do, and they're loving every step of it. You know, it is an amazing creature, the Alaskan Husky, the sled dog, what they can do out here. It's really quite impressive. It seems to be a good atmosphere at the, st at the finish. They're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would like to hear what they're <laughs> you know, they're having fun. They're having a good time. Um, like I said, being jovial and outgoing and... Uh, you know, looking forward to a, a good meal and a warm bed for more than a few hours here. So that's exciting. Going through all the mandatory equipment there, making sure they have everything they need. And you can see that sled is mostly empty, as we touched on before. Okay. There's just not a lot of equipment that you need as the race is a little bit shorter. The distances between checkpoints are shorter. And we'll stand up. Greg, is, are you already ready for an interview with um, Ailey or...? Should we wait a little bit? Greg, can you can, are you can you hear me? Are you ready with an interview with Ailey? No, he, he can't hear us, but I, he, he's on it. I think he's on it. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll tell you, Greg is. Um both quite polite, um, and I've been interviewed many times by these guys, both these two out on the trail. He's quite polite, polite but he is also persistent, so I'm sure he'll get us uh, that interview in, in due time, you know, and understanding that Ali's just finished the race and taking care of dogs and you know, obviously wants to kind of wrap this up for the dogs and get them tucked in before. It's a fine line when you're a journalist in that situation because you know you need to leave <clears throat> and you need want to get the interview in so you have to be polite but persistent. It's mm -hmm. it's it's difficult. But he's he'll 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 get there. Well, he's signing out. So, what do you think uh, Reddington is doing right now? 
I'm going to guess by now he's been across the finish line for some time now. Um, I'm thinking that he's probably f got the dogs all tucked in. It's been almost an hour, I think, that he's, okay. that he's been there. So he's got them tucked so in and probably finding back. food. We have some live <laughs> pictures now. Can you hear me, Greg? So just point to me when they want it. You can start. <laughs> Uh, he, we will just, uh, when he starts talking, we will stop talking. That sounds good. Okay, good. <laughs> like okay ladies and gentlemen, I can't hear Norway right now, but I'm assuming we're back. And, wow, second place. Uh, tell us about the dog team. You've got to be feeling really good about them. Yeah, I'm really happy with them. It was a fun 300 miles, you know, the trail is a little soft, but just slowed things down a bit. But no, the dog team was running great, managed them good, and you could see it at the end. And, and Keith, you made up a lot of time in that last run. Were you off the sled running? Take us back there, paint the picture. I was somewhat where I could on the steeper hills, but a lot of the times I didn't get out because you just screw up their rhythm when they're running up. So oh, there was okay. those kind of hills, but I did all I could. You know what I mean? I can only allow them to go so fast down the hills on the flat so I don't injure anybody and keep everybody healthy. So that's all I could do. There must be a kind of a sense of pride, and this is kind of rumor mill and musher circles, but actually some of those dogs were years previously, right? Yeah, there was there was probably, I think, seven in that team that I had sold Ryan. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of cool. I mean, yeah. you knew the dogs before, so yeah. you know their personalities yeah. and that you've had input into he, them. Yeah, but not as much as I would like, because when I sold most of them dogs to Ryan, they were young, so I quite didn't have the, a lot of time with them yet, so... Uh -huh. But it was nice to see some of them. Yeah, and now you, eventually you're going to see these guys perform in Iditarod, some yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah, it'll be exciting to look forward to. So you're a past champion and you've run this before. How did this trail compare to other years? I know there's a lot of variance in the weather and snow here, but, I mean, just kind of looking back at other races you run here, was this a more difficult, softer trail, or was it typical? Or yeah, I was... <sighs> Just, it was pretty typical, just a tad bit slower in the start, you know what I mean? We were going speeds, normally we're going almost two miles an hour faster on some of them runs in the first hundred miles, and we couldn't just because of that soft trail, so that was the only difference. So it's the first time I've been down here, but just to other mushers thinking about coming here and that are watching this race, I heard all of you guys say repeatedly, it's one key to running this race well is managing those dogs on the hills don't let them run downhill that seems to be a key factor for keeping a big team like you did yeah it's very very important because people don't realize just a notch higher than what you should be letting them dogs go down the hill that's the only spot that they can really get injured you know and that's your job as a driver you're in control of that speed just manage it right but a lot of people get antsy or, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things going on out there. And Keith, I know mushers like to reflect. So when you look back upon these 300 miles, can you go back to a moment or a decision uh, that resulted in uh, you not getting here before Ryan? Is there a point in which you can look back and say, oh, if I would have done this or... Oh, yeah. I, I thought about that on the run in here. And there was a few things just because it was kind of short notice jumping on this dog team and stuff. There was a... F there was a couple things I could have done differently, like maybe running a different leader and certain legs. Okay. And another thing I did, too, is did a lot of practice with, uh, with the amount of layover and stuff. There was two spots that I put a little bit too much food in the dogs that slowed them down. And that's a big time on the run. So, yeah, there's a few things. I easily probably could have got here at least half hour sooner if I went to made those mistakes. But yeah. that's how it goes. And, 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 again, that just proves to us all that no matter how much you do this and how many years you do this every time you come out on one of these racetracks or, or courses you learn something yes you do yep even after 30 years i'm still learning stuff all the time that's, <laughs> that's what i like about it but that's it. the fun yeah. thing that's what for I like about it. every yeah. dog's different every yep. race every yep. run is different yep <laughs> well second place is great I, I know you'll never forget this race it was great competition yeah it was and yeah. people don't realize how many good dog teams were behind me and ryan yeah. There's a lot of good dog teams in this race this year. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Keith Eiley, second place in the Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. Let's go back to Oslo, Norway. Thank you so much, Greg and Bruce, for all the great interviews in, in, at the finish line today and also for the rest, all of the checkpoints you've been following throughout the Bear Grease. You know, it's the time for everything. And it's about time to end this historical first live broadcast of the Quill Pet Arctic World Series. And I first of all want to thank you guys 
Dallas and Nina for everything, all your expertise you're bringing through all during throughout these three days. Has it been a good experience for you? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it's a marathon as well, because I'm not used to being in a studio like this. And, you know, you get pretty tired <laughs> focusing on the screen, focusing on the the race. It, I would do the same at home. It's just a little bit different for me with the cameras. And so it's really fun. This has been a fantastic experience. It's been really fun to dive into the John Berigree Sled Dog Marathon deeper than I ever have before, really following these mushers. And I just want to say one more time, I'm, I'm really impressed with how these mushers manage these teams. We saw really nice dog teams running out there, solid teams finishing the race, a well-conducted race um, all the way around. So this has been a real pleasure to follow this race. Mm. Thank you so much, but it's not over yet. You will go up to Femin Race as well, because the next event of the Krill Pet Arctic World <coughs> Series is it's already starting already next Friday. So we'll go, of course, be live from Rödos from the start, Friday 31st. So thank you for following, and please come back on Friday to watch the start of the Femin Race from Norway. Thank you all, good night, and see you then. Bye-bye.